faith of the fallen. Chapter 1 She didn't remember dying. With an obscure sense of apprehension, she wondered if the distant angry voices drifting into her meant she was again about to experience that transcendent ending, death. There was absolutely nothing she could do about it if she was. While she didn't remember dying, she dimly recalled at some later point solemn whispers saying that she had, saying that death had taken her, but that he had pressed his mouth over hers and filled her stilled lungs with his breath, his life, and in so doing had rekindled hers. She had had no idea who it was that spoke of such an inconceivable feat, or who he was. That first night, when she had perceived the distant, disembodied voices as little more than a vague notion, she had grasped that there were people around her who didn't believe, even though she was again living, that she would remain alive through the rest of the night. But now she knew she had. She had remained alive many more nights, perhaps in answer to desperate prayers and earnest oaths whispered over her that first night. But if she didn't remember the dying, she remembered the pain before passing into that great oblivion. The pain she never forgot. She remembered fighting alone and savagely against all those men, men baring their teeth like a pack of wild hounds with a hare. She remembered the rain of brutal blows driving her to the ground, heavy boots slamming into her once she was there, and the sharp snap of bones. She remembered the blood, so much blood on their fists, on their boots. She remembered the searing terror of having no breath to gasp at the agony, no breath to cry out against the crushing weight of hurt. Sometime after, whether hours or days, she didn't know, when she was lying under clean sheets in an unfamiliar bed and had looked up into his gray eyes, she knew that, for some, the world reserved pain worse than she had suffered. She didn't know his name. The profound anguish so apparent in his eyes told her beyond doubt that she should have. More than her own name, more than life itself, she knew she should have known his name, but she didn't. Nothing had ever shamed her more. Thereafter, whenever her own eyes were closed, she saw his, saw not only the helpless suffering in them, but also the light of such fierce hope as could only be kindled by righteous love. Somewhere, even in the worst of the darkness blanketing her mind, she refused to let the light in his eyes be extinguished by her failure to will herself to live. At some point, she remembered his name. Most of the time, she remembered it. Sometimes she didn't. Sometimes, when pain smothered her, she forgot even her own name. Now, as Kalin heard men growling his name, she knew it. She knew him. With tenacious resolution, she clung to that name, Richard, and to her memory of him, of who he was, of everything he meant to her. Even later, when people had feared she would yet die, she knew she would live. She had to, for Richard, her husband for the child she carried in her womb, his child, their child. The sounds of angry men calling Richard by name at last tugged Kalin's eyes open. She squinted against the agony that had been tempered, if not banished, while in the cocoon of sleep. She was greeted by a blush of amber light filling the small room around her. Since the light wasn't bright, she reasoned that there must be a covering over a window muting the sunlight, or maybe it was dusk. Whenever she woke, as now, she not only had no sense of time, but no sense of how long she had been asleep. She worked her tongue against the pasty dryness in her mouth. Her body felt leaden with the thick, lingering slumber. She was as nauseated as the time when she was little and had eaten three candy green apples before a boat journey on a hot, windy day. It was hot like that now. Summer hot. She struggled to rouse herself fully, but her awakening awareness seemed adrift, bobbing in a vast, shadowy sea. Her stomach roiled. She suddenly had to put all her mental effort into not throwing up. She knew all too well that in her present condition, few things hurt more than vomiting. Her eyelids sagged closed again, and she foundered to a place darker yet. She caught herself, forced her thoughts to the surface, and willed her eyes open again. She remembered they gave her herbs to dull the pain and to help her sleep. Richard knew a good deal about herbs. At least the herbs helped her drift into stuporous sleep. The pain, if not as sharp, still found her there. Slowly, carefully, so as not to twist what felt like double-edged daggers skewered here and there between her ribs, she drew a deeper breath. 
The fragrance of balsam and pine filled her lungs, helping to settle her stomach. It was not the aroma of trees among other smells in the forest, among damp dirt and toadstools and cinnamon ferns, but the redolence of trees freshly felled and limbed. She concentrated on focusing her sight and saw beyond the foot of the bed a wall of pale, newly peeled timber, here and there oozing sap from fresh axe cuts. The wood looked to have been split and hewn in haste, yet its tight fit betrayed a precision only knowledge and experience could bestow. The room was tiny. In the confessor's palace, where she had grown up, a room this small would not have qualified as a closet for linens. Moreover, it would have been stone, if not marble. She liked the tiny wooden room. She expected that Richard had built it to protect her. It felt almost like his sheltering arms around her. Marble, with its aloof dignity, never comforted her in that way. Beyond the foot of the bed, she spotted a carving of a bird in flight. It had been sculpted with a few sure strokes of a knife into a log of the wall on a flat spot only a little bigger than her hand. Richard had given her something to look at. On occasion, sitting around a campfire, she had watched him casually carve a face or an animal from a scrap of wood. The bird, soaring on wings, spread wide as it watched over her, conveyed a sense of freedom. Turning her eyes to the right, she saw a brown wool blanket hanging over the doorway. From beyond the doorway came fragments of angry, threatening voices. It's not by our choice, Richard. We have our own families to think about, wives and children. Wanting to know what was going on, Kaylin tried to push herself up onto her left elbow. Somehow her arm didn't work the way she had expected it to. Like a bolt of lightning, pain blasted up the marrow of her bone and exploded through her shoulder. Gasping against the racking agony of attempted movement, she dropped back before she had managed to lift her shoulder an inch off the bed. Her panting twisted the daggers piercing her sides. She had to will herself to slow her breathing in order to get the stabbing pain under control. As the worst of the torment in her arm and the stitches in her ribs eased, she finally let out a soft moan. With calculated calm, she gazed down the length of her left arm. The arm was splinted. As soon as she saw it, she remembered that of course it was. She reproached herself for not thinking of it before she had tried to put weight on it. The herbs, she knew, were making her thinking fuzzy. Fearing to make another careless movement, and since she couldn't sit up, she focused her effort on forcing clarity into her mind. She cautiously reached up with her right hand and wiped her fingers across the bloom of sweat on her brow, sweat sewn by the flash of pain. Her right shoulder socket hurt, but it worked well enough. She was pleased by that triumph, at least. She touched her puffy eyes, understanding then why it had hurt to look toward the door. Gingerly, her fingers explored a foreign landscape of swollen flesh. Her imagination colored it a ghastly black and blue. When her fingers brushed cuts on her cheek, hot embers seemed to sear raw, exposed nerves. She needed no mirror to know she was a terrible sight. She knew, too, how bad it was whenever she looked up into Richard's eyes. She wished she could look good for him, if for no other reason than to lift the suffering from his eyes. Reading her thoughts, he would say, I'm fine. Stop worrying about me and put your mind to getting better. With a bittersweet longing, Kalin recalled lying with Richard, their limbs tangled in delicious exhaustion, his skin hot against hers, his big hand resting on her belly as they caught their breath. It was agony wanting to hold him in her arms again and being unable to do so. She reminded herself that it was only a matter of some time and some healing. They were together, and that was what mattered. His mere presence was a restorative. She heard Richard beyond the blanket over the door speaking in a tightly controlled voice, stressing his words as if each had cost him a fortune. We just need some time. The men's voices were heated and insistent, as they all began talking at once. It's not because we want to. You should know that, Richard. You know us. What if it brings trouble here? We've heard about the fighting. You said yourself she's from the Midlands. We can't allow. We won't. Kalin listened, expecting the sound of his sword being drawn. Richard had nearly infinite patience, but little tolerance. Kara, his bodyguard, their friend, was no doubt out there, too. Kara had neither patience nor tolerance. Instead of drawing his sword, Richard said, I'm not asking anyone to give me anything. 
I want only to be left alone in a peaceful place where I can care for her. I wanted to be close to Hartland in case she needed something. He paused. Please, just until she has a chance to get better. Kaylin wanted to scream at him, No, don't you dare beg them, Richard. They have no right to make you beg. They've no right. They could never understand the sacrifices you've made. But she could do little more than whisper his name in sorrow. Don't test us. We'll burn you out if we have to. You can't fight us all. We have right on our side. The men ranted and swore dark oaths. She expected now, at last, to hear the sound of his sword being drawn. Instead, in a calm voice, Richard answered the men in words Kalin couldn't quite make out. A dreadful quiet settled in. It's not because we like doing this, Richard, someone finally said in a sheepish voice. We've no choice. We've got to consider our own families and everyone else. Another man spoke out with righteous indignation. Besides, you seem to have gotten all high and mighty of a sudden, with your fancy clothes and sword, not like you used to be, back when you were a woods guide. That's right, said another. Just because you went off and saw some of the world, that don't mean you can come back here thinking you're better than us. I've overstepped what you have all decided is my proper place, Richard said. Is that what you mean to say? You turned your back on your community, on your roots as I see it. You think our women aren't good enough for the great Richard Cipher. No, he had to marry some woman from away. Then you come back here and think to flaunt yourselves over us. How? By doing what? Marrying the woman I love. This you see as vain? This nullifies my right to live in peace and takes away her right to heal, to get well and live? These men knew him as Richard Cipher, a simple woods guide, not as the person he had discovered he was in truth and who he had become. He was the same man as before, but in so many ways they had never known him. You ought to be on your knees praying for the Creator to heal your wife, another man put in. All of mankind is a wretched and undeserving lot. You ought to pray and ask the Creator's forgiveness for your evil deeds and sinfulness. That's what brought your troubles on you and your woman. Instead, you want to bring your troubles among honest working folks. You've no right to try to force your sinful troubles on us. That's not what the Creator wants. You should be thinking of us. The Creator wants you to be humble and to help others. That's why he struck her down, to teach you both a lesson. Did he tell you this, Albert? Richard asked. Does this Creator of yours come to talk with you about his intentions and confide in you his wishes? He talks to anyone who has the proper modest attitude to listen to him, Albert fumed. Besides, another man spoke up, this imperial order you warn about has some good things to be said for it. If you weren't so bullheaded, Richard, you'd see that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to see everyone treated decent. It's only being fair-minded. It's only right. Those are the Creator's wishes, you've got to admit, and that's what the Imperial Order teaches, too. If you can't see that much good in the Order, well, then you'd best be gone, and soon. Kalin held her breath. In an ominous tone of voice, Richard said, So be it. These were men Richard knew. He had addressed them by name and reminded them of years and deeds shared. He had been patient with them. Patience finally exhausted. He had reached intolerance. Horses snorted and stomped, their leather tack creaking as the men mounted up. In the morning, we'll be back to burn this place down. We'd better not catch you or yours anywhere near here, or you'll burn with it. After a few last curses, the men raced away. The sound of departing hooves, hammering the ground, rumbled through Kalin's back. Even that hurt. She smiled a small smile for Richard, even if he couldn't see it. She wished only that he had not begged on her behalf. He would never, she knew, have begged for anything for himself. Light splashed across the wall as the blanket over the doorway was thrown back. By the direction and quality of the light, Kalin guessed it had to be somewhere in the middle of a thinly overcast day. Richard appeared beside her, his tall form towering over her, throwing a slash of shadow across her middle. He wore a black sleeveless undershirt, without his shirt or magnificent gold and black tunic, leaving his muscular arms bare. At his left hip, the side toward her, a flash of light glinted off the pommel of his singular sword. His broad shoulders made the room seem even smaller than it had been only a moment before. His clean-shaven face, his strong jaw, and the crisp line of his mouth perfectly complemented his powerful form. His hair, 
A color somewhere between blonde and brown brushed the nape of his neck. But it was the intelligence so clearly evident in those penetrating gray eyes of his that from the first had riveted her attention. Richard, Kalin whispered, I won't have you begging on my account. The corners of his mouth tightened with a hint of a smile. If I want to beg, I shall do so. He pulled her blanket up a little, making sure she was snugly covered even though she was sweating. I didn't know you were awake. How long have I been asleep? A while. She figured it must have been quite a while. She didn't remember arriving at this place or him building the house that now stood around her. Kaylin felt more like a person in her eighties than one in her twenties. She had never been hurt before, not grievously hurt anyway, not to the point of being on the cusp of death and utterly helpless for so long. She hated it, and she hated that she couldn't do the simplest things for herself. Most of the time she detested that more than the pain. She was stunned to understand so unexpectedly and so completely life's frailty, her own frailty, her own mortality. She had risked her life in the past and had been in danger many times, but looking back, she didn't know if she had ever truly believed that something like this could happen to her. Confronting the reality of it was crushing. Something inside seemed to have broken that night. Some idea of herself. Some confidence. She could so easily have died. Their baby could have died before it even had a chance to live. You're getting better, Richard said, as if in answer to her thoughts. I'm not just saying that. I can see that you're healing. She gazed into his eyes, summoning the courage to finally ask, How do they know about the order way up here? People fleeing the fighting have been up this way. Men spreading the doctrine of the imperial order have been even here, to where I grew up. Their words can sound good, almost make sense, if you don't think, if you just feel. Truth doesn't seem to count for much, he added in afterthought. He answered the unspoken question in her eyes. The men from the Order are gone. The fools out there were just spouting things they've heard, that's all. But they intend us to leave. They sound like men who keep the oaths they've sworn. He nodded, but then some of his smile returned. Do you know that we're very close to where I first met you last autumn? Do you remember? How could I ever forget the day I met you? Our lives were in jeopardy back then, and we had to leave here. I've never regretted it. It was the start of my life with you. As long as we're together, nothing else really matters. Kara swept in through the doorway and came to a halt beside Richard, adding her shadow to his across the blue cotton blanket that covered Kalin to her armpits. Sheathed in skin-tight red leather, Kara's body had the sleek grace of a falcon, commanding, swift, and deadly. Mord Sith always wore their red leather when they believed there was going to be trouble. Kara's long blonde hair, swept back into a single thick braid, was another mark of her profession of Mord Sith, member of an elite corps of guards to the Lord Rall himself. Richard had, after a fashion, inherited the Mord Sith when he inherited the rule of Dahara, a place he grew up never knowing. Command was not something he had sought, Nonetheless, it had fallen to him. Now a great many people depended on him. The entire New World, Westland, the Midlands, and Dahara, depended on him. How do you feel? Kara asked with sincere concern. Kalin was able to summon little more voice than a hoarse whisper. I'm better. Well, if you feel better, Kara growled, then tell Lord Rawl that he should allow me to do my job and put the proper respect into men like that. Her menacing blue eyes turned for a moment toward the spot where the men had been while delivering their threats. The ones I leave alive, anyway. Kara, use your head, Richard said. We can't turn this place into a fortress and protect ourselves every hour of every day. Those men are afraid. No matter how wrong they are, they view us as a danger to their lives and the lives of their families. We know better than to fight a senseless battle when we can avoid it. But, Richard... Kaelin said, lifting her right hand in a weak gesture toward the wall before her. You've built this... Only this room. I wanted a shelter for you first. It didn't take that long. Just some trees cut and split. We've not built the rest of it yet. 
It's not worth shedding blood over. If Richard seemed calm, Kara looked ready to chew steel and spit nails. Would you tell this obstinate husband of yours to let me kill someone before I go crazy? I can't just stand around and allow people to get away with threatening the two of you. I am more sick. Kara took her job of protecting Richard, the Lord Rawl of Dahara, and Kalin very seriously. Where Richard's life was concerned, Kara was perfectly willing to kill first and decide later if it had been necessary. That was one of the things for which Richard had no tolerance. Kalin's only answer was a smile. Mother Confessor, you can't allow Lord Rawl to bow to the will of foolish men like those. Tell him. Kalin could probably count on the fingers of one hand the people who, in her whole life, had ever addressed her by the name Kalin, without at minimum the appellation Confessor before it. She had heard her ultimate title, Mother Confessor, spoken countless times, in tones ranging from awed reverence to shuddering fear. Many people, as they knelt before her, were incapable of even whispering through trembling lips the two words of her title. Others, when alone, whispered them with lethal intent. Kaylin had been named Mother Confessor while still in her early twenties, the youngest confessor ever named to that powerful position. But that was several years past. Now she was the only living confessor left. Kaylin had always endured the title, the bowing and kneeling, the reverence, the awe, the fear, and the murderous intentions, because she had no choice. But more than that, she was the mother confessor, by succession and selection, by right, by oath, and by duty. Kara always addressed Kalin as mother confessor, but from Kara's lips, the words were subtly different than from many others. It was almost a challenge, a defiance by scrupulous compliance, but with a hint of an affectionate smirk. Coming from Kara, Kalin didn't hear mother confessor so much as she heard sister. Kara was from the distant land of Dahara. No one anywhere outranked Kara as far as Kara was concerned, except the Lord Rawl. The most she would allow was that Kalin could be her equal in duty to Richard. Being considered an equal by Kara, though, was high praise indeed. When Kara addressed Richard as Lord Rawl, however, she was not saying brother. She was saying precisely what she meant, Lord Rawl. To the men with the angry voices, the Lord Rawl was as foreign a concept as was the distant land of Dahara. Kalin was from the Midlands that separated Dahara from Westland. The people here in Westland knew nothing of the Midlands or the Mother Confessor. For decades, the three parts of the New World had been separated by impassable boundaries, leaving what was beyond those boundaries shrouded in mystery. The autumn before, those boundaries had fallen. And then in the winter, the common barrier to the south of the three lands, that had for three thousand years sealed away the menace of the Old World, had been breached, loosing the Imperial Order on them all. In the last year, the world had been thrown into turmoil. Everything everyone had grown up knowing had changed. I'm not going to allow you to hurt people just because they refuse to help us, Richard said to Kara. It would solve nothing and only end up causing us more trouble. What we started here only took a short time to build. I thought this place would be safe, but it's not. We'll simply move on. He turned back to Kalin. His voice lost its fire. I was hoping to bring you home to some peace and quiet, but it looks like home doesn't want me either. I'm sorry. Just those men, Richard. In the land of Andereth, just before Kalin had been attacked and beaten, the people had rejected Richard's offer to join the emerging Daharan Empire he led in the cause of freedom. Instead, the people of Andereth willingly chose to side with the Imperial Order. Richard had taken Kalin and walked away from everything, it seemed. What about your real friends here? I haven't had time. I wanted to get a shelter up first. There's no time now, maybe later. Kalin reached for his hand, which hung at his side. His fingers were too far away. But Richard... Look, it's not safe to stay here anymore. It's as simple as that. I brought you here because I thought it would be a safe place for you to recover and regain your strength. I was wrong. It's not. We can't stay here. Understand? Yes, Richard. We have to move on. Yes, Richard. There was something more to this, she knew. Something of far greater importance than the more immediate ordeal it meant for her. There was a distant, troubled look in his eyes. 
But what of the war? Everyone is depending on us, on you. I can't be much help until I get better. But they need you right now. The Daharan Empire needs you. You are the Lord Rahl. You lead them. What are we doing here, Richard? She waited until his eyes turned to look at her. Why are we running away when everyone is counting on us? I'm doing as I must. As you must? What does that mean? Shadow shrouded his face as he looked away. I've had a vision. Chapter 2 A vision, Kalin said in open astonishment. Richard hated anything to do with prophecy. It had caused him no end of trouble. Prophecy was always ambiguous and usually cryptic, no matter how clear it seemed on the surface. The untrained were easily misled by its superficially simplistic construction. Unthinking adherence to a literal interpretation of prophecy had in the past caused great turmoil, everything from murder to war. As a result, those involved with prophecy went to great lengths to keep it secret. Prophecy, at least on the face of it, was predestination. Richard believed that man created his own destiny. He had once told her, Prophecy can only say that tomorrow the sun will come up. It can't say what you're going to do with your day. The act of going about your day is not the fulfillment of prophecy, but the fulfillment of your own purpose. Shota, the witch woman, had prophesied that Richard and Kalin would conceive an infamous son. Richard had more than once proven Shota's view of the future to be, if not fatally flawed, at least vastly more complex than Shota would have it seem. Like Richard, Kalin didn't accept Shota's prediction. On any number of occasions, Richard's view of prophecy had been shown to be correct. Richard simply ignored what prophecy said and did as he believed he must. By his doing so, prophecy was in the end often fulfilled, but in ways that could not have been foretold. In this way, prophecy was at once proven and disproved, resolving nothing and only demonstrating what an eternal enigma it truly was. Richard's grandfather, Zed, who had helped raise him not far from where they were, had not only kept his own identity as a wizard secret. In order to protect Richard, he also hid the fact that Richard had been fathered by Darkin Rall and not George Cipher, the man who had loved and raised him. Darkin Rall, a wizard of great power, had been the dangerous, violent ruler of far-off Dahara. Richard had inherited the gift of magic from two different bloodlines. After killing Darkin Rall, he had also inherited the rule of Dahara, a land that was in many ways as much a mystery to him as was his power. Kalin, being from the Midlands, had grown up around wizards. Richard's ability was unlike that of any wizard she had ever known. He possessed not one aspect of the gift, but many, and not one side, but both. He was a war wizard. Some of his outfit came from the wizard's keep and had not been worn in three thousand years since the last war wizard lived. With the gift dying out in mankind, wizards were uncommon. Kalin had known fewer than a dozen. Among wizards, prophets were the most rare. She knew of the existence of only two. One of those was Richard's ancestor, which made visions all the more within the province of Richard's gift, yet Richard had always treated prophecy as a viper in his bed. Tenderly, as if there were no more precious thing in the whole world, Richard lifted her hand. You know how I always talk about the beautiful places only I know way back in the mountains to the west of where I grew up, the special places I've always wanted to show you. I'm going to take you there, where we'll be safe. The Harans are bonded to you, Lord Rall, Kara reminded him, and we'll be able to find you through that bond. Well, our enemies aren't bonded to me. They won't know where we are. Kara seemed to find that thought agreeable. If people don't go to this place, then there won't be any roads. How are we going to get the carriage there? The mother confessor can't walk. I'll make a litter. You and I will carry her in that. Kara nodded thoughtfully. We could do that. If there were no other people, then the two of you would be safe at least. Safer than here. I had expected the people here to leave us to ourselves. I hadn't expected the order to foment unrest this far away, at least not this quickly. Those men usually aren't a bad lot, but they're working themselves up into a dangerous mood. 
The cowards have gone back to their women's skirts. They won't be back until morning. We can let the mother confess arrest and then leave before dawn. Richard cast Kara a telling look. One of those men, Albert, has a son, Lester. Lester and his pal, Tommy Lancaster, once tried to put arrows into me for spoiling some fun Tommy was about to have hurting someone. Now Tommy and Lester are missing a good many teeth. Albert will tell Lester about us being here, and soon after, Tommy Lancaster will know, too. Now that the Imperial Order has filled their heads with talk of a noble war on behalf of good, those men will be fancying what it would be like to be war heroes. They aren't ordinarily violent, but today they were more unreasonable than I've ever seen them. They'll go drinking to fortify their courage. Tommy and Lester will be with them by then and their tales of how I wronged them and how I'm a danger to decent folks will get everyone all worked up. Because they greatly outnumber us, they'll begin to see the merit in killing us, see it as protecting their families and doing the right thing for the community and their creator. Full of liquor and glory, they won't wait until morning. They'll be back tonight. We have to leave now. Kara seemed unconcerned. I say we wait for them, and when they come back we end the threat. Some of them will bring along other friends. There will be a lot of them by the time they get here. We have Kalen to think about. I don't want to risk one of us being injured. There's nothing to be gained by fighting them. Richard pulled the ancient tooled leather baldric holding the gold and silver wrought scabbard and sword off over his head and hung it on the stump of a branch sticking out of a log. Looking unhappy, Kara folded her arms. She would rather not leave a threat alive. Richard picked his folded black shirt off the floor to the side where Kalen hadn't seen it. He poked an arm through a sleeve and drew it on. A vision? Kalen finally asked again. As much trouble as the men could be, they were not her biggest concern just then. You've had a vision? The sudden clarity of it felt like a vision, but it was really more of a revelation. Revelation? She wished she could manage more than a hoarse whisper. And what form did this vision revelation thing take? Understanding. Kalen stared up at him. Understanding of what? He started buttoning his shirt. Through this realization, I've come to understand the larger picture. I've come to understand what it is I must do. Yes, Kara muttered, and wait until you hear it. Go ahead, tell her. Richard glared at Kara and she answered him in kind. His attention finally returned to Kalin. If I lead us into this war, we will lose. A great many people will die for nothing. The result will be a world enslaved by the Imperial Order. If I don't lead our side in battle, the world will still fall under the shadow of the Order, but far fewer people will die. Only in that way will we ever stand a chance. By losing? You want to lose first and then fight? How can we even consider abandoning the fight for freedom? Andreth helped teach me a lesson, he said. His voice was restrained, as if he regretted what he was saying. I can't press this war. Freedom requires effort if it is to be won, and vigilance if it is to be maintained. People just don't value freedom until it's taken away. But many do. Kalin objected. There are always some, but most don't even understand it, nor do they care to. The same is with magic. People mindlessly shrink from it, too, without seeing the truth. The Order offers them a world without magic and ready-made answers to everything. Servitude is simple. I thought that I could convince people of the value of their own lives and of liberty. In Andereth, they showed me just how foolish I had been. Andereth is just one place. Andereth was not remarkable. Look at all the trouble we've had elsewhere. We are having trouble even here where I grew up. Richard began tucking in his shirt. Forcing people to fight for freedom is the worst kind of contradiction. Nothing I can say will inspire people to care. I've tried. Those who value liberty will have to run, to hide to try to survive and endure what is sure to come. I can't prevent it. I can't help them. I know that now. But, Richard, how can you even think of 
I must do what is best for us. I must be selfish. Life is far too precious to be casually squandered on useless causes. There can be no greater evil than that. People can only be saved from the coming dark age of subjugation and servitude if they, too, come to understand and care about the value of their own lives, their freedom, and are willing to act in their own interest. We must try to stay alive in the hope that such a day will come. But we can prevail in this war. We must. Do you think that I can just go off and lead men into war, and because I wish it, we will win? We won't. It takes more than my wishing it. It will take vast numbers of people fully committed to the cause. We don't have that. If we throw our forces against the order, we will be destroyed, and any chance for winning freedom in the future will be forever lost. He raked his fingers back through his hair. We must not lead our forces against the army of the order. He turned to pulling his black open-sided tunic on over his head. Kalin struggled to give force to her voice, to the magnitude of her concern. But what about all those who are prepared to fight? All the armies already in the field. There are good men, able men, ready to go against Chagang and stop his imperial order and drive them back to the old world. Who will lead our men? Lead them to what? Death? They can't win. Kalin was horrified. She reached up and snatched his shirt sleeve before he could lean down to retrieve his broad overbelt. Richard, you're only saying this, walking away from the struggle because of what happened to me. No. I had already decided it that same night before you were attacked. When I went out alone for a walk after the vote, I did a lot of thinking. I came to this realization and made up my mind. What happened to you made no difference except to prove the point that I'm right and should have figured it out sooner. If I had, you would never have been hurt. But if the mother confessor had not been hurt, you would have felt better by morning and changed your mind. Light coming through the doorway behind him lit in a blaze of gold the ancient symbols coiled along the squared edges of his tunic. Kara, what would happen if I'd been attacked with her and we had both been killed? What would you all do then? I don't know. That is why I withdraw. You are following me, not participating in a struggle for your own future. Your answer should have been that you would all fight on for yourselves, for your freedom. I have come to understand the mistake I've made in this, and to see that we cannot win in this way. The order is too large an opponent. Kalin's father, King Wyborn, had taught her about fighting against such odds, and she had practical experience at it. Their army may outnumber ours, but that doesn't make it impossible. We just have to outthink them. I will be there to help you, Richard. We have seasoned officers. We can do it. We must. Look how the Order's cause spreads on words that sound good. Richard swept out an arm, even to distant places like this. We know beyond doubt the evil of the order, yet people everywhere passionately side with them despite the ghastly truth of everything the imperial order stands for. Richard, Kalin whispered, trying not to lose what was left of her voice. I led those young Galean recruits against an army of experienced order officers who greatly outnumbered us, and we prevailed. Exactly. They had just seen their home city after the order had been there. Everyone they loved had been murdered, everything they knew had been destroyed. Those men fought with an understanding of what they were doing and why. They were going to throw themselves at the enemy with or without you commanding them. But they were the only ones, and even though they succeeded, most of them were killed in the struggle. Kalim was incredulous. So you were going to let the order do the same elsewhere? so as to give people a reason to fight? You were going to stand aside and let the order slaughter hundreds of thousands of innocent people? You want to quit because I was hurt. Dear spirits, I love you, Richard, but don't do this to me. I'm the mother confessor. I'm responsible for the lives of the people of the Midlands. Don't do this because of what happened to me. Richard snapped on his leather-padded silver wristbands. I'm not doing this because of what happened to you. I'm helping save those lives in the only way that has a chance. 
I'm doing the only thing I can do. You are doing the easy thing, Kara said. Richard met her challenge with quiet sincerity. Kara, I'm doing the hardest thing I have ever had to do. Kalin was sure now that their rejection by the Andereth people had hit him harder than she had realized. She caught two of his fingers and squeezed sympathetically. He had put his heart into sparing those people from enslavement by the order. He had tried to show them the value of freedom by allowing them the freedom to choose their own destiny. He had put his faith in their hands. In a crushing defeat, an enormous majority had spurned all he had offered, and in so doing, devastated that faith. Kalin thought that perhaps, with some time to heal, the same as with her, the pain would fade for him, too. You can't hold yourself to blame for the fall of Andereth, Richard. You did your best. It wasn't your fault. He picked up his big leather overbelt with its gold-worked pouches and cinched it over the magnificent tunic. When you're the leader, everything is your fault. Kalin knew the truth of that. She thought to dissuade him by taking a different tack. What form did this vision assume? Richard's piercing gray eyes locked on her, almost in warning. Vision, revelation, realization, postulation, prophecy, understanding, call it what you will. For in this they are all in one the same and unequivocal. I can't describe it but to say it seems as if I must have always known it. Maybe I have. It wasn't so much words as it was a complete concept, a conclusion, a truth that became absolutely clear to me. She knew he expected her to leave it at that. If it became so clear, and is unambiguous, she pressed, you must be able to express it in words. Richard slipped the baldric over his head, laying it over his right shoulder. As he adjusted the sword against his left hip, light sparkled off the raised gold wire woven through the silver wire of the hilt to spell out the word truth. His brow was smooth and his face calm. She knew she had at last brought him to the heart of the matter. His certainty would afford him no reason to keep it from her if she chose to hear it, and she did. His words rolled forth with quiet power like prophecy come to life. I have been a leader too soon. It is not I who must prove myself to the people, but the people who must now prove themselves to me. Until then I must not lead them, or all hope is lost. Standing there, erect, masculine, masterful in his black war wizard outfit, he looked as if he could be posing for a statue of who he was, the Seeker of Truth, rightfully named by Zedekus Zul Zarander, the first wizard himself, and Richard's grandfather. It had nearly broken Zed's heart to do so because Seekers so often died young and violently. While he lived, a Seeker was a law unto himself, Backed by the awesome power of his sword, a seeker could bring down kingdoms. That was one reason it was so important to name the right person, a moral person, to the post. Zed claimed that the seeker, in a way, named himself by the nature of his own mind and by his actions, and that the first wizard's function was simply to act on his observations by officially naming him and giving him the weapon that was to be his lifelong companion. So many different qualities and responsibilities had converged in this man she loved that she sometimes wondered how he could reconcile them all. Richard, are you so sure? Because of the importance of the post, Kalin and then Zed had sworn their lives in defense of Richard as the newly named Seeker of Truth. That had been shortly after Kalin had met him. It was as Seeker that Richard had first come to accept all that had been thrust upon him and to live up to the extraordinary trust put in him. His gray eyes fairly blazed with clarity of purpose as he answered her. The only sovereign I can allow to rule me is reason. The first law of reason is this. What exists, exists. What is, is. From this irreducible bedrock principle all knowledge is built. This is the foundation from which life is embraced. Reason is a choice, Wishes and whims are not facts, nor are they a means to discovering them. Reason is our only way of grasping reality. It's our basic tool of survival. 
We are free to evade the effort of thinking, to reject reason. But we are not free to avoid the penalty of the abyss we refuse to see. If I fail to use reason in this struggle, if I close my eyes to the reality of what is in favor of what I would wish, then we will both die in this, and for nothing. We will be but two more among uncounted millions of nameless corpses beneath the gray, gloomy decay of mankind. In the darkness that will follow, our bones will be meaningless dust. Eventually, perhaps a thousand years from now, perhaps more, the light of liberty will again be raised up to shine over a free people, but between now and then, millions upon millions of people will be born into hopeless misery and have no choice but to bear the weight of the order's yoke. We, by ignoring reason, will have purchased those mountains of broken bodies, the wreckage of lives endured but never lived. Kalin found herself unable to summon the courage to speak, much less argue. To do so right then would be to ask him to disregard his judgment at a cost he believed would be a sea of blood. But doing as he saw they must would cast her people helpless into the jaws of death. Kalin, her vision turning to a watery blur, looked away. Kara, Richard said, get the horses hitched to the carriage. I'm going to scout a circle to make sure we don't have any surprises. I will scout while you hitch the horses. I am your guard. You're my friend, too. I know this land better than you. Hitch the horses and don't give me any trouble about it. Kara rolled her eyes and huffed, but marched off to do his bidding. The room rang with silence. Richard's shadow slipped off the blanket. When Kalin whispered her love to him, he paused and looked back. His shoulders seemed to betray the weight he carried. I wish I could, but I can't make people understand freedom. I'm sorry. From somewhere inside, Kalin found a smile for him. Maybe it isn't so hard. She gestured toward the bird he had carved in the wall. Just show them that, and they will understand what freedom really means. To soar on your own wings. Richard smiled. She thought gratefully before he vanished through the doorway. Chapter 3 All the troubling thoughts tumbling through her mind kept Kalin from falling back to sleep. She tried not to think about Richard's vision of the future. As exhausted as she was by pain, his words were too troubling to contemplate. And besides, there was nothing she could do about it right then. But she was determined to help him get over the loss of Andereth and focus on stopping the Imperial Order. It was more difficult to shake her thoughts about the men who had been outside, men Richard had grown up with. The haunting memory of their angry threats echoed in her mind. She knew that ordinary men who had never before acted violently could, in the right circumstances, be incited to great brutality. With the way they viewed mankind as sinful, wretched, and evil, it was only a small step more to actually doing evil. After all, any evil they might do, they had already rationalized as being predestined by what they viewed as man's inescapable nature. It was unnerving to contemplate an attack by such men, when they could do nothing but lie there waiting to be killed. Kalin envisioned a grinning, toothless Tommy Lancaster leaning over her to cut her throat while all she could do was stare helplessly up at him. She had often been afraid in battle, but at least then she could fight with all her strength to survive. That helped counter the fear. It was different to be helpless and have no means to fight back. It was a different sort of fear. If she had to, she could always resort to her confessor's power. But in her condition, that was a dubious proposition. She had never had to call upon her power when in anything like the condition in which she now found herself. She reminded herself that the three of them would be long gone before the men returned, and besides, Richard and Kara would never let them get near her. Kalin had a more immediate fear, though, and that one was all too real. But she wouldn't feel it for long. She would pass out, she knew. She hoped. She tried not to think of it, and instead put her hand gently over her belly, over their child, as she listened to the nearby splashing and burbling of a stream. The sound of the water reminded her of how much she wished she could take a bath. The bandages over the oozing wound in her side stank and needed to be changed often. The sheets were soaked with sweat. Her scalp itched. 
The mat of grass that was the bedding under the sheet was hard and chafed her back. Richard had probably made the pallet quickly, planning to improve it later. As hot as the day was, the stream's cold water would be welcome. She longed for a bath to be clean and to smell fresh. She longed to be better, to be able to do things for herself, to be healed. She could only hope that as time passed, Richard, too, would recover from his invisible but real wounds. Kara finally returned, grumbling about the horses being stubborn today. She looked up to see the room was empty. I had better go look for him and make sure he's safe. He's fine. He knows what he's doing. Just wait, Kara, or he will then have to go out and look for you. Kara sighed and reluctantly agreed. Retrieving a cool, wet cloth, she set to mopping Kalin's forehead and temples. Kalin didn't like to complain when people were doing their best to care for her, so she didn't say anything about how much it hurt her torn neck muscles when her head was shifted in that way. Kara never complained about any of it. Kara only complained when she believed her charges were in needless danger, and when Richard wouldn't let her eliminate those she viewed as a danger. Outside, a bird let out a high-pitched trill. The tedious repetition was becoming grating. In the distance, Kalin could hear a squirrel chattering an objection to something, or perhaps arguing over his territory. He'd been doing it for what seemed an hour. The stream babbled on without let-up. This was Richard's idea of restful. I hate this, she muttered. You should be happy, lying about without anything to do. And I bet you would be happy to trade places. I am Mord Sith. For a Mord Sith, nothing could be worse than to die in bed. Her blue eyes turned to Kalin's. Old and toothless, she added. I didn't mean that you... I know what you meant. Kara looked relieved. Anyway, you couldn't die. That would be too easy. You never do anything easy. I married Richard. See what I mean? Kalin smiled. Kara dunked the cloth in a pail on the floor and wrung it out as she stood. It isn't too bad, is it? Just lying there? How would you like to have to have someone push a wooden bowl under your bottom every time your bladder was full? Kara carefully blotted the damp cloth along Kalin's neck. I don't mind doing it for a sister of the Aegeal. The Aegeal, a weapon a moored Sith always carried, looked like nothing more than a short red leather rod hanging on a fine chain from her right wrist. A moored Sith's Aegeal was never more than a flick away from her grip. It somehow functioned by means of the magic of a moored Sith's bond to the Lord Rahl. Kalin had once felt the partial touch of an Aegeal. In a blinding instant, it could inflict the kind of pain that the entire gang of men had dealt Kalin. The touch of a moored Sith's Aegeal was easily capable of delivering bone-breaking torture, and just as easily, if she desired, death. Richard had given Kalin the Aegeal that had belonged to Denna, the moored Sith who had captured him by order of Dark and Rawl. Only Richard had ever come to understand and empathize with the pain an Aegeal also gave the moored Sith who wielded it. Before he was forced to kill Denna in order to escape, she had given him her Aegeal asking to be remembered as simply Denna, the woman beyond the appellation of Mord Sith, the woman no one but Richard had ever before seen or understood. That Kalin understood and kept the Aegeal as a symbol of that same respect for women whose young lives had been stolen and twisted to nightmare purposes and duties was deeply meaningful to the other Mord Sith. Because of that compassion, untainted by pity, and more, Kara had named Kalin a sister of the Aegeal. It was an informal but heartfelt accolade. Messengers have come to see Lord Rall, Kara said. You were sleeping and Lord Rall saw no reason to wake you, she added in answer to Kalin's questioning look. The messengers were Daharan, and able to find Richard by their bond to him as their Lord Rall. Kalin, not able to duplicate the feat, had always found it unsettling. What did they have to say? Kara shrugged. Not a lot. Jagang's army of the Imperial Order remains in Andorith for the time being, with Rybish's forces staying safely to the north to watch and be ready should the Order decide to threaten the rest of the Midlands. We know little of the situation inside Andorith under the Order's occupation. 
The rivers flow away from our men toward the sea, so they have not seen bodies to indicate if there has been mass death, but there have been a few people who managed to escape. They report that there was some death due to the poison which was released, but they don't know how widespread it was. General Rybish has sent scouts and spies in to learn what they will. What orders did Richard give them to take back? None. None? He sent no orders? Kara shook her head and then leaned over to dunk the cloth again. He wrote letters to the general, though. She drew the blanket down, lifted the bandage at Kalin's side, and inspected its weak red charge before tossing it on the floor. With a gentle touch, she cleaned the wound. When Kalin was able to get her breath, she asked, Did you see the letters? Yes. They say much the same as he has told you, that he has had a vision that has caused him to come to see the nature of what he must do. He explained to the general that he could not give orders for fear of causing the end of our chances. Did General Rybish answer? Lord Rawl has had a vision. The Harans know the Lord Rawl must deal with the terrifying mysteries of magic. The Harans do not expect to understand their Lord Rawl and would not question his behavior. He is the Lord Rawl. The general made no comment but sent word that he would use his own judgment. Richard had probably told them it was a vision rather than say it was simply a realization for that very reason. Kalin considered that a moment, weighing the possibilities. We have that much luck, then. General Rybish is a good man and will know what to do. Before too long, I'll be up and about. By then, maybe Richard will be better, too. Kara tossed the cloth into the pail. As she leaned closer, her brow creased with frustration and concern. Mother Confessor, Lord Rawl said he will not act to lead us until the people prove themselves to him. I'm getting better. I hope to help him get over what happened. Help him to see that he must fight. But this involves magic. She picked at the frayed edge of the blue blanket. Lord Rawl said it's a vision. If it is magic... Then it's something he would know about and must handle in the way he sees it must be done. We need to be a little understanding of what he's been through. The loss we've all suffered to the Order. And remember, too, that Richard didn't grow up around magic, much less ruling armies. Kara squatted and rinsed her cloth in the pail. After wringing it out, she went back to cleaning the wound in Kalin's side. He is the Lord Rawl, though. Hasn't he already proven himself to be a master of magic a number of times? Kalin couldn't dispute that much of it, but he still didn't have much experience, and experience was valuable. Kara not only feared magic, but was easily impressed by any act of wizardry. Like most people, she couldn't distinguish between a simple conjuring and the kind of magic that could alter the very nature of the world. Kalin realized now that this wasn't a vision as such, but a conclusion Richard had arrived at. Much of what he'd said made sense, but Kalin believed that emotion was clouding his thinking. Kara looked back up from her work. Her voice bore an undertone of uncertainty, if not despairing bewilderment. Mother Confessor, how will the people ever be able to prove themselves to Lord Rawl? I have no idea. Kara set down the cloth and looked Kalin in the eye. It was a long, uncomfortable moment before she finally decided to speak. Mother Confessor, I think maybe Lord Rawl has lost his mind. Kalin's immediate thought was to wonder if General Rybish might believe the same thing. I thought the Harans do not expect to understand their Lord Rawl and would not question his behavior. Lord Rawl also says he wants me to think for myself. Kalin put her hand over Kara's. How many times have we doubted him before? Remember the chicken that wasn't a chicken? We both thought he was crazy. He wasn't. This is not some monster chasing us. This is something much bigger. Kara, do you always follow Richard's orders? Of course not. He must be protected and I can't allow his foolishness to interfere with my duty. 
I only follow his orders if they do not endanger him, or if they tell me to do what I would have done anyway, or if it involves his male pride. Did you always follow Dark and Rawls' orders? Kara stiffened at the unexpected encounter with the name, as if speaking it might summon him back from the world of the dead. You followed Dark and Rawls' orders no matter how foolish they were, or you were tortured to death. Which Lord Rao do you respect? I would lay down my life for any Lord Rao. Kara hesitated and then touched her fingertips to the red leather over her heart. But I could never feel this way for any other. I love Lord Rao, not like you love him, not like a woman loves a man, but it is still love. Sometimes I have dreams of how proud I am to serve and defend him, and sometimes I have nightmares that I will fail him. Kara's brow drew down with sudden dread. You won't tell him that I said I love him, will you? He must not know. Kalin smiled. Kara, I think he already knows, because he has similar feelings about you. But if you don't wish it, I won't say anything. Kara let out a sigh of relief. Good. And what made you come to feel that way about him? Many things... He wishes us to think for ourselves. He allows us to serve him by choice. No Lord Rall has ever done that before. I know that if I said I wished to quit him, he would let me go. He would not have me tortured to death for it. He would wish me a good life. That and more is what you value about him. He never pretended any claim to your lives. He believes no such claim can ever rightfully exist. It's the first time since you were captured and trained to be moored Sith that you have felt the reality of freedom. That, Kara, is what Richard wants for everyone. She swished a hand as if dismissing the seriousness of the whole thing. He would be foolish to grant me my freedom if I asked for it. He needs me too much. You wouldn't need to ask for your freedom, Kara, and you know it. You already have your freedom. And because of him, you know that, too. That's what makes him a leader you are honored to follow. That's why you feel the way you do about him. He has earned your loyalty. Kara mulled it over. I still think he has lost his mind. In the past, Richard had more than once expressed his faith that, given a chance, people would do the right thing. That was what he had done with the Mord Sith. That was also what he had done with the people of Andereth. Now, Kalin swallowed back her emotion. Not his mind, Kara, but maybe his heart. Kara, seeing the look on Kalin's face, dismissed the seriousness of the matter with a shrug and a smile. I guess we will simply have to bring him around to the way things are going to be. Talk some sense into him. Kara dabbed away the remnant of a tear as it rolled down Kalin's cheek. Before he comes back, how about getting that stupid wooden bowl for me? Kara nodded and bent to retrieve it. Kalin was already fretting, knowing how much it was going to hurt. There was no avoiding it. Kara came up with a shallow bowl. Before those men came, I was planning on making a fire and warming some water. I was going to give you a bed bath. You know, with a soapy cloth and a bucket of warm water. I guess I can do it when we get where we are going. Kaylin half closed her eyes with the dreamy thought of being at least somewhat clean and fresh. She thought she needed a bath even more than she needed the wooden bowl to relieve herself. Kara, if you would do that for me, I would kiss your feet when I get better and name you to the most important post I can think of. I am Mord Sith, Kara looked nonplussed. She finally drew the blanket down. That is the most important post there is, except perhaps wife to the Lord Rall. Since he already has a wife and I am already moored Sith, I will have to be content with having my feet kissed. Kalin chuckled, but a stab of pain through her abdomen and ribs brought it to an abrupt halt. Richard was a long time in returning. Kara had made Kalin drink two cups of cold tea, heavily laced with herbs, to dull the pain. It wouldn't be long before she was in a stupor, if not exactly asleep. Kalin had been just about to yield to Kara's desire to go look for Richard when he called from a distance to let them know it was him. Did you see any of the men? 
Kara asked when he appeared in the doorway. With a straight finger, Richard swiped glistening beads of sweat off his forehead. His damp hair was plastered to his neck. No, they're no doubt off to Heartland to do some drinking and complaining. By the time they come back, we'll be long gone. I still say we should lie in wait and end the threat, Kara muttered. Richard ignored her. I cut and stripped some stout saplings and used some canvas to make a litter. He came closer and with a knuckle nudged Kalin's chin as if to playfully buck up her courage. From now on, we'll just let you stay on the litter, and then we can move you in and out of the carriage without... He had that look in his eyes, that look that hurt her to see. He showed her a smile. It will make it easier on Kara and me. Kalin tried to face the thought with composure. We're ready, then? His gaze dropped as he nodded. Good, Kalin said cheerfully. I'm in the mood for a nice ride. I'd like to see some of the countryside. He smiled more convincingly this time, she thought. You shall have it, and we'll end up at a beautiful place. It's going to take a while to get there, traveling as slow as we must, but it will be worth the journey, you'll see. Kalin tried to keep her breathing even. She said his name over and over in her head, telling herself that she would not forget it this time, that she would not forget her own name. She hated forgetting things. It made her feel a fool to learn things she should have remembered but had forgotten. She was going to remember this time. Well, do I have to get up and walk? Or are you going to be a gentleman and carry me? He bent and kissed her forehead, the one part on her face that the soft touch of his lips would not hurt. He glanced at Kara and tilted his head to signal her to get Kalin's legs. Will those men be drinking a long time? Kalin asked. It's still midday. Don't worry, we'll be long gone before they ever get back here. I'm sorry, Richard. I know you thought these people from your homeland. They're people, just like everyone else. She nodded as she fondly stroked the back of his big hand. Kara gave me some of your herbs. I'll sleep for a long time, so don't go slow on my account. I won't feel it. I don't want you to have to fight all those men. I won't be doing any fighting, just traveling my forests. That's good. Kalin felt daggers twist in her ribs as her breathing started getting too fast. I love you, you know, in case I forgot to say it, I love you. Despite the pain in his gray eyes, he smiled. I love you, too. Just try to relax. Kara and I will be as gentle as we can. We'll go easy. There's no rush. Don't try to help us. Just relax. You're getting better, so it won't be so hard. She had been hurt before and knew that it was always better to move yourself because you knew exactly how to do it. But she couldn't move herself this time. She had come to know that the worst thing when you were hurt was to have someone else move you. As he leaned over, she slipped her right arm around his neck while he carefully slid his left arm under her shoulders. Being lifted even that much ignited a shock of pain. Kalin tried to ignore the burning stitch and attempted to relax as she said his name over and over in her mind. She suddenly remembered something important. It was her last chance to remind him. Richard, she whispered urgently just before he pushed his right arm under her bottom to lift her. Please remember to be careful not to hurt the baby. She was startled to see her words stagger him. It took a moment before his eyes turned up to look into hers. What she saw there nearly stopped her heart. Kalin, you remember, don't you? Remember? His eyes glistened. That you lost the baby when you were attacked. The memory slammed into her like a fist, nearly taking her breath. Oh. Are you all right? Yes. I forgot for a moment. I just wasn't thinking. I remember now. I remember you told me about it. And she did. Their child, their child that had only begun to grow in her, was long since dead and gone. Those beasts who had attacked her had taken that from her, too. The world seemed to turn gray and lifeless. I'm so sorry, Kalin, he whispered. She caressed his hair. No, Richard, I should have remembered. I'm sorry I forgot. I didn't mean to. He nodded. She felt a warm tear drop onto the hollow of her throat close to her necklace. 
The necklace, with its small, dark stone, had been a wedding gift from Shota, the witch woman. The gift was a proposal of truce. Shota said it would allow them to be together and share their love, as they had always wanted, without Kalin getting pregnant. Richard and Kalin had decided that, for the time being, they would reluctantly accept Shota's gift, her truce. They already had worries enough on their hands. But for a time, when the chimes had been loose in the world, the magic of the necklace, unbeknownst to Richard and Kalin, had failed. One small but miraculous balance to the horrors the chimes had brought had been that it had given their love the opportunity to bring a child to life. Now that life was gone. Please, Richard, let's go. He nodded again. Dear spirits, he whispered to himself so softly she could hardly hear him. Forgive me for what I am about to do. She clutched his neck. She now longed for what was coming. She wanted to forget. He lifted her as gently as he could. It felt like wild stallions, tied to each limb, all leaped into a gallop at the same instant. Pain ripped up from the core of her, the shock of it making her eyes go wide as she sucked in a breath, and then she screamed. The blackness hit her like a dungeon door slamming shut. Chapter 4 a sound woke her as suddenly as a slap. Kaylin lay on her back, still as death, her eyes wide, listening. It wasn't so much that the sound had been loud, but that it had been something disturbingly familiar, something dangerous. Her whole body throbbed with pain, but she was more awake than she had been in what seemed like weeks. She didn't know how long she had been asleep, or perhaps unconscious. She was awake enough to remember that it would be a grave mistake to try to sit up, because just about the only part of her not injured was her right arm. One of the big chestnut geldings snorted nervously and stamped a hoof, jostling the carriage enough to remind Kalin of her broken ribs. The sticky air smelled of approaching rain, though fits of wind still bore dust to her nostrils. Dark masses of leaves overhead swung fretfully to and fro, their creaking branches giving voice to their torment. Deep purple and violet clouds scudded past in silence. Beyond the trees and clouds, the field of blue-black sky held a lone star high over her forehead. She wasn't sure if it was dawn or dusk, but it felt like the death of day. As the gusts beat strands of her filthy hair across her face, Kaylin listened as hard as she could for the sound that didn't belong, still hoping to fit it into a picture of something innocent. Since she'd heard it only from the deepness of sleep, its conscious identity remained frustratingly out of her reach. She listened, too, for sounds of Richard and Kara, but heard nothing. Surely they would be close. They would not leave her alone, not for any reason this side of death. She recoiled from the image. She ached to call out for Richard and prove the uninvited thought of foolish fear, but instinct screamed at her to stay silent. She needed no reminder not to move. A metallic clang came from the distance, then a cry. Maybe it was an animal, she told herself. Ravens sometimes let out the most awful cries. Their shrill wails could sound so human it was eerie. But as far as she knew, ravens didn't make metallic sounds. The carriage suddenly lurched to the right. Her breath caught as the unanticipated movement caused a stitch of pain in the back of her ribs. Someone had put weight on the step. By the careless disregard for the carriage's injured passenger, she knew it wasn't Richard or Kara. But if it wasn't Richard, then who? Goose flesh tickled the nape of her neck. If it wasn't Richard... Where was he? Stubby fingers grasped the top of the corded chafing strip on the carriage's side rail. The blunt fingertips were rounded back over grubby, gnawed-down little half-button fingernails. Kalin held her breath, hoping he didn't realize she was in the carriage. A face popped up. Cunning dark eyes squinted at her. The man's four middle upper teeth were missing, leaving his eye teeth looking like fangs when he grinned. Well, well, if it ain't the wife of the late Richard Cipher. Kalin lay frozen. 
This was just like her dreams. For an instant, she couldn't decide if it was only that, just a dream, or real. His shirt bore a dark patina of dirt, as if it was never removed for anything. Sparse, wiry hairs on his fleshy cheeks and chin were like early weeds in the plowed field of his pockmarked face. His upper lip was wet from his runny nose. He had no lower teeth in front. The tip of his tongue rested partway out between the yawning gap of his smirk. He brought up a knife for her to see. He turned it this way and that, almost as if he were showing off a prized possession to a shy girl he was courting. His eyes kept flicking back and forth between the knife and Kalin. The slipshod job of sharpening appeared to have been done on rough granite rather than on a proper whetstone. Dark blotches and rust stained the poorly kept cheap steel, but the scratched and chipped edge was no less deadly for any of it. His wicked toothless grin widened with pleasure as her gaze followed the blade, watching it carve careful slices of the air between them. She made herself look into his dark, sunken eyes, which peered out from puffy slits. Where's Richard? she demanded in a level voice. Dancing with the spirits in the underworld. He cocked his head to one side. Where's the blonde bitch? The one my friends said they saw before. The one with the smart mouth. The one what needs to have her tongue shortened before I gut her. Kalin glared at him so he would know she had no intention of answering. As the crude knife advanced toward her, his stench hit her. You would have to be Tommy Lancaster. The knife paused. How'd you know that? Anger welled up from deep inside her. Richard told me about you. The eyes glittered with menace. His grin widened. Yeah? What did he tell you? that you were an ugly, toothless pig who wets his pants whenever he grins. Smells like he was right. The smirking grin turned to a scowl. He raised up on the step and leaned in with the knife. That was what Kalin wanted him to do, to get close enough so she could touch him. With the discipline born of a lifetime of experience, she mentally shed her anger and donned the calm of a confessor committed to a course of action. Once a confessor was resolved to releasing her power, the nature of time itself seemed to change. She had but to touch him. A confessor's power was partly dependent on her strength. In her injured condition, she didn't know if she would be able to call forth the required force, and if she could, whether she would survive the unleashing of it. But she knew she had no choice. One of them was about to die, maybe both. He leaned his elbow on the side rail. His fist with the knife went for her exposed throat. Rather than watching the knife, Kalin watched the little scars like dusty white cobwebs caught on his knuckles. When the fist was close enough, she made her move to snatch his wrist. Unexpectedly, she discovered she was snugly enfolded in the blue blanket. She hadn't realized Richard had placed her on the litter he'd made. The blanket was wrapped around her and tightly tucked under the stretcher poles in order to hold her as still as possible and prevent her from being hurt when the carriage was moving. Her arm was trapped inside what was about to become her death shroud. Hot panic flared up as she struggled to free her right arm. She was in a desperate race with the blade coming for her throat. Pain knifed her injured ribs as she battled with the blanket. She had no time to cry out or to curse in frustration at being so unwittingly snared. Her fingers gathered a fold of material. She yanked at it, trying to pull some slack from under the litter she lay atop so she could free her arm. Kalin had merely to touch him, but she couldn't. His blade was going to be the only contact between them. Her only hope was that maybe his knuckles would brush her flesh, or maybe he just might be close enough as he started to slice her throat that she could press her chin against his hand. Then she could release her power if she was still alive, if he didn't cut too deep first. As she twisted and pulled at the blanket, it seemed to her an eternity as she watched the blade poised over her exposed neck, an eternity to wait before she had any hope of unleashing her power, an eternity to live. But she knew 
There was only an instant more before she would feel the ripping slash of that rough blade. It didn't happen at all as she expected. Tommy Lancaster wrenched backward with an ear-splitting shriek. The world around Kalen crashed back in a riot of sound and motion with the abrupt readjustment to the discontinuation of her intent. Kalen saw Kara behind him, her teeth clenched in a grim commitment of her own. In her pristine red leather, she was a precious ruby behind a clod of dirt. Bent into the aegeal pressed against his back, Tommy Lancaster had less hope of pulling away from Kara than if she had impaled him on a meat hook. His torment would not have been more brutal to witness, his shrieks more painful to hear. Kara's aegeal dragged up and around the side of his ribs as he collapsed to his knees. Each rib the aegeal passed over broke with a sharp crack like the sound of a tree limb snapping. Vivid red, the match of her leather oozed over his knuckles and down his fingers. The knife clattered to the rocky ground. A dark stain of blood grew on the side of his shirt until it dripped off the untucked tails. Kara stood over him, an austere executioner watching him beg for mercy. Instead of granting it, she pressed her aegeal against his throat and followed him to the ground. His eyes were wide and white all around as he choked. It was a slow, agonizing journey toward death. Tommy Lancaster's arms and legs writhed as he began to drown in his own blood. Kara could have ended it quickly, but it didn't appear she had any intention of doing so. This man had meant to kill Kalen. Kara meant to extract a heavy price for the crime. Kara! Kalen was surprised that she could get so much power into the shout. Kara glanced back over her shoulder. Tommy Lancaster's hands went to his throat, and he gasped for air when she rose up to stand over him. Kara, stop it! Where's Richard? Richard may need your help. Kara leaned down over Tommy Lancaster, pressed her aegeal to his chest, and gave it a twist. His left leg kicked out once, his arms flopped to the side, and he went still. Before either Kara or Kalen could say anything, Richard, his face set in cold ferocity, sprinted up toward the carriage. He had his sword to hand. The blade was dark and wet. The instant Kalen saw his sword, she comprehended what had awakened her. The sound had been the sword of truth announcing its arrival in the evening air. In her sleep, her subconscious recognized the unique ring of steel made by the sword of truth when it was drawn, and she instinctively grasped the danger that that sound represented. On his way to Kalen's side, Richard only glanced at the lifeless body at Kara's feet. Are you all right? Kalen nodded. Fine. Belatedly, yet feeling triumphant at the accomplishment, she pulled her arm free of the blanket. Richard turned to Kara. Anyone else come up the road? No, just this one, she gestured with her aegeal toward the knife on the ground. He intended to cut the mother confessor's throat. If Tommy Lancaster hadn't already been dead, Richard's glare would have finished him. I hope you didn't make it easy on him. No, Lord Rowell, he regretted his last vile act. I made certain of it. With his sword, Richard indicated the surrounding area. Stay here and keep your eyes open. I'm sure we got them all, but I'm going to check just to be certain no one else was holding back and trying to surprise us from another direction. No one will get near the mother confessor, Lord Rowell. Dust rose in the gloomy light when he gave a reassuring pat to the shoulder of one of the two horses standing in their harnesses. Soon as I get back, I want to get going. We should have enough moon for a few hours anyway. I know a safe place to make camp about four hours up the road. That will get us a good distance away from all this. He pointed with his sword. Drag his body past the brush over there and roll him off the edge, down into the ravine. I'd just assume the bodies weren't found until after we're long gone and far away. Probably only the animals will ever find them way out here, but I don't want to take any chances. Kara snatched a fistful of Tommy Lancaster's hair. With pleasure. He was stocky, but the weight gave her no difficulty. Richard trotted soundlessly off into the gathering darkness. Kalen listened to the sound of the body scraping across the ground. She heard small branches snapping as Kara pulled the dead weight through the brush, and then the muffled thuds and tumbling scree as Tommy Lancaster's body rolled and bounced down a steep slope. It was a long time before Kalen heard the final thump at the bottom of the ravine. 
Kara ambled back to the side of the carriage. Everything all right with you? She casually pulled off her armored gloves. Kalin blinked at the woman. Kara, he nearly had me. Kara flicked her long blonde braid back over her shoulder as she scanned the surrounding area. No, he didn't. I was standing right there behind him the whole time. I was nearly breathing down his neck. I never took my eyes from his knife. He had no chance to harm you. She met Kalin's gaze. Surely you must have seen me. No, I didn't. Oh, I thought you saw me. Looking a little sheepish, she tucked most of the cuffs of the gloves behind her belt and folded the rest down over the front. I guess maybe you were too low in the carriage to see me there behind him. I had my attention on him. I didn't mean to let him frighten you. If you were there the whole time, why did you allow him to nearly kill me? He did not nearly kill you, Kara smiled without humor. But I wanted to let him believe it. It's more of a shock, more of a horror, if you let him think they've won. It crushes a man's spirit to take him then, when you've caught him dead to rights. Kalin's head was swimming in confusion, and so she decided not to press the issue. What's going on? What's happened? How long have I been asleep? We've been traveling for two days. You have been in and out of sleep, but you didn't know anything the times you were awake. Lord Raal was fretful about hurting you to get you into the carriage and about having told you what you forgot. Kalin knew what Kara meant, her dead baby. And the men? They came after us. This time, though, Lord Raal didn't discuss it with them. She seemed especially pleased about that. He knew in enough time that they were coming, so we weren't taken by surprise. When they came charging in, some with arrows knocked and some with their swords or axes out, he shouted at them once, giving them a chance to change their minds. He tried to reason with them, even then? Well, not exactly. He told them to go home in peace or they would all die. And then what? And then they all left. It only seemed to embolden them. They charged, arrows flying, swords and axes raised. So Lord Raal ran off into the woods. He did what? Before they came, he had told me that he was going to make them all chase after him. As Lord Raal ran, the one who thought he would cut your throat yelled at the others to get Richard and finish him this time. Lord Raal had hoped he would draw them all away from you. But when that one went after you instead, Lord Raal gave me a look and I knew what he wanted me to do. Kara clasped her hands behind her back as she scrutinized the gathering darkness, keeping watch should anyone try to surprise them. Kalin's thoughts turned to Richard and what it must have been like all alone as they chased him. How many men? I didn't count them, Kara shrugged. Maybe two dozen. And you left Richard alone with two dozen men chasing after him? Two dozen men intent on killing him? Kara shot Kalin an incredulous look. And leave you unprotected? When I knew that toothless brute was going after you? Lord Raal would have skinned me alive if I had left you. Tall and lean, shoulders square and chin raised, Kara looked as pleased as a cat licking mouse off its whiskers. Kalin suddenly understood. Richard had entrusted Kara with Kalin's life. The Mord Sith had proven that faith justified. Kalin felt a smile stretch the partly healed cuts on her lips. I just wish I'd known you were standing there the whole time. Now, thanks to you, I won't need the wooden bowl. Kara didn't laugh. Mother Confessor. You should know that I would never let anything happen to either of you. Richard appeared out of the shadows as suddenly as he had vanished. He stroked the horses reassuringly. As he moved down beside them, he quickly checked the neck collars, the trace chains, and the breeching to make sure it was all secure. Anything? he asked Kara. No, Lord Rall, quiet and clear. He leaned in the carriage and smiled. Well, as long as you're awake, how about I take you for a romantic moonlight ride? She rested her hand on his forearm. Are you all right? I'm fine, not a scratch. That's not what I meant. His smile vanished. They tried to kill us. Westland has just suffered its first casualties because of the influence of the Imperial Order. But you knew them. That doesn't entitle them to misplaced sympathy. How many thousands have I seen killed since I left here? I couldn't even convince men I grew up with of the truth. I couldn't even get them to listen fairly. 
All the death and suffering I've seen is ultimately because of men like this, men who refuse to see. Their willful ignorance does not entitle them to my blood or life. They picked their own path. For once they paid the price. He didn't sound to her like a man who was quitting the fight. He still held the sword, was still in the grip of its rage. Kalin caressed his arm, letting him know that she understood. It was clear to her that even though he'd been justly defending himself, and though he was still filled with the sword's rage, he keenly regretted what he'd had to do. The men, had they been able to kill Richard instead, would have regretted nothing. They would have celebrated his death as a great victory. That was still perilous, making them all chase after you. No, it wasn't. It drew them out of the open and into the trees. They had to dismount. It's rocky and the footing is poor, so they couldn't rush me together or with speed, like they could out here on the road. The light is failing. They thought that was to their advantage. It wasn't. In the trees, it was even darker. I'm wearing mostly black. It's warm, so I'd left my gold cape behind here in the carriage. The little bit of gold on the rest of the outfit only serves to break up the shape of a man's figure in the near dark, so they had an even harder time seeing me. Once I took down Albert, they stopped thinking and fought with pure anger until they started seeing blood and death. Those men are used to brawls, not battles. They had expected an easy time murdering us. They weren't mentally prepared to fight for their own lives. Once they saw the true nature of what was happening, they ran for their lives. The ones left, anyway. These are my woods. In their panic, they became confused and lost their way in the trees. I cut them off and ended it. Did you get them all? Kara asked, worried about any who might escape and bring more men after them. Yes, I knew most of them, and besides, I had their number in my head. I counted the bodies to make sure I got them all. How many? Kara asked. Richard turned to take up the reins. Not enough for their purpose. He clicked his tongue and started the horses moving. Chapter 5 Richard rose up and drew his sword. This time, when its distinctive sound rang out in the night, Kaylin was awake. Her first instinct was to sit up. Before she even had time to think better of it, Richard had crouched and gently restrained her with a reassuring hand. She lifted her head just enough to see that it was Kara leading a man into the harsh, flickering light of the campfire. Richard sheathed his sword when he saw who Kara had with her. Captain Meifert, the Daharan officer who had been with them back in Andorath. Before any other greeting, the man dropped to his knees and bent forward, touching his forehead to the soft ground strewn with pine needles. Master all guide us, master all teach us, master all protect us, Captain Myford beseeched in sincere reverence. In your light we thrive, in your mercy we are sheltered, in your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve, our lives are yours. When he had gone to his knees to recite the devotion, as it was called, Kalin saw Kara almost reflexively go to her knees with him, so ingrained was the ritual. The supplication to their Lord Ra was something all Daharans did. In the field, they commonly recited it once or on occasion three times. At the people's palace in Dahara, most people gathered twice a day to chant the devotion at length. When he'd been a captive of Dark and Ra, Richard, often in much the same condition as Tommy Lancaster just before he died, had himself been forced to his knees by a moored Sith and made to perform the devotion for hours at a time. Now the moored Sith, like all Daharans, paid that same homage to Richard. If the moored Sith saw such a turn of events as improbable or even ironic, they never said as much. What many of them had found improbable was that Richard hadn't had them all executed when he became their Lord Rawl. It was Richard, though, who had discovered that the devotion to their Lord Rawl was, in fact, a surviving vestige of a bond, an ancient magic invoked by one of his ancestors to protect the Daharan people from the Dreamwalkers. It had long been believed that the Dreamwalkers, created by wizards to be weapons during that ancient and nearly forgotten Great War, had vanished from the world. The conjuring of strange and varied abilities, of instilling unnatural attributes in people, willing or not, had once been a dark art, the results always being, at the least, unpredictable, often uncertain, and sometimes dangerously unstable. Somehow, some spark of that malignant manipulation had been passed down generation after generation, lurking unseen for three thousand years, until it rekindled in the person of Emperor Jagang. 
Kalin knew something about the alteration of living beings to suit a purpose. Confessors were such people, as had been the dreamwalkers. In Jagang, Kalin saw a monster created by magic. She knew many people saw the same in her. Much as some people had blonde hair or brown eyes, she had been born to grow tall with warm brown hair and green eyes and the ability of a confessor. She loved and laughed and longed for things just the same as those born with blonde hair or brown eyes and without a confessor's special ability. Kalin used her power for valid moral reasons. Jagang, no doubt, believed the same of himself. And even if he didn't, most of his followers certainly did. Richard, too, had been born with latent power. The ancient adjunct defense of the bond was passed down to any gifted Rawl. Without the protection of the bond to Richard, the Lord Rawl, whether formally spoken or a silent heartfelt affinity, anyone was vulnerable to Jagang's power as a dreamwalker. Unlike most other permutations conjured by wizards in living people, the confessor's ability had always remained vital. At least it had until all the other confessors had been murdered by order of Dark and Rawl. Now, without such wizards and their specialized conjuring, only if Kalin had children would the magic of the confessors live on. Confessors usually bore girls, but not always. A confessor's power had originally been created for and had been intended to be used by women. Like all other conjuring that introduced unnatural abilities in people, this, too, had had unforeseen consequences. A confessor's male children, it turned out, also bore the power. After it had been learned how treacherous the power could be in men, all male children were scrupulously culled. Kalin bearing a male child was precisely what the witch woman Shota feared. Shota knew very well that Richard would never allow his and Kalin's son to be slain for the past evils of male confessors. Kalin, too, could never allow Richard's son to be killed. In the past, a confessor's inability to marry out of love was one of the reasons she could emotionally endure the practice of infanticide. Richard, in discovering the means by which he and Kalin could be together, had altered that equation, too. But Shota didn't simply fear Kalin giving birth to a male confessor. She feared something of potentially far greater magnitude, a male confessor who possessed Richard's gift. Shota had foretold that Kalin and Richard would conceive a male child. Shota viewed such a child as an evil monster, dangerous beyond comprehension, and so had vowed to kill their offspring. To prevent such a thing from being required, she had given them the necklace to keep Kalin from becoming pregnant. They had taken it reluctantly. The alternative was war with the witch woman. It was for reasons such as this that Richard abhorred prophecy. Kalin watched as Captain Myfert spoke the devotion a third time, Kara's lips moving with his. The soft chant was making Kalin sleepy. It was a luxury for Kalin to be able to be down with Richard and Kara in the sheltered camp beside the warmth of the fire, rather than having to stay in the carriage, especially since the night had turned chilly and damp. With the litter, they could move her more easily and without causing her much pain. Richard would have made the litter sooner, but he hadn't expected to have to abandon the house he had started to build. They were far off the narrow, forsaken road in a tiny clearing concealed in a cleft in a steep rock wall behind a dense expanse of pine and spruce. A small meadow close by provided a snug paddock for the horses. Richard and Kara had pulled the carriage off the road behind a mass of deadfall and hidden it with spruce and balsam boughs. No one but a Daharan bonded to their Lord Rawl had much of a chance of ever finding them in the vast and trackless forest. The secluded spot had a fire pit Richard had dug and ringed with rocks during a previous day nearly a year before. It hadn't been used since. A protruding shelf of rock about seven or eight feet above them prevented the light of the campfire from shining up the rock wall, helping keep the camp hidden. Its slope also kept them snug and dry in the drizzle that had begun to fall. With the fog closing in, too, it was as protected and secure a campsite as Kalin had ever seen. Richard had been true to his word. It had taken more like six hours than four to reach the campsite. Richard had proceeded slowly for Kalin's sake. It was late, and they were all tired from a long day of traveling to say nothing of the attack. Richard had told her that it looked like it might rain for a day or two, and they would stay in the camp and rest up until the weather cleared. There was no urgency to get where they were going. After the third devotion, Captain Myfert came haltingly to his feet. 
he clapped his right fist to the leather over his heart in salute. Richard smiled, and the two men clasped forearms in a less formal greeting. How are you doing, Captain? Richard grasped the man's elbow. What's the matter? Did you fall off your horse or something? The captain glanced at Kara to his side. Ah, uh, well, I'm fine, Lord Rall, really. You look hurt. I just had my ribs tickled by your moored Sith, that's all. I didn't do it hard enough to break them, Kara scoffed. I'm truly sorry, Captain. We had a bit of trouble earlier today. Kara was no doubt worried for our safety when she saw you approaching in the dark. Richard's eyes turned toward Kara. But she still should have been more careful before risking injuring people. I'm sure she's sorry and will want to apologize. Kara made a sour face. It was dark. I'm not about to take any foolish chances with the life of our Lord Rall, just so... I would hope not, Captain Myford put in before Richard could reprimand her. He smiled at Kara. I was once kicked by a stalwart warhorse. You did a better job of putting me down, Mistress Kara. I'm gratified to find Lord Rawls' life is in capable hands. If sore ribs are the price, I willingly accept it. Kara's face brightened. The captain's simple concession disarmed a potentially nettlesome situation. Well, if the ribs bother you, let me know, Kara said dryly, and I'll kiss them and make them better. In the silence, as Richard glowered at her, she scratched her ear and finally added, Anyway, sorry, but I didn't want to take any chances. As I said, a price I willingly pay. Thank you for your vigilance. What are you doing here, Captain? Richard asked. General Rybish send you to see if the Lord Rawl is crazy? Although it was impossible to tell in the firelight, Kalin was sure that the man's face turned scarlet. No, of course not, Lord Rawl. It's just that the general wanted to have a full report. I see. Richard glanced down at the dinner pot. When's the last time you ate, Captain? You look a little drawn, besides having sore ribs. Well, uh... I've been riding hard, Lord Rawl. I guess yesterday I must have eaten something. I'm fine, though. I can have something after... Sit down, then, Richard gestured. Let me get you something hot to eat. It will do you good. As the man reluctantly settled down on the mossy ground beside Kalin and Kara, Richard scooped some rice and beans into a bowl. He cut a big piece of bannock from what he'd left to cool on the griddle off to the side of the fire. He held the bowl out to the man. Captain Myford saw no way to prevent it, and was now mortified to find himself being served by none other than the Lord Rawl himself. Richard had to lift the food toward him a second time before he took it. It's only some rice and beans, Captain. It's not like I'm giving you Kara's hand in marriage. Kara guffawed. Mord Sith don't marry. They simply take a man for a mate if they wish him. He gets no say in it. Kara glanced up at her. Kayla knew by Richard's tone that he hadn't meant anything by the comment. But he didn't laugh with Kara. He knew all too well the truth of her words. Such an act was not an act of love, but altogether the opposite. In the uncomfortable silence, Kara realized what she'd said and decided to break some branches down and feed them to the fire. Kalin knew that Denna, the moored Sith who had captured Richard, had taken him for her mate. Kara knew it too. When Richard would sometimes wake with a start and cling to her, Kalin wondered if his nightmares were of things imaginary or real. When she kissed his sweat-slicked brow and asked what he had dreamed, he never remembered. She was thankful for that much of it. Richard retrieved a long stick that had been propped against one of the rocks ringing the fire. With his finger, he slid several sizzling pieces of bacon off the stick and into the captain's bowl, and then set the big piece of bannock on top. They had with them a variety of food. Kalin shared the carriage with all the supplies Richard had picked up along their journey north to Hartland. They had enough staples to last for a good long time. Thank you, Captain Myford stammered. He brushed back his fall of blonde hair. It looks delicious. It is, Richard said. You're lucky. I made dinner tonight instead of Kara. Kara, proud of being a poor cook, smiled as if it were an accomplishment of note. Kalin was sure it was a story that would be repeated to wide eyes and stunned disbelief, the Lord Rawl himself serving food to one of his men. By the way the captain ate, she guessed it had been longer than a day since he had eaten. As big as he was, she figured he had to need a lot of food. He swallowed and looked up. My horse, he began to stand. 
When Mr. Escara... I forgot my horse. I need... Eat your food. Richard stood and clapped Captain Myford's shoulder to keep him seated. I was going to check on our horses anyway. I'll see to yours as well. I'm sure it would like some water and oats, too. But, Lord Rawl, I cannot allow you to eat. This will save time. When I get back, you'll be done, and then you can give me your report. Richard's shape became indistinct as he dissolved into the shadows, leaving only a disembodied voice behind. But I'm afraid I still won't have any orders for General Rybish. In the stillness, crickets once again took up their rhythmic chirping. Some distance away, Kalin heard a nightbird calling. Beyond the nearby trees, the horses whinnied contentedly, probably when Richard greeted them. Every once in a while, a feather of mist strayed in under the overhang to dampen her cheek. She wished she could turn on her side and close her eyes. Richard had given her some herb tea, and it was beginning to make her drowsy. At least it dulled the pain, too. How are you, Mother Confessor? Captain Myford asked. Everyone is terribly worried about you. A confessor wasn't often confronted with such honest and warm concern. The young man's simple question was so sincere it almost brought Kalin to tears. I'm getting better, Captain. Tell everyone I'll be fine after I've had some time to heal. We're going someplace quiet where I can enjoy the fresh air of the arriving summer and get some rest. I'll be better before autumn, I'm sure. By then I hope Richard will be less worried about me and be able to put his mind to the needs of the war. The captain smiled. Everyone will be relieved to know you're healing. I can't tell you how many people told me that when I return, they want to hear how you're doing. Tell them I said I'll be fine. And I asked for them not to worry any more about me, but to take care of themselves. He ate another spoonful. Kalin saw in his eyes that there was more to the man's anxiety. It took him a moment before he addressed it. We are concerned, too, that you and Lord Rawl need protection. Kara, already sitting straight, nevertheless managed to straighten more, at the same time making the subtle shift in her posture appear threatening. Lord Rawl and the Mother Confessor are not without protection, Captain. They have me. Anything more than a moored Sith is just pretty brass buttons. This time he didn't back down. His voice rang with a clear tone of authority. This is not a matter of disrespect, Mistress Kara, nor is presumption intended. Like you, I am sworn to their safety, and that is my proper concern. These brass buttons have met the enemy before in the defense of Lord Rall, and I don't really believe a moored Sith would want to deter me from that duty for no more reason than petty pride. We're going to a remote and secluded place, Kalin said, before Kara could answer. I think our solitude and Kara will be ample protection. If Richard decides otherwise, he will say so. With a reluctant nod, he accepted her answer. The last of it, anyway, settled the matter. When Richard had taken Kalin north, he had left their guard forces behind. She knew it was deliberate, probably part of his conviction about what he felt he had to do. Richard wasn't opposed to the concept of protection. In the past, he had accepted troops being with them. Kara, too, had been insistent on having the security of those troops along. It was different, though, for Kara to admit it directly to Captain Myford. They had spent a good deal of time in Andrith with the captain and his elite forces. Kalin knew him to be a superb officer. She thought he must be approaching his mid-twenties, probably a soldier for a decade already, and the veteran of a number of campaigns, from minor rebellions to open warfare. The sharp, wholesome lines of his face were just beginning to take on a mature set. Over millennia, through war, migration, and occupation, other cultures had mixed in with the Daharan, leaving a blend of peoples. Tall and broad-shouldered, Captain Myfert was marked as full-blooded Daharan by blonde hair and blue eyes, as was Kara. The bond was strongest in full-blooded Daharans. After he had finished about half his rice, he glanced over his shoulder into the darkness where Richard had gone. His earnest blue eyes took in both Kara and Kalin. I don't mean it to sound judgmental or personal, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. But may I ask you both a... a sensitive question? You may, Captain, Kalin said, but I can't promise we will answer it. The last part gave him pause for a moment, but then he went on. General Rybish and some of the other officers, well, 
There have been worried discussions about Lord Rawl. We trust in him, of course, he was quick to add. We really do. It's just that... So what are your concerns then, Captain? Kara put in, her brow drawing tight. If you trust him so much... He stirred his wooden spoon around the bowl. I was there in Andereth through the whole thing. I know how hard he worked. And you too, Mother Confessor. No Lord Rawl before him ever worried about what the people wanted. In the past, the only thing that mattered was what the Lord Rawl wanted. Then after all that, the people rejected his offer. Rejected him. He sent us back to the main force and just left us, he gestured around himself, to come here, out in the middle of nowhere, to be a recluse or something. He paused while searching for the right words. We don't understand it exactly. He looked up from the fire back into their eyes as he went on. We're worried that Lord Rawl has lost his will to fight, that he simply no longer cares. Or perhaps he is afraid to fight. The look on his face told Kalin that he feared reprisal for saying the things he said and for asking such a question, but he needed the answer enough to risk it. This was probably why he had come to give a report, rather than send a simple messenger. About six hours before he cooked that nice dinner pot of rice and beans, Kara said in a casual manner, he killed a couple dozen men, all by himself, hacked them apart like I've never seen before. The violence of it shocked even me. He left only one man for me to dispatch. Quite unfair of him, I think. Captain Myford looked positively relieved as he let out a long breath. He looked away from Kara's steady gaze and back into his bowl to stir his dinner. That news will be well received. Thank you for telling me, Mistress Kara. He can't issue orders, Kalin said, because he unequivocally believes that for now, if he takes part in leading our forces against the Imperial Order, it would bring about our defeat. He believes that if he enters the battle too soon, we will then have no chance of ever winning. He believes he must wait for the right time, that's all. There's nothing more to it. Kalin felt a bit conflicted, helping to justify Richard's actions, when she wasn't entirely in favor of them. She felt it was necessary to check the advance of the Imperial Order's army now and not give them a chance to freely pillage and murder the people of the New World. The captain mulled this over as he ate some bannock. He frowned as he gestured with the piece he had left. There is sound battle theory for such a strategy. If you have any choice in it, you only attack when it's on your terms, not the enemy's. He became more spirited as he thought about it a moment. It is better to hold an attack for the right moment, despite the damage an enemy can cause in the interim, than to go into a battle before the right time. Such would be an act of poor command. That's right. Kalin laid her arm back and rested her right wrist on her brow. Perhaps you could explain it to the other officers in those words, that it's premature to issue orders, and he's waiting for the proper time. I don't think that's really any different from the way Richard has explained it to us, but perhaps it would be better understood if put in such terms. The captain ate the last bite of his bannock, seeming to think it over. I trust Lord Rawl with my life. I know the others do, too but I think they will be reassured by such an explanation as to why he is withholding his orders. I can see now why he had to leave us. It was to resist the temptation to throw himself into the fray before the time was right. Kalin wished she was as confident of the reasoning as the captain. She recalled Kara's question, wondering how the people could prove themselves to Richard. She knew he would not be inclined to try it through a vote again, but she didn't see how else the people could prove themselves to him. I'd not mention it to Richard, she said. It's difficult for him, not being able to issue orders. He's trying to do what he believes is right, but it's a difficult course to hold to. I understand, Mother Confessor. In his wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are his. Kalin studied the smooth lines and simple angles of his young face lit by the dancing firelight. In that face she saw some of what Richard had been trying to say to her before. Richard doesn't believe your lives are his, Captain, but that they are your own and priceless. That is what he is fighting for. He chose his words carefully, 
If he wasn't worried about her being the mother confessor, since he hadn't grown up fearing the power and the rule of such a woman, she was still the Lord Rawls' wife. Most of us see how different he is from the last Lord Rawl. I'm not claiming that any of us understands everything about him, but we know he fights to defend rather than to conquer. As a soldier, I know the difference it makes to believe in what I'm fighting for, because... The captain looked away from her gaze. He lifted a short branch of firewood, tapping the end on the ground for a long time. His voice took on a painful inflection. Because it takes something precious out of you to kill people who never meant you any harm. The fire crackled and hissed as he slowly stirred the glowing coals. Sparks swirled up to spill out from around the underside of the rock overhang. Kara watched her Aegeal as she rolled it in her fingers. You feel that way too? Captain Myfert met Kara's gaze. I never realized before what it was doing to me inside. I didn't know. Lord Rall makes me proud to be the Haran. He makes it stand for something right. It never did before. I thought that the way things were was just the way things were, and they could never change. Kara's gaze fell away as she privately nodded her agreement. Kalin could only imagine what life was like living under that kind of rule, what it did to people. I'm glad you understand, Captain, Kalin whispered. That's one reason he worries so much about all of you. He wants you to live lives you can be proud of, lives that are your own. He dropped the stick into the fire. And he wanted all the people of Andorith to care about themselves the way he wants us to value our lives. The vote wasn't really for him, but for themselves. That was why the vote meant so much to him? That's why, Kalin confirmed, afraid to test her own voice any further than that. He stirred his spoon around to cool his dinner. It no longer needed cooling, she was sure. She supposed his thoughts were being stirred more than his dinner. You know, he said, one of the things I heard people say back in Andorith was that since Darken Rall was his father, Richard Rall was evil too. They said that since his father had done wrong, Richard Rall might sometimes do good, but he could never be a good person. I heard that too, Kara said, not just in Andorith, but a lot of places. That's wrong. Why should people think that just because one of his parents was cruel, those crimes pass on to someone who never did them, and that he must spend his life making amends? I'd hate to think that if I'm ever lucky enough to have children, they and then their children and their children after that would have to suffer forever for the things I've done serving under Dark and Rawl. He looked over at Kalin and Kara. Such prejudice isn't right. In the silence, Kara stared into the flames. I served under Dark and Rawl. I know the difference in the two men. His voice lowered with simmering anger. It's wrong of people to lay guilt for the crimes of Dark and Rawl unto his son. You're right about that, Kara murmured. The two may look a little alike, but anyone who has ever looked into the eyes of both men as I have could never begin to think they were the same kind of men. Chapter 6 Captain Myford ate the rest of his rice and beans in silence. Kara offered him her water skin. He took it with a smile and his nod of thanks. She dished him out a second bowlful from the pot and cut him another piece of bannock. He looked only slightly less mortified to be served by a moored Sith than by the Lord Rawl. Kara found his expression amusing. She called him brass buttons and told him to eat it all. He did so as they listened to the sounds of the fire snapping and water dripping from the pine needles onto the carpet of leaves and other debris of the forest floor. Richard returned, loaded down with the captain's bedroll and saddlebags. He let them slip to the ground beside the officer and then shook water off himself before sitting down beside Kalin. He offered her a drink from a full water skin he'd brought back. She took only a sip. She was more interested in being able to rest her hand on his leg. Richard yawned. So, Captain Myford, you said the general wanted you to give a full report? Yes, sir. The captain went into a long and detailed account on the state of the army to the south, how they were stationed out on the plains, what passes they guarded in the mountains, 
and how they planned on using the terrain should the Imperial Order suddenly come up out of Andorith and move north into the Midlands. He reported on the health of the men and their supply situation, both good. The other half of General Rybish's Daharan force was back in Aidendril, protecting the city, and Kalin was relieved to hear that everything there was in order. Captain Myfert relayed all the communications they'd received from around the Midlands, including from Kelton and Galia, two of the largest lands of the Midlands that were now allied with the new Daharan Empire. The allied lands were helping to keep the army supplied, in addition to providing men for rotation of patrols, scouting land they knew better, and other work. Kalin's half-brother, Harold, had brought word that Cyrilla, Kalin's half-sister, had taken a turn for the better. Cyrilla had been queen of Galia. After her brutal treatment in the hands of the enemy, she became emotionally unbalanced and was unable to serve as queen. In her rare conscious moments, worried for her people, she had begged Kalin to be queen in her stead, Kalin had reluctantly agreed, saying it was only until Cyrilla was well again. Few people thought she would ever have her mind back, but apparently it looked as if she might yet recover. In order to soothe the ruffled feathers of Galia's neighboring land, Kelton, Richard had named Kalin Queen of Kelton. When Kalin first heard what Richard had done, she had thought it was lunacy. Strange as the arrangement was, though, it suited both lands, and brought them not only peace with each other, but also into the fold of those lands fighting against the imperial order. Kara was pleasantly surprised to hear that a number of Mord Sith had arrived at the Confessor's Palace in Aidendril, in case Lord Rawl needed them. Berdine would no doubt be pleased to have some of her sister Mord Sith with her in Aidendril. Kaelin missed Aidendril. She guessed the place you grew up could never leave your heart. The thought gave her a pang of sorrow for Richard. That would be Rika. Kara said with a smile. Wait until she meets the new Lord Rahl, she added under her breath, finding that even more to smile about. Kalin's thoughts turned to the people they had left to the Imperial Order, or more accurately, to the people who had chosen the Imperial Order. Have you received any reports from Andoreth? Yes, from a number of men we sent in there. I'm afraid we lost some, too. The ones who returned report that there were fewer enemy deaths from the poisoned waters than we had hoped. Once the Imperial Order discovered their soldiers dying or sick, they tested everything on the local people first. A number of them died or became sick, but it wasn't widespread. By using the people to test the food and water, they were able to isolate the tainted food and destroy it. The army has been laying claim to everything. They use a lot of supplies. The Imperial Order was said to be far larger than any army ever assembled. Kalin knew that much of the reports to be accurate. The Order dwarfed the Daharan and Midland troops arrayed against them perhaps ten or twenty to one. Some reports claimed more than that. Some reports claimed the New World forces were outnumbered by a hundred to one. But Kalin discounted that as outright panic. She didn't know how long the Order could feed off Andreth before they moved on, or if they were being resupplied from the old world. They had to be, to some extent anyway. How many scouts and spies did we lose? Richard asked. Captain Myfert looked up. It was the first question Richard had asked. Some may yet turn up, but it appears likely that we lost fifty to sixty men. Richard sighed. And General Rybish thinks it was worth losing the lives of those men to discover this? Captain Myfert cast about for an answer. We didn't know what we would discover, Lord Rawl. That was why we sent them in. Do you wish me to tell the general not to send in any more men? Richard was carving a face in a piece of firewood, sporadically tossing shavings into the fire. He sighed. No, he must do as he sees fit. I've explained to him that I can't issue orders. The captain, watching Richard pick small chips of wood from his lap and pitch them into the fire tossed a small fan of pine needles into the flames, where it blazed in short-lived glory. Richard's carving was a remarkably good likeness of the captain. Kalin had on occasion seen Richard casually carve animals or people. She once had strongly suggested that his ability was guided by his gift. He scoffed at such a notion, saying that he had liked to carve ever since he was little. She reminded him that art was used to cast spells, 
and that once he had been captured with the aid of a drawn spell. He insisted this was nothing like that. As a guide, he said he'd passed many an evening at camp by himself carving. Not wanting to carry the added weight, he would toss the finished piece into the fire. He said he enjoyed the act of carving and could always carve another. Kalin considered the carvings inspired and found it distressing to see them destroyed. What do you intend to do, Lord Rall, if I may ask? Richard took a smooth, steady slice that demarcated the line of an ear, bringing it to life along with the line of the jaw he had already cut. He looked up and stared off into the night. We're going to a place back in the mountains where other people don't go, so we can be alone and safe. The mother confessor will be able to get well there and gain back her strength. While we're there, I may even make Kara start wearing a dress. Kara shot to her feet. What? When she saw Richard's smile, Kara realized he was only joking. She fumed nonetheless. I'd not report that part of it to the general were I you, Captain, Richard said. Kara sank back down to the ground. Not if Brass Buttons here values his ribs, she muttered. Kalin struggled not to chuckle, lest she twist the ever-present knives in her ribs. Sometimes she felt as if she knew how the chunk of wood Richard was carving felt. It was good to see Richard for once get the best of Kara. It was usually she who had him flustered. I can't help you for now, Richard said, his serious tone returning. He went back to his work with his knife. I hope you can all accept that. Of course, Lord Rall. We know that you will lead us into battle when the time is right. I hope that day comes, Captain. I really do. Not because I want to fight, but because I hope there to be something to fight for. Richard stared into the fire, his countenance a chilling vision of despair. Right now, there isn't. Yes, Lord Rall, Captain Myford said, finally breaking the uncomfortable silence. We will do as we think best until the Mother Confessor is better, and you are then able to join us. Richard didn't argue the time schedule as the captain had described it. It was one Kalin hoped for, too, but Richard had never said it would be that soon. He had, in fact, made it clear to them that the time might not ever come. He cradled the wood in his lap, studying what he had done. He ran his thumb along the fresh-cut line of the nose as he asked, did the returning scout say how it fared for the people in Andereth with the Imperial Order there? Kalin knew he was only torturing himself by asking that question. She wished he hadn't asked. It could do him no good to hear the answer. Captain Myford cleared his throat. Well, yes, they did report on the conditions. And? The young officer launched into a cold report of the facts they knew. Jagang set up his troop headquarters in the capital, Fairfield. He took over the Minister of Culture's estate for himself. Their army is so huge that it swallowed the city and overflows far out onto the hills all around. The Andereth army put up little resistance. They were collected and all summarily put to death. The government of Andereth, for the most part, ceased to exist within the first few hours. There is no rule or law. The Order spent the first week in unchecked celebration. Most people in Fairfield were displaced and lost everything they owned. Many fled. The roads all around were packed solid with those trying to escape what was happening in the city. The people fleeing the city only ended up being the spoils for the soldiers in the hills all around who couldn't fit into the city. Only a trickle, mostly the very old and sickly, made it past that gauntlet. His impersonal tone abandoned him. He had spent time with those people, too. I'm afraid that, in all, it went badly for them, Lord Rall. There was a horrendous amount of killing, of the men anyway, in the tens of thousands, likely more. They got what they asked for. Kara's voice was as cold as winter night. They picked their own fate. Kalin agreed, but didn't say so. She knew Richard agreed, too. None of them were pleased about it, though. And the countryside? Richard asked. Anything known about places outside Fairfield? Is it going better for them? No better, Lord Rall. The Imperial Order has been methodically going about the process of pacifying the land, as they call it. Their soldiers are accompanied by the gifted. By far, the worst of the accounts were about one called Death's Mistress. Who? Kara asked. 
Death's mistress, they call her. Her must be the sisters, Richard said. Which ones do you think it would be? Kara asked. Richard, cutting the mouth into the firewood face, shrugged. Jagang has both Sisters of the Light and Sisters of the Dark held captive. He's a dreamwalker. He forces both to do his bidding. It could be either. The woman is simply his tool. I don't know, Captain Myford said. We've had plenty of reports about the Sisters and how dangerous they are. But they're being used, like you said, as tools of the army, weapons, basically, not as his agents. Jagang doesn't let them think for themselves or direct anything. This one, from the reports anyway, behaves very differently from the others. She acts as Jagang's agent, but still, the word is she decides things for herself and does as she pleases. The men who came back reported that she is more feared than Jagang himself. The people of one town, when they heard she was coming their way, all gathered together in the town square. They made the children drink poison first, then the adults took their dose. Every last person in the town was dead when the woman arrived. Close to five hundred people. Richard had stopped carving as he listened. Kalin knew that unfounded rumors could also be so lurid as to turn alarm into deadly panic, to the point where people would rather die than face the object of their dread. Fear was a powerful tool of war. Richard went back to the carving in his lap. He held the knife near the tip of the point like a pen and carefully cut character into the eyes. They didn't get a name for her, did they? This death's mistress? I'm sorry, no, Lord Rall. They said she is simply called by everyone death's mistress. Sounds like an ugly witch, Kara said. Quite the contrary. She has blue eyes and long blonde hair. She is said to be one of the most beautiful women you could ever lay eyes upon. They say she looks like a vision of a good spirit. Kalin couldn't help notice the captain's furtive glances at Kara, who had blue eyes and long blonde hair, and was also one of the most beautiful women you could ever lay eyes upon. She, too, was deadly. Richard was frowning. Blonde, blue eyes. There are several it could be. Too bad they didn't catch her name. Sorry, but they gave no other name, Lord Rawl, only that description. Oh, yes, and that she always wears black. Dear spirits, Richard whispered as he rose to his full height, gripping his carving by its throat. From what I've been told, Lord Rawl, though she looks like a vision of one, the good spirits themselves would fear her. With good reason, Richard said as he stared into the distance, as if looking beyond the black wall of mist to a place only he could see. You know her then, Lord Rawl? Kalin listened to the fire pop and crackle as she waited along with the other two for his answer. It almost seemed Richard was trying to find his voice as his gaze sank back down to meet the eyes of the carving in his hand. I know her, he said at last. I know her all too well. She was one of my teachers at the Palace of the Prophets. Richard tossed his carving into the flames. Pray you never have to look into Nietzsche's eyes, Captain. Chapter 7 Look into my eyes, child, Nietzsche said in her soft, silken voice as she cupped the girl's chin. Nietzsche lifted the bony face. The eyes, dark and wide-set, blinked with dull bewilderment. There was nothing to be seen in them. The girl was simple. Nietzsche straightened, feeling a hollow disappointment. She always did. She sometimes found herself looking into people's eyes like this and then wondering why. If she was searching for something, she didn't know what it was. She resumed her leisurely walk down the line of the townspeople, all assembled along one side of the dusty market square. People in outlying farms and smaller communities no doubt came into the town several times a month on market days, some staying overnight if they had come from far away. This wasn't a market day, but it would suit her purpose well enough. A few of the crowded buildings had a second story typically a room or two for a family over their small shop. Nietzsche saw a bakery, a cobbler's shop, a shop selling pottery, a blacksmith, an herbalist, a shop offering leatherwork, the usual places. One of these towns was much the same as the next. Many of the townspeople worked the surrounding fields of wheat or sorghum, tended animals, and had extensive vegetable plots. 
dung, straw, and clay being plentiful, they lived in homes of daub and wattle. A few of the shops with a second story boasted beam construction with clabbered siding. Behind her, sullen soldiers bristling with weapons filled the majority of the square. They were tired from the hot ride, and worse, bored. Nietzsche knew they were a twitch away from a rampage. A town, even one with meager plunder, was an inviting diversion. It wasn't so much the taking as the breaking that they liked. Sometimes, though, it was the taking. The nervous women only rarely met the soldiers' bold stares. As she strolled past the scruffy people, Nietzsche looked into the eyes watching her. Most were wide with terror and fixed not on the soldiers, but on the object of their dread, Nietzsche, or as people had taken to calling her, Death's Mistress. The designation neither pleased nor displeased her. It was simply a fact, she noted, a fact of no more significance to her than if someone had told her that they had mended a pair of her stockings. Some, she knew, were staring at the gold ring through her lower lip. Gossip would have already informed them that a woman so marked was a personal slave to Emperor Jigang, something lower even than simple peasants such as themselves. That they stared at the gold ring, or what they thought of her for it, was of even less significance to her than being called death's mistress. Jigang only possessed her body in this world. The keeper would have her soul for eternity in the next. Her body's existence in this world was torment. Her spirit's existence in the next would be no less. Existence and torment were simply the two sides of the same coin. There could be no other. Smoke rolling up from the fire pit over her left shoulder sailed away on a fitful wind to make a dark slash across the bright blue afternoon sky. Stacked stones to each side of the communal cooking pit supported a rod above the fire, Two or three pigs or sheep skewered on the rod could be roasted at once. Temporary sides were probably available to convert the fire pit into a smokehouse. At other times, an outdoor fire pit was used, often in conjunction with butchering, for the making of soap, since making soap was not something typically done indoors. Nietzsche saw a wooden ash pit used for making lye standing to the side of the open area, along with a large iron kettle that could be used for rendering fat. Lye and fat were the primary ingredients of soap. Some women liked to add fragrance to their soap with herbs and such, like lavender or rosemary. When Nietzsche was little, her mother made her go each autumn, when the butchering was being done, to help people make soap. Her mother said helping others built proper character. Nietzsche still had a few small dots of scars on the backs of her hands and forearms where she had been splashed and blistered by the hot fat. Nietzsche's mother always made her wear a fine dress, not to impress the other people who didn't have such clothes, but to make Nietzsche conspicuous and uncomfortable. The attention her pink dress attracted was not admiration. As she stood with a long wooden paddle stirring the bubbling kettle while the lye was being poured in, some of the other children, trying to splash the dress and ruin it, burned Nietzsche too. Nietzsche's mother had said the burns were the creator's punishment. As Nietzsche moved past, inspecting the assembled people, the only sounds were the horses off behind the buildings, the sporadic coughs of people, and the flags of flame in the fire pit snapping and flapping in the breeze. The soldiers had already helped themselves to the two pigs that had been roasting on the rod, so the aroma of cooking meat had mostly dissipated on the wind, leaving the sour smells of sweat and the stink of human habitation. Whether a belligerent army or a peaceful town, the filth of people smelled the same. You all know why I'm here, Nietzsche announced. Why have you people made me go to the trouble of such a journey? She gazed down the line of maybe two hundred people standing four and five deep. The soldiers who had ordered them out of their homes and in from the fields greatly outnumbered them. She stopped in front of a man she had noticed people glancing at. Well... The wind fluttered his thin gray hair across his balding, bowed head as he fixed his gaze on the ground at her feet. We don't have anything to give, mistress. We're a poor community. We have nothing. You are a liar. You had two pigs. You saw fit to have a gluttonous feast instead of helping those in need. But we have to eat. It was not an argument so much as a plea. So do others but they are not so fortunate as you. 
They know only the ache of hunger in their bellies every night. What an ugly tragedy that every day thousands of children die from the simple want of food, and millions more know the gnawing pain of hunger, while people like you, in a land of plenty, offer nothing but selfish excuses. Having what they need to live is their right and must be honored by those with the means to help. Our soldiers, too, need to eat. Do you think our struggle on the behalf of the people is easy? These men risk their lives daily so you may raise your children in a proper civilized society. How can you look these men in the eye? How can we even feed our troops if everyone doesn't help support the cause? The trembling man remained mute. What must I do to impress upon you people the seriousness of your obligation to the lives of others? Your contribution to those in need is a solemn moral duty, sharing in a greater good. Nietzsche's vision suddenly went white. With a pain like scorching hot needles driven into her ears, Jagang's voice filled her mind. Why must you play this game? Make examples of people. Teach them a lesson that I am not to be ignored. Nietzsche swayed on her feet. She was completely blinded by the pain bursting inside her head. She let it wash through her, as if watching it happen to a stranger. Her abdominal muscles twitched and convulsed. A rusty, barbed lance driven up through her, ripping her insides, could not have hurt more. Her arms hung limp at her sides while she waited for Jagang's displeasure to end, or for death. She was unable to tell how long the torture lasted. When he was doing it, she was never able to sense time. The pain was too all-consuming. She knew from what others told her when they saw it done to her, and from seeing it done to others, that it sometimes lasted only an instant. Sometimes it lasted hours. Making it last hours was a waste of Jigang's effort. She couldn't tell the difference. She had told him as much. Suddenly she was unable to draw a breath. It felt like a fist squeezed her heart to a stop. She thought her lungs might burst. Her knees were about to buckle. Do not disobey me again. With a gasp, air filled her lungs. Jagang's discipline ended, as it always did, with an impossibly tart, sour taste on her tongue, like an unexpected mouthful of fresh, raw lemon juice and pain searing the nerves at the back of her jaw under her earlobes. It left her head ringing and her teeth throbbing. As she opened her eyes, she was surprised, as she always was, not to see herself standing in a pool of blood. She touched the corner of her mouth and then brushed her fingers to an ear. She found no blood. She wondered in passing why Jagang had been able to come into her mind now. Sometimes he couldn't. It didn't happen that way for any of the other sisters. He always had access to their minds. As her vision cleared, she saw people staring at her. They didn't know why she had paused. The young men, and a few of the older ones, too, were sneaking peeks at her body. They were used to seeing women in drab, shapeless dresses, women whose bodies exhibited the toll taken by endless hard work and almost constant pregnancy from the time they were old enough for the seed to catch. They had never before seen a woman like Nietzsche, standing straight and tall, looking them in the eye, wearing a fine black dress that hugged a nearly flawless shape, marred by neither hard work or the labor of birth. The stark black material contrasted the pale curve of cleavage revealed by the cut of the laced bodice. Nietzsche was numb to such stares. Occasionally they suited her purposes, but most of the time they didn't, and so she disregarded them. She began walking down the line of people again, ignoring Emperor Jagang's orders. She rarely complied with his orders. She was, for the most part, indifferent to his punishment. If anything, she welcomed it. Nietzsche, forgive me. You know I don't mean to hurt you. She ignored his voice, too, as she studied the eyes peering up at her. Not everyone did. She liked to look into the eyes of those courageous enough to risk a glimpse of her. Most were filled with simple terror. There would soon be abundant justification for such apprehension. Nietzsche, you must do as I tell you, or you are going to end up forcing me to do something terrible to you. Neither of us wants that. Some day, I am going to end up doing something from which you will be unable to recover. 
If that is what you wish to do, then do it, she thought in answer. It was not a challenge. She simply didn't care. You know I don't want to do that, Nietzsche. Without the pain, his voice was little more than a fly annoying her. She paid it no heed. She addressed the crowd. Do you people have any concept of the effort being put into the fight for your future? Or is it that you expect to benefit without contributing? Many of our brave men have given their lives fighting the oppressors of the people, fighting for our new beginning. We struggle so that all people will be able to share equally in the coming prosperity. You must help us in our effort on your behalf. Just as helping those in need is the moral obligation of every person, so too is this. Commander Cardiff, displaying a look of sour displeasure, planted himself in front of her. The sunlight, slanting across his lined face, cast his hooded eyes in deep shadows. She was not moved by his disfavor. He was never satisfied with anything. Well, she corrected herself, almost never. People can only achieve virtue through obedience and sacrifice. Your contribution to the order is to implement their compliance. We are not here to hold civic lessons. Commander Cardiff was confident in his privileged mastery over her. He, too, had given her pain. She endured what Kadar Cardiff did to her with the same detachment with which she endured what Jagang did to her. Only in the furthest depths of pain could she begin to feel anything. Even pain was preferable to the nothingness she usually felt. Kadar Cardiff was probably unaware of the punishment Jagang had just completed or his orders. His Excellency didn't use Commander Cardiff's mind. It was an arduous undertaking for Jagang to control those who didn't possess the gift. He could do it, but it was rarely worth his effort. He had the gifted to control people for him. A dreamwalker somehow used the gift in those who possessed it in order to help complete the connection to their minds. In a way, the gifted made it possible for Jagang to so easily control them. Kadar Cardiff glowered down at her as she gazed up at his darkly tanned and creased face. He was an imposing figure with the studded leather straps that crossed his massive chest, his armored leather shoulder and breastplates, his chain mail, his array of well-used weapons. Nietzsche had seen him crush men's throats in one of his big, powerful hands. As silent witness to his bravery in battle, he bore a number of scars. She had seen them all. Few officers ranked higher or were more trusted than Kadar Cardiff. He had been with the order since his youth, rising through the ranks to fight alongside Jagang as they expanded the empire of the imperial order out of their homeland of al Turang to eventually subjugate the rest of the old world. Kadar Cardiff was the hero of the Little Gap campaign, the man who almost single-handedly turned the course of the battle, breaking through enemy lines and personally slaying the three great kings who had joined forces to trap and crush the imperial order before it could seize the imaginations of the millions of people living in a patchwork of kingdoms, fiefdoms, clans, city-states, and vast regions controlled by alliances of warlords. The old world had been a tinderbox waiting for the spark of revolution. The preachings of the order were that spark. If the high priests were the order's soul, Jagang was its bone and muscle. Few people understood Jagang's genius. They saw only a dreamwalker or a ferocious warrior. He was far more. It had taken Jagang decades to finally bring the rest of the old world to heel, to put the order on its final path to greater glory. During those years of struggle for the order, while engaged in nearly constant war, Jagang toiled building the road system that allowed him to move men and supplies great distances with lightning speed. The more lands and peoples he annexed, the more laborers he put to the construction of yet more roads, by which he could conquer yet more territory. He was thus able to maintain communications and to react to situations faster than anyone would have believed possible. Formerly isolated lands were suddenly connected to the rest of the old world. Jagang had knitted them together with a net of roads. Along those roads, the people of the old world had risen up to follow him as he forged the way for the order. Kadar Cardiff had been part of it all. More than once he had taken wounds to save Jagang's life. Jagang had once taken a bolt from a crossbow to save Cardiff. If Jagang could be said to have a friend... Kadar Cardiff was as close as any came to it. 
Nietzsche first met Cardiff when he had come to the Palace of the Prophets in Tanamura to pray. Old King Gregory, who had ruled the land including Tanamura, had disappeared without a trace. Kadar Cardiff was a solemnly devout man. Before battle, he prayed to the Creator for the blood of the enemy, and after, for the souls of the men he had killed. That day he was said to have prayed for the soul of King Gregory. The imperial order was suddenly the new rule in Tanamura. The people celebrated in the streets for days. Over the course of three thousand years, the sisters from their home at the Palace of the Prophets in Tanamura had seen governments come and go. For the most part, the sisters, led by their prelate, considered matters of rule a petty foolishness best ignored. They believed in a higher calling. The sisters believed they would remain at the Palace of the Prophets, undisturbed in their work, long after the order had vanished into the dust of history. Revolutions had many times come and gone. This one, though, caught them up. Kadar Cardiff had been nearly twenty years younger then, a handsome conqueror riding into the city. Many of the sisters were fascinated by the man. Nietzsche never was. But he was fascinated by her. Emperor Jagang, of course, did not send such invaluable men as Commander Cardiff out to pacify conquered lands. He had entrusted Cardiff with a much more important task, guarding his valuable property, Nietzsche. Nietzsche turned her attention away from Kadar Cardiff and back to the people. She settled her gaze on the man who had spoken before. We cannot allow anyone to shirk their responsibility to others and to our new beginning. Please, mistress... We have nothing. Disregard of our cause is treasonous. He thought better of disagreeing with that pronouncement. You don't seem to understand that this man behind me wants you to see that the imperial order is resolute in their devotion to their cause. If you don't do your duty, I know you have heard the stories, but this man wants you to experience the grim reality. Imagining it is never quite the same never quite as gruesome. She stared at the man, waiting for his answer. He licked his weather-cracked lips. We just need some more time. Our crops are doing well. When the harvest comes in, we could contribute our fair share toward the struggle for... for... the new beginning. Yes, mistress, he said, bobbing his head. The new beginning. When his gaze returned to the dirt at his feet, she moved on down the line. Her purpose was not really to collect but to cow. The time had come. A girl, gazing up at her, snagged Nietzsche to a stop, distracting her from what she had intended. The girl's big, dark eyes sparkled with innocent wonder. Everything was new to her, and she was eager to see it all. In her dark eyes shone that rare, fragile, and most perishable of qualities, a guileless view of life that had yet to be touched by pain or loss or evil. Nietzsche cupped the girl's chin, staring into the depths of those thirsting eyes. One of Nietzsche's earliest moments was of her mother standing over her like this, holding her chin, looking down at her. Nietzsche's mother was gifted, too. She said that the gift was a curse and a test. It was a curse because it gave her abilities others didn't have, and it was a test to see if she would wrongly exert that superiority. Nietzsche's mother almost never used her gift. Servants handled the work. She spent most of her time nested among her clutch of friends, devoting herself to higher pursuits. Dear Creator, but Nietzsche's father is a monster, she would complain as she wrung her hands. Some of her friends would murmur their sympathy. Why must he burden me so? I fear his eternal soul is beyond hope or prayer. The other women would tisk in grim agreement. Her mother's eyes were the same dull brown as a cockroach's back. To Nietzsche's mind, they were set too close together. Her mouth, too, was narrow, as if fixed in place by her perpetual disapproval. While Nietzsche never really thought of her mother as homely, neither did she consider her beautiful, although her friends regularly reassured her that she most surely was. Nietzsche's mother said beauty was a curse to a caring woman and a blessing only to whores. Puzzled by her mother's displeasure of her father, Nietzsche had finally asked what he had done. Nietzsche, her mother said, cupping Nietzsche's small chin that day. Nietzsche eagerly awaited her mother's words. You have beautiful eyes, but you do not yet see with them. All people are miserable wretches. That is the lot of man. 
Do you have any idea how it hurts those without all your advantages to see your beautiful face? That is all you bring to others. Insufferable pain. The Creator brought you into the world for no reason but to ease the misery of others, and here you bring only hurt. Her mother's friend, sipping tea, nodded, whispering to one another their sorrowful but firm agreement. That was when Nietzsche had first learned that she bore the indelible stain of some shadowy, nameless, unconfessed evil. Nietzsche gazed into the rare face looking up at her. Today, this girl's dark eyes would see things they could not yet imagine. Those big eyes eagerly watched without seeing. She could not possibly understand what was to come or why. What kind of life could she have? It would be for the best this way. The time had come. Chapter 8 Before she could begin, Nietzsche saw something that ignited her indignation. She whirled to a nearby woman. Where is there a wash tub? Surprised by the question, the woman pointed a trembling finger toward a two-story building not far off. There, mistress, in the yard, behind the pottery shop, are laundry tubs where we were washing clothes. Nietzsche seized the woman by her throat. Get me a pair of scissors. Bring them to me there. The woman stared in wide-eyed fright. Nietzsche shoved her. Now! Or would you prefer to die on the spot? Nietzsche yanked free a well-worn, reserve-studded strap bunched with several others and secured over Commander Cardiff's shoulder. He made no effort to stop her, but as she gathered up the strap, he seized her upper arm in his powerful grip. You had better be planning on drowning this little brat, or maybe cutting off hunks of her hide and then stabbing out her eyes. His breath smelled of onion and ale. He smirked. In fact, you start in on her, and while she's screaming and begging for her life, I'll begin separating out some young men, or perhaps I'll select some women to be an example. Which would you prefer this time? Nietzsche turned her glare down at his fingers on her arm. He removed them as he growled a warning. She turned to the girl and whipped the strap twice around her neck to serve as a collar, twisting it into a handle in the back so she could control the girl with it. The girl squeaked in choked surprise. She had probably never been handled so roughly in her entire life. Nietzsche forced her ahead toward the building the woman had pointed out. Seeing how angry Nietzsche had suddenly become, no one followed. A woman not far off, undoubtedly the girl's mother, began to cry out in protest, but then fell silent as Cardiff's men turned their attention on her. By then, Nietzsche already had the perplexed girl around the corner. Out back, drab laundry, deformed and crumpled from its ordeal on the washboard, and now stretched and pinned to lines, twisted in the wind as if struggling to escape. Smoke from the fire pit peeked over the top of the building. The nervous woman waited with a large pair of shears. Nietzsche marched the girl up to a tub of water, drove her down on her knees, and shoved her head under the water. While the girl struggled, Nietzsche snatched the scissors from the woman. Her chore completed, the woman held her apron up over her mouth to muffle her wails as she ran off in tears, not wanting to watch a child being murdered. Nietzsche pulled the girl's head up out of the water, and while she sputtered and gasped for air, began clipping her dark, soaking wet hair close to the scalp. When Nietzsche had finished cutting it off in sodden clumps, she dunked the girl again while leaning over and scooping up a cake of pale yellow soap from the washboard on the ground beside the tub. Nietzsche hauled the girl's head up and then began scrubbing. The girl screeched, flailing her spindly arms and clawing at the strap around her neck by which Nietzsche controlled her. Nietzsche realized she was probably hurting her, but from within the grip of rage it was only a dim realization. What's the matter with you? Nietzsche shook the gasping girl. Don't you know you're crawling with lice? But, but... The soap was harsh and as rough as a rasp. The girl squealed as Nietzsche bent her over and put more muscle into the scouring. Do you like having a head full of lice? No. Well, you must. Why else would you have them? Please, I'll try to do better. I'll wash. I promise. Nietzsche remembered how much she hated catching lice from the places her mother sent her. She remembered scrubbing herself, using the harshest soap she could find, only to again be sent off to another place where she would get infested with the hated things all over again. When Nietzsche had scrubbed and dunked a dozen times, she finally dragged the girl to a tub of clean water and swished her head about in it to rinse her off. The girl blinked furiously, 
trying to clear her eyes of the stinging soapy water as it streamed down off her face. Gripping the girl's chin, Nietzsche peered into her red eyes. No doubt your clothes are lousy with knits. You're to scrub your clothes every day, under things especially, or the lice will just be right back. Nietzsche squeezed the girl's cheeks until her eyes watered. You are better than to be filthy with lice. Don't you know that? The girl nodded as best as she could with Nietzsche's strong fingers holding her face. The big, dark, intelligent eyes, though red from the water and wide with shock, were still filled with that rare sense of wonder. As painful and frightening as the experience was, this had not dispelled it. Burn your bedding. Get new. Given the way these people lived and worked, it seemed a hopeless challenge. Your whole family must burn their bedding, wash all their clothes. The girl nodded her oath. Task completed, Nietzsche marched the girl back toward the gathered crowd. Forcing her along by the studded strap used as a collar, Nietzsche was unexpectedly struck by a memory. It was a memory of the first time she had seen Richard. Nearly every sister at the Palace of the Prophets had been gathered in the great hall to see the new boy Sister Verna had brought in. Nietzsche lingered at the mahogany rail, twining around her finger a lace dangling from her bodice, only to pull the lace straight and then to twine it again when the pair of thick walnut doors opened. The rumbling drone of conversation, sprinkled with bright laughter, trailed to an expectant hush as the group, led by Sister Phoebe, marched into the chamber past the white columns topped by gold capitals and in under the huge vaulted dome. The birth of gifted boys was rare, and a cause of expectant delight when they were discovered and finally brought to live at the palace. A grand banquet was planned for that evening. Most of the sisters dressed in their finery stood on the floor below, eager to meet the new boy. Nietzsche remained near the center of the lower balcony. She didn't care whether she met him or not. It came as something of a shock to see how Sister Verna had aged on her journey. Such journeys typically lasted at most a year. This one, beyond the great barrier to the new world, had taken nearly twenty. Events beyond the barrier being uncertain, Verna had apparently been sent off on her mission too far in advance. Life at the Palace of the Prophets was as long as it was serene. No one at the Palace of the Prophets appeared to have aged at all in so trifling a span of time as two decades, but away from the spell that developed the palace, Verna had. Verna, probably close to 160 years old, had to be at least 20 years younger than Nietzsche, yet she now looked twice Nietzsche's age. People outside the palace aged at the normal rate, of course, but to see it happen so rapidly to a sister. As the roaring applause thundered on in the huge room, many of the sisters wept over the momentous occasion. Nietzsche yawned. Sister Phoebe held up her hand until the room fell silent. Sisters! Phoebe's voice trembled. Please welcome Sister Verna home. She finally had to raise a hand to again bring the clamor of applause to a halt. When the room had quieted, she said, And may I present our newest student, our newest child of the Creator, our newest charge. She turned and held an arm out in introduction, wiggling her fingers, urging the apparently timid boy forward as she went on. Please welcome Richard Cipher to the Palace of the Prophets. Several of the women stepped back out of the way as he strode forward. Nietzsche's eyes widened, her back straightened. It was not a young boy. He was grown into a man. The crowd, despite their shock, clapped and cheered with the warmth of their welcome. Nietzsche didn't hear it. Her attention was riveted by those gray eyes of his. He was introduced to some of the nearby sisters. The novice assigned to him, Pasha, was brought before him and tried to speak to him. Richard brushed Pasha aside, a stag dismissing a vole, and stepped out alone into the center of the room. His whole bearing conveyed the same quality Nietzsche beheld in his eyes. I have something to say. The vast chamber fell to an astonished hush. His gaze swept the room. Nietzsche's breath caught when, for an instant, their eyes met, as he probably met countless others. Her trembling fingers clutched the rail for support. Nietzsche swore at that moment to do whatever was necessary to be named as one of his teachers. His fingers tapped the Radha Han around his neck. As long as you keep this collar on me, you are my captors and I am your prisoner. Murmurs hummed in the air. 
a Radha Han was put around the boy's neck not just to govern him, but to protect him as well. The boys were never thought of as prisoners, but wards who needed security, care, and training. Richard, though, did not see it that way. Since I have committed no aggression against you, that makes us enemies. We are at war. Several older sisters teetered on their heels, nearly fainting. The faces of half the women in the room went red. The rest went white. Nietzsche could not have imagined such an attitude. His demeanor kept her from blinking, lest she overlook something. She drew slow breaths, lest she miss a word. Her pounding heart, though, was beyond her ability to control. Sister Verna has made a pledge to me that I will be taught to control the gift, and when I have learned what is required, I will be set free. For now, as long as you keep that pledge, we have a truce. But there are conditions. Richard lifted a red leather rod hanging on a fine gold chain around his neck. At the time, Nietzsche hadn't known it to be the weapon of a moored Sith. I have been collared before. The person who put that collar on me brought me pain to punish me, to teach me, to subdue me. Nietzsche knew that such could be the only fate of one like him. That is the sole purpose of a collar. You collar a beast. You collar your enemies. I made her much the same offer I am making you. I begged her to release me. She would not. I was forced to kill her. Not one of you could ever hope to be good enough to lick her boots. She did as she did because she was tortured and broken, made mad enough to use a collar to hurt people. She did it against her nature. You, his gaze swept all the eyes watching him, you do it because you think it is your right. You enslave in the name of your creator. I don't know your creator. The only one beyond this world who I know would do as you do is the keeper. The crowd gasped. As far as I'm concerned, you may as well be the keeper's disciples. Little did he know that some of them were. If you do as she and use this collar to bring me pain, the truce will be ended. You may think you hold the leash to this collar, but I promise you, if the truce ends, you will find that what you hold is a bolt of lightning. The room was as silent as a tomb. He was alone, defiant, in the midst of hundreds of sorceresses who knew how to harness every nuance of the power with which they were born. He knew next to nothing of his ability and was collared by Arata Han besides. In this, he may have been a stag, but a stag challenging a congregation of lions, hungry lions. Richard rolled up his left sleeve. He drew his sword, a sword, in defiance of the prodigious power arrayed before him. The distinctive ring of steel filled the silence as the blade was brought free. Nietzsche stood spellbound as he listed his conditions. He finally pointed back with the sword. Sister Verna captured me. I have fought her every step of this journey. She has done everything short of killing me and draping my body over a horse to get me here. Though she, too, is my captor and enemy, I owe her certain debts. If anyone lays a finger to her because of me, I will kill that person, and the truce will be ended. Nietzsche couldn't fathom such a strange sense of honor, but somehow she knew it fit what she saw in his eyes. The crowd gasped as Richard drew his sword across the inside of his arm. He turned it, wiping both sides in the blood until it dripped from the tip. Nietzsche could plainly see, even if the others could not, much as she saw in his eyes a quality others did not see, that the sword united with and completed magic within him. His knuckles white around the hilt, he thrust the glistening crimson blade into the air. I give you a blood oath, he cried out. Harm the Bakaban Mana? Harm Sister Verna, or harm me, and the truce will be ended, and I promise you, we will have war. If we have war, I will lay waste to the palace of the prophets. From the upper balcony, where Richard couldn't see him, Jedediah's mocking voice drifted out over the crowd. All by yourself. Doubt me at your peril. I am a prisoner. I have nothing to live for. I am the flesh of prophecy. I am the bringer of death. No answer came in the stupefied silence. 
probably every woman in the room knew of the prophecy of the bringer of death, though none was certain of its intended meaning. The text of that prophecy, along with all the others, was kept in the vaults deep under the palace of the prophets. That Richard knew it, that he dared declare it aloud in such company, augured the worst possible interpretation. Every lioness in the room retracted her claws in caution. Richard drove his sword home into its scabbard as if to punctuate his threat. Nietzsche knew that the profound importance of what she had seen in his eyes and in his presence would forever haunt her. She knew, too, that she must destroy him. Nietzsche had to surrender favors and commit to obligations she never imagined she would have willingly done, but in return she became one of Richard's six teachers. The burdens she had taken on in return for that privilege were all worth it when she sat alone with him across a small table in his room, lightly holding his hands, if one could be said to lightly grasp lightning, endeavoring to teach him to touch his Han, the essence of life and spirit within the gifted. Try as he might, he felt nothing. That in itself was peculiar. The inkling of what she felt within him, though, was often enough to leave her unable to bring forth more than a few sparse words. She had casually questioned the others and knew they were blind to it. Although Nietzsche could not comprehend what it was about his intellect that his eyes and his conduct revealed, she did know that it disturbed the numb safety of her indifference. She ached to grasp it before she had to destroy him, and at the same time ached to destroy him before she did. Whenever she became confident that she was beginning to unravel the mystery of his singular character and thought she could predict what he would do in a given situation, he would confound her by doing something completely unexpected, if not impossible. Time and again he reduced to ashes what she had thought was the foundation of her understanding of him. She spent hours sitting alone in abysmal misery because it seemed to be in plain sight, yet she couldn't define it. She knew only that it was some principle important beyond measure, and it remained beyond her grasp. Richard, never happy about his situation, became increasingly distant as time passed. Forlorn of hope, Nietzsche decided that the time had come. When she went to his room for what she meant to be his final lesson and his end, he surprised her by offering her a rare white rose. Worse, he offered it with a smile and no explanation. As he held it out, she was so petrified that she could only manage to say, Why, thank you, Richard. The white roses were from only one kind of place, dangerous, restricted areas no student should ever have been able to enter. That he apparently could, and that he would so boldly offer her the proof of his trespass, startled her. She held the white rose carefully between a finger and thumb, not knowing if he was warning her, by giving her a forbidden thing, that he was the bringer of death, and she was being marked, or if it was a gesture of simple, if strange, kindness. She erred on the side of caution. Once again, his nature had stayed her hand. The other sisters of the dark had plans of their own. Richard's gift, as far as Nietzsche was concerned, was probably the least remarkable and by far the least important thing about him. Yet Liliana, one of his other teachers, a woman of boundless greed and limited insight, thought to steal the innate ability of his Han for herself, it sparked a lethal confrontation, which Liliana lost. The six of them, their leader, Ulyssia, and Richard's five remaining teachers, having been discovered, escaped with their lives and little else, only to end up in Jagang's clutches. In the end, Nietzsche understood that quality in his eyes no better than the first moment she had seen it. It had all slipped through her fingers. The girl ran for her mother when Nietzsche released her grip on the studded strap around her neck. Well, Commander Cardiff shrieked. He planted his fists on his hips. Are you through with your games? It's time these people learned the true meaning of ruthless. Nietzsche stared into the depths of his dark eyes. They were defiant, angry, and determined. Yet they were nothing at all like Richard's eyes. Nietzsche turned to the soldiers. She gestured. You too. Seize the commander. The men blinked dumbly. Commander Cardiff's face went red with rage. That's it. You've finally gone too far. He wheeled to his men, a whole field of them, two thousand of them. He pointed a thumb back over his shoulder at Nietzsche. Grab this lunatic witch. 
Half a dozen men nearest to her drew weapons as they rushed her. Like all order field troops, they were big, strong, and quick. They were also experienced. Nietzsche thrust a fist out in the direction of the closest as he lifted his whip to lash out and entangle her. With the speed of thought, both additive magic and subtractive twined together in a lethal mix as she unleashed a focused bolt of power. It produced a burst of light so hot and so white that for an instant it made the sunlight seem dim and cold by comparison. The blast blew a melon-sized hole through the center of the soldier's chest. For an instant, before the internal pressure forced his organs to fill the sudden void, she could see the men behind through the gaping hole in his chest. The afterimage of the flare lingered in her mind's eye like lightning's arc. The acrid smell of scorched air stung her eyes. The clap of her power's thunder rumbled out across the surrounding green fields of wheat. Before the soldier hit the ground, Nietzsche unleashed her power on three more of the charging men, taking off one's entire shoulder, the wallop whirling him around like a ghastly fountain, the dangling limb flying off into the crowd. A third man was cut almost in two. She felt the concussion of the following bolt deep in her chest, and amid a blinding flash, the fourth man's head came apart in a cloud of red mist and bony debris. Her warning gaze met the eyes of two men with knives gripped in white-knuckled fists. They halted. Many more took a step back as the four reports to her so separate yet so close atop one another that they almost merged into one ripping blast still echoed off the buildings. Now, she said in a quiet, calm, composed voice that by its very gentleness betrayed how deadly earnest was the threat. If you men do not follow my orders and seize Commander Cardiff, I will seize him myself. But, of course, not until after I've killed every last one of you. The only sound was the moan of wind between the buildings. Do as I say or die. I will not wait. The big men, knowing her, made their decision in the instant they knew was all she would grant them and leaped to seize the Commander. He managed to draw his sword. Kadar Cardiff was no stranger to pitched battle. He screamed orders as he fought them off. More than one man fell dead in the melee. Others cried out as they took wounds. From behind, men finally caught the deadly sword arm. Additional men piled on the commander until they had him disarmed, down on the ground, and finally under control. What do you think you're doing? Kadar Cardiff roared at her as the men pulled him to his feet. Nietzsche closed the distance between them. The soldiers held his arms twisted behind his back. She stared into his wild eyes. Why, Commander, I am merely following your orders. What are you talking about? She smiled without humor, just because she knew it would further madden him. One of the men glanced back over his shoulder. What do you want done with him? Don't hurt him. I want him fully conscious. Strip him and bind him to the pole. Pole? What pole? the pole that held the pigs you men ate. Nietzsche snapped her fingers, and they began pulling off their commander's clothes. She watched without emotion as he was finally stripped. His gear and prized weapons became plunder, quickly disappearing into the hands of men he had commanded. They grunted with effort as they fought to bind the struggling, naked, hairy commander to the pole at his back. Nietzsche turned to the stunned crowd. Commander Cardiff wishes you to know how ruthless we can be. I am going to carry out those orders and demonstrate it for you. She turned back to the soldiers. Put him over the fire to roast like a pig. The soldiers bore the struggling, furious Kadar Cardiff, the hero of the Little Gap campaign, to the fire pit. They knew that Jagang watched them through her eyes. They had reason to be confident that the Emperor would stop her if he wished to. After all, he was the Dreamwalker, and they had seen him force her and the other sisters to submit to his wishes countless times, no matter how degrading those wishes were. They could not know that, for some reason, Jagang did not have access to her mind right then. The wooden ends of the pole clattered into the sockets in the stone supports to each side of the fire pit. The pole sprang up and down with the weight of its load. The weight finally settled, leaving Kadar Cardiff to hang face down. He had little choice but to watch the glowing coals beneath him.
Even though the fire had burned down, it wasn't long before the heat of the wavering low flames began causing him distress. As people watched in silent dismay, the commander twisted as he shrieked orders, demanding that his men take him down, promising them punishment if they delayed. His diatribe trailed off as he began gasping for control of his growing dread. Watching the eyes of the townspeople, Nietzsche pointed behind her. This is how ruthless the Imperial Order is. They will slowly, painfully burn to death a great commander, a war hero, a man known and revered far and wide, a man who has served them well, just to prove to you, the people of an insignificant little town, that they will not hesitate to kill anyone. Our goal is the good of all, and that goal is held more important than any mere man among us. This is the proof. Now, do you people, for any reason, still think that we would shrink from harming any or all of you if you don't contribute to the common good? Nearly everyone shook their heads as they all mumbled, No, mistress. Behind her, Commander Cardiff writhed in pain. He again yelled at his men, commanding them to bring him down and to kill the crazy witch. None of the soldiers moved to comply with his orders. To look at them, they didn't even hear him. These men had no notion of compassion. There was only life and death. They chose life. That choice required his death. Nietzsche stood watching the eyes of the people as the minutes dragged on. The commander was up a good distance from the low flames, but there was an expansive bed of broiling hot coals. She knew that from time to time the gusty breeze diverted the fierce heat to give him a fleeting reprieve. It would only prolong his ordeal. The heat was inexorable. Still, it would take some time. She didn't ask for more firewood. She was in no hurry. People's noses wrinkled. Everyone could smell his body hair burning. No one dared speak. As the ordeal wore on, the skin across Cardiff's chest and stomach reddened and then darkened. It was a good fifteen minutes before it finally began to crack and split open. He shrieked in pain nearly the entire time. The smell turned to a surprisingly pleasant aroma of cooking meat. In the end, he gave in to wailing for mercy. He called her name, begging her to bring it to an end, to either free him or to finish him quickly. As she listened to him sob her name, she stroked the gold ring through her lower lip, his voice little more to her than the buzzing of a fly. The thin layer of fat that lay over his powerful muscles began melting. He grew hoarse. Fueled by the fat, flames flared up, scorching his face. Nietzsche! Cardiff knew his pleas for mercy were falling on indifferent ears. He betrayed his true feelings. You vicious bitch! You deserved everything I did to you! She casually confronted his wild gaze. Yes, I did. Give my regards to the keeper, Kadar. Tell him yourself. When Jagang finds out about this, he'll tear you limb from limb. You'll soon be in the underworld in the keeper's hands. His words were once more but a trifling drone. Sweat beaded on people's foreheads as the spectacle dragged on. They needed no spoken orders to know she expected them to remain and watch the whole thing. Their own imaginations should they consider disobeying her unspoken orders, would dream up punishments she never could. Only the boys were fascinated by the remarkable exhibition. Knowing looks passed among them. Torture such as this was a treat to the minds of young immortals. Some day they might make good order troops, if they didn't grow up. Nietzsche met the glare of the girl. The hatred in those eyes was breathtaking. Even though the girl had been afraid of the dunking and scrubbing, her eyes at the time had shown that the world was still a wondrous place, and she was something special. Now her eyes betrayed her lost innocence. The whole time, Nietzsche stood tall with her back straight and shoulders square to take the full blow of the girl's bright new hatred, feeling the rare sensation of experiencing something. The girl had no idea that Commander Cardiff had taken her place in the flames. When the commander finally went silent, Nietzsche turned her eyes from the girl and spoke to the townspeople. The past is gone. You are part of the imperial order. 
If you people don't do the moral thing by contributing toward the well-being of your fellow citizens of the order, I will return. They did not doubt her. If there was one thing they obviously wanted, it was never to see her again. One of the soldiers, his fists trembling at his sides, tramped forward in halting steps. His eyes were wide with bewildered pain. I want you back, darling, he growled in a voice that didn't match the startled expression in his eyes. The voice turned deadly. And I want you back right now. There was no mistaking Jagang's voice or the rage in it. It was difficult for him to control the mind of one without the gift. He had the soldier in a tenacious grip. Jagang would not have used a soldier, thereby betraying his impotence, had he been able to reach in and control Nietzsche's mind. She had absolutely no idea why he had suddenly lost the link to her. It had happened before. She knew he would eventually re-establish his ability to hurt her. She had merely to wait. You are angry with me, Excellency? What do you think? She shrugged. Since Kadar was your better in bed, I would think you would be pleased. Get yourself back here right now, the soldier roared in Jagang's voice. Do you understand? Right now. Nietzsche bowed. But of course, Excellency. As she straightened, she yanked the soldier's long knife from the sheath at his belt and slammed it hilt deep into his muscled gut. She gritted her teeth with the effort of pivoting the handle sideways, sweeping the blade in a lethal arc through his insides. She doubted the man felt his messy death, writhing at her feet while she waited for a carriage to make its way around the square. He died with Jagang's chuckle on his lips. Since a dreamwalker could only be in a living mind, for the time being the afternoon returned to quiet. After her carriage rocked to a dusty halt, a soldier reached up and opened the door. She leaned out from the step, turning back to the crowd, holding the outside handrail in order to stand straight so that they all might see her. Her blonde hair fluttered in the sunny breeze. Do not forget this day and how your lives were all spared by Jagang the Just. The commander would have murdered you. The emperor through me has instead shown his compassion. Spread the word of the mercy and wisdom of Jagang the Just, and I will have no need to return. The crowd mumbled that they would. Do you want us to bring the commander with us? A soldier asked. The man, Kadar Kardif's loyal second, now wore Kardif's sword. Like vegetables, Fidelity's fresh vitality was fleeting, its final fate stench and rot. Leave him to roast as a reminder. Everyone else will return with me to Fairfield. By your command, he said with a bow. He circled his arm and ordered the men to mount up and move out. Nietzsche leaned out farther and looked up at the driver. His Excellency wishes to see me. Although he has not said as much, I am reasonably sure he would like you to hurry. Nietzsche took her place on the hard leather cushion inside, her back straight against the upright seat, while the driver let out a shrill whistle and cracked his whip. The team leaped forward, jerking the carriage ahead. With a hand on the window sill. She steadied herself as the iron-bound wheels bounced over the hard, rough ground of the town square until they reached the road where the carriage settled down into this familiar, jolting ride. Sunlight slanted in the window, falling across the empty cushion opposite her. The bold, bright patch glided off the seat as the carriage negotiated a curve in the road, finally slipping up to come to rest in her lap like a warm cat. Darkly clad riders to each side, ahead and behind, stretched forward over the withers of their galloping mounts. A rumbling roar, along with billowing plumes of dust, lifted into the air from the thundering hooves. For the moment, Nietzsche was free of Jagang. She was surrounded by two thousand men, yet she felt totally alone. Before long, she would have pain to fill the terrible void. She felt no joy, no fear. She sometimes wondered why she felt nothing but the need to hurt. As the carriage raced toward Jagang, her thoughts were focused instead on another man, trying to recall every occasion that she had seen him. She went over every moment she had spent with Richard Cipher, or as he was now known, and as Jagang knew him, Richard Rawl. She thought about his gray eyes. Until the day she saw him, she had never believed such a person could exist. 
When she thought about Richard, like now, only one haunting need burned in her, to destroy him. Chapter 9 Huge, garish tents festooned the prominent hill outside the city of Fairfield, yet despite the festive colors erected amid the gloom, despite the laughing, the shouting, the coarse singing, and the riotous excess, this was no carnival come to town, but an occupying army. The emperor's tents and those of his retinue were styled in the fashion of the tents used by some of the nomadic people from Jigang's homeland of al Turang. yet they were embellished far beyond any actual tradition. The emperor, a man vastly exceeding any nomadic tribal leader's ability to imagine, created his own cultural heritage as he saw fit. Around the tents covering the hills and valleys as far as Nietzsche could see, the soldiers had pitched their own small grimy tents. Some were oiled canvas, many more were made from animal skins. Beyond the shared basics of practicality, there was uniformity only in their lack of conformity to any one style. Outside some of the shabby little tents and almost as large sat ornate upholstered chairs looted from the city. The juxtaposition almost looked as if it had been intentionally done for a comical effect, but Nietzsche knew the reality had no kinship to humor. When the army eventually moved on, such large, meticulously crafted items were too cumbersome to take and would be left to rot in the weather. Horses were picked haphazardly, with occasional paddocks holding small herds. Other enclosures held meat on the hoof. Individual wagons were scattered here and there, seemingly wherever they could find an empty spot, but in other places they had been set up side by side. Many were camp followers. Others were army wagons with everything from basic supplies to blacksmith equipment. The army brought along minimal siege equipment. They had the gifted to use as weapons of that sort. Brooding clouds scudded low over the scene. The humid air reeked of excrement from both animals and men. The green fields all around had been churned to a muddy morass. The two thousand men who had returned with Nietzsche had disappeared into the sprawling camp like a sprinkling of raindrops into a swamp. An Imperial Order army encampment was a place of noise and seeming confusion, yet it was not as disorderly as it might appear. There was a hierarchy of authority and duties and chores to attend. Scattered men worked in solitude on their gear, oiling weapons and leather or rolling their chain mail inside barrels with sand and vinegar to clean it of rust, while others cooked at fires. Farriers saw to the horses, Craftsmen saw to everything from repairing weapons to fashioning new boots to pulling teeth. Mystics of all sorts prowled the camp, tending impoverished souls or warding troublesome demons. Duties completed, raucous gangs gathered together for entertainment, usually gambling and drinking. Sometimes the diversions involved the camp followers, sometimes the captives. Even surrounded by such vast numbers, Nietzsche felt alone. Jagang's absence from her mind left a feeling of staggering isolation, not a sense of being forsaken, but simply solitude by contrast. With the dreamwalker in her mind, not even the most intimate detail of life, no thought, no deed, could be held private. His presence lurked in the dark mental corners, and from there he could watch everything. Every word you spoke, every thought you had, every bite you took, every time you cleared your throat, every time you coughed, every time you went to the privy, you were never alone. Never. The violation was debilitating. The trespass complete. That was what broke most of the sisters. The brutal totality of it. The awareness of his constant presence in your own mind. Watching. Worst almost, the dreamwalker's roots sunk down through you, but you never knew when his awareness was focused on you. You might call him a vile name, and with his attention elsewhere, it would go unnoticed. Another time... You might have a brief, private, nasty thought about him, and he would know it the same instant you thought it. Nietzsche had learned to feel those roots, as had many of the other sisters. She had also learned to recognize when they were absent, as now. That never happened with the others. With them, those roots were permanent. Jagang always eventually returned, though, to once again sink his roots into her, but for now, she was alone. She just didn't know why. The jumble of troops and campfires left no clear route for the team, so Nietzsche had left her carriage for the walk the rest of the way up the hill. 
It exposed her to the lecherous looks and lewd calls of the soldiers who crowded the slope. She supposed that before Jagang was finished with her, she might be exposed to far more from the men. Most of the sisters were sent out to the tents from time to time to be used for the men's pleasure. It was done either to punish them, or sometimes merely to let them know it could be ordered on a whim, to remind them that they were slaves, nothing more than property. Nietzsche, though, was reserved for the exclusive amusement of the emperor and those he specifically selected, like Kadar Kadif. Many of the sisters envied her status, but despite what they believed, being a personal slave to Jigang was no grace. Women were sent to the tents for a period of time, maybe a week or two, but the rest of the time they had less demanding duties. They were valued, after all, for their abilities with their gift. There was no such time limit for Nietzsche. She had once spent a couple of months sequestered in Jigang's room so as to be there for his amusement any time of day or night. The soldiers enjoyed the women's company, but had to mind certain restrictions in what they could do to them. Jigang and his friends imposed on themselves no such limits. On occasion, for reason or not, Jigang would become furious at her and would heatedly order her to the tents for a month to teach her a lesson, he would say. Nietzsche would obediently bow and pledge it would be as he wished. He knew she was not bluffing. It would have been a lesser torment. Before she could be out the door to the tents, he would turn moody, command her to return to face him, and then angrily retract the orders. Since the beginning, Nietzsche had, measure by measure, inch by inch, acquired a certain status and freedom afforded none of the others. She hadn't specifically sought it. It just came about. Jagang had confided to her that he read the sisters' thoughts and that they privately referred to her as the slave queen. She supposed Jagang told her so as to honor her in his own way, but the title slave queen had meant no more to her than death's mistress. For now, she floated like a bright water lily flower in the dark swamp of men. Other sisters always made an attempt to look as drab as the men so as to go less noticed and be less desirable. They only deceived themselves. They lived in constant terror of what Jagang might do to them. What happened, happened. They had no choice or influence in it. Nietzsche simply didn't care. She wore her fine black dresses and left her long blonde hair uncovered for all to see. For the most part, she did as she wished. She didn't care what Jagang did to her, and he knew it. In much the way Richard was an enigma to her, she was an enigma to Jagang. Too, Jagang was fascinated by her. Despite his cruelty toward her, there was a spark of caution mixed in. When he hurt her, she welcomed it. She merited the brutality. Pain could sometimes reach down into the dark emptiness. He would then recoil from hurting her. When he threatened to kill her, she waited patiently for it to be done. She knew she didn't deserve to live. He would then withdraw the sentence of death. The fact that she was sincere was her safety and her peril. She was a fawn among wolves, safe in her coat of indifference. The fawn was in danger only if it ran. She did not view her captivity as a conflict with her interests. She had no interests. Time and again she had the opportunity to run, but didn't. That, perhaps more than anything, captivated Jagang. Sometimes he seemed to pay court to her. She didn't know his real interest in her. She never tried to discover it. He occasionally professed concern for her, and a few times something akin to affection. Other times, when she left on some duty, he seemed glad to be rid of her. It had occurred to her, because of his behavior, that he might think he was in love with her. As preposterous as such a thought might be, it didn't matter one way or the other. She doubted he was capable of love. She seriously doubted that Jagang really knew what the word meant, much less the entire concept. Nietzsche knew all too well what it meant. A soldier near Jagang's tent stepped in front of her. He grinned moronically. It was meant to be an invitation by means of threat. She could have dissuaded him by mentioning that Jagang waited for her, or she could even have used her power to drop him where he stood, but instead she simply stared at him. It was not the reaction he wanted. Many of the men rose to the bait only if it squirmed. When she didn't, his expression turned sour. He grumbled a curse at her and moved off. Nietzsche continued on toward the emperor's tent. Nomadic tents from all to Arang were actually quite small and practical, being made of bland, unadorned lambskin. 
Jagang had recreated them rather more grandly than the originals. His own were more oval than round. Three poles, rather than the customary one, held up the multi-peaked roof. The tent's exterior walls were decorated with brightly embroidered panels. Around the top edge of the sides, where the roof met the walls, hung fist-sized, multi-colored tassels and streamers that marked the traveling palace of the emperor. Banners and pennants of bright yellow and red atop the huge tent hung limp in the stale late afternoon air. Outside, a woman beat small rugs, hung over one of the tent's lines. Nietzsche lifted aside the heavy doorway curtain embellished with gold shields and hammered silver medallions depicting battle scenes. Inside, slaves were at work, sweeping the expansive carpets, dusting the delicate ceramic ware set about on the elaborate furnishings, and fussing at the hundreds of colorful pillows lining the edge of the floor. Hangings, richly decorated with traditional Altuarang designs, divided the space into several rooms. A few openings overhead, covered with gauzy material, let in a little light. All the thick materials created a quiet place amid the noise. Lamps and candles lent sleepy light to the soft room. Nietzsche did not acknowledge the eyes of the guards flanking the inside of the doorway or those of the other slaves going about their domestic duties. In the middle of the front room sat Jagang's ornate chair, draped with red silks. This was where he sometimes took audiences, but the chair was empty. She didn't falter, as did other women summoned by His Excellency, but strode resolutely toward his bedroom in the rear section. One of the slaves, a nearly naked boy, looking to be in his late teens, was down on his hands and knees with a small whisk broom, sweeping the carpet set before the entrance to the bedroom. Without meeting Nietzsche's gaze, he informed her that His Excellency was not occupying his tents. The young man, Erwin, was gifted. He lived at the Palace of the Prophets, training to be a wizard. Now Erwin tended the fringe of carpets and emptied the chamber pots. Nietzsche's mother would have approved. Jagang could be any number of places. He might be off gambling or drinking with his men. He could be inspecting his troops or the craftsmen who attended them. He might be looking over the new captives, selecting those he wanted for himself. He might be talking with Kadar Kardif II. Nietzsche saw several sisters cowering in a corner. Like her, they too were Jagang's slaves. As she strode up to the three women, she saw that they were busy sewing, mending some of the tent's gear. Sister Nietzsche! Sister Georgia rushed to her feet as a look of relief washed across her face. We didn't know if you were alive or dead. We haven't seen you for so long. We thought maybe you had vanished. Being that Nietzsche was a sister of the dark, sworn to the keeper of the underworld, she found the concern from three sisters of the light to be somewhat insincere. Nietzsche supposed that they had considered their captivity a common bond and their feelings about it paramount, overcoming their more basic rifts. Two, they knew Jagang treated her differently. They were probably eager to be seen as friendly. I've been away on business for His Excellency. Of course, Sister Georgia said, dry washing her hands as she dipped her head. The other two, Sisters Rochelle and Aubrey, set aside the bag of bone buttons and tent thread, untangled themselves from yards of canvas, and then stood beside Sister Georgia. They both bowed their heads slightly to Nietzsche. The three of them feared her inscrutable standing with Jagang. Sister Nietzsche, His Excellency is very angry, Sister Rochelle said. Furious, Sister Aubrey confirmed. He, he railed at the walls, saying that you had gone too far this time. Nietzsche only stared. Sister Aubrey licked her lips. We just thought you should know, so you can be careful. Nietzsche thought this would be a poor time to suddenly begin being careful. She found the groveling of women hundreds of years her senior annoying. Where is Jagang? He has taken a grand building not far outside the city as his quarters, Sister Aubrey said. It used to be the Minister of Culture's estate, Sister Rochelle added. Nietzsche frowned. Why? He has his tents. Since you've been gone, he's decided that an emperor needs proper quarters, Sister Rochelle said. Proper? Proper for what? To show the world his importance, I suppose. Sister Aubrey nodded. He's having a palace built in Alto Rang. It's his new vision. She arced an arm through the air, apparently indicating with the slice of her hand the grand scale of the place. He's ordered a magnificent palace built. He was planning on using the Palace of the Prophets, Sister Rochelle said. But since it was destroyed, he's decided to build another, only better. 
the most opulent palace ever conceived. Nietzsche frowned at the three women. He wanted the palace of the prophets because it had a spell to slow aging. That was what interested him. All three women shrugged. Nietzsche began to get an inkling of what Jagang might have in mind. So, this place he's at now, what is he doing? Learning to eat with something other than his fingers? Seeing how he likes living the fancy life under a roof? He only told us he was staying there for now, Sister Georgia said. He took most of the younger women with him. He told us to stay here and see to things in case he wished to return to his tent. It didn't sound like much had changed except the setting. Nietzsche sighed. Her carriage was gone. She would have to walk. All right, how do I find the place? After Sister Aubrey gave her detailed directions, Nietzsche thanked them and turned to go. Sister Alessandra has vanished, Sister Georgia said in a voice straining mightily to sound nonchalant. Nietzsche stopped in her tracks. She rounded on Sister Georgia. The woman was middle-aged and seemed to look worse every time Nietzsche saw her. Her clothes were little more than tattered rags she wore with the pride of a fine uniform. Her thin hair was more white than brown. It might once have looked distinguished, but it didn't appear to have seen a brush, much less soap, for weeks. She was probably infested with lice, too. Some people look forward to age as an excuse to become a frump, as if all along their greatest ambition in life had been to be drab and unattractive. Sister Georgia seemed to delight in dowdiness. What do you mean, Sister Alessandra has vanished? Nietzsche caught the slight twitch of satisfaction. Georgia spread her hands innocently. We don't know what happened. She's just turned up missing. Still, Nietzsche didn't move. I see. Sister Georgia spread her hands again, feigning simple-mindedness. It was about the time the prelate disappeared, too. Nietzsche denied them the reward of astonishment. What was Verna doing here? Not Verna, Sister Rochelle said. She leaned in. Anne. Sister Georgia scowled her displeasure at Rochelle for spoiling the surprise, and a surprise it was. The old prelate had died. At least that was what Nietzsche had been told. Since leaving the Palace of the Prophets, Nietzsche had heard about all the other sisters, novices, and young men spending the night at the funeral pyre for Anne and the prophet Nathan. Knowing Anne, there was obviously some sort of deception afoot, but even for her, such a thing would be extraordinary. The three sisters smiled like cats with a carp. They looked eager for a long game of truth and gossip. Give me the important details. I don't have time for the long version. His Excellency wishes to see me. Nietzsche took in the three wilting smiles. She kept her voice level. Unless you want to risk him returning here, angry and impatient to see me. Sisters Rochelle and Aubrey blanched. Georgia abandoned the game and went back to dry washing her hands. The prelate came to the camp when you were gone and was captured. Why would she come into Jagang's midst? To try to convince us to escape with her, Sister Rochelle blurted out. A shrill titter, jittery rather than amused, burbled up. She had some silly story about the chimes being loose and magic failing. Imagine that. Wild stories they were. Expected us to believe. So that was what happened, Nietzsche whispered as she stared off in reflection. She realized instantly it was no wild story. Pieces began fitting together. Nietzsche used her gift. The others weren't allowed to, so they might not know if magic had failed for a time. That's what she claimed, Sister Georgia said. So magic had failed, Nietzsche reasoned aloud, and she thought that would prevent the Dreamwalker from controlling your minds. That might explain much of what Nietzsche didn't understand, why Jagang sometimes couldn't enter her mind. But if the chimes are loose... Were, Sister Georgia said. Even if it was true, for a time, they now have been banished. His Excellency has full access to us, I'm happy to say, and everything else concerning magic has returned to normal. Nietzsche could almost see the three of them wondering if Jagang was listening to their words. But if magic was returned to normal... Jagang should be in Nietzsche's mind. He wasn't. She felt the spark of a possible understanding fizzle and die. 
So the prelate made a blunder and Jagang caught her. Well, not exactly, Sister Rochelle said. Sister Georgia went and got the guards. We turned her in, as was our duty. Nietzsche burst out with a laugh. Her own sisters of the light. How ironic. She risks her life while the chimes have interrupted magic to come and save your worthless hides, and instead of escaping with her, you turn her in. How fitting. We had to, Sister Georgia protested. His Excellency would have wished it. Our place is to serve. We know better than to try to escape. We know our place. Nietzsche surveyed their tense faces. These women sworn to the Creator's light. These sisters of the light who had worked hundreds of years in his name. Yes, you do. You'd have done the same, Sister Aubrey snapped. We had to, or His Excellency would have taken it out on the others. It was our duty to the welfare of the others, and that includes you, I might add. We couldn't think only of ourselves, or Anne, but had to think of what was good for everyone. Nietzsche felt the numb indifference smothering her. Fine, so you betrayed the prelate. Only a spark of curiosity remained. But what made her think she could escape with you for good? Surely she must have had some plan for the chimes. What was she expecting to happen when Jagang once again had access to your minds and hers? His Excellency is always with us, Sister Aubrey insisted. Anne was just trying to fill our heads with her preposterous notions. We know better. The rest of it was just a trick, too. We were too smart for her. Rest of it? What was the rest of her plan? Sister Georgia huffed her indignation. She tried to tell us some foolishness about a bond to Richard Rawl. Nietzsche blinked. She concentrated on keeping her breathing even. Bond? What nonsense are you talking about now? Sister Georgia met Nietzsche's gaze squarely. She insisted that if we swore allegiance to Richard, it would protect us. She claimed some magic of his would keep Jagang from our mind. How? Sister Georgia shrugged. She claimed this bond business protected people's minds from dreamwalkers. But we aren't that gullible. To still her fingers, Nietzsche pressed her hands to her thighs. I don't understand. How would such a thing work? She said something about it being inherited from his ancestor. She claimed that we had but to swear loyalty to him, loyalty in our hearts, or some such nonsense. To tell the truth, it was so preposterous I wasn't really paying that much attention. She claimed that was why Jagang couldn't enter her mind. Nietzsche was staggered. Of course. She had always wondered why Jagang didn't capture the rest of the sisters. There were many more still free. They were protected by this bond to Richard. It had to be true. It made sense. Her own leader, Sister Ulyssia, and Richard's other teachers had escaped too. But that didn't seem to make sense. They were sisters of the dark, like Nietzsche. They would have had to swear loyalty to Richard. Nietzsche couldn't imagine such a thing. But then, Jagang was often unable to enter Nietzsche's mind. You said Sister Alessandra has vanished. Sister Georgia fussed with the collar of her scruffy dress. She and Anne both vanished. Jagang doesn't bother to inform you of his actions. Perhaps he simply had them put to death. Georgia glanced at her companions. Well, maybe. But Sister Alessandra was one of yours, a sister of the dark. She was caring for Anne. Why weren't you caring for her? You are her sisters. Sister Georgia cleared her throat. She threw such a fit about us that His Excellency assigned Sister Alessandra to look after her. Nietzsche could only imagine that it must have been quite a fit, but after being betrayed by her own sisters, it was understandable. Jagang would have thought the woman valuable enough that he wanted to keep her alive. As we marched into the city, the wagon with Anne's cage never showed up, Sister Georgia went on. One of the drivers finally came around with a bloody head and reported that the last thing he saw before the world went dark was Sister Alessandra. Now the two of them are gone. Nietzsche felt her fingernails digging into her palms. She made herself relax her fists. So, Anne offered you all freedom and you chose instead to continue to be slaves. The three women lifted their noses. We did what is best for everyone, Sister Georgia said. We are sisters of the light, 
Our duty is not to ourselves, but to relieve the suffering of others, not cause it. Besides, Sister Aubrey added, we don't see you leaving. Seems you've been free of His Excellency from time to time, and you don't go. Nietzsche frowned. How do you know that? Well, I, I mean, Sister Aubrey stammered. Nietzsche seized the woman by the throat. I asked you a question. Answer it. Sister Aubrey's face reddened as Nietzsche added the force of her gift to the grip. The tendons in her wrist stood out with a strain. The woman's eyes showed white all around as Nietzsche's power began squeezing the life from her. Unlike Nietzsche, Jagang possessed their minds, and they were prohibited from using their power except at his direction. Sister Georgia gently placed a hand on Nietzsche's forearm. His Excellency questioned us about it. That's all, sister. Let her go, please. Nietzsche released the woman, but turned her glare on Sister Georgia. Questioned you? What do you mean? What did he say? He simply wanted to know if we knew why he was from time to time blocked from your mind. He hurt us, Sister Rochelle said. He hurt us with his questions, because we had no answer. We don't understand it. For the first time, Nietzsche did. Sister Aubrey comforted her throat. What is it with you, Sister Nietzsche? Why is His Excellency so curious about you? Why is it you can resist him? Nietzsche turned and walked away. Thank you for the help, sisters. If you can be free of him, why do you not leave? Sister Georgia called out. Nietzsche turned back from the doorway. I enjoy seeing Jagang torment you witches of the light. I stay around so that I might watch. They were unmoved by her insolence. They were accustomed to Nietzsche, Michelle said, smoothing back her frizz of hair. What did you do that made His Excellency so angry? What? Oh, that. Nothing of importance. I just had the men tie Commander Cardiff to a pole and roast him over a fire. The three of them gasped as they straightened as one. They reminded Nietzsche of three owls on a branch. Sister Georgia fixed Nietzsche with a grim glare, a rare blaze of authority born of seniority. You deserve everything Jagang does to you, sister, and what the Keeper will do to you, too. Nietzsche smiled and said, Yes, I do, before ducking through the tent opening. Chapter 10 The city of Fairfield had returned to a semblance of order. It was the order of a military post. Little of what could be said to make a city was left. Many of the buildings remained, but there were few of the people who had once lived and worked in them. Some of the buildings had been reduced to charred beams and blackened rubble. Others were hulks with windows and doors broken out. Yet most were much the same as they had been before, except, of course, that all had been emptied in the wanton looting. The buildings stood like husks, only a reminder of past life. Here and there a few toothless old people sat, legs splayed, leaning against a wall, watching with empty eyes the masses of armed men moving up and down their streets. Orphaned children wandered in a daze or peered out from dark passageways. Nietzsche found it remarkable how quickly civilization could be stripped from a place. As she walked through the streets, Nietzsche thought she understood how many of the buildings would feel if they could feel. Empty, devoid of life, lacking purpose while they waited for someone to serve, their only true value being in service to the living. The streets, populated as they were by grim-faced soldiers, gaunt beggars, the skeletal old and sick, wailing children, all amongst the rubble and filth, looked much like some of the streets Nietzsche remembered from when she was little. Her mother often sent her out to streets like this to minister to the destitute. It's the fault of men like your father, her mother had said. He's just like my father was. He has no feelings, no concern for anyone but himself. He's heartless. Nietzsche had stood wearing a freshly washed, frilly blue dress, her hair brushed and pinned back, her hands hanging at her sides, listening as her mother lectured on good and evil, on the ways of sin and redemption. Nietzsche hadn't understood a lot of it, but in later years it would be repeated until she would come to know every word, every concept, every desolate truth by heart. Nietzsche's father was wealthy. Worse, to mother's way of thinking, he wasn't remorseful about it. 
Mother explained that self-interest and greed were like the two eyes of a monstrous evil, always looking for yet more power and gold to feed its insatiable hunger. You must learn, Nietzsche, that a person's moral course in this life is to help others, not yourself, Mother said. Money can't buy the Creator's blessing. But how can we show the Creator we're good, Nietzsche asked. Mankind is a wretched lot, unworthy, morbid, and foul. We must fight our depraved nature. Helping others is the only way to prove your soul's value. It's the only true good a person can do. Nietzsche's father had been born a noble, but all his adult life he had worked as an armorer. Mother believed that he had been born with comfortable wealth, and instead of being satisfied with that, he sought to build his legacy into a shameless fortune. She said wealth could only be had by fleecing it from the poor in one fashion or another. Others of the nobility, like Mother and many of her friends, were content not to squeeze an undeserved share from the sweat of the poor. Nietzsche felt great guilt for Father's wicked ways, for his ill-gotten wealth, Mother said she was doing her best to try to save his straying soul. Nietzsche never worried for her mother's soul, because people were always saying how caring, how kind-hearted, how charitable Mother was, but Nietzsche would sometimes lie awake at night unable to sleep with worry for Father, worried that the Creator might exact punishment before Father could be redeemed. While Mother went to meetings with her important friends, the nanny on the way to the market often took Nietzsche to Father's business to ask his wishes for dinner. Nietzsche relished watching and learning things at Father's work. It was a fascinating place. When she was very young, she thought she might grow up to be an armorer, too. At home, she would sit on the floor and play at hammering on an item of clothing meant to be armor, laid on an upturned shoe used as an anvil. That innocent time was her fondest memory of her childhood. Nietzsche's father had a great many people working for him. Wagons brought four-square bars and other supplies from distant places. Heavy cast-metal sows came in on barges. Other wagons with guards took goods to far-off customers. There were men who forged metal, men who hammered it into shape, and yet other men who shaped glowing metal into weapons. Some of the blades were made from costly poison steel said to inflict mortal wounds even in a small cut. There were other men who sharpened blades, men who polished armor, and men who did beautiful engraved artwork on shields, armor, and blades. There were even women who worked for Nietzsche's father, helping to make chain mail. Nietzsche watched them, sitting on benches at long wooden tables, gossiping a bit among themselves, tittering at stories as they worked with their pincers, burring over tiny rivets, in the flattened ends of all those thousands of little steel rings that together went into the making of a suit of chainmail armor. Nietzsche thought it remarkable that man's inventiveness could turn something as hard as metal into a suit of clothes. Men from all around and from distant places, too, came to buy her father's armor. Father said it was the finest armor made. His eyes, the color of the blue sky on a perfect summer day, sparkled wonderfully when he spoke of his armor. Some was so beautiful that kings traveled from great distances to have armor ordered and fitted. Some was so elaborate that it took skilled men hunched at benches many months to make. Blacksmiths, bellowsmen, hammermen, millmen, platers, armorers, polishers, leather workers, riveters, pattern makers, silversmiths, gilders, engraving artists, even seamstresses for the making of the quilted and padded linen, and, of course, apprentices came from great distances, hoping to work for her father. Many of those with skills lugged along samples of their best work to show him. Father turned away far more than he hired. Nietzsche's father was an impressive figure, upright, angular, and intense. At his work, his blue eyes always seemed to Nietzsche to see more than any other person saw, as if the metal spoke to him when his fingers glided over it. He seemed to move his limbs precisely as much as was needed and no more. To Nietzsche, he was a vision of power, strength, and purpose. Officers, officials, and nobility came round to talk to him, as did suppliers and his workers. When Nietzsche went to her father's work, she was always astonished to see him engaged in so much conversation. Mother said it was because he was arrogant and made his poor workers pay court to him. Nietzsche liked to watch the intricate dance of people working. 
The workers would pause to smile at her, answer her questions, and sometimes let her hit the metal with a hammer. From the looks of it, father enjoyed talking to all those people, too. At home, mother talked and father said little, as his face took on the look of hammered steel. When he did talk at home, he spoke almost exclusively about his work. Nietzsche listened to every word, wanting to learn all about him and his business. Mother confided that at his core, his vile nature ate away at his invisible soul. Nietzsche always hoped to someday redeem his soul and make it as healthy as he outwardly appeared. He adored Nietzsche, but seemed to think raising her was a task too sacred for his coarse hands, so he left it to Mother. Even when he disagreed with something, he would bow to Mother's wishes, saying she would know best about such a domestic duty. His work kept him busy most of the time. Mother said it was a sign of his barren soul that he spent so much of his time at building his riches, taking from people, she often called it, rather than giving of himself to people, as the Creator meant all men to do. Many times when Father came home for dinner, while servants scurried in and out with all the dishes they'd prepared, Mother would go on in tortured tones about how bad things were in the world. Nietzsche often heard people say that Mother was a noble woman because of how deeply she cared. After dinner, father would go back to work, often without a word. That would anger mother, because she had more to tell him about his soul, but he was too busy to listen. Nietzsche remembered occasions when mother would stand at the window, looking out over the dark city, worrying, no doubt, about all the things that plagued her peace. On those quiet nights, father sometimes glided up behind mother, putting a hand tenderly to her back, as if she were something of great value. He seemed to be mellow and contented at those moments. He squeezed her bottom just a little as he whispered something in her ear. She would look up hopefully and ask him to contribute to the efforts of her fellowship. He would ask how much. Peering up into his eyes as if searching for some shred of human decency, she would name a figure. He would sigh and agree. His hands would settle around her waist, and he would say that it was late and that they should retire to bed. Once... When he asked her how much she wished him to contribute, she shrugged and said, I don't know. What does your conscience tell you, Howard? But a man of true compassion would do better than you usually do, considering that you have more than your fair share of wealth and the need is so great. He sighed. How much do you and your friends need? It's not me and my friends who need it, Howard, but the masses of humanity crying out for help. Our fellowship simply struggles to meet the need. How much? He repeated. She said, Five hundred gold crowns, as if the number were a club she had been hiding behind her back, and seeing the opening she had been waiting for, she suddenly brandished it to bully him. With a gasp, Father staggered back a step. Do you have any idea of the work required to make a sum of that size? You do no work, Howard. Your slaves do it for you. Slaves. They are the finest craftsmen. They should be. You steal the best workers from all over the land. I pay the best wages in the land. They are eager to work for me. They are the poor victims of your tricks. You exploit them. You charge more than anyone else. You have connections and make deals to cut out other armorers. You steal the food from the mouths of working people just to line your own pockets. I offer the finest work. People buy from me because they want the best. I charge a fair price for it. No one charges as much as you, and that's the simple fact. You always want more. Gold is your only goal. People come to me willingly because I have the highest standards. That is my goal. The other shops produce haphazard work that doesn't proof out. My tempering is superior. My work is all proofed to a double stamp standard. I won't sell inferior work. People trust me. They know I create the best pieces. Your workers do. You simply rake in the money. The profits go to wages and to the business. I just sank a fortune into the new battering mill. Business, business, business. When I ask you to give a little something back to the community, to those in need, you act as if I wanted you to gouge out your eyes. Would you really rather see people die than to give a pittance to save them? Does money really mean more to you, Howard, than people's lives? Are you that cruel and unfeeling a man? Father hung his head for a time and at last quietly agreed to send his man around with the gold. His voice came gentle again. He said he didn't want people to die, and he hoped the money would help. 
He told her it was time for bed. You put me off, Howard, with your arguing. You couldn't just give charitably of yourself. It always has to be dragged out of you. When it's the right thing to do in the first place, you only agreed now because of your lecherous needs. Honestly, do you think I have no principles? Father simply turned and headed for the door. He paused as he suddenly saw Nietzsche sitting on the floor watching. The look on his face frightened her, not because it was angry or fierce, but because there seemed to be so much in his eyes, and the weight of never being able to express it was crushing him. Raising Nietzsche was mother's work, and he had promised her he would not meddle. He swept his blonde hair back from his forehead, then turned and picked up his coat. In a level voice, he said to mother that he was going to go see to some things at work. After he was gone, Mother, too, saw Nietzsche forgotten on the floor, playing with beads on a board, pretending to make chain mail. Her arms folded. She stood over Nietzsche for a long moment. Your father goes to whores, you know. I'm sure that's where he's off to now. A whore. You may be too young to understand, but I want you to know, so that you don't ever put any faith in him. He's an evil man. I'll not be his whore. Now put away your things and come with Mother. I'm going to see my friends. It's time you came along and began learning about the needs of others instead of just your own wants. At her friend's house, there were a few men and several women sitting and talking in serious tones. When they politely inquired after Father, Nietzsche's mother reported that he was off working or whoring, I don't know which, and can control neither. Some of the women laid a hand on her arm and comforted her. It was a terrible burden she bore, they said. Across the room sat a silent man who looked to Nietzsche as grim as death itself. Mother quickly forgot about Father as she became engrossed in the discussion her friends were having about the terrible conditions of people in the city. People were suffering from hunger, injuries, sickness, disease, lack of skill, no work, too many children to feed, elderly to care for, no clothes, no roof over their heads, and every other kind of strife imaginable. It was all so frightening. Nietzsche was always anxious when Mother talked about how things couldn't go on the way they were for much longer and that something had to be done. Nietzsche wished someone would hurry up and do it. Nietzsche listened as Mother's fellowship friends talked about all the intolerant people who harbored hate. Nietzsche feared ending up as one of those terrible people. She didn't want the Creator to punish her for having a cold heart. Mother and her friends went on at great length about their deep feeling for all the problems around them. After each person said their piece, they would steal a glance over at the man sitting solemnly in the straight chair against the wall, watching with careful dark eyes as they talked. The prices of things are just terrible, a man with droopy eyelids said. He was all crumpled down in his chair like a pile of dirty clothes. It isn't fair. People shouldn't be allowed to just raise their prices whenever they want. The Duke should do something. He has the King's ear. The Duke, Mother said. She sipped her tea. Yes, I've always found the Duke to be a man sympathetic to good causes. I think he could be persuaded to introduce sensible laws. Mother glanced over the gold rim of her cup at the man in the straight chair. One of the women said she would encourage her husband to back the Duke. Another spoke that they would write a letter of support for such an idea. People are starving, a wrinkled woman said, into a lull in the conversation. People eagerly mumbled their acknowledgment, as if this were an umbrella to run in under to escape the drenching silence. I see it every day. If we could just help some of those unfortunate people. One of the other women puffed herself up like a chicken ready to lay an egg. It's just terrible the way no one will give them a job, when there's plenty of work, if it was just spread around. I know, Mother said with a tisk. I've talked to Howard until I'm blue in the face. He just hires people who please him, rather than those needing the job the most. It's a disgrace. The others sympathized with her burden. It isn't right that a few men should have so much more than they need, while so many people have so much less, the man with the droopy eyelids said. It's immoral. Man has no right to exist for his own sake. Mother was quick to put in as she nibbled on a piece of dense cake while glancing again at the grimly silent man. I tell Howard all the time that self-sacrifice in the service of others is man's highest moral duty and his only reason for being placed in this life. To that end, Mother announced. 
I have decided to contribute five hundred gold crowns to our cause. The other people gasped their delight and congratulated Mother for her charitable nature. They agreed as they sneaked peeks across the room that the Creator would reward her in the next life and talked about all they would be able to do to help those less fortunate souls. Mother finally turned and regarded Nietzsche for a moment and then said, I believe my daughter is old enough to learn to help others. Nietzsche sat forward on the edge of her chair, thrilled at the idea of at last putting her hand to what Mother and her friends said was noble work. It was as if the Creator himself had offered her a path to salvation. I would so like to do good, Mother. Mother cast a questioning look at the man in the straight chair. Brother Nariv? The deep creases of his face pleated to each side as the thin line of his mouth stretched in a smile. There was no joy in it, or in his dark eyes hooded beneath a brow of tangled white and black hairs. He wore a creased cap and heavy robes as dark as dried blood. Wisps of his wiry hair above his ears curled up around the edge of the cap that came halfway down on his forehead. He stroked his jaw with the side of a finger as he spoke in a voice that almost rattled the teacups. So, child, you wish to be a little soldier? Well, no, sir. Nietzsche didn't know what soldiering had to do with doing good. Mother always said that father pandered to men in an evil occupation. Soldiers. She said soldiers only cared about killing. I wish to help those in need. That is what we all tried to do, child. His spooky smile remained fixed on his face as he spoke. We here are all soldiers in the fellowship. The fellowship of order, as we call our little group. All soldiers fighting for justice. Everyone seemed too timid to look directly at him. They glanced for a moment, looked away, then glanced back again, as if his face was not something to be taken in all at once, but sipped at, like a scalding, hot, foul-tasting remedy. Mother's brown eyes darted around like a cockroach looking for a crack. Why, of course, Brother Nareth, that is the only moral sort of soldier, the charitable sort. She urged Nietzsche up and scooted her forward. Nietzsche, Brother Narev here is a great man. Brother Narev is the high priest of the Fellowship of Order, an ancient sect devoted to doing the Creator's will in this world. Brother Narev is a sorcerer. She cast a smile up at him. Brother Narev, this is my daughter, Nietzsche. Her mother's hands pushed her at the man as if she were an offering for the Creator. Unlike everyone else, Nietzsche couldn't take her gaze from his hooded eyes. She had never seen their like. There was nothing in them but dark, cold emptiness. He held out a hand. Pleased to meet you, Nietzsche. Curtsy and kiss his hand, dear, Mother prompted. Nietzsche went to one knee. She kissed the knuckles so as not to have to put her lips on the spongy web of thick blue veins covering the back of his hairy hand floating before her face. The whitish knobs were cold, but not icy, as she had expected. We welcome you to our movement, Nietzsche, he said in that deep, rattling voice of his. With your mother's caring hand raising you up, I know you will do the Creator's work. Nietzsche thought that the Creator himself must be very much like this man. From all the things her mother told her, Nietzsche feared the Creator's wrath. She was old enough to know that she had to start doing the good work her mother always talked about, if she was to have any chance at salvation. Everyone said Mother was a caring, moral person. Nietzsche wanted to be a good person, too. But good work seemed so hard, so stern, not at all like her father's work, where people smiled and laughed and talked with their hands. Thank you, Brother Nerev, Nietzsche said. I will do my best to do good in the world. One day, with the help of fine young people like you, we will change the world. I don't delude myself with so much callousness among men. It will take time to win true converts. But we here in this room, along with others of like mind throughout the land, are the foundation of hope. Is the fellowship a secret, then? Nietzsche asked in a whisper. Everyone chuckled. Brother Nariv didn't laugh, but his mouth smiled again. No, child, quite the contrary. It is our most fervent wish and duty to spread the truth of mankind's corruption... The Creator is perfect. We mortals are but miserable wretches. 
We must recognize our wicked nature if we hope to avoid his righteous wrath and reap our deliverance in the next world. Self-sacrifice for the good of all is the only route to salvation. Our fellowship is open to all those willing to give of themselves and live ethical lives. Most people don't take us seriously. Someday they will. Gleaming, mousy eyes around the room watched without blinking as his deep, powerful voice rose like the Creator's own fury. A day will come when the hot flames of change will sweep across the land, burning away the old, the decaying, and the foul, to allow a new order to grow from the blackened remains of evil. After we burn clean the world, there will be no kings, yet the world will have order championed by the hand of the common man for the common man. Only then will there be no hunger, no shivering in the cold, no suffering without help. The good of the people will be put above the selfish desires of the individual. Nietzsche wanted to do good, she truly did, but his voice sounded to her like a rusty dungeon door grating shut on her. All the eyes in the room watched her to see if she was good like her mother. That sounds wonderful, Brother Nerev. He nodded. It will be, child. You will help bring this to be. Let your feelings be your guide. You will be a soldier marching toward a new world order. It will be a long and arduous task. You must keep the faith. The rest of us in this room will not likely live to see it flourish, but perhaps you will live long enough to one day see such a wondrous order come to pass. Nietzsche swallowed. I will pray for it, Brother Narev. Chapter 11 The next day, loaded with a big basket of bread, Nietzsche was led out of the carriage along with a gaggle of other people from the fellowship to fan out and distribute bread to the needy. Mother had attired her in a ruffled red dress for the special occasion. Her short white stockings had designs stitched in red thread. Filled with pride to at last be doing good, Nietzsche marched down the garbage-strewn street armed with her basket of bread, thinking about the day when the hope of a new order could be spread to all so that all could finally rise up out of destitution and despair. Some people smiled and thanked her for the bread. Some took the bread without a word or a smile. Most, though, were surly about it, complaining that the bread was late and the loaves were too small or the wrong kind. Nietzsche was not discouraged. She told them what Mother had said, that it was the baker's fault, because he baked bread for profit first, and since he received a reduced rate for charity, baked that second. Nietzsche told them that she was sorry that wicked people treated them as second rate, but that some day the fellowship of order would come to the land and see to it that everyone was treated the same. As Nietzsche walked down the street handing out the bread, a man snatched her arm and pulled her into the stench of a narrow, dark alley. She offered him a loaf of bread. He swiped the basket out of her hands. He said he wanted silver or gold. Nietzsche told him she had no money. She gasped in panic as he yanked her close. His filthy, probing fingers groped everywhere on her body, even violating her most private places, looking for a purse, but found none hidden on her. He pulled off her shoes and threw them away when he found they had no coins hidden in them. His fist punched her twice in the stomach. Nietzsche crashed to the ground. He spat a curse at her as he stole away into the shadowed heaps of refuse. Holding herself up on trembling arms, Nietzsche vomited into the oily water running from under the mounds of offal. People passing the alley looked in and saw her retching there on the ground, but turned their eyes back to the street and hurried on their way. A few quickly darted into the alley, bent, and scooped up bread from the overturned basket before rushing off. Nietzsche panted, tears stinging her eyes, trying to get her wind back. Her knees were bleeding. Her dress was splattered with scum. When she returned home in tears, Mother smiled at seeing her. Their plight often brings tears to my eyes, too. Nietzsche shook her head, her golden locks swinging side to side, and told Mother that a man had grabbed her and hit her, demanding money. Nietzsche reached for her mother as she wailed in misery that he was a wicked, wicked man. Mother smacked her mouth. Don't you dare judge people. You are just a child. How can you presume to judge others? Stopped cold. Nietzsche was bewildered by the slap, more startling than painful. 
The rebuke stung more. But, Mother, he was cruel to me. He touched me everywhere, and then he hit me. Mother smacked her mouth again, harder the second time. I'll not have you disgrace me before Brother Narev and my friends with such insensitive talk. Do you hear? You don't know what made him do it. Perhaps he has sick children at home, and he needs money to buy medicine. Here he sees some spoiled rich child, and he finally breaks, knowing his own child has been cheated in life by the likes of you and all your fine things. You don't know what burdens life has handed the man. Don't you dare to judge people for their actions just because you are too callous and insensitive to take the time to understand them. But I think... Mother smacked her across the mouth a third time, hard enough to stagger her. You think? Thinking is a vile acid that corrodes faith. It is your duty to believe, not think. The mind of man is inferior to that of the Creator. Your thoughts, the thoughts of anyone, are worthless. As all mankind is worthless, you must have faith that the Creator has invested His goodness in those wretched souls. Feelings, not thinking, must be your guide. Faith, not thinking, must be your only path. Nietzsche swallowed back her tears. Then what should I do? You should be ashamed that the world treats those poor souls so cruelly that they would so pitifully strike out in confusion. In the future, you should find a way to help people like that because you are able and they are not. That is your duty. That night, when her father came home and tiptoed into her room to see if she was tucked in snugly, Nietzsche clutched two of his big fingers together and held them tight to her cheek. Even though her mother said he was a wicked man, it felt better than anything else in the world when he knelt beside the bed and silently stroked her brow. In her work on the streets, Nietzsche came to understand the needs of many of the people there. Their problems seemed insurmountable. No matter what she did, it never seemed to resolve anything. Brother Narev said it was only a sign that she wasn't giving enough of herself. Each time she failed, at Brother Narev's or Mother's urging, Nietzsche redoubled her efforts. One night at dinner, after being in the fellowship several years, she said, Father, there is a man I've been trying to help. He has ten children and no job. Will you hire him, please? Father looked up from his soup. Why? I told you, he has ten children. But what sort of work can he do? Why would I want him? Because he needs a job. Father set down his spoon. Nietzsche, dear, I employ skilled workers. That he has ten children is not going to shape steel now, is it? What can the man do? What skills has he? If he had a skill, father, he could get work. Is it fair that his children should starve because people won't give him a chance? Father looked at her as if inspecting a wagon load of some suspicious new metal. Mother's narrow mouth turned up in a little smile, but she said nothing. A chance? At what? He has no skill. With a business as big as yours, surely you can give him a job. He tapped a finger on the stem of his spoon as he considered her determined expression. He cleared his throat. Well, perhaps I could use a man to load wagons. He can't load wagons. He has a bad back. He hasn't been able to work for years because of his back troubling him so. Father's brow drew down. His back didn't prevent him from begetting ten children. Nietzsche wanted to do good, and so she met his stare with a steady look of her own. Must you be so intolerant, Father? You have jobs, and this man needs one. He has hungry children needing to be fed and clothed. Would you deny him a living just because he has never had a fair chance in life? Are you so rich that all your gold has blinded your eyes to the needs of humble people? But I need... Must you always frame everything in terms of what you need instead of what others need? Must everything be for you? It's a business. And what is the purpose of a business? Isn't it to employ those who need work? Wouldn't it be better if the man had a job instead of having to humiliate himself begging? Is that what you want? For him to beg rather than work? Aren't you the one who always speaks so highly of hard work? Nietzsche was firing the questions like arrows, getting them off so fast he couldn't get a word through her barrage. Mother smiled as Nietzsche rolled out words she knew by heart. Why must you reserve your greatest cruelty for the least fortunate among us? Why can't you for once think of what you can do to help instead of always thinking of money, money, money? Would it hurt you to hire a man who needs a job? Would it, Father? Would it bring your business to an end? Would that ruin you? The room echoed her noble questions. 
He stared at her as if seeing her for the first time. He looked as if real arrows had struck him. His jaw worked, but no words came out. He didn't seem able to move. He could only gape at her. Mother beamed. Well, he finally said, I guess. He picked up his spoon and stared down into his soup. Send him around, and I'll give him a job. Nietzsche swelled with a new sense of pride and power. She had never known it would be so easy to stagger her father. She had just bested his selfish nature with nothing more than goodness. Father pushed back from the table. I... I need to go back to the shop. His eyes searched the table, but he would not look at Nietzsche or Mother. I just remembered. I have some work I must see to. After he had gone, Mother said, I'm glad to see that you have chosen the righteous path, Nietzsche, instead of following his evil ways. You will never regret letting your love of mankind guide your feelings. The Creator will smile upon you. Nietzsche knew she had done the right thing, the moral thing, yet the thought that came to haunt her victory was the night her father had come into her room and silently stroked her brow as she had held two of his fingers to her cheek. The man went to work for father. Father never mentioned anything about it. His work kept him busy and away from home. Nietzsche's work took more and more of her time as well. She missed seeing that look in his eyes. She guessed she was growing up. The next spring, when Nietzsche was thirteen, she came home one day from her work at the fellowship to find a woman in the sitting room with Mother. Something about the woman's demeanor made the hair at the back of Nietzsche's neck stand on end. Both women rose as Nietzsche set aside her list of names of people needing things. Nietzsche, darling, this is Sister Alessandra. She's traveled here from the Palace of the Prophets in Tanamora. The woman was older than Mother. She had a long braid of fine brown hair looped around in a circle and pinned to the back of her skull like a loaf of braided bread. Her nose was a little too big for her face, and she was plain, but not at all ugly. Her eyes focused on Nietzsche with an unsettling intensity, and they didn't dart about the way mothers always did. Was it quite a journey, Sister Alessandra? Nietzsche asked, after she had curtsied. All the way from Tanamora, I mean? Three days is all. Sister Alessandra said. A smile grew on her face as she took in Nietzsche's bony frame. My, my, so little yet for such grown-up work. She held out a hand toward a chair. Won't you sit with us, dear? Are you a sister with the fellowship? Nietzsche asked, not really understanding who the woman was. The what? Nietzsche, Mother said. Sister Alessandra is a sister of the light. Astonished, Nietzsche dropped into a chair. Sisters of the Light had the gift, just like her and Mother. Nietzsche didn't know very much about the sisters, except that they served the Creator. That still didn't settle her stomach. To have such a woman right there in her house was intimidating, like when she stood before Brother Narod. She felt an inexplicable sense of doom. Nietzsche was also impatient because she had duties waiting. There were donations to collect. She had older sponsors who accompanied her to some of the places. For other places, they said a young girl could get better results by herself, by shaming people who had more than they deserved. Those people, who had businesses, all knew who she was. They would always stammer and ask her how her father was. As she had been instructed, Nietzsche told them how pleased her father would be to know they were thoughtful to the needy. In the end, most became civic-minded. Then there were remedies Nietzsche needed to take to women with sick children. There wasn't enough clothing for the children either. Nietzsche was trying to get some people to give cloth and other people to sew clothes. Some people had no homes. Others were crowded together in little rooms. She was trying to get some rich people to donate a building. Also, Nietzsche had been assigned the task of locating jugs for women to bring water from the well. She needed to pay a visit to the potter. Some of the older children had been caught stealing. Others had been fighting, and a few of them were beating younger children bloody. Nietzsche had been pleading on their behalf, trying to explain that they had no fair chance and were only reacting to their cruel circumstance. She hoped to convince Father to take on at least a few so they might have work. The problems just kept mounting without any end in sight. It seemed like the more people the fellowship helped, the more people there were who needed help. Nietzsche had thought she was going to solve the problems of the world. She was beginning to feel hopelessly inadequate. It was her own failing, she knew. She needed to work harder. Do you read and write, dear? the sister asked. 
Not very much, sister, mostly just names. I've much too much to do for those less fortunate than myself. Their needs must come before any selfish desires of my own. Mother smiled and nodded to herself. Practically a good spirit in the flesh, the sister's eyes teared. I've heard about your work. You have? Nietzsche felt a flash of pride, but then she thought of how things never seemed to get better, despite all her efforts and her sense of failure returned. Besides, Mother said pride was evil. I don't see what's so special about what I do. The people in the streets are the ones who are special because of their suffering in horrid conditions. They are the true inspiration. Mother smiled contentedly. Sister Alessandra leaned forward, her tone serious. Have you learned to use your gift, child? Mother teaches me to do some small things, like how to heal little troubles. But I know it would be unfair to flaunt it over those less blessed than I, so I try my best not to use it. The sister folded her hands in her lap. I've been talking to your mother while we waited for you. She's done a fine job of getting you started on the right path. We feel, however, that you would have so much more to offer were you to serve a higher calling. Nietzsche sighed. Well, all right, maybe I can get up a little earlier, but I already have my duties to the needy, and I will have to fit this other in as I can. I hope you understand, sister. I'm not trying to get undeserved sympathy, honestly I'm not, but... I hope you don't need this calling done too soon, as I'm already quite busy. Sister Alessandra smiled in a long-suffering sort of way. You don't understand, Nietzsche. We would like you to continue your work with us at the Palace of the Prophets. You would be a novice at first, of course, but one day you will be a Sister of the Light, and as such, you will carry on with what you have started. Panic welled up in Nietzsche like rising floodwaters. There were so many people who hung to life only by a thread she tended. She had friends at the fellowship whom she had come to love. She had so much to do. She didn't want to leave mother and even father. He was evil, she knew, but he wasn't evil to her. He was selfish and greedy, she knew, but he still tucked her in the bed sometimes and patted her shoulder. She was sure she would see something in his blue eyes again if she just gave it time. She didn't want to leave him. For some reason, she desperately needed to again see that spark in his eyes. She was being selfish, she knew. I have needy people here, Sister Alessandra. Nietzsche blinked at her tears. My responsibility is to them. I'm sorry, but I can't abandon them. At that moment, Father came in the door. He stopped in an awkward posture, his legs frozen in mid-stride, with his hand on the lever, staring at the sister. What's this, then? Mother stood. Howard, this is Alessandra. She's a sister of the light. She's come to... No, I'll not have it, do you hear? She's our daughter, and the sisters can't have her. Sister Alessandra stood, giving Mother a sidelong glance. Please ask your husband to leave. This is not his business. Not my business? She's my daughter. You'll not take her. He lunged forward to seize Nietzsche's outstretched hand. The sister lifted a finger, and to Nietzsche's astonishment, he was thrown back in a sparkling flash of light. Father's back slammed against the wall. He slid down, clutching his chest as he gasped for breath. Tears bursting forth, Nietzsche ran for him, but Sister Alessandra snatched her by the arm and held her back. Howard, Mother said through gritted teeth, the child is my business to raise. I carry the Creator's gift. You gave your word when our union was arranged that if we had a girl and she had the gift, I would have the exclusive authority to raise her as I saw fit. I believe this to be the right thing to do, but the Creator wants... With the sisters, she will have time to learn to read. She will have time to learn to use her gift to help people as only the sisters can. You will keep your word. I will see to this. I'm sure you have work to which you must immediately return. With the flat of his hand, he rubbed his chest. Finally, his arms dropped to his sides. Head down, he shuffled to the door. Before he pulled closed the door, his gaze met Nietzsche's. Through the tears... She saw the spark in his eyes, as if he had things to tell her. But then it was gone, and he pulled the door shut behind himself. Sister Alessandra said it would be best if they left at once, and if Nietzsche didn't see him just now. She promised that if Nietzsche followed instructions, and after she was settled, and after she had learned to read, and after she had learned to use her gift, she would see him again. Nietzsche learned to read and use her gift and mastered everything else she was supposed to master. She fulfilled all the requirements. 
She did everything expected of her. Her life as a novice to become a sister of the light was numbingly selfless. Sister Alessandra forgot her promise. She was not pleased to be reminded of it and found more work that Nietzsche needed to do. Several years after she had been taken to the palace, Nietzsche again saw Brother Narev. She came across him quite by accident. He was working as a stable hand at the Palace of the Prophets. He smiled his slow smile while his eyes fixed on her. He told her that he had gotten the idea to go to the palace by her example. He said he wished to live long enough to see order come to the world. She thought it an odd occupation for him. He said that he found working for the sisters morally superior to contributing his labor to the evil of profit. He said it mattered not if she chose to tell anyone at the palace anything about him or his work for the fellowship, but he asked her not to tell the sisters that he was gifted, since they would not allow him to continue to stay and work in the stables if they knew, and he would refuse to serve them should they discover his gift, because, he said, he wanted to serve the Creator in his own quiet way. Nietzsche honored his secret, not so much out of any sense of loyalty, but mostly because she was kept far too busy with her studies and work to concern herself with Brother Narev and his fellowship. She rarely had occasion to see him mucking out horse stalls, and as his importance in her childhood had faded into her past, she never really even gave him a second thought. The palace had work they wished her to put her attention to, much the same sort of work Brother Narev would have approved of. Only many years later did she come to discover his real reasons for having been at the Palace of the Prophets. Sister Alessandra saw to it that Nietzsche was kept busy. She was allowed no time for such selfish indulgences as going home for a visit. Twenty-seven years after she had been taken away to become a Sister of the Light, still a novice, Nietzsche again saw her father. It was at his funeral. Mother had sent word for Nietzsche to return home to see father because he was in failing health. Nietzsche immediately rushed home, accompanied by Sister Alessandra. By the time Nietzsche arrived, father was already dead. Mother said that for several weeks he had been begging her to send for his daughter. She sighed and said she put it off, thinking he would get better. Besides, she said, she hadn't wanted to disturb Nietzsche's important work, not for such a trivial matter. She said it had been the only thing he asked for, to see Nietzsche. Mother thought that was silly, since he was a man who didn't care about people. Why should he need to see anyone? He died alone, while Mother was out helping the victims of an uncaring world. By that time, Nietzsche was forty. Mother, though, still thinking of Nietzsche as a young woman, because under the spell at the palace she had aged only enough to look to be maybe fifteen or sixteen, told her to wear a pretty, brightly colored dress, because it wasn't really a sad occasion after all. Nietzsche stood looking at the body for a long time. Her chance to see his blue eyes again was forever lost. For the first time in years, the pain made her feel something down deep inside. It felt good to feel something again, even if it was pain. As Nietzsche stood looking at her father's sunken face, Sister Alessandra told Nietzsche that she was sorry she had to take her away, but that in her whole life, she had not encountered a woman with the gift as powerful as it was in Nietzsche, and that such a thing as the Creator had given her was not to be wasted. Nietzsche said she understood. Since she had ability, it was only right that she use it to help those in need. At the Palace of the Prophets, Nietzsche was said to be the most selfless, caring novice they had under their roof. Everyone pointed to her and told the younger novices to look to Nietzsche's example. Even the prelate had commended her. The praise was but a buzz in her ear. It was an injustice to be better than others. Try as she might, Nietzsche could not escape her father's legacy of excellence. His taint coursed through her veins, oozed from every pore, and infected everything she did. The more selfless she was, the more it only confirmed her superiority and thus her wickedness. She knew that could mean only one thing. She was evil. Try not to remember him like this, Sister Alessandra said after a long silence as they stood before the body. Try to remember what he was like when he was alive. I can't, Nietzsche said. I never knew him when he was alive. Mother and her friends at the fellowship ran the business. She wrote Nietzsche joyful letters, telling her how she had put many of the needy to work at the armorers. She said the business could afford it, with all the wealth it had accumulated. Mother was proud that that wealth could now be put to a moral use. She said father's death had been a cloaked blessing, 
because it meant help at last for those who had always deserved it most. It was all part of the Creator's plan, she said. Mother had to raise her prices in order to pay the wages of all the people she'd given work. A lot of the older workers left. Mother said she was glad they were gone because they had uncooperative attitudes. Orders fell behind. Suppliers began demanding to be paid before delivering goods. Mother discontinued having the armor proofed because the new workers complained that it was an unfair standard to be held to. They said they were trying their best, and that was what counted. Mother sympathized. The battering mill had to be sold. Some of the customers stopped ordering armor and weapons. Mother said they would be better off without such intolerant people. She sought new laws from the Duke to require work to be spread out equally, but the laws were slow in coming. The few remaining customers hadn't paid their account for quite a while, but promised to catch up. In the meantime, their goods were shipped, if late. Within six months of father dying, the business failed. The vast fortune he had built over a lifetime was gone. Some of the skilled workers once hired by father moved on, hoping to find work at armories in distant places. Most men who stayed could find only menial work. They were lucky to have that. Many of the new workers demanded mother do something. She and the fellowship petitioned other businesses to take them on. Some business tried to help, but most were in no position to hire workers. The armory had been the largest employer in the area and drew many other people employed in other occupations. Other businesses, like traders, smaller suppliers, and cargo carriers, who had depended on the armory, failed for lack of work. Businesses in the city, everything from bakers to butchers, lost customers and were reluctantly forced to let men go. Mother asked the Duke to speak with the King. The Duke said the King was considering the problem. Like her father's armory, other buildings were abandoned as people left to find work in thriving cities elsewhere. Squatters, at the Fellowship's urging, took over many of the abandoned buildings. The empty places became the sites of robberies and even murders. Many a woman who went near those places regretted it. Mother couldn't sell the weapons from her closed armory, so she gave them to the needy so they might protect themselves. Despite her efforts, crime only increased. In honor of all her good work and her father's service to the government, the king granted mother a pension that allowed her to stay in the house with a reduced staff. She continued her work with the fellowship, trying to right all the injustice that she believed was responsible for the failure of the business. She hoped one day to reopen the shop and employ people. For her righteous work, the king awarded her a silver medal, Mother wrote that the king proclaimed she was as close to a good spirit in the flesh as he had ever seen. Nietzsche regularly received word of awards Mother was given for her selfless work. Eighteen years later, when Mother died, Nietzsche still looked like a young woman of perhaps seventeen. She wanted a fine black dress to wear to the funeral, the finest available. The palace said that it was unseemly for a novice to make such a selfish request, and it was out of the question. They said they would supply only simple, humble clothes. When Nietzsche arrived home, she went to the tailor to the king and told him that for her mother's funeral she needed the finest black dress he had ever made. He told her the price. She informed him she had no money, but said she needed the dress anyway. The tailor, a man with three chins, waxy down, growing from his ears, abnormally long yellowish fingernails, and an unfailing lecherous smirk, said there were things he needed, too. He leaned close, lightly holding her smooth arm in his knobby fingers, and intimated that if she would take care of his needs, he would take care of hers. Nietzsche wore the finest black dress ever made to her mother's funeral. Mother had been a woman who had devoted her entire life to the needs of others. Nietzsche could never again look forward to seeing her mother's cockroach-brown eyes. Unlike at her father's funeral, Nietzsche felt no pain reach down to touch that abysmal place inside her. Nietzsche knew she was a terrible person. For the first time, she realized that for some reason, she simply no longer cared. From that day on, Nietzsche never wore any dress but black. One hundred and twenty-three years later, standing at the railing overlooking the great hall, Nietzsche saw eyes that stunned her with their sense of an inner value held dear. But what had been an uncertain ember in her father's eyes was a blaze in Richard's. She still didn't know what it was. She knew only that it was the difference between life and death, and that she had to destroy him. Now at long last, she knew how. 
If only when she had been little, someone had shown her father such mercy. Chapter 12 Trudging down the road between the edge of the city of Fairfield and the estate where the three sisters had told her Emperor Jagang had set up his residence, Nietzsche scanned the surrounding jumble of the Imperial Order's encampment, looking for a specific station of tents. She knew they would be somewhere in the area. Jagang liked to have them close at hand. Regular sleeping tents, wagons, and men lay like a dark soot over the fields and hills as far as she could see. Sky and land alike seemed tinted by a dusky taint. Sprinkled through the dark fields, campfires twinkled like a sky full of stars. The day was becoming oppressively dim, not only with the approach of evening, but also from the dull overcast of churning gray clouds. The wind kicked up in little fits, setting tents and clothes flapping, fluttering the campfire's flames, and whipping smoke this way and that. The gusts helped coat the tongue with a fetid stench of human and animal waste, smothering any pleasant but weak cooking aroma that struggled to take to the air. The longer the army stayed in place, the worse it would get. Up ahead, the elegant buildings of the estate rose above the dark crime at its feet. Jagang was there. Because he had access to sisters Georgia, Rochelle, and Aubrey's minds, he would know Nietzsche was back. He would be waiting for her. The emperor would have to wait. She had something else to do first. Without Jagang able to enter her mind, she was free to pursue it. Nietzsche saw what she was looking for off in the distance. She could just make them out, standing above the smaller tents. She left the road and headed through the crowded snarl of troops. Even from the distance, she could distinguish the distinctive sounds coming from the group of special tents, hear it over the laughing and singing, the crackle of fires, the sizzle of meat and skillets, the scraping rasp of whetstones on metal, the ring of hammers on steel, and the rhythm of saws. Boisterous men grabbed at her arms and legs or tried to snatch her dress as she marched along, picking her way through the disorder. The rowdy soldiers were but a minor consideration. She simply pulled away, ignoring their mocking calls of love as she made her way through the throng. When a husky soldier seized her wrist in his powerful grip, yanking her around to a jerking halt, she paused only long enough to loose her power and burst his beating heart within his chest. Other men laughed when they saw him collapse to the ground with a thud, not yet realizing he was dead, but none tried to claim his intended prize. She heard the words, Death's Mistress, pass in whispers among the men. She finally made her way through the gauntlet. Soldiers played dice, ate beans, or snored in their bedrolls beside the tents, where captives screamed under the agony of torture. Two men lugged a corpse, dragging some of its innards out of a big tent, they threw the flaccid form in a wagon with a tangle of others. Nietzsche snapped her fingers at an unshaven soldier coming from the direction of another tent. Let me see the list, Captain. She knew he was the officer in charge by the blue canvas cover of the register book he carried. He scowled at her a moment, but when he glanced down at her black dress, a look of recognition came over his face. He passed her the grubby, rumpled book. It had a deep crease across the middle as if someone had accidentally sat on it. The pages that had fallen out had been pushed back in, but they never fit right, and their edges stuck out here and there to become frayed and filthy. Not much to report, mistress, but please let His Excellency know that we've tried just about every skill known, and she isn't talking. Nietzsche opened the book and began scanning the list of recent names and what was known about them. Her? Who are you talking about, Captain? She mumbled as she read. Why, the Mord Sith, of course. Nietzsche turned her eyes up toward the man. The Mord Sith, of course. Where is she? He pointed at a tent a ways off through the disarray. I know His Excellency said he didn't expect a witch of her dark talents to give us any information about Lord Rall, but I was hoping to surprise him with good news. He hooked his thumbs behind his belt as he let out a sigh of frustration. No such luck. Nietzsche eyed the tent for a moment. She heard no screams. She had never before seen one of those women, the Mord Sith, but she knew a little about them. She knew that using magic against one was a deadly mistake. She went back to reading the entries in the register. There was nothing of much interest to her. Most of the people were from around here. They were merely a sampling collected to check what they might know. 
they would not have the information she wanted. Nietzsche tapped a line near the end of the writing in the book. It said, Messenger. Where is this one? The captain tilted his head, indicating a tent behind him. I put one of my best questioners with him. Last I checked, there was nothing from him yet. But that was early this morning. It had been all day since he had checked. All day could be an eternity under torture. Like all the rest of the tents used for questioning prisoners, the one with the messenger stood above the surrounding field tents, which were only large enough for soldiers to lie in. Nietzsche pushed the book at the officer's thick gut. Thank you, that will be all. You'll be giving His Excellency a report then? Nietzsche nodded absently at his question. Her mind was already elsewhere. You'll tell him that there is little to be learned from this lot? No one was eager to stand before Jagang and admit they were unable to accomplish a task, even if there was nothing to accomplish. Jagang did not appreciate excuses. Nietzsche nodded as she strode away, heading for the tent holding the messenger. I'll be seeing him shortly. I'll give him the report for you, Captain. As soon as she threw back the flap and entered, she saw that she was too late. The messy remains of the messenger lay on a narrow wooden table, affixed with glistening tools of the trade. The messenger's arms hung down off the sides, dripping warm blood. Nietzsche saw that the questioner had a folded piece of paper. What have you there? He held up the paper and flashed her a grin. Something His Excellency will be very pleased to hear about. I've got a map. A map of what? Where this fellow's been. I drew it all out from what he volunteered. He laughed at his own humor. She didn't. Really, Nietzsche said. The man's grin was what had her attention. A man like this only grinned when he had something he'd been seeking, something to bring him favor in the eyes of his superiors. And where has the man been? to see his leader. He waved the paper like a treasure map. Tired of the game, Nietzsche snatched the booty from his hand. She unfolded the wrinkled yellow paper and saw that it was indeed a map with rivers, the coastline, and mountains all meticulously drawn out. Even mountain passes were noted. Nietzsche could tell that the map was authentic. When she had lived at the Palace of the Prophets, the New World was a far-off and mysterious place, rarely visited by anyone but a few sisters. Any sister who ventured there always kept exacting records that were added to maps at the palace. Along with many other esoteric items, all novices memorized those maps in the course of their studies. Even though at the time she had never expected to travel to the New World, she was thoroughly familiar with the lay of the land there. Nietzsche scrutinized the paper in her hands, carefully surveying the geography, overlaying everything on it that was new onto the memorized map in her mind. The soldier pointed a thick finger at a single bloody fingerprint on the map. That there is where Lord Rahl himself is hiding, on that dot in those mountains. Nietzsche's breath paused. She stared at the paper, burning the line of every stream and river, every mountain, every road, trail, and mountain pass, every village, town, and city into her memory. What did this man confess before he died? She looked up. His Excellency is waiting for my report. I was just on my way to see him. She snapped her fingers impatiently. Let's have it all. The man scratched his beard. His fingernails were crusted with dried blood. You'll tell him, won't you? You'll tell His Excellency that Sergeant Wetzel was the one who got the information out of the messenger? Of course, Nietzsche assured him. You will receive full credit. I have no need of such recognition. She tapped the gold ring through her lower lip. The Emperor is always, every moment of every day, in my mind. He no doubt this very moment sees through my eyes that you, not I, are the one who succeeded in getting the information. Now, what did this man confess? Sergeant Wetzel scratched his beard again, apparently trying to decide if he could trust her to credit him, or if he should be sure and take the information to Jigang. There was little trust among those in the Imperial Order, and good reason to distrust everyone. As he scratched his beard, flakes of dried blood stuck in its curly hair. Nietzsche stared into his red-rimmed eyes. He smelled of liquor. If you don't report everything to me, Sergeant Wetzel, and I mean right now, I will have you up on that table next, and I will have your report between your screens. And when I'm done with you... They will throw you in the wagon with the rest of the corpses. He dipped his head twice in surrender. 
Of course, I only wanted to be sure His Excellency knew of my success. When Nietzsche nodded, he went on. He was just a messenger. We had a small unit of six men doing deep scouting patrol. They went on a circle far to the north around any enemy forces. They had one of the gifted women with them to help them remain at a good distance so they wouldn't be detected. They were somewhere northwest of the enemy force when by chance they came across this man. They brought him back for me to question. I discovered he was one of a number of regular messengers sent back and forth to report to Lord Rao. Nietzsche waggled a finger at the paper. But this down here looks like the enemy force. Are you saying rich Lord Rao isn't with his men, with his army? That's right. The messenger didn't know why. His only duty was to carry troop positions and regular news of their condition to his master. He tapped the map in her hand. But right here is where Lord Rao is hiding, along with his wife. Nietzsche looked up, her mouth falling open. Wife? Sergeant Wetzel nodded. The man said Lord Rahl married some woman known as the Mother Confessor. She's hurt, and they're hiding way up there in those mountains. Nietzsche remembered Richard's feelings for her, and her name, Kalin. Richard being married put everything in a new light. It had the potential to disrupt Nietzsche's plans. Or anything else, Sergeant. The man said Lord Rahl and his wife have one of them women, them moored Sith, guarding them. Why are they up there? Why aren't Lord Rahl and the Mother Confessor with their army, or back in Aidendrill, or in Dahara, for that matter? He shook his head. This messenger was just a low-ranking soldier who knew how to ride fast and read the lay of the land. That's all he knew. They're up there, and they're all alone. Nietzsche was puzzled by such a development. Anything else? Anything at all? He shook his head. She laid her hand on the man's back between his shoulder blades. Thank you, Sergeant Wetzel. You have been more help than you will ever know. As he grinned, Nietzsche released a flow of power that shot up through his spine and instantly incinerated his brain inside his skull. He dropped with a crash to the hard ground, the air fleeing his lungs in a grunt. Nietzsche held up the map she had committed to memory and with her gift set it aflame. The paper crackled and blackened as the fire advanced across the rivers and cities and mountains all carefully drawn out on it until the hot glow surrounded the bloody fingerprint over a dot in the mountains. She let the paper rise from her fingers as it was consumed in a final puff of smoke. Ash, like black snow, drifted down onto the body at her feet. Outside the tent where the moored Sith was held, Nietzsche cast a wary gaze across the surrounding camp to see if anyone was watching. No one was paying any attention to the business of the torture tents. She slipped in through the opening. Nietzsche winced at the sight of the woman laid out on the wooden table. She finally made herself draw a breath. A soldier, his hands red from his work, scowled at Nietzsche. She didn't wait for him to object, but simply commanded, Report. Not a word from her, he growled. Nietzsche nodded and placed her hand on the soldier's broad back. Wary of her hand, he began to step away from it, but he was too late. The man fell dead before he knew he was in trouble. Had she the time, she would have made him suffer first. Nietzsche made herself step up to the table and looked down into the blue eyes. The woman's head trembled slightly. Use your power to hurt me, witch. A small smile touched Nietzsche's lips. To the bitter end, you would fight, wouldn't you? Use your magic, witch. I think not. You see, I know a bit about you women. Defiance blazed up from the blue eyes. You know nothing. Oh, but I do. Richard told me. You would know him as your Lord Rahl, but he was for a time my student. I know that women like you have the ability to capture the power of the gifted if that power is used against you. Then you can turn it against us. So you see, I know better than to use my power on you. The woman looked away. Then torture me if that is what you came to do. You will learn nothing. I'm not here to torture you, Nietzsche assured her. Then what do you want? Let me introduce myself, Nietzsche said. I am death's mistress. The woman's blue eyes turned back, betraying for the first time a glint of hope. Good. Kill me. I need you to tell me some things. I'll not tell you anything. It was a struggle for her to speak. 
Not anything. Kill me. Nietzsche picked up a bloody blade from the table and held it before the blue eyes. I think you will. The woman smiled. Go ahead. It will only hasten my death. I know how much a person can take. I am not far from the spirit world. But no matter what you do, I'll not talk before I die. You misunderstand. I do not wish you to betray your Lord Rahl. Didn't you hear your questioner hit the ground? If you turn your head a little more, perhaps you can see that the man who did this to you is now dead. I don't wish you to tell me any secrets. The woman glanced as best she could toward the body on the ground. Her brow twitched. What do you mean? Nietzsche noticed that she didn't ask to be freed. She knew she was well past the point of hope to live. The only thing she could hope for now was for Nietzsche to end her agony. Richard was my student. He told me that he was once a captive of the moored Sith. Now that's not a secret, is it? No. That's what I want to know about. What is your name? The woman turned her face away. Nietzsche put a finger to the woman's chin and turned her head back. I have an offer to make you. I won't ask you anything secret that you aren't supposed to tell. I'll not ask you to betray your Lord Rahl. I wouldn't want you to. Those are not the things that are of interest to me. If you cooperate, Nietzsche held up the blade again for the woman to see, I will end it quickly for you. I promise. No more torture, no more pain, just the final embrace of death. The woman's lips began trembling. Please, she whispered, the hope returning to her eyes. Please, kill me. What is your name? Nietzsche asked. Nietzsche, for the most part, was numb to sights of torture, but this she found disturbing. She avoided looking away from the woman's face down at the naked body so as not to have to consider what had been done to her. Nietzsche could not imagine how this woman could keep from screaming or even how she was able to speak. Hanya. The woman's hands and ankles were shackled to the table, so she was unable to move much other than her head. She stared up into Nietzsche's eyes. Will you kill me? Please. I will, Hanya, I promise, quickly and efficiently, if you tell me what I want to know. I can't tell you anything. In despair, Hanya seemed to sag against the table, knowing her ordeal was to go on. I won't. I only want to know about when Richard was a captive. Did you know he was once a captive of the Mord Sith? Of course. I want to know about it. Why? Because I want to understand him. Hanya's head rocked side to side. She actually smiled. None of us understands Lord Rahl. He was tortured, but he never took revenge. We don't understand him. I don't either, but I hope to. My name is Nietzsche. I want you to know that. I'm Nietzsche, and I'm going to deliver you from this, Hanya. Tell me about it, please. I need to know. Do you know the woman who captured him? Her name? The woman considered for a moment before she spoke, as if testing in her own mind whether or not the information was in any way secret or could in any way harm him. Dena, Hanya whispered at last. Dena. Richard killed her in order to escape. He already told me that much. Did you know Dena before she died? Yes. I'm not asking anything of secret military importance, am I? Hanya hesitated. She finally shook her head. So you knew Dena. And did you know Richard at the time, when he was there and she had him? Did you know he was her captain? We all knew. Why is that? Lord Rahl, the Lord Rahl at the time. Richard's father. Yes, he wanted Dena to be the one to train Richard to prepare him to answer without hesitation whatever questions Dark and Rawl asked him. She was the best at what we do. Good. Now, tell me everything about it. Everything you know. Hanya drew a shaky breath. It took a moment before she spoke again. I won't betray him. I am experienced at what is being done to me. You cannot trick me. I will not betray Lord Rahl just to spare myself this. I have not endured this much to betray him now. I promise not to ask anything about the present, about the war, 
anything that would betray him to Jagang. If I tell you only about when Denna had him, and not about now, about the war, or where he is, or anything else, do you give me your word that you will end it for me, that you will kill me? I give you my word, Hanya. I wouldn't ask you to betray your Lord Rao. I know him and have too much respect for him to ask that of you. All I wish is to understand him for personal reasons. I was his teacher last winter, instructing him in the use of his gift. I want to understand him better. I need to understand him. I believe I can help him if I do. And then you will help me. There was a shimmer of hope along with the tears. You will kill me then? This woman could aspire to nothing more now. It was all that was left to her in this life. A quick death to finally end the pain. Just as soon as you're finished telling me all about it, I will end your suffering, Hanya. Do you swear it by your hope to an eternity in the underworld, in the warmth of the Creator's light? Nietzsche felt a sharp shiver of pain wail up from her very soul. She had started out near to 170 years before, wanting nothing but to help, and yet she could not escape the fate of her evil nature. She was death's mistress. She was a fallen woman. She ran the side of a finger down Hanya's soft cheek. The two women shared a long and intimate look. I promise, Nietzsche whispered, quick and efficient. It will be the end of your pain. Tears overflowing her eyes, Hanya gave a little nod. Chapter 13 The estate was a grand place, she supposed, Nietzsche had seen grandeur such as this before. She had also seen much greater majesty, to be sure. She had lived among such splendor for nearly one and three-quarter centuries, among the imposing columns and arches of immaculate rooms, the intricately carved stone vines and buttery smooth wood paneling, the feather beds and silk coverlets, the exquisite carpets and rich draperies, the silver and gold ornamentation, and the bright sparkle of windows made of colored glass composed into epic scenes. The sisters there offered Nietzsche bright-eyed smiles and clever conversation. The extravagance meant no more to her than the rubble of the streets, the cold, wet blankets laid on rough ground, the beds made in the slime among greasy runnels, in the muck of narrow alleys with nothing but the bitter sky overhead. The huddled people there never offered a smile, but gaped up at her with hollow eyes like so many pigeons cooing for alms. Some of her life was spent among splendor, some among garbage. Some people were fated to spend their lives in one place, some in the other, she in both. Nietzsche reached for the silver handle on one of the ornate double doors flanked by two husky soldiers who had probably been raised in a sty with the hogs and saw that her hand was covered in blood. She turned and casually wiped the hand on the filthy blood-stained fleece vest worn by one of the men. The biceps of his folded arms were nearly as thick as her waist. Although he scowled as she cleaned her hand on him, he made no move to stop her. After all, it wasn't as if she were defiling him. Hanya had kept her part of the bargain. Nietzsche rarely resorted to using a weapon. She usually used her gift. But of course, in this case, that would have been a mistake. When she had held the knife over her throat, Hanya had whispered her thanks for what Nietzsche was about to do. It was the first time anyone had ever thanked Nietzsche before she had killed them. Few people ever thanked Nietzsche for the help she provided. She was able, they were not. It was her duty to serve their needs. When she had finished cleaning her hand on the mute guard, she flashed an empty smile at his dark, glaring visage and then went on through the doors into a stately reception hall. A row of tall windows lining one wall of the room was trimmed with wheat-colored drapes. Near their tasseled edges, the curtains sparkled in the lamplight as if they might be embellished with gold thread. Late summer rain spattered against tightly shut glass panes that revealed only darkness outside but reflected the activity inside. The pale wool carpets, graced with flowers painstakingly sculpted in relief by means of different length yarn, were tracked with mud. Scouts came and went along with messengers and soldiers giving their reports to some of the officers. Other officers barked orders. Soldiers carrying rolled maps followed a few of the higher-ranking men as they meandered around the stuffy room. 
One of the maps lay unrolled across a narrow table. The table's silver candelabrum had been set aside on the floor beside the table. As Nietzsche passed the table, she glanced down and saw that it was missing many of the elements so carefully marked on the map drawn by the Daharan messenger. On the map laid out over the narrow table, there was nothing but dark splotches from spilled ale in the area of the northwest. In the map etched in Nietzsche's mind, there were the mountains, rivers, high passes and streams there, and a dot, marking the place where Richard was, along with his mother confessor bride and the moored Sith. Officers talked among themselves, some standing about, some half-sitting on iron-legged, marble-topped tables, some lounging in padded leather chairs as they took delicacies from silver trays borne on the trembling hands of sweating servants. Others swilled ale from tall pewter mugs, and yet others drank wine from dainty glasses, all acting as if they were intimate with such splendor, and all of them looking as out of place as toads at tea. An older woman, Sister Lidmilla, apparently trying to be unobtrusive by cowering in the shadows beside the drapes, snapped upright when she saw Nietzsche marching across the room. Sister Lidmilla stepped out of the shadows, briefly pausing to smooth her dingy skirts, an act that could not possibly produce any noticeable improvement. Sister Lidmilla once had told Nietzsche that things learned in youth never left you and were often much easier to recall than yesterday's dinner. Rumor had it that the old sister, skilled in arcane spells known to only the most powerful sorceresses, had many interesting things from her youth to recall. Sister Lidmilla's leathery skin was stretched so tight over the bones of her skull that she reminded Nietzsche of nothing so much as an exhumed corpse. As cadaverous-looking as the aged sister was, she advanced across the room in quick, sharp movements. When she was only ten feet away, Sister Lidmilla waved an arm as if not sure Nietzsche would see her. Sister Nietzsche, Sister Nietzsche, there you are. She seized Nietzsche's wrist. Come along, dear, come along. His Excellency is waiting for you. This way, come along. Nietzsche clasped the sister's tugging hand. Lead the way, Sister Lidmilla. I'm right behind you. The older woman smiled over her shoulder. It wasn't a pleasant or joyous smile, but one of relief. Jagang punished anyone who displeased him, regardless of their culpability. What took you so long, Sister Nietzsche? His Excellency is in quite a state he is because of you. Where have you been? I had business I had to attend to. The woman had to take two or three steps for every one of Nietzsche's. Business, indeed. Were it up to me, I'd have you down in the kitchen scrubbing pots for being off on a lark when you are wanted. Sister Lidmilla was frail and forgetful, and she sometimes failed to realize she was no longer at the Palace of the Prophets. Jagang used her to fetch people or to wait for them and show them the way, usually to his tents. Should she forget the way, he could always correct her route if need be. It amused him to use a venerable sister of the light, a sorceress reputedly possessing knowledge of the most esoteric incantations as nothing more than an errand girl. Away from the palace and its spell that slowed aging, Sister Lidmilla was in a sudden headlong rush toward the grave. All the sisters were. The round-backed sister, her dangling arms swinging, shuffled along in front of Nietzsche, pulling her by her hand, leading her through grand rooms, up stairways, and down hallways. At a doorway framed in gold-leafed moldings, she finally paused, touching her fingers to her lower lip as she caught her breath. Sober soldiers prowling the hall painted Nietzsche with glares as dark as her dress. She recognized the men as imperial guards. Here it is, Sister Lidmill appeared up at Nietzsche. His Excellency is in his rooms. Hurry then, go on, go on now. She swirled her hands as if she were trying to herd livestock. In you go. Before entering, Nietzsche took her hand from the lever and turned back to the old woman. Sister Lidmilla. You once told me that you thought I would be the one best suited for some of the knowledge you had to pass on. Sister Lidmilla's face brightened with a sly smile. Ah, some of the more occult magic interests you at long last, Sister Nietzsche? Nietzsche had never before been interested in what Sister Lidmilla had occasionally pestered her to learn. Magic was a selfish pursuit. Nietzsche learned what she had to, but never went out of her way to go beyond, to the more unusual spells. Yes, as a matter of fact, I believe I am at last ready. 
I always told the prelate that you were the only one at the palace with the power for the conjuring I know. The woman leaned close. Dangerous conjuring it is, too. It should be passed on while you are able. Sister Lidmilla nodded with satisfaction. I believe you are old enough. I could show you. When? I will come see you tomorrow. Nietzsche glanced toward the door. I don't believe I will be able to take a lesson tonight. Tomorrow, then. If I do come around to see you, I will be most eager to learn. I especially wish to know about the maternity spell. From what Nietzsche knew of it, the oddly named maternity spell might be just what she needed. It had the further advantage that once invoked, it was inviolate. Sister Lidmilla straightened and again touched her fingers to her lower lip. A look of concern crossed her face. My, my, that one is it. Well, yes, I could teach you. You have the ability. Few do. I'd trust none but you to be able to bring such a thing to life. It requires tremendous power of the gift. You have that. As long as you understand and are willing to accept the cost involved, I can teach you. Nietzsche nodded. I will come when I can, then. The old sister ambled on down the hall, deep in thought, already thinking about the lesson. Nietzsche didn't know if she would live to take the lesson. After she had watched the old sister vanish around the corner, Nietzsche entered a quiet room lit by myriad candles and lamps. The high ceiling was edged with a painted leaf and acorn design. Plush couches and chairs upholstered in muted browns were set about on thick carpets of rich yellows, oranges, and reds, making them look like a forest floor in the autumn. Heavy drapes had been pulled closed across an expanse of windows. Two sisters sitting on a couch leaped to their feet. Sister Nietzsche, one virtually shouted in relief. The other ran to the double doors at the other side of the room and opened one without knocking, apparently by instruction. She stuck her head into the room beyond to speak in a low voice Nietzsche couldn't hear. The sister leaped back when Jagang in the inner room roared, Get out! All of you! Everyone else out! Two more young sisters, no doubt personal attendants to the emperor, burst out of the room. Nietzsche had to step out of the way as all four gifted women made for the doorway leading out of the apartment. A young man Nietzsche hadn't noticed in the corner joined the women. None even glanced in Nietzsche's direction as they rushed to do as they were ordered. The first lesson you learned as a slave to Jagang was that when he told you to do something, he meant you to do it right now. Little provoked him more than delay. At the door to the inner room, a woman Nietzsche didn't recognize ran out, following close on the heels of the others. She was young and beautiful, with dark hair and eyes, probably a captive picked up somewhere along the long march, and no doubt used for Jagang's amusement. Her eyes reflected a world gone mad for her. Such were the unavoidable costs if the world was to be brought to a state of order. Great leaders, by their very nature, came with shortcomings in character, which they themselves viewed as mere peccadilloes. The far-ranging benefits Jagang would bring to the poor, suffering masses of humanity far outweighed his crass acts of personal gratification and the relatively petty havoc he wrought. Nietzsche was often the object of his transgressions. It was a price worth paying for the help that would eventually accrue to the helpless. That was the only matter that could be considered. The outer door closed, and the apartment was finally empty of everyone but Nietzsche and the Emperor. She stood erect, head held high, arms at her sides, relishing the quiet of the palace. The splendor meant little to her, but quiet was a luxury she had come to appreciate, even if it was selfish. In the tents there was always the noise of the army pressed close around. Here it was quiet. She glanced around the spacious and elaborately decorated outer room, contemplating the idea that Jagang would have acquired the taste for such places. Perhaps he, too, simply wanted quiet. She turned back to the inner room. He was just inside, waiting, watching her, a muscled mass of fury coiled in rage. She strode directly up to him. You wish to see me, Excellency? Nietzsche felt a stunning pain as the back of his beefy hand whipped across her face. The blow spun her around. Her knees hit the floor. He yanked her to her feet by her hair. The second time... She clouted the wall before crashing to the floor again. Stupefying pain throbbed through her face. 
When she had her bearings, she got her legs under her and stood before him again. The third time, she took a free-standing candelabrum down with her. Candles tumbled and rolled across the floor. A long wisp of sheer curtain she had snatched as she grabbed for support ripped away and drifted down over her as she and an upturned table slammed to the floor. Glass shattered. Metal clattered as small items bounded away. She was dizzy and stunned, her vision faltering. Her eyes felt as if they might have burst, her jaw as if it had been shattered, her neck as if the muscles had ripped. Nietzsche lay sprawled on the floor, savoring the strident waves of pain, wallowing in the rare sensation of feeling. She saw blood splattered across the light fringe of the carpet beneath her and across the warm glow of wooden flooring. She heard Jagang yelling something at her, but she couldn't make out the words over the ringing in her ears. With a shaky arm, she pushed herself up onto her hip. Blood warmed her fingers when she touched them to her mouth. She relished the hurt. It had been so long since she had felt anything, except for that too brief moment with the moored Sith. This was a glorious wash of agony. Jagang's brutality was able to reach down into the abyss, not only because of the cruelty itself, but because she knew she need not suffer it. He, too, knew that she was there by her choice, not his. That only intensified his anger, and thus her sensations. His rage seemed lethal. She merely noted the fact that she very probably wouldn't leave the room alive. She would probably not get to learn Sister Lidmilla's spells. Nietzsche simply waited to discover what fate had already decided for her. The room's spinning finally slowed enough for her to once more make it to her feet. She pulled herself up straight before the silent, brawny form of Emperor Jagang. His shaved head reflected points of light from some of the lamps. His only facial hair was a two-inch braid of mustache growing above each corner of his mouth and another in the center under his lower lip. The gold ring through his left nostril and its thin gold chain running to another ring in his left ear glimmered in the mellow lamplight. Except for a heavy ring on each finger, he was without the plundered assortment of royal chains and jewels he usually wore around his neck. The rings glistened with her blood. He was bare-chested, but unlike his head, his chest was covered in coarse hair. His muscles bulged, their tendons standing out as he flexed his fists. He had the neck of a bull, and his temperament was worse. Nietzsche, half a head shy of his height, stood before him, waiting, looking into the eyes she used to see in her nightmares. They were a murky gray, without whites, and clouded over with sullen, dusky shapes that stole across a surface of inky obscurity. Even though they had no evident iris and pupil, nothing but seeming dark voids where a normal person had eyes, she never had any doubt whatsoever as to when he was looking at her. They were the eyes of a dreamwalker. A dreamwalker denied access to her mind. Now she understood why. Well, he growled. He threw up his hands. Cry, yell, scream, beg, argue, make excuses. Don't just stand there. Nietzsche swallowed back the sharp taste of blood as she gazed placidly into his scarlet glare. Please be specific, Excellency, as to which you would prefer, how long I should carry on, and if I should end it of my own accord or wait for you to beat me into unconsciousness. He lunged at her with a howl of fury. He seized her throat in his massive fist to hold her as he struck her. Her knees buckled, but he held her up until she was able to steady herself. He released her throat with a shove. I want to know why you did that to Kadar. She offered only a bloody smile to his anger. He wrenched her arm behind her back and pulled her heart against him. Why would you do such a thing? Why? The deadly dance with Jagang had begun. She dimly wondered again if this time she would lose her life. Jagang had killed a number of the sisters who had displeased him. Nietzsche's safety with him, such as it was, lay in her very indifference to her safety. Her utter disinterest in her own life fascinated Jagang, because he knew it was sincere. Sometimes you're a fool, she said with true contempt, too arrogant to see what is in front of your nose. He twisted her arm until she thought it surely would snap. His panting breath was warm on her throbbing cheek. 
I've killed people for saying much less than that. She mocked him through the pain. Do you intend to bore me to death, then? If you want to kill me, seize me by the throat and strangle me, or slash me to a bloody mess so that I will bleed to death at your feet? Don't think you can suffocate me with the sheer weight of your monotonous threats. If you wish to kill me, then be a man and do so, or else shut your mouth. The mistake most people made with Jagang was to believe, because of his capacity for such profound brutality, that he was an ignorant, dumb brute. He was not. He was one of the most intelligent men Nietzsche had ever met. Brutality was but his cloak. As an outgrowth of his access to the thoughts of so many different people's minds, he was directly exposed to their knowledge, wisdom, and ideas. Such exposure augmented his intellect. He also knew what people most feared. If anything about him frightened her, it was not his brutality, but his intelligence, for she knew that intelligence could be a bottomless well of truly inventive cruelty. Why did you kill him, Nietzsche? he asked again, his voice losing some of its fire. In her mind, like a protective stone wall, was the thought of Richard. He had to see it in her eyes. Part of Jagang's rage, she knew, was at his own impotence at penetrating her mind, of possessing her as he could so many others. Her knowing smirk taunted him, with what he could not have. It amused me to hear the great Kadar Kardif cry for mercy, and then to deny it. Jagang roared again, a beastly sound out of place for such a mannerly bedchamber. She saw the blur of his arms swinging for her. The room whirled violently around her. She expected to hit something with a bone-breaking impact. Instead, she upended and crashed onto unexpected softness, the bed, she realized. Somehow she had missed the marble and mahogany posts at the corners. They surely would have killed her. Fate, it seemed, was trifling with her. Jagang landed atop her. She thought he might beat her to death now. Instead, he studied her eyes from inches away. He sat up, straddling her hips. His meaty hands pulled at the laces on the bodice of her dress. With a quick yank of the material, he exposed her breasts. His fingers squeezed her bared flesh until her eyes watered. Nietzsche didn't watch him or resist, but instead went limp as he pushed her dress up around her waist. Her mind began its journey away to where only she alone could go. He fell on her, driving the wind from her lungs in a helpless grunt. Arms lying at her sides, her fingers open and slack, eyes unblinking, Nietzsche stared at the folds of the silk in the canopy of the bed, her mind unaffected in the distant, quiet place. The pain seemed remote. Her struggle to breathe seemed trivial. As he went about his coarse business, she focused her thoughts instead on what she was going to do. She had never believed possible what she now contemplated. Now she knew it was. She had only to decide to do it. Jagang slapped her, causing her to focus her mind back on him. You're too stupid to even weep. She realized he had finished. He was not happy that she hadn't noticed. She had to make an effort not to comfort her jaw, stinging from what to him was a smack, but to the person receiving it was a blow nearly strong enough to cripple. Sweat dripped from his chin onto her face. His powerful body glistened from the exertion she had not perceived. His chest heaved as he glared down at her. Anger, of course, powered the glare, but Nietzsche thought she saw a tinge of something else there, too. Regret, or maybe anguish, or maybe even hurt. Is that what you wish me to do, then, Excellency? Weep? His voice turned bitter as he flopped onto his side beside her. No, I wish you to react. But I am, she said as she stared up at the canopy. It is simply not the reaction you wish. He sat up. What's the matter with you, woman? She gazed up at him a moment and then turned her eyes away. I have no idea, she answered honestly. But I think I must find out. Chapter 14 Jagang gestured. Take off your clothes. You're spending the night. It's been too long. This time it was he who stared off at the walls. I've missed you in my bed, Nietzsche. She didn't answer. She did not believe that in his bed he missed anything. She didn't believe she could conceive of him understanding what it was to miss a person. What he missed, she thought, 
was being able to miss someone. Nietzsche sat up and threw her legs over the side of the bed as she untangled herself from the black dress. She pulled it off over her head and then laid it out across the back of a padded leather chair. She reclaimed her underthings from the tangles of the bed covering and tossed them on the chair before drawing off her stockings and placing them, too, on the seat of the chair. He watched her body the whole time, watched her as she tended to her dress, smoothing it to straighten what he had done to it, watching the mysterious allure of a woman acting a woman. When she had finished, she turned back to him. She stood proudly to let him see that which he could have only by force and never as a willing gift. She could detect the sense of privation in his expression. This was the only victory she could have. The more he took her by force, the more he understood that that was the only way he could ever have her, and the more it maddened him. She would just as soon die as willingly give him the satisfaction of that gift, and he knew the brutal truth of that. He finally forced himself away from his private bitter longing and looked up into her eyes. Why'd you kill Kadar? She sat on the edge of the bed opposite him, just out of his easy reach, but within range of his lunge, and shrugged her bare shoulders. You are not the Order. The Order is no single man, but an ideal of equity. As such, it will survive any one person. You serve that ideal in the Order for now, in the capacity of but a brute. The Order could use any brute to serve its purpose. You, Kadar, or another... I simply eliminated someone who might one day have been a threat to you before you can rise above your present role. He grinned. You expect me to believe that you are doing me a kindness. Now you mock me. If it pleases you to think so, then do. Her smooth white limbs were a vivid contrast to the heavy, dark, variegated, verdant bed cover in sheets. He lay back atop them against several rumpled pillows immodestly displayed before her. His eyes looked even darker than usual. What's all this talk I keep hearing about Jagang the Just? Your new title. It is the thing that will save you, the thing that will win for you, the thing that will bring you more glory than anything else. Yet in return for eliminating a future threat to your standing and for making you a hero to the people, you draw my blood. He put an arm behind his head. Sometimes you make me believe the stories that people tell, that you really are crazy. And if you kill everyone, then they will be dead. I have recently been through towns visited by your soldiers. It seems they didn't harm the people, at least they didn't slaughter everyone in sight, as they did when they began their march into the new world. He lunged and seized a fistful of her hair. With a snarl, he yanked her onto her back beside him. She caught her breath as he rose up on an elbow and directed his disturbing gaze down into her eyes. It is your job to make examples of people, to show them that they must contribute to our cause, to make them fear the Imperial Order's righteous wrath. That is the task I assigned you. Is that so? Then why did the soldiers not make examples too? Why did they let those towns be? Why did they not contribute to striking fear into the hearts of the people? Why didn't they lay waste to every city and town in their path? And then who would I rule but my soldiers? Who would do the work? Who would make things? Who would grow the food? Who would pay tribute? To whom will I bring the hope of the order? Who will be there to glorify the great Emperor Jagang if I kill them all? He flapped onto his back. You may be called death's mistress, but we can't have it your way and kill everyone. In this world, you are bound to the Order's purpose. If people feel the Order's arrival can mean nothing but their death, they will resist to the end. They must know that it is only their resistance which will bring a swift and sure death. If they realize our arrival offers them a moral life, a life which puts man under the Creator and the welfare of man above all else, they will embrace us. You dealt death to this city, she taunted, forcing him to unwittingly prove the validity of what she had done, even though they chose the order. 
I've given orders that any people of the city still alive be allowed to go back to their homes. The rampage is ended. The people here betrayed their promises and thus invited brutality. They saw it, but now that is finished and a new day of order has come. The old ideas of separate lands are over. As it was ended in the old world, all people will be governed together and will enter a new age of prosperity together under the imperial order. Only those who resist will be crushed, not because they resist, but because ultimately they are traitors to the well-being of their fellow man and must be eliminated. Here in Andrith was the turning point in our struggle. Richard Rawl was at last cast out by the people themselves, who came to see the virtue of what we offer. No longer can he claim to represent them. Yet you came in and slaughtered... The leaders here betrayed certain promises to me. Who knows how much of the general population may have collaborated in that. And so the people had to pay a price. But collectively, they have also earned a place in the order for their courage in emphatically rejecting Lord Rawl and the outdated, selfish, uninspired morals he offered them. The tide has turned. People no longer have faith in Lord Rawl. Nor can he now have any faith in them. Richard Rawl is a fallen leader. Nietzsche smiled inwardly, a sad smile. She was a fallen woman, and Richard was a fallen man. Their fate was sealed. Perhaps here in this one small place, she said, but he is far from defeated. He is still dangerous. After all, you failed to gain everything you sought here in Andreth because of Richard Rawl. He not only denied you a clear victory by destroying vast stores of supplies and leaving the systems and services of production in total disarray, but he also slipped right through your fingers when you should have captured him. I will have him. Really? I wonder. She watched his fist and waited until it relaxed before she continued. When will you move our forces north into the Midlands? Jagang stroked his hand down his woolly chest. Soon. I want to give them time to become careless first. When they grow complacent, I will strike north. A great leader must read the nature of the battle to be able to adjust his tactics. We will be liberators now as we move north into the Midlands, bringing the Creator's glory to the people. We must win the hearts and minds of the unconverted. You have decided this change on your own. You do not consider the will of the Creator in your campaign. He glared at her insolence, as if to tell her she knew better than to even ask such a question. I am the Emperor. I need not consult our spiritual guides. But since their counsel is always welcome, I've already talked to the priests. They've spoken favorably about my plans. Brother Nariv thinks it wise and has given his blessing. You had better keep to your job of extinguishing any ideas of opposition. If you don't follow my orders, well, no one will miss one sister. I have others. She was not moved by his threats, real as they were. By his suspicious look, he was beginning to understand her vision, too. What you are doing is fitting, she said. But it must be cut up into little pieces the people can chew. They do not have the Order's wisdom in seeing what is best for them. The public rarely does. Even one as bull-headed as you must be able to see that I have anticipated your plans by helping those you can't afford to kill to understand that you are sparing them out of your sense of justice. Word of such deeds will win hearts. He cast her a sidelong glance. I am the Order's cleansing fire. The fire is a necessary conflagration, but not the important end. It is merely the means to the end. From the ashes I, Jagang, create, new order can sprout and grow. It is this end, this glorious new age of man that warrants the means. In this it is my responsibility, not yours, to decide justice, when and how I will dispense it and who will receive it. She grew impatient with his vanity. Scorn seeped into her voice. I have simply put a name to it, Jagang the Just, and begun to spread your new title for you when the opportunity arose. 
I sacrificed Kadar to that end for all the same reasons you've listed. It had to be done now in order for it to have the necessary time to spread and flourish, or the new world would soon harden irreversibly against the order. I chose the time and place, and by using Kadar Kardif's life, a war hero's life, proved your devotion to the cause of the order above all else. You benefit. Any brute could ignite the conflagration. This new title shows your moral vision, another manifestation of worth over other men. I have planted the vital seed that will make you a hero to the common people and, even more important, to the priests. Are you going to pretend you think the title inadequate or that it will not serve you well? What I alone have done will help win what your powerful army cannot, willing allegiance without a battle at a cost of nothing. With Kadar's life, I, Nietzsche, have made you more than you could make of yourself. I, Nietzsche, have given you the reputation of honor. I, Nietzsche, have made you into a leader people will trust because they believe you to be just. He brooded for a time, turning his gaze from her hot glare. His arm finally fell open, and his fingers tenderly trailed down her thigh. The touch was an admission for him, an admission that she was right, even if he would not say the words. After a few moments he yawned, and then his eyes closed. His breathing evened, and he started to drift off into a nap, as was his way with her. He expected her to remain right where she was, so that when he awoke she would be available to him. She supposed she could leave, but it was not time, not yet. He finally awoke an hour later. Nietzsche was still staring up at the canopy, thinking about Richard. There seemed to be one piece missing in her plan, one more thing that she felt needed to fall into place. In his sleep, Jagang had rolled over on his side, facing away from her. Now he turned back. His dark eyes took her in with a look of lust rekindled. He drew her close. His body was as warm as a rock in the sun and only slightly softer. Pleasure me, he commanded in a husky growl that would have frightened any other woman into doing as ordered. Or what? You will kill me? If I feared that, I would not be here. This is by force, not consent. I will not willingly take part in it, nor will I allow you to deceive yourself into believing that I want you. He backhanded her, knocking her across the bed. You take part willingly. He seized her by the wrist and dragged her back toward him. Why else would you be here? You ordered me here. He smirked. And you came when you could have fled. She opened her mouth, but she had no answer she could put into words, no answer he would understand. With a grin of victory, he fell on her and pressed his lips to hers. As much as it hurt her, for Jagang, this was gentle behavior. He had told her several times that she was the only woman he ever cared to kiss. He seemed to believe that by expressing those emotions for her, she could have no alternative but to surrender feelings in kind, as if spoken feelings were currency with which he could purchase affection on demand. It was only the beginning of a long night, a long ordeal, she knew. She would have to endure his forceful violation several more times before morning. His question haunted the distant place in her mind. Morning came, accompanied by the dull throbbing of a headache from her succeeding beating, and the sharper aches from the places where he'd struck her when he came to find that what he thought was her willing submission was but a delusion that left him more angered than before. The pillows were stained with her blood. It had been a long night of rare sensations experienced. She knew she was evil, and deserved to be violated in such a brutal fashion. She could offer no moral objection to it. Even in the terrible things he did to her, Jagang was nowhere near as corrupt as she. Jagang erred in simple matters of the flesh, and that could only be expected. All people were corrupt in the flesh. But because of her indifference to the suffering around her, she failed in matters of the spirit. That, she knew, was pure evil. That was why she deserved to suffer whatever he did to her. For the moment, that deep, dark place within came close to being sated. Nietzsche touched her mouth and found the cuts painful but closed. The healing of wounds, though, did not offer the warranted sensations of receiving them, 
so she resolved to have one of the other sisters heal her, rather than give him the satisfaction of witnessing her suffering the inconvenience of the injuries. With that, her mind turned to thoughts of Sister Lidmilla. Nietzsche realized that Jagang wasn't in bed beside her. She sat up and saw him in a chair not far away, watching her. She pulled the sheet up to cover her breasts, speckled with droplets of dried blood. You are a pig. You can't get enough of me. Despite what you say, Nietzsche, you wish to be with me. If not, why would you stay? Those nightmare eyes of his watched her, trying to find a way into her mind. There was none. He could no longer be a nightmare for her. Richard guarded her mind. Not for the reasons you wish to believe. I stay because the ultimate cause of the order is a moral one. I wish it to succeed. I wish the suffering of life's helpless victims to end. I wish everyone to finally be equal and to finally live with everything they need. I have worked nearly my entire life for those goals. The order can see to it that such a fair world comes to be. If I must endure you, even aid you, for such an end, then it is but an insignificant gnat to swallow. You sound so very noble, but I think there is something more basic behind it. I think you would have left if you could, or, he smiled, if you could, you would have left if you really wanted to. Which is it then, Nietzsche? She didn't want to contemplate the question. Her head hurt. What's all the talk about you building a palace? So you heard then. He took a deep breath and sighed wistfully. It will be the grandest palace ever built, a fitting place for the emperor of the imperial order, for the man who rules both the old and the new worlds. The man who wants to rule. Lord Rawl stands in your way. How many times has he bested you now? Jagang's eyes flashed a rage she knew could turn violent. Richard had frustrated Jagang a number of times. Even if Richard hadn't been victorious over Jagang, he had stung him. Quite an accomplishment, really, for such a tiny force against the array of the Imperial Order. A man like Jagang hated the humiliation of a sting almost as much as he would hate to be gored. I will eliminate Richard Rawl, don't you worry, Jagang said in a low growl. She changed the subject back to what she really wanted to know about. Since when has the all-conquering Emperor Jagang turned soft and wanted to live in splendor? Ah, but I am Jagang the Just now, remember? He returned to the bed and flopped down beside her. Nietzsche, I'm sorry I hurt you. I never want to hurt you, but you make me do it. You know I care about you. You care about me, yet you beat me? You care about me, yet you never bothered to tell me of such an enormous project as the building of a palace? I am insignificant to you. I told you. I'm sorry I hurt you. But that was your own fault, and you know it. He spoke the words almost lovingly. With mention of the palace, his face had softened into a visionary look. It's only proper and fitting that I at last have the prestige of such a monumental edifice. You... The man who was content in tents in the field now wants to live in a resplendent building. Why? Because once I bring the new world under the guidance of the order, I will owe it to all the people as their leader to be seen in a majestic setting. But it will have more than simple splendor. But of course, she sniped. He gathered up her hand. Nietzsche, I will proudly wear the title Jagang the Just. You're right. The time has come for such a move. I was only angered because you wrongly made that move without first discussing it with me. But let us forget that now. She said nothing. He gripped her hand more tightly to show his sincerity, she supposed. You're going to love the palace when it's finished. He ran the back of the fingers of his other hand tenderly down her cheek. We will all live there for a very long time. The words struck a chord in her. A very long time? For the first time she realized there was something more to this than simply his vanity of wanting a palace after Richard had denied him the palace of the prophets. He wanted what else Richard had denied him. Could it be? 
She looked up into his face, searching for the answer. He simply smiled at the questions in her eyes. Construction has already begun, he said, turning his words away from those questions. Architects and great builders from all over the old world have gathered to work on it. Everyone wants to be part of such a grand project. And Brother Narin, she probed. What does he think of building such a frivolous monument to one man when there is important work to be done for so many needy people? Brother Narev and his disciples greatly favor the project. Jagang flashed her a sly smile. They will live there, too, of course. Understanding washed over her. He's going to spell the new palace, she whispered in astonishment to herself. Jagang only smiled as he watched her, clearly pleased with her reaction. Brother Nariv had been at the Palace of the Prophets almost as long as she, nearly 170 years, but in all that time he seemed to have aged only 10 or 15 years, the same as she. No one but Nietzsche ever knew he was anything but a stable hand. They didn't know he was gifted. In all that time, with her, along with everyone else paying him little heed, he must have been studying the spell around the palace. From what she knew, most of Brother Narev's disciples had been young wizards from the Palace of the Prophets. They had access to the vaults. They, too, could have added information that helped him. But could he really do such a thing? Tell me about the palace, she said, preferring his voice to the silent scrutiny of his nightmare eyes. He kissed her first, the way a man kisses a woman, not the way a brute kisses a victim. She endured it with no more favor than any of the rest of it. He seemed not to notice this time and by the smile of his face appeared to have enjoyed it. It will be a walk of nearly fifteen miles to walk all the halls. He swept a hand out and began to give shape to the grand palace in the air before them. As he went on, he stared off at his imaginary outline, hanging there in space. The world has never seen anything to match it. While I carry on with our work of bringing the hope of the order to the new world, of bringing the true word of the Creator to the wicked and the greedy, of banishing the selfish ideals of the ancient religion of magic back in my homeland, the work of building the palace will go on. Quarries will be busy for years extracting all the rock that will go into the construction. The variety of stone will leave no doubt about the glory of the place. The marble will be the finest. The woods will be only the best. Every material going into the palace will be exceptional. The best craftsmen will shape it all into a grand structure. Yes, but despite the fact that others may live there, she mocked in cool disdain, it will be but a pompous monument to only one man, the great and powerful Emperor Jagang. No, it will be devoted to the glory of the Creator. Oh, and will the Creator be taking up residence there too, then? Jagang scowled at her blasphemy. Brother Narev wishes the palace to be instructional to the people. He is contributing his spiritual guidance to the undertaking and will personally oversee the construction while I cleanse the way for the order. That was what she wanted to know. He stared off at the invisible shape still hanging in the air before them. His voice took on a reverent tone. Brother Narev shares my vision in this. He has always been like a father to me. He put the fire in my belly. His spiritual direction has been a lifelong inspiration. He allows me to stand at the fore and take the glory of our victories. But I would be nothing without his moral teachings. What I win is only as the fist of the order. And a fist is but one part of the whole, as we are all but insignificant fragments of society as a whole. You are right. Many others could stand in my place for the order. But it is my part to be the one to lead us. I would never do anything to betray the trust Brother Narev has placed in me. That would be like betraying the Creator himself. He guides the way for all of us. I only thought to build a fitting palace for us all, a place from which to govern for the benefit of the people. It was Brother Narev who took up the dream and gave it moral meaning by envisioning everyone, when they see the vast structure, as seeing man's place in the new order seeing that man can never live up to the glory of the Creator, and that individually he is but a meaningless member of the greater brotherhood of man, and thus can have no greater part to play than to uplift all his brothers in need. 
so all will thrive together. Yet it will also be a place that will humble every man before it, by showing him his utter insignificance before the glory of the Creator, by showing man's depravity, his tortured, contorted, inferior nature, for all men in this world are such as this. Nietzsche could almost see such a place when he spoke of it. It would indeed be a humbling inspiration to the people. He came near to inspiring her with such talk, as Brother Nariv had at one time inspired her. This is why I have stayed, she whispered, because the cause of the order is righteous. The peace that had been missing was now found. In the quiet, Jagang kissed her again. She allowed him to finish it and then pushed away from his embrace. With a distant smile, he watched as she rose and began dressing. You're going to love it there, Nietzsche. It will be a place befitting you. Oh, as the slave queen? As a queen, if you wish it. I plan to give you the kind of authority you've never before had. We'll be happy there, you and I. Truly happy. For a long, long time, we'll be happy there. She drew a stocking up her leg. When Sister Ulyssia and the four with her found a way to leave you, I chose to ignore their discovery and stay, because I know the order is the only moral course for mankind. But now I... You stayed because you would be nothing without the order. She looked away from his eyes. She tugged her dress down over her head, poked her arms through the sleeves, and worked the skirt over her hips. I am nothing without the order. And I am nothing with it. No one is. We are all inadequate, miserable creatures. That is the nature of man. That is what the Creator teaches. But the Order shows man his duty to make a better life for the good of all. And I am the Emperor of the Imperial Order. His red face cooled more slowly than it had heated. He gestured vaguely in the hollow silence, and he went on in a more mellow tone. The world will be one under the order. We'll be happy at the palace when it's finished, Nietzsche. You and I, under the spiritual guidance of our priests, you'll see. In time, when... I'm leaving, she drew on a boot. I will not permit it. Nietzsche paused at pulling on her other boot and glanced up into his dark eyes. She flicked a finger toward a stone vase on a table against the far wall. Light flashed. The vase exploded in a cloud of dust and chips with a sound that rocked the room. The draperies shuddered. The panes in the window chattered. When the dust had settled, she said, You will not permit it? She bent forward and began doing up the laces on her boots. Jagang strolled over to the table and dragged his fingers through the dust that was all that remained of the stone vase. He turned back to her in all his naked, hairy, imperial glory. Are you threatening me? Do you actually think you could use your power against me? I do not think it. She yanked the laces tight. I know it. The truth is I choose not to. He struck a defiant pose. And why is that? Nietzsche stood and faced him. Because, as you said, the Order needs you, or rather a brute like you. You serve the ends of the Order. You are their fist. You bring that cleansing fire. You perform that function very well. It could even be said that you perform that service with extraordinary talent. You are Jagang the Just. You see the wisdom and the title I have given you, and will use it to further the cause of the order. That is why I choose not to use my power against you. It would be like using my power against the order, against my own duty to the future of mankind. Then why do you want to leave? Because I must. She gave him a look of icy determination and deadly threat. Before I go, I will be spending some time with Sister Lidmilla. You are to immediately and completely withdraw from her mind and remain out of it the entire time I am with her. We will use your tents, since you are not using them. You will see to it that everyone leaves us entirely alone for however long it takes us. Anyone who enters without my express permission will die. That includes you. You have my oath as a sister of the dark on that. When I'm finished and after I leave, you may do what you will with Sister Lidmilla. Kill her if that is your wish, although I don't see why you would want to bother, since she is going to be doing you a great service. I see. 
His huge chest rose. He let the deep breath out slowly. And how long will you be gone this time, Nietzsche? This is not like the other times. This is different. How long? Perhaps only a short time, perhaps a very long time. I don't yet know. Leave me alone to do as I must, and if I can, I will one day return to you. He gazed into her eyes, but he could not look into her mind. Another man protected her mind and kept her thoughts her own. In all the time she had spent with Richard, Nietzsche had never learned that which she hungered most to know, but in one way she had learned too much. Most of the time she was able to entomb that unwanted knowledge under the numb weight of indifference. Occasionally, though, it would, like now, unexpectedly rise up out of its tomb to seize her. When it did, she was helpless in its grip and could do nothing but wait for the oblivion of numb detachment to bury it yet again. Staring into the long, dark night of Jagang's inhuman eyes, eyes that revealed nothing but the bleakness of his soul, Nietzsche touched her finger to the gold ring Jagang had ordered pierced through her lower lip to mark her as his personal slave. She released a thread-thin channel of subtractive magic, and the ring ceased to exist. And where are you going, Nietzsche? I am going to destroy Richard Rawl for you. Chapter 15 Zedekus Zul Zarander had been able to talk and smile his way past the other soldiers, but these were not moved by his explanation that he was Richard's grandfather. He supposed he should have entered the camp in the daylight. It would have avoided a lot of the suspicion, but he was tired and hadn't thought it would be that much trouble. The soldiers were properly suspicious, which greatly pleased him, but he was weary and had more important things to do than answer questions. He wanted to ask them instead. Why do you want to see him? The bigger guard repeated. I told you, I'm Richard's grandfather. This is the Richard Cipher you're talking about, who you now say, Yes, yes, that was his name when he grew up, and that's what I'm used to calling him. But I meant Richard Rawl, who he is now. You know, Lord Rawl, your leader. I would think being the grandfather of someone as important as your Lord Rawl would accord me some respect Maybe even a hot meal. I could say I'm Lord Rawl's brother, the man said, keeping a tight grip on the bit in the mouth of Zed's horse. But that doesn't make it so. Zed sighed. How very true. As vexing as it was, Zed, at some dim inward level, was pleased to see that the men weren't stupid, nor easily duped. But I'm also a wizard, Zed added, drawing low his eyebrows for dramatic effect. If I wasn't friendly, I could simply do you up crisp and be on my way past the both of you. And if I wasn't friendly, the man said, I could give this signal, now that we've let you venture in this far so that you are completely surrounded, and the dozen archers hiding all around you in the dark would let fly the arrows that are at this moment trained on you, as they have been ever since you approached our encampment. Ah... Zed said, holding up a finger in triumph. All very well and good, but... And even if I were to die in a final flame of service to the Lord Rawl, those arrows will let fly without me needing to give any signal. Zed harumphed, lowering his finger, but inwardly he smiled. Here he was, first wizard, and if he weren't entering a friendly camp, he would have been bested in this game of banter by a simple soldier. Or maybe not. In the first place, Sergeant, I am, as I said, a wizard, and so I knew of the archers, and have already dealt with the threat by spelling their arrows, so they will fly no truer and with no more deadly effect than wet dish rags. I have nothing to fear from them. In the second place, even if I'm lying, which is precisely what you are considering at this very moment, you have made a mistake by telling me of the threat which enables me, as a wizard of great repute, to now use my magic to nullify it. A slow smile came to the man's face. Why, that's remarkable. He scratched his head. He looked to his partner and then back to Zed. You're right, that was exactly what I was thinking. That you could be lying about knowing the archers were back there in the dark. You see there, young man, you're not so smart after all. You're right, sir, I'm not. Here I was, so busy talking to you and being so intimidated by your wizardly powers and all that I plumb forgot to tell you about what else was out there in the dark watching you. 
The soldier's brow lowered. And it would be a mite more trouble than any simple arrows, I dare say. Zed scowled down at the man. Now see here, why don't you do as I ask and come down here in the light where I can see you better and answer some of our questions? With a sigh of resignation, Zed dismounted. He gave Spider a reassuring pat on her neck. Spider, a chestnut-colored mare, had a leggy black splotch on her creamy rump from which she had acquired her name. Young, strong, and possessing an agreeably spirited nature, she made a pleasant traveling companion. The two of them had been through a great deal together. Zed stepped into the intimate circle of light from the watch fire. He turned his hand up and brought a white-hot flame to life just above the flesh of his palm. The two soldiers' eyes widened. Zed scowled. But I have my own fire if you need to see better. Does this help you see things better, Sergeant? Uh, why, yes, it does, sir, the man stammered. Yes, it does indeed, a woman said as she stepped into the light. Why didn't you simply use your Han and give a display of your craft in the first place? She motioned into the darkness, as if signaling for others to stand down. She turned back with a smile that was no more than courteous. Welcome, wizard. Zed bowed from the waist. Zedicus Zul Zorander, first wizard at your service. Sister Philippa, Wizard Zarander, I am aide to the prelate. She gestured, and the sergeant took the reins from Zed's hand to lead the horse away. Zed clapped the man on the back to let him know there were no hard feelings, and then gave a similar pat to Spider to let her know it was all right to go with the men. Treat her especially well, sergeant. Spider is a friend, the sergeant saluted by tapping his fist to his heart. She'll be treated as a friend, sir. After the soldiers had led Spider away, Zed said, The prelate? Which one? The narrow-jawed sister clasped her hands together. Prelate Verna, of course. Oh, yes, of course, Prelate Verna. The sisters of the light didn't know Anne was still alive. At least she had been alive when Zed last saw her, several months past. Anne had written in her journey book, telling Verna that she was alive, but also asking her to keep that information private for the time being. Zed had been hoping that perhaps Anne had turned up at the Daharan army camp with her sisters of the light. He was sorry to learn she hadn't. It boded ill for her. Zed held no favor with the sisters of the light. A lifetime of disapproval was not easily forgotten. But he had come to respect Anne as a woman of self-discipline and resolve, even if he took a dim view of some of her convictions and past objectives. He knew that, at the least, he and Anne shared many important values. He didn't know about the rest of the sisters, though. Sister Philippa appeared middle-aged, but with sisters that meant little. She might have lived at the Palace of the Prophets for only a year or for centuries. With dark eyes and high cheekbones, she was an exotic-looking woman. As in the Midlands, there were places in the old world where the people had unique physical characteristics. Sister Philippa moved the way high-minded women tended to move, like a swan taken to human form. How may I be of service, Wizard Zarander? Zed will do. Is this prelate of yours awake? She is. This way, Zed, if you please. He fell in behind the woman as she glided off toward the dark shapes of tents. Got anything to eat around here? She looked back over her shoulder. This late? Well, I've been traveling hard. It's not really all that late, is it? In the dark, she assessed him briefly. I don't believe it's ever too late, according to the teachings of the Creator, and you do look emaciated. From your travels, I'm sure. Her smile warmed a little. Food is always at the ready. We have soldiers who are active through the night and need to be fed. I believe I could find something for you. She returned her gaze to the indiscernible path. That would be a kindness, Zed said in a jovial voice as he scowled at her back. And I'm not emaciated, I'm wiry. Most women find lean men appealing. Do they? I never knew that. Sisters of the Light were a lofty lot, Zed thought ruefully. For thousands of years, it had been a death sentence for them to even set foot in the New World. Zed had always been a little more lenient, but not by much. In the past, the sisters only came into the New World to steal boys with the gift. They claimed to be saving them. It was a wizard's task to train wizards. If they came for the reason of taking a boy back beyond the great barrier to their palace, Zed viewed it as the gravest of crimes. They had come for that very reason only the winter before and taken Richard. 
Sister Verna was the one who had captured him and taken him to the old world. Under the spell of their palace, he could have ended up being there for centuries. Leave it to Richard to make friends with the Sisters of the Light, of all people. Zed guessed he and the sisters were even, that they had good reason to view him in a harsh way. He had, after all, set the spell that Richard had used to destroy their palace. But Anne had helped, knowing it was the only way to prevent Jagang from capturing the palace and acquiring the prophecies therein for his own purposes. All around, guards, big guards, prowled the encampment. In chain mail and leather armor, they were an imposing sight. They watched everything as they slipped through the darkness. The camp was relatively quiet, considering its size. Noise could give away a variety of information to an enemy. It was not easy to see to it that this many men kept quiet. I'm relieved that our first incursion by someone possessing the gift turned out to be a friend, the sister said. And I'm glad to see that the gifted are helping to keep watch. But there are types of enemy forays that the regular sentries could not identify. Zed wondered if they were really prepared for those kinds of troubles. If magic is involved, we will be there to detect it. I suppose you were watching me the whole time? I was, Sister Philippa said. From the time you crossed the line of hills back there. Zed scratched his jaw. Really? That far away? With a satisfied smirk, she said, that far. He peered over his shoulder into the night. Both of you, very good. She halted and turned to him. Both? You knew there were two of us watching? Zed smiled innocently. But of course, you were just watching. She was farther away, following, conjuring some little nasty, should I prove hostile. Sister Philippa blinked in astonishment. Remarkable. You could sense her touching her Han from that distance? Zed nodded with satisfaction. They didn't make me first wizard just because I was wiry. Sister Philippa's smile finally looked sincere. I am relieved you came as a friend rather than one intent on harm. There was more truth in that than the woman knew. Zed had experience in the unpleasant, dirty business of magic in warfare. When he'd come near their camp, he saw the holes in their defense and the weaknesses in the way they used the gift for their purpose. They were not thinking as their enemy would think. Had he been intent on harm, the entire camp would be in an uproar by now, despite what they had done to prepare for one such as he. Sister Philippa turned back to the night to lead him on. It was somewhat unsettling for Zed to walk through a Daharan camp, even though he knew they were now fighting on the same side. He had spent a good deal of his life dealing with Daharans as the deadly enemy. Richard had changed all that. Zed sighed. He sometimes thought that Richard might make friends with thunder and lightning and invite them both to dinner. Dark shapes of tents and wagons loomed all around. Pole weapons were stacked upright in neat ranks, ready should they be suddenly needed. Some soldiers snored, and some sat around in the dark, talking in low voices or laughing quietly, while others patrolled the inky shadows. Those passed close enough for Zed to smell their breath, but in the darkness he could not make out their faces. Well-hidden sentries were stationed at every possible approach route. There were very few fires in the camp, and those were mostly watch fires set away from the main force, leaving the mass of the camp a dark hole of night. Some armies carried on a considerable amount of work at night, performing repairs or making things they needed and letting the men do as they would. These men remained quiet throughout the night, so watching eyes and listening ears could gain little, if any, help for an invading force. These were well-trained, disciplined, professional soldiers. From a distance, it was difficult to tell the size of the camp. It was huge. Sister Philippa brought Zed to a sizable tent, one tall enough to stand in. Light from lamps hanging inside gave the canvas walls and roof a soft amber glow. She ducked beneath a tent line and poked her head in under the flap. I have a wizard out here who wishes to see the prelate. Zed heard muffled, astonished acknowledgement from inside. Go on in, Sister Philippa smiled while giving his back a gentle push. I'll see if I can find you some dinner. I would be not only grateful, but greatly in your debt, Zed told her. As he stepped inside the tent, the people were just coming to their feet to greet him. Zed, you old fool, you'll be alive. Zed grinned as Addie, the old sorceress known as the Bone Woman in their adopted homeland of Westland, rushed into his arms. 
He let out a grunt as she momentarily squeezed the wind from his lungs. He smoothed her square-cut, jaw-length black and gray hair as he held her head to his chest. I promised you'd see me again, now didn't I? Yes, you did, she whispered into his heavy robes. She pushed back, holding his arms, and looked him over. She reached up and smoothed down his unruly, wavy white hair. You look as lovely as ever, he told her. She peered at him with her completely white eyes. Her sight had been taken from her when she was but a young woman. Addie now saw by means of her gift. In some ways, she saw better. Where be your hat? Hat? I bought you a fine hat and you lost it. I see you still have not replaced it. You told me you would get another. I believe you promised. Zed hated the hat with the long feather she'd bought for him when they'd acquired the rest of his clothes. He'd rather be wearing the simple robes befitting a wizard of his rank and authority, but Addie had lost them after he purchased the fancy maroon robes with black sleeves and cowled shoulders he now wore. Three rows of silver brocade circled the cuffs. Thicker gold brocade ran around the neck and down the front. A red satin belt set with a gold buckle, gathered the outfit at his thin waist. Such clothes marked one with the gift as an initiate. For one without the gift, such clothes befitted nobility, or in most places a wealthy merchant. So although Zed disliked the ostentatious attire, it had at times been a valuable disguise. Besides, Addie liked him in the maroon robes. The hat, though, was too much for him. It had been misplaced. He noted that Addie had managed to keep her simple clothes along the way, yellow and red beads around the neck of her robes, sewn in the shapes of the ancient symbols of her profession of sorceress, were the only ornamentation she wore. I've been busy, he said, flicking his hand, hoping to dismiss the matter. Or I would have replaced the hat. Bah, she scoffed. You'll be up to mischief. Why, I've been... Hush now, Addie said, holding his arm in a tight grip, she held out the long, thin fingers of her other hand. Zed, this be Verna, prelate of the Sisters of the Light. The woman looked to be in her late thirties, perhaps early forties. Zed knew her to be much older. Anne, Verna's predecessor, had told him Verna's age, and while he couldn't recall the exact number, it was somewhere close to one hundred and sixty years, young for a Sister of the Light. She had simple, attractive features and brown hair with just enough curl and body to add a hint of sophistication. Her intent, brown-eyed gaze looked as if it could scour lichen off granite. By the lines of a resolute expression enduringly fixed on her face, she appeared to be a woman with a shell as tight as a beetle's and just as hard. Zed bowed his head. Prelate, first wizard Zedicus Zul Zarander, at your service. He let her know by his tone that it was merely a figure of speech. This was the woman who had taken Richard away to the old world. Even if she believed it was to save his life, Zed, as first wizard, viewed such an act as abhorrent. The sisters, sorceresses all, believed they could train gifted young men to be wizards. They were wrong. Such a task could only be adequately accomplished by another wizard. She offered her hand with the sunburst patterned gold ring of office. He bent forward and kissed it, out of what he thought must be their custom. She pulled his hand close when he had finished and kissed it in return. I am humbled to meet the man who helped raise our Richard. You would have to be as rare a person as I found him to be when we helped begin his training. She forced a chuckle. We found it a formidable labor trying to teach that grandson of yours. Zed slightly altered his opinion of the woman, treating her with greater caution. The air in the tent was stuffy and uncomfortable. That is because you are all oxen trying to teach a horse to run. You sisters should stick to work more befitting your nature. Yes, yes, you be a brilliant man, Zed, Addie scoffed. Simply brilliant. One of these days even I may come to believe you. She tugged his sleeve, turning him from Verna's scarlet face. And this be Warren, Addie said. Zed inclined his head toward Warren, but the boy was already falling to his knees and bowing his blonde head. Wizard Zarander, this is quite an honor. He popped back up and seized Zed's hand in both of his, pumping it until Zed thought his arm might come undone at the shoulder. I'm so pleased to meet you. Richard told me all about you. I'm so pleased to meet a wizard of your standing and talent. 
I would be so happy to learn from you. The happier he looked, the more Verna scowled. Well, I'm pleased to meet you too, my boy. Zed didn't tell Warren that Richard had never mentioned him, but that was not out of disrespect or neglect. Richard had never had a chance to tell Zed a great number of very important things. Zed thought he could sense through Warren's grip that the young man was a wizard of unusual talents. A bear of a man with a curly, rust-colored beard, a white scar from his left temple to his jaw, and heavy eyebrows stepped forward. His grayish-green eyes fixed on Zed with fierce intensity, but he had a grin like a soldier on a long march who had spotted a lonely cask of ale. General Rybish, commander of the Deharan forces here in the south, the man said, taking Zed's hand when Warren at last surrendered it and stepped back beside Verna. Lord Rall's grandfather, what good fortune to see you, sir. His grip was firm, but not painful. It got tighter. What very good fortune. Yes, indeed, Zed muttered. Unfortunate as the circumstances are, General Rybish. Unfortunate? Well, never mind for the moment, Zed said, waving off the question. He asked another instead. Tell me, General, have you begun to dig all the mass graves yet? Or do you intend the few who are left alive to simply abandon all the bodies? Bodies? Why, yes, the bodies of all your troops who are going to die. Chapter 16 I hope you like eggs, Sister Philippa sang out as she swept into the tent, holding out a steaming plate. Zed rubbed his hands together. Delightful! Everyone else was still standing in stiff, stunned silence. Sister Philippa didn't seem to notice all the hanging jaws. I had the cook add some ham and a few other things he had about. She glanced down at Zed's form. I thought you could use some substance. Marvelous! Zed grinned as he relieved her of the plate mounded high with scrambled eggs and ham. Ah, the general began, seemingly befuddled as to how to frame his question. Might you kindly explain what you mean by that, Wizard Zarander? Zed will do. Zed looked up from inhaling the intoxicating aroma of the dish. Dead! He drew the fork across his throat. You know, dead. Nearly all of them. Dead. He turned back to Sister Philippa. This smells delightful. He again inhaled the steam lifting from the plate of eggs. Simply delightful. You are a woman of a kind heart and a skillful mind to think to have the cook add such a splendid complement of ingredients. Simply delightful. The sister beamed. The general lifted a hand. Wizard Zarander, if I may. Addie hushed the burly general. You be poor competition to food. Be patient. Zed took a forkful, humming his pleasure at the flavor he encountered. As he took a second forkful, Addie guided him to a simple bench at the side of the tent. A table in the middle held a few mugs and a lamp that lent the cozy tent not only its light, but its oily odor as well. Despite Addie's advice to be patient, everyone began talking at once, asking questions and offering objections. Zed ignored them as he shoveled in the scrambled eggs. The large chunks of ham were delicious. He waved a particular juicy piece of meat to the confounded spectators to indicate his pleasure with it. The spices, the onions, the peppers, and the warm lumps of cheese were delightful. He rolled his eyes and moaned in bliss. It was the best food he'd had in days. His traveling rations were simple and had long ago become boring. He had often grumbled that Spider ate better than he did. Spider seemed smug about it, too, which he had always found annoying. It wasn't good for a horse to be smug with you. Philippa, Verna growled, must you be so pleased about a plate of eggs? Well, the poor man is practically starving. Puzzled by Verna's scowl, she waggled her hand at Zed. Just look at him. I'm simply happy to see him enjoy his meal, and pleased I could help one of the creators gifted. Zed slowed when he all too soon approached the end of his meal, putting off the last few bites. He could have eaten another plate the same size. General Rybish, sitting on a bench on the opposite side of the small tent, had been furiously twisting a strand of beard. Now he leaned forward, his intent gaze fixed on Zed. Wizard Zorander, I need... Zed, remember? Yes, Zed, Zed. The lives of these soldiers are my responsibility. Could you please tell me if you think they are in danger? Zed spoke around a mouthful. I already did. But what is the nature of the danger? The gifted. 
You know, magic. The general straightened with a sober expression. His fingers dug into his muscular thighs. The gifted. Yes, the enemy has gifted among them. I thought you knew. He blinked a few times as he seemed to run it through his mind again, trying to discover the nugget of invisible danger in Zed's simple statement. Of course we know that. Ah, then why haven't you dug some mass graves? Verna shot to her feet. In the name of creation, what do you think we are? Serving wenches? Here to bring you dinner? We are gifted sisters, here to defend the army from Jagang's captive sisters. Addie stealthily signaled Verna to sit down and keep quiet. Her voice came out like gravel and honey. Why don't you tell us what you have found, Zed? I be sure the general and the prelate would like to hear how to improve our defenses. Zed scraped the small yellow lumps across the plate, collecting them into a final pitifully small forkful. Prelate, I didn't mean to imply a deliberate inadequacy on your part. Well, you certainly... You are all too good, that's all. I beg your pardon. Too good. You and your sisters have spent your lives trying to help people. Well, I... We... Why, of course we help people. That's our calling. Killing is not. Jagang will be intent on killing you all. We know that, Zed. The general scratched his beard, his gaze darting back and forth between Verna and Zed. The prelate and her sisters have helped us with detecting a number of enemy scouts and such. Just the same as Sister Philippa here found you when you approached our camp, they found others intent on harm. They've done their part, Zed, and without complaint. Every soldier in this camp is glad to have them here. All well and good, but when the army of the Imperial Order attacks, it will be different. They will use the gifted to lay waste to your forces. They will try, Verna insisted, trying to be convincing without shouting, which she was clearly itching to do. But we are prepared to prevent such a thing. That's right, Warren said, nodding his confidence. We have gifted at the ready at all times. That's good, that's good, Zed drawled as if he might be reconsidering. Then you have dealt with the simple threats. The albino mosquitoes and such. General Rybish's bushy eyebrows wrinkled together. The what? Zed waved his fork. So tell me then, just to satisfy my curiosity, what are the gifted planning to do when the enemy charges our forces? Say, with a line of cavalry. Lay down a line of fire before their cavalry, Warren said without hesitation. As they charge in, we'll incinerate them before they can so much as launch a spear. Ah, Zed said. Fire. He put the last forkful in his mouth. Everyone silently watched him chew. He paused in his chewing and looked up. Big fire, I presume? Colossal gouts of flame and all. What mosquitoes is he talking about? General Rybish muttered under his breath toward Verna and Warren beside him on his bench opposite Zed and Addie. That's right, Verna said, ignoring the general. He sighed and folded his arms across his barrel chest. A proper line of fire. Verna waited until Zed swallowed. Do you find something unsatisfactory about that, First Wizard? Zed shrugged. Well, he paused, then frowned. He leaned toward the general, peering more closely. Zed wagged a bony finger at the man's folded arms. There's one now. A mosquito is about to suck your blood, General. What? Oh, he swatted it. They've been thick this summer. I think the season for them is drawing to an end, though. We'll be happy to be rid of the little pests, I can tell you. Zed waggled his finger again. And were they all like that one? General Rybish lifted his forearm and glanced down at the squashed bug. Yes, the bloodthirsty little... His voice trailed off. He peered more closely. With a finger and thumb, he gingerly lifted the tiny insect by a wing, holding it up to have a better look. Well, I'll be. This thing is... His face lost a shade of color. White. His grayish-green eyes turned up toward Zed. What was that you were saying about... Albino mosquitoes, Zed confirmed, as he set his empty plate on the ground. He gestured with a stick-like finger at the general's flat assailant. Have you ever seen the albino fever, general? Have any of you? Terrible thing, albino fever. What's albino fever? Warren asked. I never heard of it. I've never read anything about it either, I'm sure. 
Really? Must be just a Midlands thing. The general peered more closely at the tiny white insect he was holding up. What does this albino fever do to a person? Oh, your flesh turns the most ghastly white, Zed waved his fork. Do you know, he said, frowning in thought, as if distracted by something as he looked up at the ceiling of the tent, that I once saw a wizard lay down a simply prodigious font of flame before a line of charging cavalry? Well, there you go, Verna said. You know its value, then. You've seen it in action. Yes, Zed drawled. Problem was, the enemy had been prepared for such a simple-minded trick. Simple-minded. Verna shot to her feet. I don't see how you could possibly consider... The enemy had conjured curved shields just for such an eventuality. Curved shields? Warren swiped back a curly lock of his blonde hair. I've never heard of such a thing. What are curved... The wizard who laid down the fire had been expecting shields, of course, and so he made his fire resistant to such an expected defense. These shields, though, weren't conjured to stop the fire. Zed's gaze shifted from Warren's wide eyes to Verna's scowl. But to roll it. Albino fever, the general waved his bug. If you might, could you explain... Roll the fire, Warren asked as he leaned forward. Yes, Zed said. Roll the fire before the cavalry charge, so that instead of a simple cavalry assault, the defenders now had deadly fire rolling back at them. Dear creator, Warren whispered. That's ingenious. But surely the shield would extinguish the fire. Zed twirled his fork as he spoke, as if to demonstrate the shield rolling the flames. Conjured by their own wizard for the expected defense... The fire had been hardened against shields, so instead of fizzling, it stayed viable. That, of course, enabled the curved shield to roll the fire back without it extinguishing. And, of course, being hardened to shields, the wizard's own quickly thrown-up defensive shields couldn't stop his own fire's return. But he could just cut it off. Warren was becoming panicked, as if seeing his own wizard's fire coming back at him. The wizard who created it could call it and cut it off. Could he? Zed smiled. He thought so, too, but he hadn't been prepared for the peculiar nature of the enemy's shield. Don't you see? It not only rolled the fire back, but in so doing, rolled around the fire as it went, protecting it from any alteration by magic. Of course, Warren whispered to himself. The shield was also sprinkled with a provenance-seeking spell, so it rolled the fire back toward the wizard who conjured it. He died by his own fire, after it had seared through hundreds of his own men on its way to him. Silence settled into the tent. Even the general, still holding out the albino mosquito, sat transfixed. You see, Zed finally went on, tossing his fork down onto his plate, Using the gift in war is not simply an act of exercising your power, but an act of using your wits. Zed pointed. For example, consider that albino mosquito General Rybish is holding. Under cover of darkness, just like right now, tens of thousands of them conjured by the enemy could be sneaking into this camp to infect your men with fever, and no one would even realize they were under attack. Then in the morning... The enemy strikes a camp of weak and sick soldiers and slaughters the lot of you. Sister Philippa, over on the other side of Addie, swished her hand in alarm at a tiny buzzing mosquito. But the gifted we have could counter such a thing. It was more a plea than an argument. Really? It's difficult to detect such an infinitesimal bit of magic. None of you detected these minuscule invaders, did you? Well, no, but... Zed fixed a fierce glare on Sister Philippa. It's night. In the night, they simply seem to be ordinary mosquitoes. Pesky, but no different from any other. Why, the general here didn't notice them. Neither did any of you gifted people. You can't detect the fever they carry, either, because it, too, is such a tiny speck of magic you aren't watching for it. You're looking for something huge and powerful and fearsome. 
Most of the gifted sisters will be bitten in their sleep without ever knowing it happened, until they awake in the pitch blackness with the shivering chills of a frightful fever, only to discover the first truly debilitating symptom of this particular fever, blindness. You see, it isn't the blackness of night they awake to. Dawn has already broken, but blindness. Then they find that their legs won't obey their wishes. Their ears are ringing with what sounds like an endless tingling scream. The general's gaze darted about, testing his eyesight as Zed went on. He twisted a big finger in an ear as if to clean it out. By now, anyone bitten is too weak to stand. They lose control of their bodily functions and lie helpless in their own filth. They are within hours of death. But those last hours will seem like a year. How do we counter it? On the edge of his seat, Warren licked his lips. What's the cure? Cure? There is no cure. Now a fog is beginning to creep toward the camp. This time, the few gifted left can sense that the wide mass of seething murk is foul with dark, suffocating magic. They warn everyone. Those too sick to stand wail in terror. They can't see, but they can hear the distant battle cries of the advancing enemy. In a panic, not to be touched by the deadly fog, anyone able to rise from their bedrolls does so. Too delirious to stand, a few manage to crawl. The rest run for their lives before the advancing fog. It's the last mistake they ever make, Zed whispered. He swept a hand out before their white faces. They run headlong into the horror of a waiting death trap. Everyone was wide-eyed and slack-jawed by now, sitting on the edge of their benches. So, General, Zed said in a bright, cheery tone as he sat back, what about those mass graves? Or are you planning on any of you left alive just abandoning the sick for dead and leaving the bodies to rot? Probably not a bad idea. There will be enough to worry about without the burdensome task of trying to care for the dying and burying all the dead, especially since the very act of touching their white flesh will contaminate the living with a completely unexpected sickness. And then... Verna shot to her feet. But what can we do? She could plainly see the potential for chaos all around her. How can we counter such vile magic? She threw open her arms. What do we need to do? Zed shrugged. I thought you and your sisters had it all figured out. I thought you knew what you were doing. He waggled his hand over his shoulder, gesturing off to the south toward the enemy. I thought you said you had the situation well in hand. Verna silently sank back down to the bench beside Warren. Uh, Zed. General Rybish swallowed in distress. He held out the mosquito. Zed... I think I'm starting to feel dizzy. Isn't there anything you can do? About what? The fever. I think my vision is getting dimmer. Can you do nothing? No, nothing. Nothing? Nothing because there's nothing wrong with you. I just conjured a few albino mosquitoes to make a point. The point is that what I saw when I came into this camp scared the wits out of me. If the gifted among the enemy are at all diabolical, and with Jagang we have ample reason to believe they are, then this army is ill-prepared for the true nature of the threat. Sister Philippa haltingly lifted a hand like a schoolgirl with a question. But with all the gifted among us, surely we would know or something. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The way things are now, you won't know. It's the things you never heard of, haven't seen before, don't expect, and can't even imagine that are going to be coming for you. The enemy will use conventional magic, to be sure, and that will be trouble enough. But it's the albino mosquitoes you must fear. As you said, though, you only conjured them to make a point, Warren said. Maybe the enemy isn't as smart as you and won't think of such things. The Order did not take over all of the old world by being stupid, but by being ruthless. Zed's brow drew lower. He lifted a finger skyward to mark his words. Besides, they have already thought of just such things. This past spring, one of the sisters in the hands of the enemy used magic to unleash a deadly plague that could not be detected by anyone with the gift. Tens of thousands of people, from newborn infants to the old, suffered gruesome deaths. Those sisters, in the hands of the enemy, 
were a grave and ever-present danger. Anne had gone off alone on a mission to either rescue those sisters or eliminate them. From what Zed had seen when he had been down in Andorith, Anne had failed in her mission. He didn't know what had become of her, but he knew that Jagang still held sisters captive. But we stopped the plague, Warren said. Richard stopped it, as only he could. Zed held the gaze of the young wizard. Did you know that in order to save us from that grim fate, he had to venture to the Temple of the Winds, hidden away beyond the Veil of Life in the underworld itself? Neither you nor I can imagine the toll such an experience must have taken on him. I saw a shadow of the specter in his eyes when he spoke of it. I can't even hazard a guess as to how trifling a chance at success he had when he started on so hopeless a journey. Had he not prevailed against all odds, we would all be dead by now from an unseen death brought on by magic we could not detect and could not counter. I'd not want to again count on such an auspicious deliverance. No one could disagree with him. They nodded slightly or looked away. The tent had become a gloomy place. Verna rubbed her fingers across her brow. Pride is of no use to the dead. I admit it. Those gifted among us have little knowledge of what we're doing when it comes to using our gift in warfare. We know some things about fighting, perhaps even a great many things, but I admit we could be woefully lacking in the depth of knowledge needed. Think us fools, if you will, but don't ever think us at odds with you, Zed. We are all here on the same side. Her brown eyes betrayed nothing but simple sincerity. We not only could use your help, we would gratefully welcome it. Of course he will help us, Addie scoffed while giving Zed a scolding frown. Well, you have a good start. Admitting that you don't know something is the first step to learning, Zed scratched his chin. Every day I amaze myself with all I don't know. That would be wonderful, Warren said, if you would help us, I mean. He sounded hesitant, but forged ahead anyway. I would really like to have the benefit of a real wizard's experience. Despondent with the weight of his other troubles, Zed shook his head. I would like to. And to be sure, I will give you all some advice in the task at hand. However, I've been on a long and frustrating journey, and I'm afraid I'm not yet finished with it. I can't stay. I must soon be off again. Chapter 17 Warren swiped back his curly blonde hair. What sort of journey have you been on, Zed? Zed pointed a bony finger. You don't need to keep that flattened mosquito, General. General Rybish realized it was still between his finger and thumb. He tossed it away. Everyone awaited Zed's words. He smoothed the heavy maroon robes over his twig-like thighs as his gaze absently studied the dirt floor. He let out a crestfallen sigh. I was recovering from my own auspicious deliverance from grappling with remarkable magic I'd never before encountered, and as I regained my senses, spent months searching. I was down in Andorith, and saw some of what happened after the Order swept in there. It was a dark time for the people, not only from the rampaging soldiers, but also from one of your sisters, Verna. Death's mistress, they called her. Do you know which one it is? Verna asked in a bitter voice at hearing of a sister causing harm. No, I only saw her once from a goodly distance. Had I been fully recovered, I might have tried to remedy the situation. But I wasn't myself yet and dared not confront her. She also had a few thousand soldiers with her. The sight of all the soldiers, led by a woman they had heard of and feared, had people in a panic. The sister was young, with blonde hair. She wore a black dress. Dear creator, Verna whispered, not one of mine, one of the keepers. There are few women born with a strength of power such as she has. She also has power acquired by nefarious means. Nietzsche is a sister of the dark. I've gotten the reports, General Rybish said. By his grim tone, Zed knew the reports must have had it right. I've heard, too, that it's quieted considerably. Zed nodded. 
The order was at first brutal, but now Jagang the Just, as they have taken to calling him, has spared them further harm. In most places, other than the capital of Fairfield, where the most killing took place, people have turned to supporting him as a liberator, come to deliver them into a better life. Their reporting neighbors or travelers, whoever they suspect is not an adherent to the noble ideals of the order. I was all through Andereth and spent a good deal of time behind the enemy lines, searching without success. I then journeyed up into the wilds and north to a number of towns and even a few cities, but I can find no sign of them. I guess my abilities were a long time in recovering. I only a short time ago discovered where you all were. I have to commend you, General. You've kept the presence of your forces well hidden. Took me forever to find your army. The boy, though, seems to have vanished without a trace. Zed's fist tightened in his lap. I must find him. You mean Richard? Addie asked. You'll be searching for your grandson? Yes, for Richard and Kalen both. Zed lifted his hands in a helpless gesture. However, without any success, I must admit. I've talked to no one who has seen even a sign of them. I've used every skill I possess, but to no avail. If I didn't know better, I'd say they no longer existed. Looks passed among everyone else. Zed peered from one surprised face to another. For the first time in months, Zed's hopes rose. What? What is it? You know something? Verna gestured under the bench. Show him, General. At her urging, the General lifted out a map roll. He pulled it wide in his calloused hands and laid it on the ground at his feet. The map was turned around so Zed could read it. General Rybish tapped the mountains to the west of Heartland. Right here, Zed. Right there what? Richard and Kalen, Verna said. Zed gaped at her face and then down at the map. General Rybish's finger hovered over a wild range of peaks. Zed knew those mountains. They were an inhospitable place. There? Dear spirits, why would Richard and Kalen be all the way up there in such a forbidding place? What are they doing there? Kalen be hurt, Addie said in a consoling tone. Hurt? She was at the brink of passing into the spirit world. From what we be told, maybe she saw the world on the other side of the veil. Addie pointed to the map. Richard took her there to recover. But why would he do that? With a hand, Zed flattened his wavy white hair to the top of his head. His thoughts spun in a confusing jumble while he tried to take it all in at once. She could be healed. No, she be spelled. If magic be used to try to heal her, a vile hidden spell would be unleashed and she would die. Understanding washed over him. Dear spirits, I'm thankful the boy knew it in time. Before the horror of memories of the screams could come roaring to the fore of his thoughts, Zed slammed a mental door on them. He swallowed with the pain of those that slipped through. But still, why would he go there? He's needed here. He certainly is, Verna snapped. By her tone, it was a sore subject. He can't come here, Warren said. When Zed only stared at him, he explained further. We don't understand it all. But we believe Richard is following a prophecy of some sort. Prophecy? Zed dismissed it with a wave. Richard doesn't take to riddles. He hates them and won't pay heed to them. There are times when I wish he would, but he won't. Well, this one he's paying heed to. Warren pressed his lips tight for a moment. It's his own. His own what? Warren cleared his throat. Prophecy. Zed jumped to his feet. What? Richard? Nonsense! He's a war wizard, Verna said with quiet authority. Zed passed a scowl among all the suddenly circumspect expressions. He made a sour face and with a flourish of his robes returned to his seat beside Addie. What is this prophecy? Warren twisted a little knot of his violet robes. He didn't say exactly. Here, General Rybish pulled some folded papers from a pocket. He wrote me letters. We've all read them. Zed stood and snatched the letters from the general's big fist. He went to the table and smoothed out the pages. As everyone else sat silently watching, Zed leaned over the table and read Richard's words lying before him. 
With great authority, Richard paradoxically turned away from authority. He said that after much reflection, he had come to an understanding that arrived with the power of a vision, and he knew then beyond doubt that his help would only bring about certain catastrophe. In letters that followed, Richard said he and Kalin were safe, and she was slowly recovering. Kara was with them. In response to letters General Rybish and others had written, Richard remained steadfast in his stand. He warned them that the cause of freedom would be forever lost if he failed to remain on his true path. He said that whatever decisions General Rybish and the rest of them made, he would not contradict or criticize. He told them that his heart was with them, but they were on their own for the foreseeable future. He said, possibly forever. His letters basically gave no real information other than alluding to his understanding or vision and making it clear that they could expect no guidance from him. Nonetheless, Zed could read some of what the words didn't say. Zed stared at the letters long after he had finished reading them. The flame of the lamp wavered slowly from side to side, occasionally fluttering and sending up a coiled thread of oily smoke. He could hear muffled voices outside the tent as soldiers on patrol quietly passed along information. Inside, everyone remained silent. They had all read the letters. Verna's expression was tight with anxiety. She could hold her tongue no longer. Will you go see him, Zed? Convince him to return to the struggle? Zed lightly trailed his fingers over the words on paper. I can't. This is one time I can be of no help to him. But he's our leader in this struggle. The soft lamplight illuminated the feminine grace of her slender fingers as she pressed them to her brow in vain solace. Her hand fell back to her lap. Without him... Zed didn't answer her. He could not imagine what Anne's reaction to such a development would be. For centuries she had combed through prophecies in anticipation of the war wizard who would be born to lead them in this battle for the very existence of magic. Richard was that war wizard, born to the battle he had suddenly abandoned. What do you think be the problem? Addie asked in her quiet, raspy voice. Zed looked back to the letters one last time. He pulled his gaze from the words and straightened. All eyes around the dimly lit tent were on him as if hoping he could somehow rescue them from a fate they couldn't comprehend, but instinctively dreaded. This is a time of trial to the depth of Richard's soul. Zed slipped his hands up opposite sleeves until the silver brocade at the cuffs met. A passage of sorts, thrust upon him because of his comprehension of something only he sees. Warren cleared his throat. What sort of trial, Zed? Can you tell us? Zed gestured vaguely as memories of terrible times flashed through his mind. A struggle. A reconciliation. What sort of reconciliation? Warren pressed. Zed gazed into the young man's blue eyes, wishing he wouldn't ask so many questions. What is the purpose of your gift? Its purpose? Well, I guess to... Well, it just is. The gift is simply an ability. It is to help others, Verna stated flatly. She clutched her light blue cloak more tightly around her shoulders, as if it were armor to defend her from whatever Zed might throw at her in answer. Ah, then what are you doing here? The question caught her by surprise. Here? Yes. Zed waved his arm, indicating a vague, distant place. If the gift is to help others, then why are you not out there doing it? There are sick needing to be healed, ignorant needing to be taught, and the hungry needing to be fed. Why are you just sitting there, healthy, smart, and well-fed? Verna rearranged her cloak as she squared her shoulders into a posture of firm resolve. In battle, if you abandon the gates to help a fallen comrade, you have given in to a weakness. Your inability to steel yourself to an immediate suffering in order to prevent suffering on a much greater scale. If I run off to help the few people I could in that manner, I must leave my post here with this army, as they try to keep the enemy from storming the gateway into the new world. Zed's estimation of the woman rose a little. She had come tantalizingly close to expressing the essence of a vital truth. He offered her a small smile of respect as he nodded. 
She looked more surprised by that than she had by his question. I can certainly see why the Sisters of the Light are widely regarded as proper servants of need. Zed stroked his chin. So then it is your conviction that we with the ability, the gift, are born into the world to be slaves to those with needs? Well, no. But if there is a great need, then we are more tightly bound in the chains of slavery to those with every greater need, Zed finished for her. Thus anyone with a need, by right, to your mind, becomes our master, indentured servant to one cause, or to any greater cause that might come along, but chattel all the same, yes? This time Verna chose not to dance with him over what she apparently regarded as a patch of quicksand. It didn't prevent her from glaring at him, though. Zed held that there could be only one philosophically valid answer to the question. If Verna knew it, she didn't offer it. Richard has apparently come to a place where he must critically examine his alternatives and determine the proper course of his life, Zed explained. Perhaps circumstances have caused him to question the proper use of his abilities. And in view of his values, his true purpose... Verna opened her hands in a helpless gesture. I don't see how he could have any higher purpose than to be here, helping the army against the threat to the new world, the threat to the lives of free people. Zed sank back down onto the bench. You do not see, and I do not see, but Richard sees something. That doesn't mean he's right, Warren said. Zed studied the young man's face for a moment. Warren had fresh features, but also a knowing look in his eyes that betrayed something beyond mere youth. Zed wondered how old Warren was. No, it does not mean Richard is right. He may be making a heroic mistake that destroys our chance to survive. Kalen thinks maybe it be a mistake, Addie finally put in, as if regretting having to tell him. She wrote a note to me, I believe without Richard's knowledge, seeing as Kara wrote down Kalen's words for her, and gave it to the messenger. Kalen says that she fears Richard be doing this in part because of what happened to her. The mother confessor also confided that she be afraid Richard has lost his faith in people, and because of his rejection by the people of Andereth, Richard may view himself as a fallen leader. Bah! Zed waved his hand dismissively. A leader cannot follow behind people, tail between his legs, sniffing for their momentary whims and wishes, whining to follow them this way and that as they ramble through life. Those kind of people are not looking for a leader. They are looking for a master, and one will find them. A true leader forges a clear path through a moral wilderness so that people might see the way. Richard was a woods guide because such is his nature. Perhaps he is lost in that dark wood. If he is, he must find his way out. And it must be a correctly reasoned course if he is to be the true leader of a free people. Everyone silently considered the implications. The general was a man who followed the Lord Rawl and simply awaited his orders. The sisters had their own ideas. Zed and Addie knew the way ahead was not what it might seem to some. That's what Richard did for me. Warren said in a soft voice, staring off into memories of his own. He showed me the way, made me want to follow him up out of the vaults. I had become comfortable down there, content with my books and my fate, but I was a prisoner of that darkness, living my life through the struggles and accomplishments of others. I never could understand precisely how he inspired me to want to follow him up and out. Warren looked up into Zed's eyes. Maybe he needs that same kind of help himself. Can you help him, Zed? He has entered a dark time for any man, and especially for a wizard. He must come out the other side of this on his own. If I take him by the hand and lead him through, so to speak, I might take him away he would not have selected on his own, and then he would forever be crippled by what I had chosen for him. But worse yet, what if he's right? If I unwittingly forced him to another course, it could doom us all and result in a world enslaved by the Imperial Order. Zed shook his head. No, this much I know. Richard must be left alone to do as he must. If he truly is the one to lead us in this battle for the future of magic and of mankind, 
then this can only be part of his journey as it must be traveled. Almost everyone nodded, if reluctantly, at Zed's words. Warren didn't nod. He picked at the fabric of his violet robes. There's one thing we haven't considered. As everyone waited, his blue eyes turned up to meet Zed's gaze. In those eyes, Zed saw an uncommon wisdom that told him that this was a young man who could gaze into the depths of things when most people saw only the sparkles on the surface. It could be, Warren said, in a quiet but unflinching voice, that Richard, being gifted, and being a war wizard, has been visited by a legitimate prophecy. War wizards are different from the rest of us. Their ability is not narrowly specific, but broad. Prophecy is, at least theoretically, within his purview. Moreover, Richard has subtractive magic as well as additive. No wizard born in the last 3,000 years has had both sides. While we can perhaps imagine, we could not possibly begin to understand his potential, though the prophecies have alluded to it. It could very well be that Richard has had a valid prophecy that he clearly understands. If so, then he may be doing precisely what must be done. It could even be that he clearly understands the prophecy, and it is so gruesome he is doing us the only kindness he can by not telling us. Verna covered his hand with hers. You don't really believe that, do you, Warren? Said noticed that Verna put a lot of stock in what Warren said. Anne had told Zed that Warren was only beginning to exhibit his gift of prophecy. Such wizards, prophets, were so rare that they came along only once or twice a millennium. The potential importance of such a wizard was incalculable. Zed didn't know how far along that path Warren really was yet. Warren probably didn't either. Prophecy can be a terrible burden, Warren smoothed his robes along his thigh. Perhaps Richard's prophecy told him that if he is to ever have a chance to oversee victory, he must not die with the rest of us in our struggle against the army of the Imperial Order. General Rybish, silent about such wizardly things, had nevertheless been listening and watching intently. Sister Philippa's thumb twiddled a button on her dress. Even with Verna's comforting hand on his, Warren at that moment looked nothing but forlorn. Warren, Zed waited until their eyes met. We all at times envision the most fearful turn of events, simply because it's the most frightening thing we can imagine. Don't invest your thoughts primarily in that which is not the most likely reason for Richard's actions, simply because it is the reason you fear most. I believe Richard is struggling to understand his place in all this. Remember, he grew up as a woods guide. He has to come to terms not only with his ability, but with the weight of rule. Yes, but Zed lifted a finger for emphasis. The truth of a situation most often turns out to be that one with the simplest explanation. The gloom on Warren's face finally melted away under the dawning radiance of a luminous smile. I'd forgotten that ancient bit of wisdom. Thank you, Zed. General Rybish, combing his curly beard with his fingers, pulled the hand free and made a fist. Besides, the Harans will not be so easily bested. We have more forces to call upon, and we have allies here in the Midlands who will come to aid in the fight. We have all heard the reports of the size of the Order, but they are just men, not evil spirits. They have gifted, but so do we. They have yet to come face to face with the might of the Haran soldiers. Warren picked up a small rock, not quite the size of his fist, and held it in his palm as he spoke. I mean no disrespect, General. And I do not mean to dissuade you from our just cause, but the subject of the Order has been a pastime of mine. I've studied them for years. I'm also from the old world. Fair enough. So what is it you have to tell us? Well, say that the tabletop is the old world, the area from which Jagang draws his troops. Now, there are places, to be sure, where there are few people spread over vast areas, but there are many places with great populations, too. It's much the same in the New World, the general said. Dahara has populous places and desolate areas. Warren shook his head. He passed his hand over the tabletop. Say this is the Old World, the whole of this table. He held up the rock to show the general, 
and then placed it on the edge of the tabletop. This is the new world. This is its size, this rock, compared to the old world. But, but that doesn't include Dahara, General Rivish sputtered. Surely with Dahara, Dahara is included in the rock. I'm afraid Warren is right, Verna said. Sister Philippa, too, nodded grim acknowledgement. Perhaps, she said, looking down at her hands folded in her lap, perhaps Warren is right, and Richard has seen a vision of our defeat, and knows he must remain out of it, or be lost with all the rest of us. I don't think that's it at all, Zed offered in a gentle voice. I know Richard. If Richard thought we would lose, he would say so in order to give people a chance to weigh that in their decisions. The general cleared his throat. Well, actually, one of the letters is missing from that stack. It was the first, where Lord Rawl told me about his vision. In it, Lord Rawl did say that we had no chance to win. Zed felt the blood drain down into his legs. He tried to keep his manner unconcerned. Oh, where is the letter? The general gave Verna a sidelong glance. Well, actually, Verna said, when I read it, I was angered and... And she balled it up and threw it in the fire, Warren finished for her. Verna's face turned red, but she offered no defense. Zed could understand the sentiment, but he would have liked to have read it with his own eyes. He forced a smile. Were those his actual words, that we had no chance to win, Zed asked, trying not to sound alarmed. He could feel sweat running down the back of his neck. No, General Rybish said as he shifted his shoulders inside his uniform while giving the question careful thought. No, Lord Rawl's words were that we must not commit our forces to an attack directly against the army of the Imperial Order, or our side will be destroyed, and any chance for winning in the future will be forever lost. The feeling began to return to Zed's fingers. He wiped a bead of sweat from the side of his forehead. He was able to draw an easier breath. Well, that only makes sense. If they are as large a force as Warren says, then any direct attack would be foolhardy. It did make sense. Zed wondered, though, why Richard would make such a point of it to a man of General Rybish's experience. Perhaps Richard was only being cautious. There was nothing wrong with being cautious. Addie slipped her hand under Zed's and cuddled her loose fist under his palm. If you believe you must let Richard be in this, then you will stay... Help teach the gifted here what they must know? Every face was etched with concern as they watched him, hanging on what he might decide. The general idly stroked a finger down the white scar on the side of his face. Sister Philippa knitted her fingers together. Verna and Warren entwined theirs. Zed smiled and hugged Addie's shoulders. Of course I'm not going to abandon you. The three on the bench opposite them each let out a little sigh. Their posture relaxed as if ropes around their necks had been slackened. Zed passed a hard look among them all. War is a nasty business. It's about killing people before they can kill you. Magic in war is simply another weapon, if a frightening one. You must realize that it, too, in this must be used for the end result of killing people. What do we need to do? Verna asked, clearly relieved that he had agreed to stay, but not to the obvious extent of General Rybish, Warren, or Sister Philippa. Zed pulled some of his robes from each side of his legs over into the middle between them as he gave the question some thought. It was not the sort of lesson he relished. Tomorrow morning we will begin. There is much to learn about countering magic in warfare. I will teach all the gifted some things about the awful business of using what you always hoped to use for good for harm instead. The lessons are not pleasing to endure, but then neither is the alternative. The thought of such lessons, and worse, the use of such knowledge, could not be pleasant for any of them to contemplate. Addie, who knew a little bit about the horrific nature of such struggle, rubbed his back in sympathy. His heavy robe stuck to his skin. He wished he had his simple wizard's robes back. We will all do as we must to protect our own people from falling to the monstrous magic of the Imperial Order, Verna said. You have my word as prelate. Zed nodded. Tomorrow, then, we begin. 
I fear to think of magic added to warfare, General Ryber said as he stood. Zed shrugged. To tell the truth, the ultimate object of magic in warfare is to counter the enemy's magic. If we do our job properly, we will bring balance to this. That would mean that all magic would be nullified, and the soldiers would then be able to fight without magic swaying the battle. You will be able to be the steel against steel, while we are the magic against magic. You mean your magic won't be of direct help to us? Zed shrugged. We will try to use magic to visit harm on them in any way we can. But when we try to use magic as a weapon, the enemy will try to counter ours. Any attempt to use their power against us, we will try to counter. The result of magic in warfare, if properly and expertly done, is that it seems as if magic did not exist at all. If we fail to rise to the challenge, then the power they throw at us will be truly horrific to witness. If we can best them, then you will see such destruction of their forces as you can't imagine. But in my experience, magic has a way of balancing so that you rarely see such events. A deadlock, then, is our goal? Sister Philippa asked. Zed turned his palms up, moving his hands up and down in opposition, as if they were scales holding great weight. The gifted on both sides will be working harder than they have ever worked before. I can tell you that it's exhausting. The result, except with small shifts in the advantage, is that it will seem as if we were all doing nothing to earn our dinner. Zed let his hands drop. It will be punctuated with brief moments of sheer horror and true panic when it seems beyond doubt that the world itself is about to end in one final fit of sheer madness. General Rybish grinned in an odd, gentle, knowing way. Let me tell you, war, when you're holding a sword, looks about the same way. He held up a hand in mock defense. But I'd rather that, I guess, than have to swing my sword at every magic mosquito that came along. I'm a man of steel against steel. We have Lord Rawl to be the magic against magic. I'm relieved we have Lord Rawl's grandfather, the first wizard, to aid us, too. Thank you, Zed. Anything you need is yours. Just ask. Verna and Warren added silent nods as the general stepped to the entrance of the tent. When Zed spoke, General Rybish turned back, gripping the flap in one hand. You're still sending messengers to Richard? The general confirmed that they were. Captain Myfert was up there, too. He might be able to tell you more about Lord Rawl. Have all of the messengers returned safely? Most of them. He rubbed his bearded chin. We've lost two so far. One messenger was found by chance at the bottom of a rock slide. Another never returned, but his body wasn't found, which wouldn't be unusual. It's a long and difficult journey. There are any number of hazards on such a journey. We have to expect we might lose a few men. I'd like you to stop sending men up there to Richard. But Lord Rawl needs to be kept informed. What if the enemy should capture one of those messengers and find out where Richard is? If you have no scruples, most any man can eventually be made to talk. The risk is not worth it. The general rubbed his palm on the hilt of his sword as he considered Zed's words. The order is far to the south of us, way down in Anderith. We control all the land between here and the mountains where Lord Rawl is staying. He shook his head in resignation at Zed's unflinching gaze. But if you think it's a concern, I'll not send another. Won't Lord Rawl wonder, though, what's going on with us? What's going on with us is not really relevant to him right now. He is doing as he must do, and he can't allow our situation to influence him. He has told you already that he won't be able to give you any orders that he must stay out of it. Zed tugged his sleeves straight and sighed as he thought about it. Perhaps when the summer is over, before the full grip of winter descends and they're snowed in way up there, I'll go and see how they fare. General Rybish gave a departing smile. If you could talk to Lord Rull, it would be a relief for us all, Zed. He would trust your word. Good night, then. The man had just betrayed his true feelings. No one in the tent really trusted what Richard was doing, except perhaps Zed, and Zed had his doubts too. 
Kalin had said that she believed Richard viewed himself as a fallen leader. These people who claimed not to understand how he could believe such a thing at the same time didn't trust his actions. Richard was all alone with only the strength of his beliefs to support him. After the general had gone, Warren leaned forward eagerly. Zed, I could go with you to see Richard. We could get him to tell us everything, and we could then determine if it really is a prophecy, or, as he says, just an understanding he's come to. If it's not really a prophecy, we might be able to make him see things differently. More important, we could begin teaching him, or you could, anyway, about his gift, about using magic. He needs to know how to use his ability. As Zed paced, Verna let out a little grunt to express her misgivings about Warren's suggestion. I tried to teach Richard to touch his Han. A number of sisters attempted to. No one was able to make any progress. But Zed believes a wizard is the one to do it. Isn't that right, Zed? Zed halted his pacing and regarded them both a moment as he considered how to put his thoughts into words. Well, as I said before, teaching a wizard is not really the work for sorceresses, but another wizard. With Richard, I don't think you would have any better luck than we did, Verna railed. Warren didn't give ground, but Zed believes... Zed cleared his throat, bidding silence. You're right, my boy. It is the job of a wizard to teach another wizard born with a gift. Verna rose an angry finger to object, but Zed went on. In this case, however, I believe Verna is right. She is? Warren asked. I am? Verna asked. Zed waved in a mollifying gesture. Yes, I believe so, Verna. I think the sisters can do some teaching. After all, look at Warren here. The sisters have managed to teach him something about using his gift, even if it was at the cost of time. You've taught others, if in a limited way, to my view of it. But you couldn't manage to teach Richard the most simple of things. Is that correct? Verna's mouth twisted with displeasure. None of us could teach him the simple task of sensing his own Han. I sat with him hours at a time and tried to guide him through it. She folded her arms and looked away from his intent gaze. It just didn't work the way it should have. Warren touched a finger to his chin while he frowned, as if recalling something. You know, Nathan said something to me once. I told him that I wanted to learn from him, that I wanted him to teach me about being a prophet. Nathan said that a prophet could not be made, but that they were born. I realized then that everything I knew and understood about prophecy really understood about it, in a whole new way, I had learned on my own and not from anyone else. Could this with Richard be something like that? Is that your point, Zed? It is. Zed sat down once more on the hard wooden bench beside Addie. I would love, not only as his grandfather, but as first wizard, to teach Richard what he needs to know about using his ability, but I'm coming to doubt that such a thing is possible. Richard is different from any other wizard in more ways than just his having the gift for subtractive magic in addition to the usual additive. But still, Sister Philippa said, you are first wizard. Surely you would be able to teach him a great deal. Zed pulled a fold of his heavy robes from between his bony bottom and the hard bench as he considered how to explain it. Richard has done things even I don't understand. Without my training, he has accomplished more than I can even fathom. On his own, Richard reached the Temple of the Winds in the Underworld, accomplished the task of stopping a plague, and returned from beyond the veil to the world of life. Can any of you even grasp such a thing? Especially for an untrained wizard. He banished the chimes from the world of the living. How? I have no idea. He has worked magic I've never heard of, much less seen or understand. I'm afraid my knowledge could be more of an interference than an aid. Part of Richard's ability and advantage is the way he views the world, through not just fresh eyes, but the eyes of a seeker of truth. He doesn't know something is impossible, so he tries to accomplish it. I fear to tell him how to do things, how to use his magic, because such teaching also might suggest to him limits of his powers, thus creating them in reality. What could I teach a war wizard? I know nothing about the subtractive side of magic, much less the gift of such power. Lacking another war wizard with subtractive magic, are you suggesting it would maybe take a sister of the dark to teach him? Warren asked. Well, Zed mused, that might be a thought. 
He let out a tired sigh as he turned more serious. I have come to realize that it would not only be useless to try to teach Richard to use his ability, but it may even be dangerous to the world. I would like to see him and offer my encouragement, experience, and understanding, but help? Zed shook his head. I don't dare. No one offered any objection. Werner, for one, had first-hand experience that very likely confirmed the truth of his words. The rest of them probably knew Richard well enough to understand much the same. May I help you find a spare tent, Zed? Verna finally asked. You look like you could use some rest. In the morning, after you get a good night's rest, and we all think this over, we can talk more. Warren, who had just been about to ask another question before Verna spoke first, looked disappointed but nodded in agreement. Zed stretched his legs out straight as he yawned. That would be best. The thought of the job ahead was daunting. He ached to see Richard to help him, especially after searching for him for so long. Sometimes it was hard to leave people alone when that was what they most needed. That would be best, he repeated. I am tired. Summer be slipping away from us. The nights be turning chilly, Addie said as she pressed against Zed's side. She looked up at him with her white eyes that in the lamplight had a soft amber cast. Stay with me and warm my bones, old man. Zed smiled as he embraced her. It was as much of a comfort to be with her again as he had expected. In fact, at that moment, if she had given him another hat with a feather, he would have donned it and with a smile. Worry, though, ached through his bones like an approaching storm. Zed, Verna said, seeming to notice in his eyes the weight of his thoughts. Richard is a war wizard, who, as you say, has in the past proven his remarkable ability. He's a very resourceful young man. Besides that, he is none other than the seeker himself and has the sword of truth with him for protection, a sword that I can testify he knows how to use. Kalin is a confessor, the mother confessor, and is experienced in the use of her power. They have a moored Sith with them. Moored Sith take no chances. I know, Zed whispered staring off into a nightmare swirl of thoughts. But I still fear greatly for them. What is it that worries you so? Warren asked. Albino mosquitoes. Chapter 18 Panting in exhaustion, Kalin had to dance backward through the snarl of hobblebush, stitched through with thorny blackberry, to dodge the swing of the sword. The tip whistled past, missing her ribs by an inch, in her mad dash to escape, she ignored the snag and tug of thorns on her pants. She could feel her heartbeat galloping at the base of her skull. As he relentlessly pressed his attack, forcing her back over a low rise of ledge and through the swale beyond, mounds of fallen leaves kicked aloft by his boots boiled up into the late afternoon air like colorful thunderheads. The bright yellow lustrous orange and vivid red leaves rained down over rocky outcrops, swaddled in prickly whorls of juniper. It was like doing battle amid a fallen rainbow. Richard lunged at her again. Kalin gasped, but blocked his sword. He pressed his grim attack with implacable determination. She gave ground, stepping high as she did so, in order to avoid tripping over the snare of roots around a huge white spruce. Losing her footing would be fatal. If she fell... Richard would stab her in an instant. She glanced left. There loomed a tall prominence of sheer rock draped with long trailers of woolly moss. To the other side, the brink of a ridge ran back to eventually meet that rock wall. Once the level ground tapered down to that dead end, the only option was going to be to climb straight up or straight down. She deflected a quick thrust of his sword, and he warded hers. In a burst of fury, she pressed a fierce assault, forcing him back a dozen steps. He effortlessly parried her strikes and then returned her attack in kind. What she had gained was quickly lost twice over. She was once again desperately defending herself and trading ground for her life. On a low dead branch of a balsam fir not ten feet away, a small red squirrel, with his winter ear tufts already grown in, plucked a leathery brown rosette of lichen growing on the bark. With his white belly gloriously displayed, he sat on his haunches at the end of the broken-off dead wood his bushy tail raised up, holding the crinkled piece of lichen in his tiny paws, eating round and round the edges like some spectator at a tournament eating a fried bread cake while he watched the combatants clash. 
Kaylin gulped air as her eyes darted around, looking for clear footing among the imposing trunks of the highland wood, while at the same time watching for an opportunity that might save her. If she could somehow get around Richard, around the menace of his sword, she might be able to gain a clear escape route. He would run her down, but it would buy her time. She dodged a quick thrust of his sword and ducked around a maple sapling into a bed of brown and yellow bracken ferns dappled by glowing sunlight. Richard, driving forward in a sudden mad rush to end it, lifted his sword to hack her. It was her opening, her only chance. In a blink, Kalin reversed her retreat and sprang ahead a step, ducking under his arm. She drove her sword straight into his soft middle. Richard covered the wound with both hands. He teetered a moment and then crumpled into the bed of ferns, sprawling flat on his back. Leaves lying lightly atop taller ferns were lifted by the disturbance. They somersaulted up into the air, finally drifting down to brightly decorate his body. The fierce red of the maple leaves was so vibrant it would have made blood look brown by comparison. Kalin stood over Richard, gasping to catch her breath. She was spent. She dropped to her knees and then threw herself across his supine body. All around them fern fronds the color of caramel candy were curled into little fists as if in defiance of having to die with the season. The sprinkling of lighter, yellowish, hay-scented ferns lent a clean, sweet scent to the afternoon air. There were few things that could equal the fragrance of the woods in late autumn. In a spectacular bit of chance, a tall maple nearby, sheltered as it was by a protective corner in the rock wall, was not yet denuded, but displayed a white spread of leaves so orange they looked tangy against the powder-blue sky above. Kara! Putting her left hand to Richard's chest, Kaylin pushed herself up on one arm to call out, Kara, I killed Richard! Kara, not far off, laying on her belly at the edge of the ridge as she watched out beyond, said nothing. I killed him, did you hear? Kara, did you see? Yes, she muttered, I heard you killed Lord Thrall. No, you didn't, Richard said, still catching his breath. She whacked him across the shoulder with her willow switch sword. Yes, I did. I killed you this time, killed you dead. You only grazed me. He pressed the point of his willow switch to her side. You've fallen into my trap. I have you at the point of my sword now. Surrender or die, woman. Never, she said, still gasping for breath as she laughed. I'd rather die than be captured by the likes of you, you rogue. She stabbed him repeatedly in his ribs with her willow practice sword as he giggled and rolled from side to side. Cara, did you see? I killed him this time. I finally got him. Yes, all right, Kara grouched as she intently watched out beyond the ridge. You killed Lord Rall. Good for you. She glanced back over her shoulder. This one is mine, right, Lord Rall? You promised this one was mine. Yes, Richard said, still catching his breath. This one goes for yours, Kara. Good, Kara smiled in satisfaction. It's a big one. Richard smirked up at Kalen. I let you kill me, you know. No, you didn't. I won. I got you this time. She whacked him again with her willow sword. She paused and frowned. I thought you said you weren't dead. You said it was only a scratch. Ha! You admitted I got you this time. Richard chuckled. I let you... Kalen kissed him to shut him up. Kara saw and rolled her eyes. When Kara looked back over the ridge, she suddenly sprang up. They just left. Come on before something gets it. Kara, nothing is going to get it, Richard said. Not this quickly. Come on, you promised this one was mine. I don't want to have gone through all this for nothing. Come on. All right, all right, Richard said as Kalen climbed off him. We're coming. He held his hand out for Kalen to help him up. She stabbed him in the ribs instead. Got you again, Lord Rawl. You're getting sloppy. Richard only smiled as Kalen finally offered her hand. When he was up, he hugged her in a quick gesture and before turning to follow after Kara, said, Good job, Mother Confessor. Good job. You killed me dead. I'm proud of you. Kalen endeavored to show him a sedate smile, but she feared it came out as a giddy grin. Richard scooped up his pack and hefted it onto his back. Without delay, he started the descent down the steep, broken face of the mountain. Kalen threw her long wolf's fur mantle around her shoulders and followed him through the deep shade of sheltering spruce at the edge of the ridge, stepping on the exposed ledge rather than the low places. Be careful, Richard called out to Kara, already a good distance ahead of them. With all the leaves covering the ground, you can't see holes or gaps in the rock. 
I know, I know, she grumbled. How many times do you think I need to hear it? Richard constantly watched out for them both. He had taught them how to walk in such terrain and what to be careful of. From the beginning, marching through the forests and mountains, Kayla noted that Richard moved with quiet fluidity, while Kara traipsed along, bounding up onto and off of rocks and ledges, almost like an exuberant youngster. Since Kara had spent most of her life indoors, she didn't know that it made a difference how you walked in such terrain. Richard had patiently explained to her, Pick where to put your feet in order to make your steps comparatively level. Don't step down to a lower spot if you don't need to, only to have to step up again as you continue your climb up the trail. Don't step up needlessly, only to have to step down again. If you must step up on something, you don't always need to lift your whole body. Just flex your legs. Kara complained that it was too hard to think about where to put her foot each time. He told her that by walking the way she did, she was actually climbing the mountain twice for each time he climbed it. He admonished her to think as she walked, and soon it would become instinctive and would require no conscious thought. When Kara found that her shin and thigh muscles didn't get as tired and sore when she followed his suggestions, she became a keen student. Now she asked questions instead of arguing. Most of the time. Kaylin saw that as Kara descended the steep trail, she did as Richard had taught her and used a stick as an improvised staff to probe any suspicious low area where leaves collected before stepping there. This was no place to break an ankle. Richard said nothing, but sometimes he smiled when she found a hole with her stick rather than her foot, as she used to. Forging a new trail on a steep slope like the one they were descending was dangerous work. Potential trails often withered into dead ends, requiring that you retrace your steps. On less severe slopes, hillsides, and flatter ground especially, animals often made good trails. In a valley, a suitable trail that shrank to nothing wasn't a big problem, because there you could beat through the brush to more open ground. Making your own trail on a rocky precipice a thousand feet up was always arduous and often frustrating. In such conditions, particularly if the hour grew late, the desire not to have to backtrack a difficult climb tempted people into taking chances. Richard said that it was hard work that demanded you put reason before your wish to get down, get home, or get to a place to camp. Wishing gets people killed, he often said. Using your head gets you home. Kara poked her stick into a pile of leaves between bare granite rocks. Don't step in the leaves here, she said over her shoulder as she hopped onto the far rock. There's a hole. Why, thank you, Kara, Richard said in mock gratitude, as if he would have stepped there had she not warned him. The cliff face they were on had a number of sizable ledges with rugged little trees and shrubs that provided good footing and the safety of a handhold. Below, the mountainside dropped away before them into a lush ravine. Beyond the defile, it rose up again in a steep slope covered with evergreens and the dull gray and brown skeletons of oaks, maples, and birches. The raucous coats of autumn leaves had been resplendent while they lasted, but now they were but confetti on the ground, and there they faded fast. Usually the oaks held on to their leaves until at least early winter, and some of them until spring, but up in the mountains icy winds and early storms had already stripped even the oaks bare of their tenacious brown leaves. Kara stepped out onto a shelf of ledge, jutting out over the chasm below. There, she said as she pointed across the way. Up there, do you see? Richard shielded his eyes against the warm sunlight as he squinted higher up on the opposite slope. He made a sound deep in his throat to confirm that he saw it. Nasty place to die. Kalen snugged the warm wolf fur up against her ears to protect them from the cold wind. There's a good place? Richard let his hand drop from his brow. I guess not. Farther up the slope from where Kara had pointed the forest ended in a place called the Crooked Wood. Above that, where no trees could grow, the mountain was naked rock ridges and scree. A little farther up, snow, white as sugar, sparkled in the slanting sunlight. Below the snow and bare rock, the Crooked Wood was exposed to harsh winds and bitter weather, causing the trees to grow in tortured shapes. The Crooked Wood was a line of demarcation between the desolation, where little more than lichen could survive the forbidding weather, and the forest of trees huddled below. Richard gestured off to their right. Let's not waste any time, though. I don't want to be caught up here come dark. 
Kalin looked out to where the mountain opened onto a grand vista of snow-capped peaks, valleys, and the undulating green of seemingly endless, trackless forests. A roiling blanket of thick clouds had invaded those valleys, stealing in around the mountains, sneaking ever closer. In the distance, some of the snow-capped peaks stood isolated in a cottony gray sea. Lower down the mountains, below those dense dark clouds, the weather would be miserable. Both Richard and Kara awaited Kalin's word. She didn't like the thought of being exposed in the crooked wood when the icy cold fog and drizzle arrived. I'm fine. Let's go and get it done. Then we can get down lower, where we'll be able to find a wayward pine to stay dry tonight. I wouldn't mind sitting beside a hearty little fire sipping hot tea. Kara blew warm breath into her cupped hands. That sounds good to me. It was on the first day Kalin met Richard more than a year before that he had taken her to a wayward pine. Kalin had never known about such trees in the deep woods of Westland. Wayward pines still held the same mystic quality for her as they did the first time she saw one silhouetted against a darkening sky, taller than all the trees around it. Such mature trees were a friend to travelers far from any conventional shelter. A big wayward pine's boughs hung down to the ground all around. The needles grew mostly at the outer fringe, leaving the inner branches bare. Inside, under their dense green skirts, wayward pines provided excellent shelter from harsh weather. Something about the tree's sap made them resistant to fire, so if you were careful, you could have a cozy campfire inside while outside it rained and stormed. Richard, Kalen, and Kara often stayed in wayward pines when they were out in the mountains. Those nights getting warm around a small fire within the tree's confines brought them all closer and gave them time to reflect, to talk, and to tell stories. Some of the stories made them laugh. Some brought a lump to their throats. After Kalin's assurance that she was up to it, Richard and Kara nodded and started down the cliff. She had recovered from her terrible wounds, but they still left it up to her to decide if she was prepared for the effort of such a descent and climb and then descent again before they found a sheltered campsite, hopefully in a wayward pine. Kalin had been a long time in healing. She had known, of course, that injuries such as she had suffered would take time to heal. Bedridden for so long, her muscles had become withered, weak, and nearly useless. For a long time, it had been hard for her to eat much. She became a skeleton. With the realization of just how weak and helpless she had become, even as she healed, she had inexorably spiraled down into a state of abject oppression. Kalin had not comprehended completely the punishing effort that would be required if she was to be herself again. Richard and Kara tried to cheer her up, but their efforts seemed distant. They just didn't understand what it was like. Her legs wasted away until they were bony sticks with knobby knees. She felt not just helpless, but ugly. Richard carved animals for her, hawks, foxes, otters, ducks, and even chipmunks. They seemed only a curiosity to her. At the lowest point, Kalin almost wished she had died along with their child. Her life became a tasteless gruel. All she saw day after day, week after week, were the four walls of her sick room. The pain was exhausting and the monotony numbing. She came to hate the bitter yarrow tea they made her drink and the smell of the poultice made of tall sink foil and yarrow. When after a time she resisted drinking yarrow, they would sometimes switch to linden, which wasn't so bitter but didn't work as well, yet it did help her sleep. Skullcap often helped when her head hurt, though it was so astringent it made her mouth pucker for a long time after. Sometimes they switched to a tincture of fever few to help ease her pain. Kalin came to hate taking herbs and would often say she didn't hurt, when she did, just to avoid some horrid concoction. Richard hadn't made the window in the bedroom very big, in the summer heat, the room was often sweltering. Kalin could see only a bit of the sky outside her window, the tops of some trees and the jagged blue-gray shape of a mountain in the distance. Richard wanted to take her outside, but Kalin begged him not to try because she didn't think it would be worth the pain. It didn't take much convincing for him to be talked out of hurting her. Every kind of day, from sunny and bright to gray and gloomy, came and went. Lying in her little room as time slipped away while she slowly healed, Kalin thought of it as her lost summer. One day she was parched, 
and Richard had forgotten to fill the cup and place it where she could reach it on the simple table beside the bed. When she asked for water, Richard came back with the cup and a full water skin and set them both on the window sill as he called to Kara outside. He rushed out, telling Kalen as he went that he and Kara had to go check the fishing lines and they would be back as soon as they could. Before Kalen could ask him to put the water closer, he was gone. Kalen lay fuming in the silence, hardly able to believe that Richard had been so inconsiderate as to leave the water out of her reach. It was unusually warm for late summer. Her tongue felt swollen. She stared helplessly at the wooden cups setting in the window sill. On the verge of tears, she let out a moan of self-pity and smacked her fist against the bed. She rolled her head to the right away from the window and closed her eyes. She decided to take a nap in order not to think about her thirst. Richard and Kara would be back by the time she awoke, and they would get the water for her. And Richard would get a scolding. Sweat trickled down her neck. Outside, a bird kept calling. Its repetitious song sounded like a little girl with a high-pitched voice saying, Who me? Once a who me bird started in, it was a long performance. Kaylin could think of little else besides how much she wanted a drink. She couldn't make herself fall asleep. The annoying bird kept asking its question over and over again. More than once she found herself whispering, Yes, you, an answer. She growled a curse at Richard. She squeezed her eyes shut and tried to forget her thirst, the heat, and the bird, and go to sleep. Her eyes kept popping open. Kaylin lifted her sleeping gown away from her chest, roughing it up and down to cool herself. She realized she was staring at the water in the window. It was out of her reach, clear over on the other side of the room. The room wasn't very big. But still, she couldn't walk. Richard knew better. She thought that maybe, if she could sit up and move to the bottom of the bed, she might be able to reach the cup. With an ill-tempered huff, she threw the light cover off her bony legs. She hated seeing them. Why was Richard being so inconsiderate? What was the matter with him? She intended to give him a piece of her mind when he got back. She eased her legs over the side of the bed. The mattress was a pliable woven mat stuffed with grasses and feathers and toe padding. It was quite comfortable, and Kalen was pleased with her snug bed. With a great effort, she pushed herself up. For a long time, she sat on the edge of the bed, holding her head in her hands as she caught her breath. Her whole body throbbed in pain. It was the first time she had sat up all by herself. She understood very well what Richard was doing. Still, she didn't appreciate his way of forcing her to get up. It was cruel. She wasn't ready. She was still badly hurt. She needed to rest in bed in order to recover. Her oozing wounds had finally closed up and healed over, but she was sure she was still too injured to be getting up. She feared to test broken bones. Accompanied by a lot of groaning and grunting, she worked herself to the bottom of the bed. Sitting there, one hand holding the footboard to steady herself, she was still too far from the window to reach the water. She was going to have to stand. She paused for a while to have dark thoughts about her husband. After a day many weeks before, when she had called for a long time and Richard hadn't heard her weak voice, he had left a light pole beside her, so she would be able to use it to reach out and knock on the wall or door if she was in urgent need of their help. Now, Kaylin worked her fingers around the pole lying alongside her bed and lifted it upright. She planted the thicker end on the ground and leaned on the pole for support as she carefully slid off the bed. Her feet touched the cool dirt floor. Putting weight on her legs made her gasp in pain. She half stood, half leaned on the bed, prepared to cry out, but realized she was gasping more at the brutal pain she expected than from the actual pain. It did hurt, but she realized it wasn't too much to endure. She was a bit disgruntled to learn it wasn't nearly as bad as it had been. She had been planning on reducing Richard to tears with the torturous suffering he had so cavalierly forced upon her. She put more weight on her feet and pulled herself up with the aid of the pole. Finally, she stood in wobbling triumph. She was actually on her feet and she had done it by herself. Kalen couldn't seem to make her legs walk the way she wanted them to. In order to get to the water, she was going to have to make them do her bidding, at least until she reached the window. 
Then she could collapse to the floor where Richard would find her. She luxuriated in her mental picture of it. He wouldn't think his plan to get her out of bed so clever then. With the aid of the stout pole for support and her tongue poked out the corner of her mouth for balance, she slowly shuffled to the window. Kaylin told herself that if she fell, she was going to lie there in a heap on the floor without any water until Richard came back and found her moaning through cracked lips, dying of thirst. He would be sorry he had ever tried such a pitiless trick. He would feel guilty for the rest of his life for what he had done to her. She would see to it. Almost wishing every difficult step of the way that she would fall, she finally made it to the window. Kaylin threw an arm over the sill for support and closed her eyes as she panted in little breaths so as not to hurt her ribs. When she had her wind back, she drew herself up to the window. She snatched the cup and gulped down the water. Kaylin plunked the empty cup down on the sill and peered out as she caught her breath again. Richard was sitting on the ground just outside, his arms hooked around his knees, his hands clasped. Hi there, he said with a smile. Kara, sitting right beside him, gazed up without emotion. I see you're up. Kaylin wanted to yell at him, but instead she found herself trying with all her might not to laugh. She felt suddenly and overwhelmingly foolish for not trying sooner to get up on her own. Tears stung her eyes as she looked out at the expanse of trees, the vibrant colors, the majestic mountains, and the huge sweep of blue sky dotted with fluffy white clouds marching off into the distance. The size of the mountains, their imposing slopes, their luscious color, was beyond anything she had ever encountered before. How could she possibly not have wanted more than anything to get up and see the world around her? You know, of course, that you've made a big mistake, Richard said. What do you mean? Kaylin asked. Well, had you not gotten up, we'd have kept waiting on you, at least for a time. Now that you've shown us that you can get up and move on your own, we're only going to keep doing this, putting things out of your reach to make you start moving about and helping yourself. While she silently thanked him, she was unwilling just yet to tell him out loud how right he had been, but inside she loved him all the more for braving her anger to help her. Kara turned to Richard. Should we show her where she can find the table? Richard shrugged. If she gets hungry, she'll come out of the bedroom and find it. Kalin threw the cup at him, hoping to wipe the smirk off his face. He caught the cup. Well, glad to see your arm works, he said. You can cut your own bread. When she started to protest, he said... It's only fair. Kara baked it. The least you can do is to cut it. Kalin's mouth fell open. Kara baked bread? Lord Raal taught me, Kara said. I wanted bread with my stew, real bread, and he told me that if I wanted bread, I would have to learn to make it. It was easy, really. A little like walking to the window. But I was much more good-natured about it and didn't throw anything at him. Kalin could not help smiling, knowing it must have been harder for Kara to knead dough than for Kalin to get up and walk. She somehow doubted that Kara had been good-natured about it. Kalin would like to have seen that battle of wills. Give me back my cup, and then go catch some fish for dinner. I'm hungry. I want a trout, a big trout, along with bread, Richard smiled. I can do that, if you can find the table. Kalin did find the table. She never ate in bed again. At first, the pain of walking was sometimes more than she could tolerate, and she took refuge in her bed. Kara would come in and brush her hair, just so Kaylin wouldn't be alone. She had no power in her muscles, and could hardly move by herself. Brushing her own hair was a colossal task. Just getting to the table was exhausting, and all she could accomplish at first. Richard and Kara were sympathetic, and continually encouraged her, but they pushed her, too. Kalin was joyous to be out of the bed, and that helped her to ignore the pain. The world was again a wondrous place. She was more than joyous to be able at last to go out to the privy. While she never said so, Kalin was sure Kara was happy about that, too. As much as she liked the snug home, going outside felt like finally being freed from a dungeon. Before, Richard had frequently offered to take her outside for the day, but she had never wanted to leave her bed, fearing the pain. She realized that because she was so sick, her thinking had slowly become dull and foggy. Along with her summer, she had for a time lost herself. Now at long last, 
she felt clear-headed. She discovered that the view outside her window was the least impressive of the surrounding sights. Snow-capped peaks towered around the small house Richard and Kara had built in the lap of breathtaking mountains. The simple house, with a bedroom at either end, one for Richard and Kalen and one for Kara, with a common room in the middle, sat at the edge of a meadow of velvety green grasses sprinkled with wildflowers. Even though it was late in the season when they had arrived, Richard managed to start a small garden in a sunny place outside Kara's window, growing fresh greens for the table and some herbs to add flavor to their cooking. Right behind the house, huge old white pines towered over them, sheltering them from the full force of the wind. Richard had continued his carving to pass the time as he sat by Kaylin's bed, talking and telling stories. But after she had at last gotten out of bed, his carvings changed. Instead of animals, Richard began sculpting people. And then one day he surprised her with his most magnificent carving yet. In celebration, he said, of her getting well enough to finally come out into the world. Astonished by the utter realism and power of the small statue, she whispered that it could only be the gift that had guided his hand in carving it. Richard regarded such talk as nonsense. People without the gift carve beautiful statues all the time, he said. There's no magic involved. She knew, though, that some artists were gifted and able to invoke magic through their art. Richard occasionally spoke wistfully about the works of art he'd seen at the People's Palace in Dahara, where he had been held captive. Growing up in Heartland, he had never before seen statues carved in marble, and certainly none carved on such a grand scale or by such talented hands. Those works had in some ways opened his eyes to the greater world around him and had made a lasting impression on him. Who else but Richard would remember fondly the beauty he saw while held captive and being tortured? It was true that art could exist independent of magic, but Richard had been taken captive in the first place only with the aid of a spell brought to life through art. Art was a universal language, and thus an invaluable tool for implementing magic. Kalin finally stopped arguing with him about whether the gift helped him to carve. He simply didn't believe it. She felt, though, that having no other outlet, his gift must be expressing itself in this way. Magic always seemed to find a way to seep out, and his carvings of people certainly did seem magical to her. But the figure of the woman that he carved for her as a gift stirred profound emotion within her. He called it an image nearly two feet tall, carved from buttery, smooth, rich, aromatic walnut, spirit. The femininity of her body its exquisite shape and curves, bones and muscle, were clearly evident beneath her flowing robes. She looked alive. How Richard had accomplished such a feat, Kalin couldn't even imagine. He had conveyed through the woman, her robes flowing in a wind as she stood with her head thrown back, her chest out, her hands fisted at her sides, her back arched and strong as if in opposition to an invisible power trying unsuccessfully to subdue her, a sense of spirit. The statue was obviously not intended to look like Kalin, yet it evoked in her some visceral response, a tension that was startlingly familiar. Something about the woman in the carving, some quality it conveyed, made Kalin hunger to be well, to be fully alive, to be strong and independent again. If this wasn't magic, she didn't know what was. Kalin had been around grand palaces her whole life, exposed to any number of pieces of great art by renowned artists, but none had ever taken her breath with its thrust of inner vision, its sense of individual nobility, as did this proud, vibrant woman in flowing robes. The strength and vitality of it brought a lump to Kalin's throat, and she could only throw her arms around Richard's neck in speechless emotion. Chapter 19 Now Kalin went outside at every opportunity. She placed the carving of spirit on the windowsill, so she could see it not only from bed, but also when she was outdoors. She turned the statue so that it always faced outside. She felt it should always be facing the world. The woods around the house were mysterious and alluring. Intriguing trails went off into the shadowy distance, and she could just detect light off at the end of the gently curving tunnel through the trees. 
she ached to explore those narrow tracks, animal trails enlarged by Richard and Kara on their short treks to ten fishing lines and forays in search of nuts and berries. Kaylin, with the aid of a staff, hobbled around the house and the meadow to strengthen her legs. She wanted to go with Richard on those treks, through the filtered sunlight and gentle breezes, over the open patches of ledge and under the arched, enclosing limbs of huge oaks. One of the first places Richard took her, when she insisted she could walk for a short distance, was through that tunnel in the thick, dark wood to the patch of light at the other end, where a brook descended a rocky gorge. The brook was sheltered on the hillside above them by a dense stand of trees. An enormous weight of water continuously plunged over that stepped tumble of rocks, surging around boulders and pouring in glassy sheets over ledges. Many of the bare-sized rocks sitting in the shady pools were flocked in a dark green velvet of moss and sprinkled with long, tawny needles from the white pines that favored the rock slope. Flecks of sunlight winking through the dense canopy shimmered in the clear pools. At the bottom of that gorge, in that sunny mountain glen off behind their house where the trail emerged from the woods, the brook broadened and slowed as it meandered through the expansive valley surrounded by the awesome jut of the mountains. Sometimes Kaylin would dangle her bony legs over a bank and let the cool water caress her feet. There she could sit on the warm grass and soak up the sun while watching fish swim through the crystal-clear water flowing over gravel beds. Richard had been right when he told her that trout liked beautiful places. She loved watching the fish, frogs, crayfish, and even the salamanders. Oftentimes, she would lie on her stomach on the low grassy bank with her chin resting on the backs of her hands and watch for hours as the fish came out from under sunken logs from beneath rocks or from the dark depths of the larger pools to snatch a bug from the surface of the water. Kalen caught crickets, grasshoppers, and grubs, and periodically tossed them in for the fish. Richard laughed when she talked to the fish, encouraging them to come up out of their dark holes for a tasty bug. Sometimes a graceful gray heron would stand on its thin legs in the shallow marshes not far away, and occasionally spear a fish or a frog with its dagger-like bill. Kaylin could not recall in the whole of her life ever being in a place with such a vibrancy of life to it surrounded by such majesty. Richard teased her, telling her she hadn't seen anything yet, making her curious and ever eager to get stronger so she could explore new sights. She felt like a little girl in a magical kingdom that was theirs and theirs alone. Having grown up a confessor, Kaylin had never spent much time outdoors watching animals or water tumbling down over rocks or clouds or sunsets. She had seen a great many magnificent things, but they were in the context of travel, cities, buildings, and people. She had never lingered in one place in the countryside to really soak it all in. Still, the thoughts in the back of her mind hounded her. She knew that she and Richard were needed elsewhere. They had responsibilities. Richard casually deflected the subject whenever she broached it. He had already explained his reasoning and believed he was doing what was right. They hadn't been visited by messengers for a very long time. That worry played on her mind, too. But Richard said that he couldn't allow himself to influence the army, so it was just as well that General Rybish had stopped sending reports. Besides, he said, it only needlessly endangered the messengers who made the journey. For the time being, Kalin knew she needed to get better, and her isolated mountain life was making her stronger by the day, probably as nothing else could. Once they returned to the war, once she convinced him that they must return, this peaceful life would be but a cherished memory. She resolved to enjoy what she couldn't change while it lasted. Once, when it had been raining for a few days, and Kalin was missing going out to the brook to watch the fish, Richard did the most unheard of thing. He started bringing her fish in a jar. Live fish. Fish just for watching. After he'd cleaned an empty lamp oil jug and several wide-mouthed glass jars that had held preserves, herbs, and unguents for her injuries, along with other supplies he had purchased on their journey away from Andorith, he put some gravel at the bottom and filled them with water from the stream. He then caught some black-nosed dace minnows and put them in the glass containers. They were yellowish olive on top, speckled with black with white bottoms, and a thin black line down each side. 
He even provided them with a bit of weed from the brook so they could have a place to hide and feel safe. Kaylin was astonished when Richard brought home the first jar of live fish. She set the jars, eventually four jars and one jug and all, on the window sill in the main room beside several of Richard's smaller carvings. Richard, Kaylin, and Kara sat at the small wooden table when they ate and watched the marvel of fish living in a jar. Just don't name them, Richard said because eventually they're going to die. What she had at first thought was an entirely daft idea became a center of fascination for her. Even Kara, who sighted fish in a jar as lunacy, took a liking to the little fish. It seemed that every day with Richard in the mountains held some new marvel to turn her mind away from her own pains and troubles. After the fish became accustomed to people, they went about their little lives as if living in a jar were perfectly natural. From time to time, Richard would pour out part of their water and add fresh water from the brook. Kalen and Kara fed the little fish crumbs of bread or tiny scraps from dinner, along with small bugs. The fish ate eagerly and spent most of their time pecking at the gravel on the bottom or swimming about, looking out at the world. After a while, the fish learned when it was lunchtime. They would wiggle eagerly on the other side of the glass whenever anyone approached, like puppies happy to see their masters. The main room had a small fireplace Richard had built with clay from stream banks he'd formed into bricks and dried in the sun and then cooked in a fire. They had the table he'd made and chairs constructed of branches intertwined and lashed together. He'd woven the chair bottoms and backs from leathery inner bark. In the corner of the room was a wooden door over a deep root cellar. Against the back wall were simple shelves and a big cupboard full of supplies. They'd bought a lot of supplies along the way and carried them either in the carriage with Kalen or strapped on the back and sides. For the last part of the journey, Richard and Kara had lugged everything in since the carriage couldn't make it over narrow mountain passes where there were no roads. Richard had blazed the trail in. Kara had her own room opposite theirs. Once up and about, Kalen was surprised to find that Kara had a collection of rocks. Kara bristled at the term collection and asserted that they were there as defensive weapons, should they be attacked and trapped in the house. Kalen found the rocks, all different colors, suspiciously pretty. Kara insisted they were deadly. While Kalen had been bedridden, Richard had slept on a pallet in the main room, or sometimes outside under the stars. A number of times at first, when she was in so much pain, Kalen had awakened to see him sitting on the floor beside her bed, dozing as he leaned against the wall, always ready to jump up if she needed anything or to offer her medicines and herb teas. He hadn't wanted to sleep in bed with her for fear of it hurting her. She almost would have been willing to endure it for the comfort of his presence beside her. Finally, though, after she was up and about, he was at last able to lie beside her. That first night with him in bed, she had held his big warm hand to her belly as she gazed at spirit, silhouetted in the moonlight, listening to the night calls of birds, bugs, and the songs of the wolves until her eyes closed and she drifted into a peaceful slumber. It was on the next day that Richard first killed her. They were at the stream checking the fishing lines when he cut two straight willow switches. He tossed one on the ground beside where she sat and told her it was her sword. He seemed in a playful mood and told her to defend herself. Feeling playful herself, Kalen took up the challenge by suddenly trying to stab him just to put him in his place, he stabbed her first and declared her dead. She fought him again more earnestly the second time, and he quickly dispatched her with a convincingly feigned beheading. By the third time she went after him, she was a little irked. She put all her effort into her assault, but he smoothly thwarted her attack and then pressed the tip of his willow switch sword between her breasts. He announced her dead for a third time out of three. Thereafter, it became a game Kalen wanted to win. Richard never let her win, not even just to be nice when she was feeling low because of her slow progress at getting stronger. He repeatedly humbled her in front of Kara. Kalen knew he was doing it to make her push herself to use her muscles, to forget her aches, to stretch and strengthen her body. Kalen just wanted to win. They each carried their willow switch swords sheathed behind a belt, always at the ready. Every day she would attack him or he would attack her, and the fight was on. At first, she was no challenge to him, and he made it clear she was no challenge. That, of course, only made her determined to show him that she was no novice, 
that it was not so much a battle of strength, but of leverage, advantage, and swiftness. He encouraged her, but never gave her false praise. As the weeks passed, she slowly began making him work for his kills. Kaelin had been taught to use a sword by her father, King Wyborn. At least he had been king before Kaelin's mother took him for her mate. King was an insignificant title to a confessor. King Wyborn of Galea had had two children with his queen and first wife, so Kaelin had both an older half-sister and a half-brother. Kaelin wanted very much to make a good show of her training under her father. It was frustrating to know she was far better with a weapon than she was showing Richard. It wasn't so much that she didn't know what to do, but that she simply couldn't do it. Her muscles were not yet strong enough, nor would they respond nearly quickly enough. Something about it, though, was still unsettling. Richard fought in a way Kaelin had never encountered in her training, or in the real combat she had seen. She couldn't define or analyze the difference, but she could feel it, and she didn't know what to do to counter it. In the beginning, Richard and Kaelin had most of their battles in the meadow outside their house, so that Kaelin wouldn't be as likely to trip over something, and if she did, not as likely to hit her head on anything granite. Kara was their ever-present audience. As time passed, the battles lasted longer and grew more strenuous. They became furious and exhausting. A couple of times, Kaelin had been so upset by Richard's relentless attitude toward their sword fights that she didn't speak to him for hours afterward, lest she let slip words she didn't really mean and which she knew she would regret. Richard would then sometimes tell her, Save your anger for the enemy. Here it will do you no good. There it can overcome fear. Use this time now to teach your sword what to do, so later it will do it without conscious thought. Kalen well knew that an enemy was never kind. If Richard gave in to kindness, awarded her false pride, it could only serve her ill. As aggravating as such lessons sometimes were, it was impossible to remain angry with Richard for very long, especially because she knew she was really only angry with herself. Kalen had been around weapons and men who used them all her life, a few of the better ones, in addition to her father, were on occasion her teachers. None of them had fought like Richard. Richard made fighting with a blade look like art. He gave beauty to the act of dealing death. There was something about it, though, tickling at her, something she knew she still wasn't grasping. Richard had told her once, before she had been hurt, that he had come to believe that magic itself could be an art form. She had told him she thought that was crazy. Now she didn't know. From the bits of the story she'd heard, she suspected that Richard had used magic in something of that way to defeat the chimes. He had created a solution where it had never before existed or even been imagined. One day, in one of their fierce sword fights, she had been positive she had him dead to rights and that she was delivering the stroke of victory. He effortlessly evaded what she had been sure was her killing strike and killed her instead. He made what had seemed impossible look natural. It was in that instant that the whole concept came clear for her. She had been looking at it all wrong. It wasn't that Richard could fight well with a sword, or that he could create beautiful statues with a knife and chisel. It was that Richard was one with the blade, the blade in any form, sword, knife, chisel, or willow switch. He was a master not of sword fighting or carving as such, but in the most fundamental way of the blade itself. Fighting was but one use of a blade. His balance for using his sword to destroy, magic always sought balance, was using a blade to carve things of beauty. She had been looking at the individual parts of what he did, trying to understand them separately. Richard saw only one unified whole. Everything about him, the way he shot an arrow, the way he carved, the way he used a sword, even the way he walked with such fluid, reasoned intent, they weren't separate things, separate abilities. They were all the same thing. Richard paused. What's the matter? Your face is turning white. Kalen stood with her willow sword lowered. You're dancing with death. That's what you're doing with your sword. Richard blinked at her, as if she had just announced that rain was wet. But of course. Richard touched the amulet hanging at his chest. In the center, surrounded by a complex of gold and silver lines, was a teardrop-shaped ruby as big as her thumbnail. 
I told you that a long time ago. Are you just now coming to believe me? She stood gaping. Yes, I think I am. Kalin recalled all too clearly his chilling words to her when she had first seen the amulet around his neck, and she had asked him what it was. The ruby is meant to represent a drop of blood. It is the symbolic representation of the way of the primary edict. It means only one thing and everything. Cut. Once committed to fight, cut. Everything else is secondary. Cut. That is your duty, your purpose, your hunger. There is no rule more important, no commitment that overrides that one. Cut. The lines are a portrayal of the dance. Cut from the void, not from bewilderment. Cut the enemy as quickly and directly as possible. Cut with certainty. Cut decisively, resolutely. Cut into his strength. Flow through the gaps in his guard. Cut him. Cut him down utterly. Don't allow him a breath. Crush him. Cut him without mercy to the depths of his spirit. It is the balance to life. Death. It is the dance with death. It is the law a war wizard lives by, or he dies. The dance was art. It was no different, really, from carving. Art expressed through a blade. It was all one and the same to him. He saw no distinction, for within him there was none. They shared the meadow with a red fox who hunted it for rodents, mostly, but wasn't averse to chewing on whatever juicy bugs she could catch there. Their horses didn't mind the fox so much, but they didn't like the coyotes that sometimes visited. Kalin rarely saw them, but she knew they were about when the horses snorted their displeasure. She often heard the coyotes barking at night higher up in the surrounding slopes. They would let out long, flat howls, followed by a series of yips. Some nights the wolves sang their long, monotone howls, without the yapping of the coyotes, echoing through the mountains. Once, Kalin saw a black bear off in the trees, ambling along, giving them only a passing look. And once a bobcat passed near their house, sending the horses off in a panic. It took Richard the better part of a day to find the horses. Chipmunks begged at their door and regularly invited themselves into the house for a look around. Kalin often caught herself talking to them and asking questions as if they could understand her every word. The way they paused and cocked their heads at her made her suspect they really could. In the early mornings, small herds of deer often visited the meadow, some leaving fresh inverted heart-shaped tracks near the door as they passed. Lately, aggressive bucks in rut bearing huge racks had been showing up. One of the hides Kalin wore was from a wolf injured by one of those bucks up in an oak grove not far away. Richard had spared the wounded animal a lingering, suffering death. Beside the sword fights, they went on marches up into the mountains to help Kalin strengthen her limbs. Those walks were taxing on her leg muscles, sometimes leaving her so sore she couldn't sleep. Richard would rub oil into her feet, calves, and thighs when they hurt too much for her to sleep. That usually worked, relaxing her and making her drowsy and able to fall asleep. She distinctly remembered the rainy night after walking home in the wet and cold when she lay on her back in bed, eyes shut, as Richard rubbed warm oil into her leg muscles. He whispered that her legs finally seemed to have gotten back all their tone and shape. Kalin looked up and saw desire in his eyes. It was an almost forgotten thrill to know his hunger for her. She had been so startled that she felt tears trickle down her cheeks with the joy of suddenly feeling like a woman again, a desirable woman. Richard raised her leg to his mouth and gently kissed her bare ankle. By the time his soft, warm kisses reached her thighs, she was panting with suddenly and unexpectedly awakened desire. He laid open her nightshirt and rubbed the warm oil on her exposed belly. His big hands moved up her body to caress her breasts. He breathed through his mouth as he rolled her nipples until they were hard between his finger and thumb. Why, Lord Rawl, she said in a breathy whisper, I do believe you are going to get carried away. He paused, seeming to check himself and what he was doing, and then pulled back. I won't break, Richard, she said, as she caught his hand and pulled it back. I'm all right now. I'd like it if you got carried away. She clutched his hair in her fists as his kisses covered her breasts and then her shoulders and then worked up her neck. His panting warmed her ear. His exploring fingers made her frantic with need. 
His body against hers felt wildly erotic. She no longer felt weary. Finally, he tenderly kissed her lips. She let him know by the way she returned the kiss that he needn't be all that tender. As the rain drummed on the roof, as lightning lit the lines and the clenched fist strength of the statue in the window, and thunder rumbled through the mountains, Kalen, without fearing it, without worrying about it, without wondering if she would be able, held Richard tightly as they made quiet, gentle, fierce love. They had never needed each other as much as that night. All her fears and worries evaporated in the heat of overpowering need welling up through her. She wept with the strength of her pleasure and the release of her emotions. When later Richard lay in her arms, she felt a tear roll off his face, and she asked him if something was wrong. He shook his head and said distantly that he had for so long feared losing her that sometimes he had believed he might go mad. It seemed as if he could finally allow himself release from his private terror. The pain Kalin had first seen in his eyes when she couldn't remember his name was at last banished. Their marches into the mountains ranged farther and farther. Sometimes they took packs and spent the night in the woods, often in a wayward pine, when they could find one. The rugged terrain offered a never-ending variety of vistas. In places, sheer rock cliffs towered over them. In other places, they stood at the brink of sheer drops and watched the sun turn the sky orange and purple as it went down while wispy clouds drifted through quiet green valleys below. They went to towering waterfalls with their own rainbows. There were clear, sunlit pools up in the mountains where they swam. They ate on rocks overlooking rugged sights no one but they ever saw. They followed animal trails through vast woods of gnarled trees and others among the dark forest floor, where grew trees with trunks like huge brown columns, so big twenty men couldn't have joined hands around them. Richard had Kaylin practice with a bow to help strengthen her arms. They hunted small game for stews or for roasting. Some they smoked and dried along with the fish they caught. Richard usually didn't eat meat, but occasionally he did. Not eating meat was part of the balance needed by his gift for when he was forced to kill. That need of balance was lessening because he wasn't killing. He was at peace. Perhaps the balance was now being served by his carving. As time passed, he was able to eat more meat. When they were out on journeys, they usually ate rice and beans, along with bannock and any berries they collected along the way, in addition to game they caught. Kalin helped clean fish and salt them down and smoke yet others for their winter stores. It was a job that she had never before undertaken. They collected berries, nuts, and wild apples, and put a lot of those away in the root cellar, along with root crops he had purchased before coming up into the mountains. Richard dug up small apple trees when he found any, and planted them in the meadow by the house, so that, he said, some day they would have apples close at hand. Kalin wondered how long he intended to keep them away from where they were needed. The silent question always hung there, seen by all but unspoken. Kara never asked him, but she sometimes made some small mention of it to Kalin when they were alone. She was Lord Rawls' guard, and glad to be close at hand, so she generally offered no objection. He was, after all, Lord Rawl, and he was safe. Kalin had always felt the weight of their responsibilities, like the towering mountains all around, looming over them, always shadowing them, that responsibility could never be completely forgotten. As much as she loved the house Richard had built on the edge of the meadow, and as much as she loved exploring the rugged, beautiful, imposing, and ever-changing mountains, with each passing day, she more and more felt that weight and the anxious need to be back where they were needed most. She fretted at what could be going on that they weren't aware of. The Imperial Order was not going to stay put. An army that size liked to move. Soldiers, especially soldiers of that ilk, became restless in long encampments, and sooner or later started causing trouble. She worried about all the people who needed the reassurance of Richard's presence, his guidance, and hers. There were people who their whole lives had depended on the mother confessor always being there to stand up for them. With winter coming on, Richard had made Kalen a warm mantle, mostly out of wolf fur. The other two pelts were coyotes. Richard had found one of the coyotes with a broken leg, probably from a fall, and had put it out of its misery. The other had been a rogue chased off by the local pack. 
It had taken to raiding food from their little smokehouse. Richard had taken the sly looter with a single arrow. They had collected most of the wolf pelts from injured or old animals. Richard, Kalen, and Kara often tracked wolf packs as a way of helping to build Kalen's strength. Kalen came to recognize their tracks and even learned to know at a glance if the prints were in mud or soft dirt, their front paws from the rear. Richard showed her how the toes of the front spread out more with a more well-defined heel pad than the rear paw. She had located several packs in the mountains, and the three of them often followed one group or family to see if they could do so without the wolves knowing. Richard said it was a kind of game guides used to play to keep in practice, to keep their senses sharp. After Kalen's mantle was completed, they had turned to collecting pelts for Kara's winter fur. Kara, who always wore the clothes of her profession, had liked the idea of Lord Rawl making something for her to wear, the same as he had made for Kalen. While she had never said as much, Kalen had always felt that Kara saw the mantle he was making for her as a mark of his feelings, his respect, proof that she was more than just his bodyguard. This had been a journey to find pelts for Kara's mantle, and she had been eager. She had even cooked for them. Now, coming down off the ridge where Kalen had finally bested Richard in a sword fight, Kalen was in a good mood. For the last two days, they had been following the wolf pack up in the mountains to the west of their house. It was not simply a hunt, and not simply to get a pelt for Kara, but part of the never-ending pressure Richard put on Kalen to keep up. Almost every day for the last two months, Richard had her marching over the most difficult terrain, the kind of terrain that made her strain every muscle in her body. As Kalen had gotten stronger, the marches had gotten longer. At first, they were only across the house. Now they were across mountains. On top of that... He frequently attacked her with his willow sword and poked fun at her if she didn't put in her absolute hardest fight. In a way, finally beating Richard in one of their mock sword fights puzzled her. He might have been tired from carrying the heaviest pack and scouting some of the steeper trails by himself first and then coming back for them, but he hadn't slacked off, and she had still killed him. She couldn't help but be pleased with herself, even if she did question her victory. Out of the corner of her eye, she had caught him smiling as he looked at her. Kalen knew Richard was proud of her for besting him. In a way, his losing was a victory for him. Kalen thought that she must be stronger now, after all Richard had put her through, than at any time in her life. It had not been easy, but it had been worth, at last, feeling like the carving in the window of her bedroom. Kalen put a hand on Richard's shoulder as he followed Kara down broken granite blocks, placed by chance like big, irregular steps. Richard, how did I beat you? He saw in her eyes the seriousness of the question. You killed me because I made a mistake. A mistake? You mean perhaps you had gotten too confident? Perhaps you were just tired or were thinking of something else. Doesn't really matter, does it? Whatever it was, it was a mistake that cost me my life in the game. In a real fight, I would have died. You've taught me a valuable lesson to redouble my resolve to always put in my absolute full effort. It just goes to remind me, though, that I could make a mistake at any time and lose. Kalen couldn't help but be struck by the obvious question. Was he making a mistake in staying out of the effort to keep the Midlands free from the tyranny of the Imperial Order? She couldn't help feeling the pull to help her people, even though Richard still felt that if the people didn't want his leadership, his efforts could do no good. As Mother Confessor, Kalen knew that while people didn't always understand that what a leader did was done in their best interest, that was no reason to abandon them. With winter coming on, she hoped the Imperial Order would choose to stay put in Andorith. Kalen needed to convince Richard to return to help the Midlands, but she was at a loss to know how. He was firm in his reasoning, and she could find no chink in the armor of his logic. Emotion did not sway him in this. Kara led them down the craggy precipice, having to backtrack only twice. It was a difficult descent. Kara was pleased with herself, and that Richard had let her pick the route. It was her pelt they were going after, so he let her lead them across the tangle of undergrowth in the ravine at the bottom, and then up the following lip of the notch where trees clung with roots like talons to the rocky rise. The wind coming up the ravine had turned bitter. The clouds had thickened, until they snuffed out the golden rays of sunlight. Their ascent took them up into a gloomy, dark wood of towering evergreens. 
Far over their heads, the treetops swayed in the wind, but down on the ground, it was still. Their footfalls were hushed by a thick, spongy mat of brown needles. The climb was steep, but not arduous. As they ascended, the big trees grew farther and farther apart. The boughs became scraggly, allowing more of the somber light to seep in. For the most part, the rocks higher up were bare of moss and leaves. In places, they had to use handholds on the rock or else roots to help them climb. Kalin pulled deep breaths of the cold air. It felt good to test her muscles. They came out of the forest into the steel-gray light of late afternoon and the moaning voice of the wind. They were in the crooked wood. The scree and rock were naked of the thick moss common lower down the mountain, but they bore yellow-green splotches of lichen outlined in black. Only a bit of scraggly brush clung to the low places here and there. But it was the trees that were the most odd and gave the place at the top of the tree line its name. They were all stunted, few taller than Kalin or Richard. Most of the branches grew to one side because of the prevailing winds, leaving the trees looking like grotesque running skeletons frozen in torment. Above the crooked wood, few things other than sedges and lichens grew. Above that, the snow cap held sway. Here it is, Kara said. They found the wolf sprawled on the scree beside a low boulder with a dark stain of dried blood at the sharp edge. Up higher, the pack of gray wolves had been trying to take down a woodland caribou. The old bull had grazed the unlucky wolf with a kick. That in itself would likely not have been anything more than painful, but the wolf had slipped from the higher ledge and fallen to its death. Kalin ran her fingers through the thick yellow-gray coat tipped in black. It was in good condition and would be a warm addition to Kara's winter mantle. Richard and Kara started skinning the good-sized female animal as Kalin went out to the edge of an overhang. She drew her own mantle up around her ears as she stood in the bitter wind surveying the approaching clouds. She was somewhat startled by what she saw. Richard, it's not drizzle coming our way, Kalin said. It's snow. He looked up from his bloody work. Do you see any wayward pines down in the valley? She squinted down to the valley floor spread out before her. Yes, I see a couple. The snow is still a ways off. If you're not long at that, we can probably make it down there and collect some wood before it gets wet. We're almost done, Kara said. Richard stood to have a quick look for himself. With a bloody hand, he absently lifted his real sword a few inches and then let it drop back, a habit he had of checking to make sure the weapon was clear in its scabbard. It was an unsettling gesture. He had not drawn the weapon from its hilt since the day he had been forced to kill all those men who had attacked them back near Heartland. Is something wrong? What? Richard saw where her eyes were looking and glanced down at the sword on his hip. Oh, no, nothing. Just habit, I guess. Kalin pointed. There's a wayward pine there. It's the closest and good size, too. Richard wiped the back of his wrist across his brow, swiping his hair away from his eyes. His fingers glistened with blood. We'll be down there, sheltered by a wayward pine, sitting beside a cozy fire having tea before dark. I can stretch the hide on the branches inside and scrape it there. The snow will help insulate us inside the tree's boughs. We'll have a good rest before heading back in the morning. Down a little lower, it will only be rain. Kaylin snuggled her cheek inside her wolf fur as a shiver tingled through her shoulders and up the back of her neck. Winter had snuck up on them. Chapter 20 When they arrived home two days later, the little fish in the jars were all dead. They had used the same easier route over the pass that they had originally used to enter the valley when they had first come in with the horses months before. Of course, Kaylin didn't recall that trip, she had been unconscious. It seemed a lifetime ago. There was now a shorter trail to their home, one they had blazed down from the pass. They could have used that alternative route, but it was narrow and difficult and would have saved them only ten or fifteen minutes. They had been out for days, and as they had wearily stood in the wind-swept notch at the top of the pass looking down at their cozy home far below at the edge of the meadow, they had decided to take the easier passage, even though it took a little longer. It had been a relief to finally get inside the house out of the wind and drop all their gear. As Richard brought in firewood and Kara fetched water, 
Kaylin pulled out a little square of cloth with some small bugs she'd caught earlier that day, intending to give her fish a treat, since they were sure to be hungry. She let out a little groan when she saw that they were dead. What's the matter? Kara asked as they walked in, lugging a full bucket. She came over to see the fish. Looks like they starved, Kaylin told her. Little fish like that don't often live long in a jar, Richard said as he knelt and started stacking birch logs atop kindling in the fireplace. But they did live a long time, Kalin said, as if to prove him wrong and somehow talk him out of it. You didn't name them, did you? I told you not to name them because they would die after a time. I warned you not to let yourself get emotionally attached when it can only come to no good end. Kara named one. Did not, Kara protested. I was just trying to show you which one I was talking about, that's all. After the flames took from his flint, Richard looked up and smiled. Well, I'll get you some more. Kalen yawned. But these were the best ones. They needed me. Richard snorted a laugh. You've got quite the imagination. They only depended on us because we artificially altered their lives. Just like the chipmunks would stop hunting seeds for their winter stores if we gave them handouts all the time. Of course, the fish had no choice because we kept them in jars. Left to their own initiative, the fish wouldn't need any help from us. After all, it took a net to catch them. I'll catch you some more, and they'll come to need you just as much. Two days later, on a thinly overcast day, after they'd had a big lunch of thick rabbit stew with turnips and onions along with bread Kara had made, Richard went off to check the fishing lines and to catch some more of the black-nosed dace minnows. After he'd left... Kara picked up their spoons and put them in the bucket of wash water on the counter. You know, she said, looking back over her shoulder. I like it here. I really do, but it's starting to make me jumpy. Kalin scraped the plates off into a wooden bowl with the cooking leavings for the midden heap. Jumpy? She brought the plates to the counter. What do you mean? Mother confessor, this place is nice enough, but it's starting to make me go daft. I am more Sith. Dear spirits, I'm starting to name fish in jars. Kara turned back to the bucket and bent to cleaning the spoons with a washcloth. Don't you think it's about time we convinced Lord Rawl that we need to get back? Kalin sighed. She loved their home in the mountains, and she loved the quiet and solitude. Most of all, she treasured the time she and Richard were able to spend together without other people making demands of them. But she also missed the activity of Aidendril, the company of people, and the sights of cities and crowds. There was a lot not to like about being in places like that, but there was an excitement about it, too. She'd had a lifetime to become used to the way people didn't always want or understand her help, and forging ahead anyway because she knew it was in their best interest. Richard never had to learn to face that cold indifference and go about his duty despite it. Of course I do, Kara. Kalin placed the bowl of scraps on a shelf, reminding herself to empty it later. She wondered if she was to be a mother confessor who forever lived in the woods away from her people, a people struggling for their liberty. But you know how Richard feels. He thinks it would be wrong. More than that, he thinks it would be irresponsible to give in to such a wish when reason tells him he must not. Kara's blue eyes flashed with determination. You are the mother confessor. Break the spell of this place. Tell him that you are needed back there and that you are going to return. What's he going to do, tie you to a tree? If you leave, he will follow. He will have to return then. Kalin shook her head emphatically. No, I can't do that. Not after what he's told us. That's not the kind of thing you do to a person you respect. I may not exactly agree with him, but I understand his reasons and know him well enough to dread that he's right. But going back doesn't mean he would have to lead our side. You would only be making him follow you back, not making him return to leadership, Kara smirked. But maybe when he sees how much he is needed, he will come to his senses. That's part of the reason he's brought us so far out in the mountains. He fears that if he's near the struggle, or if he goes back, he will see all that's happening and be drawn in. I can't use his feelings for me to force him into such a corner. Even if we did go back and he resisted the temptation to help people fighting for their lives and wasn't drawn into the struggle against the brutality of the imperial order, such an overt act of coercion on my part would create an enduring rift between us. 
Kaylin shook her head again. This is something he believes too strongly. I won't force him into returning. Kara gestured with the dripping washcloth. Maybe he doesn't really believe it, not really, not deep down inside. Maybe he doesn't want to go back because he doubts himself over the Andorith thing, and so he thinks it's just easier for him to stay away. I don't believe Richard doubts himself in this. Not in this, not for a second. Not one tiny little bit. I think that if he had any doubt whatsoever, he would return, because that is really the easier path. Staying away is harder, as you and I can attest. But you can leave at any time, Kara. If you feel so strongly about going back, he has no claim on your life. You don't have to stay here if you don't wish to. I am sworn to follow him no matter what foolish thing he does. Foolish? You follow him because you believe in him. So do I. That's why I could never walk away, forcing him to follow. Kara pressed her lips tight. Her blue eyes lost their fire as she turned away and forced the cloth back into the bucket of water. Then we will be stuck here, condemned to live out our lives in paradise. Kalen smiled in understanding of Kara's frustration. While she wouldn't try to force Richard into something he was dead set against, that didn't preclude her from trying to change his mind. She drained her teacup and plunked it down on the counter. That would be different. Maybe not. You know, I've been thinking the same thing. That we need to go back, I mean. Kara peered over with a suspicious sidelong glance. So, what do you think we can do to convince him? Richard is going to be gone for a while, without him here to bother us. How about we have a bath? A bath? Yes, a bath. I've been thinking about how much I'd like to get cleaned up. I'm tired of looking like a backcountry traveler. I'd like to wash my hair and put on my white mother confessor's dress. Your white mother confessor's dress? Kara smiled conspiratorially. Ah, now that will be the kind of battle a woman is better equipped to fight. Out of the corner of her eye, Kaylin could see Spirit, standing in the bedroom window, looking out at the world, her robes flowing in the wind, her head thrown back, her back arched, her fists at her sides in defiance of anything that would think to bridle her. Well... Not exactly a battle the way you're thinking, but I believe I can state the case better if I'm dressed properly. That wouldn't be unfair. I will be putting the issue to him as the mother confessor. I believe that in some ways his judgment has been clouded. It's hard to think about anything else when you're worried sick about someone you love. Kaylin's fists tightened at her sides as she thought about the danger hanging over the Midlands. He's got to see that all of that is in the past, that I'm healthy now, and that the time has come to return to our duties to our people. Smirking, Kara swiped back a wisp of her blonde hair. He will see that and more if you were in that dress of yours, that's for sure. I want him to see the woman who was strong enough to win against him with a sword. I want him to see that mother confessor in the dress, too. From the corner of her mouth, Kara puffed another strand of hair off her face. To tell you the truth... I wouldn't mind a bath myself. You know, I think that if I stand beside you in a proper moored Sith outfit and my hair is washed and my braid is done up fresh and I'm looking properly moored Sith-like and I speak my argument with what you say, Lord Rawl will be all the more convinced that we're right and inclined to see that the time has come for us to return. Kalin set the plates into the bucket of water. It's settled then. We've enough time before he comes back. Richard had made them a small wooden tub, big enough to sit in and have a nice bath. It wasn't big enough to lie back and luxuriate in, but it was still quite the luxury for their mountain home. Kara towed the tub from the corner, leaving drag marks across the dirt floor. I'll put it in my room. You go first. That way, if he comes back sooner rather than later, you can keep your nosy husband busy and out of my hair while I wash it. Together, Kalen and Kara hauled in buckets of water from the nearby spring, heating some in a kettle over a roaring fire. When Kalen finally sank into the steaming water, she let out a long sigh. The air was chilly, and the hot bath felt all the better for it. She would have liked to linger, but decided not to. She smiled at recalling all the trouble Richard had had with women in bathwater. It was a good thing he wasn't there. 
Later, after they had their talk, she thought she would ask him to take a bath before bed. She liked the aroma of his sweat when it was clean sweat. With the knowledge that she would face Richard with her hair washed and sparkling and in her white dress, Kaylin felt more confident about the real possibility of their return than she had in a long time. She dried and brushed her hair by the heat of the fire as Kara boiled some more water. While Kara went in to take her bath, Kaylin went to her room to slip into her dress. Most people feared the dress because they feared the woman who wore it. Richard had always liked her in the dress. As she tossed the towel on the bed, her eye was caught by the statue in the window. Kaylin fisted her hands at her sides and, standing naked, arched her back and threw her head back, mimicking the spirit, letting the feelings of it overcome her, letting herself be that strong spirit, letting it flow through her. For that moment, she was the spirit of the statue. This was a day of change. She could feel it. It seemed a little odd, after being a woodswoman for so long, to be back in her mother confessor's dress, to feel the satiny smooth material against her skin. Mostly, though, the feeling was the comfort of the familiar. As mother confessor, Kaylin felt sure of herself. On a fundamental level, the dress was a form of battle armor. Wearing the dress, Kaylin also felt a sense of importance, in that she carried the weight of history of exceptional women who had gone before her. The mother confessor bore a terrible responsibility, but also had the satisfaction of being able to make a real difference for the better in people's lives. Those people depended on her. Kaylin had a job to do, and she had to convince Richard that she needed to do it. They needed him, too, but even if he would not issue orders, he needed to at least willingly return with her. Those fighting for their cause deserved to know the mother confessor was with them, and that she had not lost faith in them or their cause. She had to make Richard see that much of it. Once she was back out of the main room, Kaylin could hear Kara splashing in the tub. Need anything, Kara? she called out. No, I'm fine, Kara called from her room. This feels so good. I think there is enough dirt in this water to plant potatoes. Kaylin laughed knowingly. She saw a chipmunk casting about outside the house. I'm going to go feed Chippy some apple cores. If you need anything, call out. Their universal name for all the chipmunks was Chippy. They all answered to it. They knew the name augured well for a handout. All right, Kara said from her tub. If Lord Rao gets back, though, just kiss him or something to keep him busy, but wait until I'm done before you talk to him. I want to be with you to help you convince him. I want to be sure we make him see the light. Kalen smiled. I promise. She plucked an apple core from the wooden bucket of little animal snacks they kept hanging on a piece of twine where the chipmunks couldn't get to them on their own. The squirrels loved apple cores, too. The horses preferred their apples whole. Here, Chippy, Kaylin called out through the door in the voice she always used with them. She raised the bucket back toward the ceiling and hooked the line to the peg on the wall. Chip, Chip, you want an apple? Outside, Kaylin saw the chipmunk off to the side foraging through the grass. The chill breeze caressed the long folds of her dress to her legs as she walked. It was almost cold enough to need the fur mantle. The bare branches of the oaks behind the house creaked and groaned as they rubbed together. The pines, reaching toward the sky where the wind was stronger, bowed deeply with some of the gusts. The sun had taken refuge behind a steel-gray overcast that made her white dress all the more striking in the gloom. Near the window where Spirit stood watching out, Kaylin called the chipmunk again. The chipmunks were held spellbound by the soft voice Kaylin used when she talked to them. When he heard her, the furry little striped creature stood on his hind legs for a moment, stiff and still, checking that all was clear, and when he was sure it was safe, scurried to her. Kaylin squatted and rolled the apple core out of her hand onto the ground. Here you go, sweetheart, she cooed. A nice apple for you. Chippy wasted no time starting in on his treat. Kalen's cheeks hurt from smiling at the way the chipmunk nibbled his way around the apple core as it rolled along the ground. She rose to her feet, brushing her hands clean as she watched, captivated by the little creature at his feverish work. He suddenly flinched with a squeak and froze. Kalen looked up. She was staring right into a woman's blue eyes. The woman stood not ten feet away in a pose of cool scrutiny. Kalen's throat locked the gasp in her lungs. 
the woman had seemed to appear in the middle of nowhere, out of nowhere. Icy goose flesh prickled up the backs of Kalin's arms. The woman's long blonde hair cascaded over the shoulders of an exquisite black dress. She was of such shapely beauty, her face of such pure perfection, but especially her eyes were of such intelligent, lucid witnesses to all around her that she could only be a creature of profound integrity or unspeakable evil. Kalin knew without a doubt which it was. This woman made Kalin feel as ugly as a clod of dirt and instinctively as helpless as a child. She wanted nothing so much as to shrink away. Instead, she stared into the woman's blue eyes for what couldn't have been more than a second or two, but in that span of time an eternity seemed to pass. In those knowing blue eyes flowed some formidable, frightful current of contemplation. Kalin remembered Captain Myford's description of this woman. For the life of her, though, Kalin couldn't just then recall her name. It seemed trivial. What mattered was that this woman was a sister of the dark. Without speaking a word, the woman lifted her hands out a little and turned her palms up as if humbly offering something. Her hands were empty. Kalin committed to the vault through space necessary to close the distance. She committed to unleashing her power. With her resolution, the act had in a way already commenced, but she desperately needed to get closer if it was to be meaningful or effective. As she began to move, to make that reckless leap, the world went white in a bloom of pain. Chapter 21 Richard heard an odd sound that stopped him in his tracks. He felt a thump through the ground and deep in his chest. He thought he'd seen a flash in the treetops, but it had been so quick he wasn't sure. It was the sound, though, as if some great hammer had struck off the top of a mountain that made his blood go cold. The house wasn't far off through the trees. He dropped the string of trout and the jar of minnows and ran. At the edge of the woods where it opened into the meadow, he skidded to a halt. His pounding heart felt as if it had risen up into his throat. Richard saw the two women not far away in front of the house, one dressed in white and one in black. They were connected by a snaking, undulating, crackling line of milky white light. Nietzsche's arms were lifted slightly with her hands turned palms up and a little farther apart from the width of her hips. The milky light went from Nietzsche's chest across the space between the two women and pierced Kalin through the heart. The wavering aurora between the two turned blindingly bright, as if twisting in an agony it was unable to escape. Seeing Kalin trembling with the fury of that lance of light pinning her to the wall, Richard was paralyzed by fear for her, fear he knew all too well, from when she had been on the cusp of death. That bolt pierced Nietzsche's heart, too, connecting the two women. Richard didn't understand the magic Nietzsche was using, but he instinctively recognized it as profoundly dangerous, not only to Kalin, but to Nietzsche as well, for she too was in pain. That Nietzsche would put herself at such risk gripped him with dread. Richard knew he had to remain calm and keep his wits about himself if Kalin was to have a chance. He viscerally wanted to do something to strike Nietzsche down, but he was certain that it wouldn't be as simple as that. Zed's oft-repeated expression, nothing is ever easy, flashed into Richard's mind with sudden and tangible meaning. In a desperate search for answers, everything Richard knew about magic cascaded in a torrent through his mind. None of it told him what to do, but it did tell him what he must not do. Kalin's life hung in the balance. Just then, Kara came flying out of the house. She was stark naked. It somehow didn't look all that odd. Richard was accustomed to the shape of her body and her skin-tight leather outfits. Other than the color, this didn't look all that different. She was dripping wet. Her hair was undone, which seemed more outlandishly indecent to him than her naked body. He was used to seeing her with a braid all the time. Kara's fist clutched the red leather rod, her aegeal, as she crouched. The muscles of her legs, arms, and shoulders strained with tension, demanding release. Kara, no! Richard cried out. He was already tearing across the meadow as Kara sprang and slammed her aegeal against the side of Nietzsche's neck. Nietzsche shrieked in pain that dropped her to her knees. Kalin cried out in equal pain and crumpled to her knees as well, her movement a close match to Nietzsche's. Kara seized Nietzsche's hair in a fist and yanked her head back. Time to die, witch! 
Nietzsche was doing nothing to stop Kara as the Aegeal hung only inches from her throat. Richard dove toward the moored Sith, desperately hoping he wouldn't be too late. Kara's Aegeal just grazed Nietzsche's throat as Richard tackled her around the middle, ramming her backward. The feel of her was briefly surprising, silky soft flesh over iron-hard muscle. The impact drove the wind from her when they hit the ground. Kara was so enraged and in such a combative state that she lashed out with her Aegeal at Richard, not realizing it was him, knowing only that she was being prevented from protecting Kalin. The violent impact of the weapon to the side of Richard's face felt like a blow by an iron bar followed immediately by a lightning strike. The crack of pain under his skull was momentarily blinding. His ears rang. The jolt took his breath, staggering him, and brought back in a single instant an avalanche of macabre memories. Kara was riveted on the kill and furious at any interference. Richard regained his senses just in time to seize her wrists and pin her to the ground before she could pounce on Nietzsche. A moored Sith was formidable, to be sure, but such a woman was instilled with the ability to counter magic, not muscle. That was why she had been trying to goad Nietzsche into using her power. Only in that way could she capture the enemy's magic and so overpower her. Kara's writhing naked body under him hardly registered in Richard's mind. He tasted blood in his mouth. His attention was focused on her Aegeal and making sure she couldn't use it on him. His head throbbed with a painful ringing, and he had to fight not only Kara, but encroaching unconsciousness. It was all he could do to hold Kara down. At that moment, the moored Sith was more of a threat to Kalin's life than Nietzsche was. If Nietzsche intended to kill Kalin, he was sure she could have already done so. Richard might not have understood specifically what Nietzsche was doing, but by what he had already seen, he grasped the general nature of it. Blood dripped down onto Kara's bare chest, vivid red against the expanse of her white skin. Kara, stop! His jaw worked, if painfully, so he reasoned it wasn't broken. It's me! Stop! You'll kill Kalin! Kara stilled under him, staring up in angry confusion. What you do to Nietzsche happens to Kalin, too! You had better listen to him, Nietzsche said from behind him in that velvety voice of hers. Kara reached up when Richard released her wrists and touched the side of his mouth. I'm sorry, she whispered, realizing what she had done. Her tone told him she meant it. Richard nodded and then stood, pulling her up by her hand before rounding on Nietzsche. Nietzsche stood tall in that proud and proper posture she had. Her attention and her magic was focused on Kalin. The calm but violent power from within him had awakened, waiting to be commanded. Richard didn't know how to use it to stop Nietzsche. He held back, fearing that anything he did would only make Kalin's peril worse. Kalin was on her feet, too, but once again pinned to the wall of the house by the milky rope of light. Her green eyes were wide with the trembling torment of whatever it was Nietzsche was doing. Nietzsche's hands lifted. She laid her palms to her heart over the light. Her back was to Richard, but he could see the light through her, like fire eating through the center of a piece of paper, the incandescent hole expanding outward, appearing to consume her. The twisting flare of light was doing the same thing to Kalin, seeming to burn through her, yet Richard could see that she was not being killed by it. She was still breathing, still moving, still alive, not reacting at all the way a person would if they were really having holes burned through them. With magic, he knew better than to believe his eyes. At the center of Nietzsche's chest, under her hands, she began to become solid again, reforming where the light had spent itself in glowing rays, working out toward the edges of her. The light cut off. Kalin, her own hands pressed to the wall behind her, sagged in relief as it extinguished, her eyes closing as if it was too much to endure looking at the woman standing before her. Richard was restrained fury. His muscles screamed to be released. The magic within was a coiled viper, waiting to strike. He wanted almost more than anything to cut down this woman. The only thing he wanted more was for Kalin to be safe. Nietzsche smiled pleasantly at Kalin before turning to Richard. Her calm blue eyes momentarily took in his white-knuckled fist on the hilt of his sword. Richard, it's been a long time. You look well. What have you done? He growled through gritted teeth. She smiled. 
It was a smile a mother gave a child, a smile of indulgence. She took a breath, as if recovering from a difficult bit of labor, and lifted a hand to indicate Kalin. I have spelled your wife, Richard. Richard could hear Kara's breath close behind his left shoulder. She was staying out of the way of his sword arm. To what end, he asked. Why, to capture you, of course. What's going to happen to her? What harm have you done? Harm? Why, none. Any harm that comes to her will only be by your hand. Richard frowned, understanding her, but wishing he were wrong. You mean if I hurt you, Kalin will suffer it too? Nietzsche smiled with the same discerning, disarming smile she used to have when she came to give him lessons. He could hardly believe that he used to imagine that she must look like nothing so much as a good spirit in the flesh. Richard could sense the magic crackling around this woman. He had come to know in most cases, through his own gift, when a person had the gift, what others couldn't see, he saw. He could see it in their eyes, and sometimes sense the aura of it around them. He had rarely met gifted women who made the very air about them sizzle with their power. Worse, though, Nietzsche was a sister of the dark. Yes, and more, much more. You see, we are now linked by a maternity spell. Odd name for a spell, yes? The name, in part, is derived from the spell's nurturing aspects. As in life-giver, the way a mother nurtures her child and keeps it alive. That light you saw was an umbilical cord of sorts, an umbilical cord of magic. By bending the nature of this world, it links our lives, no matter the distance between us. Just as I am the daughter of my mother, and nothing could ever change that, so neither can this magic be altered by anyone else. She spoke as an instructor, as she had once spoken to him at the Palace of the Prophets, when she had been one of his teachers. She always spoke with a quiet economy of words that he had once thought added an air of nobility to her bearing. Back then, Richard couldn't have imagined coarse words coming from Nietzsche's mouth, but the words she spoke now were vile. She still moved with an unmatched slow elegance. He had always thought her movements seductive. He now saw them as the sinuous movements of a snake. The magic of his sword thundered through him, screaming to be loosed. The sword's magic had been created specifically to combat what the sword's wielder considered evil. At that moment, Nietzsche fit the requirement to such an extent that the magic of the sword was close to overpowering him, near to taking command in order to destroy this threat. With the pain from the Aegeal still throbbing in his head, it was a struggle to maintain his control over the power of the sword. Richard could feel the raised gold letters of the word truth on the hilt pressing into his palm. This was a time, perhaps more than any other, that he knew had to be faced with truth and not his raw wishes. Life and death hung in the balance. Richard, Kalin said in a level voice. She waited until his eyes met hers. Kill her. She spoke with a quiet authority that demanded obedience. In her white mother confessor's dress, her words carried the unequivocal weight of command. Do it. Don't wait another moment. Kill her. Don't think about it. Do it. Nietzsche calmly watched to see what he might do. What he would finally decide seemed no more than a matter of curiosity to her. Richard had no need to think or to decide. I can't, he said to Kalin. That would kill you, too. Nietzsche lifted one eyebrow. Very good, Richard. Very good. Do it, Kalin shrieked. Do it now while you still have the chance. Keep still, he said in a calm voice. He looked back at Nietzsche. Let's hear it. She clasped her hands in the way the Sisters of the Light were wont to do, only she was not a Sister of the Light. There looked to be something deeply felt behind that blue-eyed gaze, but what those feelings could be, he didn't know and feared to imagine. It was one of those intense gazes that held a world of emotion, everything from longing to hatred. One thing he was sure he saw was a dead serious determination that was more important to her than life itself. It's like this, Richard. You are to come with me. As long as I live, Kalin will live. If I die, she dies. It's as simple as that. What else, he demanded. 
What else? Nietzsche blinked. Nothing else. What if I decide to kill you? Then I will die. But Kalin will die with me. Our lives are now linked. That's not what I mean. I mean you must have some purpose. What else will it mean if I decide to kill you? Nietzsche shrugged. Nothing. It's up to you to decide. Our lives are in your hands. Should you choose to preserve her life, you will have to come with me. And what do you intend to do with him? Kalen asked as she edged her way over to Richard's side. Torture a sham confession out of him so that Jagang can put him on some kind of show trial followed by a very public execution? If anything, Nietzsche looked surprised, as if such a thought had never occurred to her, and she found it abhorrent. No, none of that. I intend him no harm, for now, anyway. Eventually, of course, I will most likely have to kill him. Richard glared. Of course. When Kalin made a move forward, he caught her arm and restrained her. He knew what she intended. He didn't know exactly what would happen if Kalin unleashed her confessor's power on Nietzsche while they were both linked by the spell, but he had no intention of finding out, since he was sure it would come to no good end. Kalin was far too ready, as far as he was concerned, to forfeit her life to save his. Just hold on for now, he whispered to her. Kalin threw her arm out, pointing. She just admitted she intends to kill you. Nietzsche smiled reassuringly. Don't worry about that for now. If it comes to that, it will not likely be for a long time. Perhaps even a lifetime. And in the meantime, Kalin asked, What plans do you have for him before you discard his life, as if it were insignificant? Insignificant? Nietzsche opened her hands in an innocent gesture. I have no plans. I expect only to take him away. Richard had thought he understood what was going on, but he was less and less sure with everything Nietzsche said. You mean you want to take me away so that I can't fight against the Imperial Order? Her brow twitched. If you wish to think of it in those terms, I admit it is true that your time as the leader of the Daharan Empire is over, but that is not the point. The point is that everything about your life up until now, Nietzsche glanced pointedly at Kalin, is over. Her words seemed to chill the air. They surely chilled Richard. What's the rest of it? He knew there had to be more, something that would make sense of it all. What other terms are there if I want to keep Kalin alive? Well, no one is to follow us, of course. And if we do? Kalin snapped. I might follow you and kill you myself, even if it means the end of my own life. Kalin's green eyes shone with icy resolve as she cast a threatening glare on the woman. Nietzsche lifted her brows deliberately as she leaned ever so slightly toward Kalin, the way a mother would in cautioning a child. Then that will be the end of it, unless Richard stops you from doing such a thing. That is all part of what he must decide to do. But you make a miscalculation if you think I care one way or the other. I don't, you see. Not at all. What is it you intend me to do, Richard said, pulling Nietzsche's unsettlingly calm gaze from Kalin. What if I get where you're taking me and I don't do as you wish? You misunderstand, Richard, if you believe that I have some preconceived notion of what it is I wish you to do. I don't. You will do as you wish, I imagine. As I wish? Well, naturally, you won't be allowed to return to your people. She tossed her head, flicking back strands of her long blonde hair that the wind had pulled across in front of her blue eyes. Her gaze never left his. And I suppose, if you were to be in some way impossibly and defiantly contrary, then in that case, such would obviously be an answer in and of itself. It would be a shame, of course, but I would then have no use for you. I would kill you. You would have no further use? You mean Jagang would have no further use? No. Once again, Nietzsche looked surprised. I do not act on behalf of His Excellency. She tapped her lower lip. You see? I removed the ring he put through my lip, marking me as his slave. I do this on behalf of myself. A yet more disturbing thought surfaced. How is it that he can't enter your mind? That he can't control you? You don't need me to answer that question, Richard Rawl. 
It made no sense to him. The bond to the Lord Rawl worked for those loyal to him. He could see no way that this could be construed as an act of loyalty. This was unequivocally an act of aggression and against his will. The bond shouldn't work for her. He reasoned that perhaps Jagang was in her mind and she was unaware of it. The thought occurred to him that maybe Jagang was in her mind and it had driven her insane. Look, Richard said, feeling like they weren't even speaking the same language. I don't know what you think. Enough talk. We are leaving. Her blue eyes watched him without anger. It almost seemed to Richard that for Nietzsche, Kalin and Kara were not there. This doesn't make any sense. You want me to go with you, but you aren't acting on behalf of Jagang? If that's true, then... I believe I've made it as clear as possible and quite simple besides. If you wish to be free, you may kill me at any opportunity. If you do, Kalin will also die. Those are your only two choices. Although I believe I know what you will do, I am in no way certain. Two paths now lie before you. You must take one. Richard could hear Kara's angry breath behind him. She was a coiled spring ready to strike. Fearing she might do something of irredeemable harm, he lifted his hand just to be sure she knew he meant for her to stay behind him. Oh, and one additional matter. Should you think to resort to some plot or treachery, or for that matter refuse to do the simple things I ask of you, through the spell that joins us, I can at any time end Kalin's life. I have but to will it. It is not necessary for me to die. She lives every day from now on only by my grace, and thus yours. I wish her no harm, and have no feelings one way or the other about her life. In fact, if anything, I wish it to be long. She has brought you a measure of happiness, and in return for that I hope she will not have to forfeit her life. But then you have some influence over that by your behavior. Nietzsche cast a deliberate glare over Richard's shoulder to Kara. She then reached out and with her fingers gently wiped blood from his mouth. She finished cleaning his chin with her thumb. Your moored Sith has hurt you. I can help you if you wish. No. Very well. She wiped her bloody fingers clean on the skirt of her black dress. Unless you want to risk other people causing Kalin's death without your intending it, I suggest you ensure that others don't act without your consent. Mord Sith are resourceful and determined women. I respect their devotion to duty. However, if your Mord Sith follows us, and my magic will tell me if she does, Kalin will die. And just how will I know Kalin is all right? We could get a mile away from here, and you could use that magic link to kill her. I would never know. Nietzsche's brow creased together. She looked genuinely puzzled. Why would I do that? A storm of rage and panic pushed his emotions first one way and then the other. Why are you doing any of this? She regarded him in silent curiosity for a moment. I have my reasons. I'm sorry, Richard, that you must suffer in this. Making you suffer is not my purpose. I give you my word that I will not harm Kalin without informing you. You expect me to believe your word? I've told you the truth. I have no reason to lie to you. In time, you will come to understand everything better. Kalin will come to no harm from me as long as I am safe, and you come with me. For reasons he couldn't fathom, Richard found himself believing her. She seemed dead honest and completely sure of herself, as if she had reasoned it all out a thousand times. He didn't believe that Nietzsche was telling him everything. She was making it simple, so that he could grasp the important elements and have an easier time deciding what to do. Whatever the rest of it was, it couldn't be as devastating as this much of it. The thought of being taken from Kalin was agony, but he would do almost anything to save her life. Nietzsche knew that. The enigma resurfaced. It was somehow linked to this. The spell that protects a person's mind from the Dreamwalker works only for those loyal to me. You can't expect to be safe from Jagang if you do this. It's an act of treachery. Jagang does not frighten me. Don't fear for my mind, Richard. I'm quite safe from his excellency. In time, perhaps you will come to see how wrong you have been in so many things. You're deceiving yourself, Nietzsche. You only see part of it, Richard. She lifted an eyebrow in a cryptic manner. 
At heart, your cause is the cause of the order. You are too noble a person for it to be otherwise. I may die at your hands, but I will die hating everything you and the order stand for, Richard's fists tightened. You'll not get what you want, Nietzsche. Whatever it is, you'll not get it. She regarded him with great compassion. This is all for the best, Richard. Nothing he said seemed to hold any sway with her, and he could make no sense of the things she said. The fury inside boiled up. The magic of the sword fought him for control. He could barely contain it. Do you really expect me to ever come to believe that? Nietzsche's blue eyes seemed to be focused somewhere beyond him. Possibly not. Her gaze fixed on him once more. She put two fingers between her lips as she turned and whistled. In the distance, a horse whinnied and trotted out of the woods. I have another horse for you, waiting up on the other side of the pass. Terror clawed at his bones. Kalin's fingers tightened on his arm. Kara's hand touched his back. Memories of being captured before and all it meant, all the things he had endured, made his pulse race and his breath come in rapid pulls. He felt trapped. Everything was slipping through his fingers, and there didn't seem to be anything he could do about it. He wanted more than anything to fight, but he couldn't figure how. He wished it were as simple as striking down his adversary. He reminded himself that reason, not wishing, was his only chance. He seized the calm center within and used it to quell the rising storm of panic. Nietzsche stood tall, her shoulders square, her chin up. She looked like someone facing an execution with courage. He realized then that she truly was prepared for whichever way it was to go. I have given you your choice, Richard. You have no other options. Choose. There is no choice to make. I'll not allow Kalin to die. Of course not. Nietzsche's posture eased almost imperceptibly. A small smile of reassurance warmed her eyes. She will be fine. The horse slowed from its trot as it approached. When the handsome dappled mare halted beside her, Nietzsche took a hold of the reins near the bit. Its gray mane ruffled in the cold breeze. The mare snorted and tossed her head, uneasy before strangers and eager to be away. But, but, Richard stammered as Nietzsche stepped up into the stirrup. But what am I allowed to take? Nietzsche swung her leg over the horse's rump and settled into the saddle. She squirmed herself into position and adjusted her shoulders, setting them back. Her black dress and blonde hair stood out in stark relief against the iron sky. You may bring anything you like, as long as it isn't a person. She clicked her tongue, urging her horse around to face him. I suggest you take clothes and such. Whatever you wish to have with you, take all you can carry if you want. Her voice took on an edge. Leave that sword of yours, though. You won't be needing it. She leaned down, her expression for the first time turning cold and threatening. You are no longer the Seeker or Lord Rahl, leader of the Daharan Empire, or for that matter, you are no longer the husband of the Mother Confessor. From now on, you are nobody but Richard. Kara stepped out beside him, a thunderhead of dark fury. I am Mord Sith. If you think I'm going to allow you to take Lord Rahl, you're crazy. The Mother Confessor has already stated her wishes. My duty above all else is to kill you. Nietzsche curled three fingers around the reins, her thumbs holding them tight. Do as you must. You know the consequences. Richard held out a restraining arm to prevent Kara from going up after Nietzsche and dragging her off the horse. Take it easy, he whispered. Time is on our side. As long as we're all still alive, we have the chance to think of something. The strain of Kara's weight against his arm eased. She reluctantly backed a step. I have to get some things, Richard said to Nietzsche, trying to buy that time. Wait at least until I can get my pack together. Nietzsche laid the reins over and stepped her horse back toward him. She rested her left wrist across the saddle's pommel. I'm leaving. With a long, graceful finger of her other hand, she pointed. You see that pass up there? You be with me by the time I'm at the top, and Kalin will live. If I cross over and you aren't with me, Kalin will die. You have my word. It was all happening too fast. He needed to think of a way to stall. 
then what good will any of this have done you? He will have told me what means more to you. She sat back up in her saddle. When you think about it, that is quite a profound question. It is yet to be answered. By the time I get to the top of the pass, I will have the answer. Nietzsche rocked her hips in the saddle, urging the horse ahead into a walk. Don't forget. Top of the pass. You have until then to say your goodbyes, pack what you wish to take, and then catch up with me if you wish Kaylin to live. Or if you choose to stay, you have until then to say your goodbyes before she dies. Understand, though, when making your choice, that the first will be as final as the second. Kaylin struggled to run toward the horse, but Richard clutched her around her waist. Where are you taking him? she demanded. Nietzsche stopped her horse momentarily and gazed down at Kaylin with a look of frightening finality. Why, into oblivion. Chapter 22 As she watched Nietzsche turn her dappled mare toward the pass and the distant blue mountains beyond, Kaylin was still struggling to overcome her dizziness from what the woman had done to her. Off near the distant trees, a doe and her nearly grown fawn, two of the small herd of deer that frequented the meadow, stood at alert, their ears perked, watching Nietzsche, waiting to see if she might be a threat. Spooked by what they saw when Nietzsche turned their way, both deer flicked their tails straight up and bounded for the trees. Kaylin refused to allow herself to give in to the disorientation, but for Richard's iron arms around her waist, she would have thrown herself at the sister of the dark. Kaylin had desperately wanted to unleash her confessor's power. No one had ever deserved it more. Had her senses not still been floundering in a daze, she might have been able to invoke her power through the Kondar, the blood rage, of an ancient ability she possessed. Such rare magic would have bridged the relatively small distance, but reeling from the lingering force of Nietzsche's conjuring, the attempt had been futile. It was all Kalin could do to keep her feet under her and her last meal in her stomach. It was frustrating, infuriating, and humiliating, but Nietzsche had surprised her, and with magic as swift as Kalin's confessor's power, had taken her before she could react. Once Nietzsche's talons clutched her, Kalin had been powerless. She had grown up being trained not to be taken by surprise. Confessors were always targets. She knew better. Any number of times in similar situations, she had prevailed. Lulled by months of tranquility, Kalin had lost her edge. She vowed never to let it happen again. But that would do her no good now. She could still feel Nietzsche's vital magic sizzling through her as if her soul itself had been scorched in the heat of the ordeal. Her insides roiled as waves of the onslaught had yet to settle down. The cold air rushed across the meadow, bending the brown grass, swept up to chill her burning face. The wind carried an unfamiliar scent into the valley, something that her jumbled senses perceived as vaguely portentous. The big pines behind the house bowed and twisted, but stood tall as the wind broke against them with a sound not unlike waves rushing against stone cliffs. Whatever sort of magic had been unleashed in her, Kalin was convinced Nietzsche had told the truth about its consequence. Despite how much she hated the woman, because of the maternity spell, Kalin felt a connection to her, a connection that she could only interpret as affection. It was a bewildering sensation. While positively disturbing, it was also in a way a comforting connection to the woman, beyond her vile magic and twisted purpose. There seemed to be something deep within Nietzsche worth loving. Regardless of Kalin's far-fetched feelings, her perception and reasoning told her the truth of the matter. Such impressions were illusion. If she got the opportunity, she would not again hesitate for an instant to kill Nietzsche. Kara, Richard said, glaring at Nietzsche's back as she walked her horse across the meadow, I don't want you even thinking about trying to stop her. I'm not going to allow... I mean it. I mean it more than any order I've ever given you. If you ever brought Kalin to harm in such a way... Well, I trust you'd never do such an evil thing to me. Why don't you go get dressed? Kara growled a curse under her breath. Richard turned to Kalin as the moored Sith marched off into the house. Kalin only then really noticed that Kara was naked. She must have been interrupted in her bath. 
The magic Nietzsche used had fogged Kalin's mind, blurring her memory of recent events. Kalin did recall quite clearly, though, the feel of the Aegeal. The shattering torture of the moored Sith's weapon had spiked through Nietzsche's magic like a lance through straw. Even though Kara had used her Aegeal on Nietzsche, Kalin felt as if it had been used directly against the side of her own neck. Kalin gently touched Richard's jaw in sympathy, then took hold of his upper arms instead when he gave her a look that suggested no need for sympathy. His big hands closed on her waist. She stepped into his embrace and rested her forehead against his cheek. This can't be, she whispered. It just can't. But it is. I'm so sorry. Sorry? That I let her take me by surprise. Kalin trembled with anger at herself. I should have been alert. If I'd done as I should have and killed her first, it would never have come to this. Richard ran a hand gently down the back of her head, holding her to his shoulder. Remember how you killed me in a sword fight the other day? She nodded against him. We all make mistakes. Get caught off guard. Don't blame yourself. No one is perfect. It could even be that she cast a web of magic to dull your awareness so she could slip up to you like like some silent, unseen mosquito. Kalin had never considered that. Caught off guard or not, though, it made her furious with herself. If only she had not been paying attention to the stupid chipmunk. If only she had looked up sooner. If only she had acted without waiting a split second to analyze the true nature of the threat to decide if it warranted the unleashing of her devastating magic. Almost from birth, Kalin had been instructed in the use of her power, with the mandate of unleashing it only upon being certain of the need. Much like killing, a confessor's power was the destruction of who a person was. Afterward, the person acted exclusively on behalf of the confessor and at the direction of the confessor. It was as final as death. Kalin looked up into Richard's gray eyes. They looked all the more gray with the gray sky behind him. My life is a precious and sacred thing to me, she said. Yours is no less to you. Don't throw yours away to be a slave to mine. I couldn't stand it. It's not come to that yet. I'll figure something out. But for now, I have to go with her. We'll follow, but stay well back. He was already shaking his head. But she won't even be aware... No. For all we know, she could have others with her. They could be waiting to catch you if you follow. I couldn't bear the thought of knowing that at any moment she could use magic or somehow find out you were following. If that happened, you would die for nothing. You mean you think she could hurt you to make you tell her I plan to follow? Let's not let our imaginations get the better of us. But I should be close for when you make a move, for when you figure a way to stop her. Richard cupped her face tenderly in his hands. He had a strange look in his eyes, a look she didn't like. Listen to me. I don't know what's going on, but you mustn't die just to free me. Tears of desperation stung her eyes. She blinked them away. She fought to keep her voice from becoming a wail. Don't go, Richard. I don't care what it means for me as long as you can be free. I would die happy if doing so would keep you from the enemy's cruel hands. I can't allow the order to have you. I can't allow you to endure the slow grinding death of a slave in exchange for my life. I can't allow them to... She bit off the words of what she feared most. She couldn't bear the thought of him being tortured. It made her even more dizzy and sick to think of him being maimed and mutilated, of him suffering all alone and forgotten in some distant, stinking dungeon with no hope of help. But Nietzsche said they wouldn't. Kalin told herself that, for her own sanity, she had to believe Nietzsche's word. Kalin realized Richard was smiling to himself, as if trying to commit to memory every detail of her face, while at the same time running a thousand other things through his thoughts. There's no choice, he whispered. I must do this. She clutched his shirt in her fist. You're doing just as Nietzsche wants. She knows you'll want to save me. I can't allow you to make that sacrifice. Richard looked up briefly, gazing out at the trees and mountains behind their house, taking it all in, like a condemned man savoring his last meal. His gaze, more earnest, settled once more on hers. Don't you see? I am making no sacrifice. I am making a fair trade. The reality that you exist is my basis for joy and happiness. 
I make no sacrifice, he repeated, stressing each word. To be a slave, even if that is what happens to me, and yet know you're alive, is my choice over being free in a world in which you don't exist. I can live with the first, I can't with the second. The first is painful, the second unbearable. Kalin beat a fist against his chest. But you will be a slave or worse, and I can't bear that. Kalin, listen to me. I will always have freedom in my heart because I understand what it is. Because I do, I can work toward it. I will find a way to be free. I cannot find a way to bring you back to life. The spirits know that in the past I have been willing to forfeit my life for a just cause, and if my life would truly make a difference. In the past I have knowingly imperiled both our lives, been willing to sacrifice both our lives, but not in return for nothing. Don't you see? This would be a fool's bargain. I'll not do it. Kalin pulled her breaths in small gasps, trying to hold back the tears as well as her rising sense of panic. You're the seeker. You must find a way to freedom. Of course you will. You will, I know. She forced a swallow past the constriction in her throat as she tried to reassure Richard, or perhaps herself. You'll find a way. I know you will. You'll find a way and you'll come back. You did before. You will this time. The shadows of Richard's features seemed dark and severe, cast as they were in a mask of resignation. Kalen, you must be prepared to go on. What do you mean? You must find joy in the fact that I, too, live. You must be prepared to go on with that knowledge and nothing else. What do you mean, nothing else? He had a terrible look in his eyes, some kind of sad, grim, tragic acceptance. She didn't want to look into his eyes, but standing there with her hand against his chest, feeling the warmth of him, the life within him, she couldn't make herself look away as he spoke. I think it's different this time. Kalin pulled her hair back when the wind dragged it over her eyes. Different? There's something very different about the feel of this. It doesn't make sense in the way things in the past have made sense. There's something deadly serious about Nietzsche. Something singular. She's planned this out, and she's prepared to die for it. I can't lie to you to deceive you. Something tells me that this time I may never be able to find a way to come back. Don't say that. In weak fingers trembling with dread, Kalin gathered his dark shirt into a wrinkled knot. Please don't say that, Richard. You must try. You must find a way to come back to me. Don't ever think I won't be doing my best. His voice was impassioned, almost to the point of sounding angry. I swear to you, Kalin, that as long as there is a breath in my lungs, I'll never give up. I'll always try to find a way. But we can't ignore the possibility just because it's painful to contemplate. I may never be back. You must face the fact that it looks like you must go on without me. But with the knowledge that I'm alive, just as I will have that awareness of you in my heart, where no one can touch it, in our hearts we have each other and always will. That was the oath we swore when we were married, to love and honor each other for all time. This can't change it. Distance can't change it. Time can't change it. Richard. She choked back her wail, but she couldn't keep the tears from coursing down her face. I can't stand the thought of you being a slave because of me. Don't you see that? Don't you see what that would do to me? I'll kill myself if I must so that she can't do this to you. I must. He shook his head, the wind ruffling his hair. Then I would have no reason to escape her. Nothing to escape for. You won't need to escape. That's just it. She won't be able to hold you. She's a sister of the dark. He threw open his hands. She will simply use another means I won't know how to counter, and if you're dead, I won't care to. But don't you see? He seized her by her shoulders. Kalin, you must live to give me a reason to try to escape her. Your own life is your reason, she said. To be free to help people will be your reason. The people be cursed. He released her and gestured angrily. Even people where I grew up turned against us. They tried to murder us, remember? The lands that have surrendered into the Union with Dahara will likely not remain loyal either when they see the reality of the Imperial Order's army moving up into the Midlands. 
Eventually, Dahara will stand alone. People don't understand or value freedom. The way it now stands, they won't fight for it. They've proven it in Andrith and in Heartland, where I grew up. What more clear evidence could be seen? I hold out no false hope. Most of the rest of the Midlands will quail when it comes time to fight against the Imperial Order. When they see the size of the Order's army and their brutality with those who resist, they will surrender their freedom. He looked away from her, as if regretting his flash of anger in their last moments together. His tall form, so stalwart against the sweep of mountains and sky, sagged a little, seeming to huddle closer to her as if seeking comfort. The only thing I have to hope for is to get away so I can come back to you. His voice had lost all traces of heat as he spoke in a near whisper. Kalen, please don't take that hope from me. It's all I have. In the distance, she could see the fox trotting across the meadow. Its thick, white-tipped tail followed out straight behind as the fox made its inspection for any rodents that might be about. As Kalen's gaze tracked its movement, from the corner of her eye she caught a glimpse of spirit, standing proud and free in the window. How could she lose the man who had carved that for her when she needed it most? She could, she knew, because now he needed what only she could give him. Looking back up into his intense gray eyes, she realized she could not hope to deny him his earnest plea and only request, not at a time like this. All right, Richard, I won't do anything rash to free you. I'll wait for you. I'll endure it. I know you. I know you won't ever give up. You know I expect no less from you. When you get away, and you will, I'll be waiting for you. And then we'll be together again. We'll never be apart in our hearts. As you said, our oath of love is timeless. Richard closed his eyes with relief. He tenderly kissed her brow. He lifted her hand from his chest and pressed soft kisses to her knuckles. She saw then how much her pledge meant to him. Kaylin pulled her hand away and quickly removed her necklace, the one Shota had given her as a wedding gift. It was meant to prevent her from getting pregnant. She turned Richard's hand over and pushed the necklace into his palm. He frowned in confusion at the small dark stone hanging from the gold chain draped over his fingers. What's this about? I want you to take it. Kaylin cleared her throat to keep her voice. She could only manage a whisper. I know what she wants of you, what she will make you do. No, that's not what... He shook his head. He said, I'm not taking this, as if turning it away would somehow deny the possibility. Kalin put her hand to the side of his face. His face wavered before her in a watery blur. Please, Richard, please take it for me. I couldn't bear the thought of another woman having your child or even the thought of the attempt at its creation, but she didn't say that part of it. Especially not after mine. He looked away from her eyes. Kalen, words failed him. Just do it for me. Take it. Please, Richard. I'm doing as you ask and will endure your captivity. Please honor my request in return. I couldn't stand the thought of that bewitching blonde beast having your child, the child that should be mine. Don't you see? How could I ever love something I hated? And how could I ever hate something that was part of you? Please, Richard, don't let it come to that. The cold wind lifted and twisted her hair. Her whole life, it seemed, was twisting out of her control. She could hardly believe that this place of such joy, peace, and redemption, a place where she had come to live again, could be a place where it would all be taken away. Richard held the necklace out to her, as if it were a thing that might bite him. The dark stone swung under his fingers, gleaming in the gloom. Kalen, I don't think that's what this is about. I really don't. But anyway, she could simply refuse to wear it and threaten your life if I didn't. Kalen pulled the gold chain from his fingers and laid it all in a small, neat mound in his palm. The dark stone glimmered from its imprisonment behind the veil of tiny gold links. She closed his fingers around the necklace and held his fist shut with both of her hands. You're the one who demands we not ignore those things that are painful to contemplate. But if she refuses... Kalen gripped his fist tighter in her trembling fingers. If it comes to a time when she makes that demand of you, you must convince her to wear the necklace. 
You must. For me. It's bad enough for me to think she might take my love, my husband, from me like that. But to also fear his big hand felt so warm and familiar and comforting to her. Her words came choked with desperate tears. She could do no more than beg. Please, Richard. He pressed his lips tight, then nodded and stuffed the necklace in a pocket. I don't believe those are her intentions. But if it should turn out to be so, you have my word. She will wear the necklace. Kalin sagged against him with a sob. He took her by the arm. Come on, hurry. I have to get whatever I need to take. I've only got a few minutes or all this will be for nothing. I can take the shorter trail and still catch up with her at the top of the pass, but I don't have much time. Chapter 23 Kalin was aware of Kara, wearing her blood-red leather, standing in the doorway to their bedroom, watching Richard cram his things into his pack. Kalin nodded as she and Richard exchanged brief, stilted instructions. They had already come to terms with the life and death issues. It seemed they both feared to say anything of consequence for fear of disturbing the delicate, desperate, difficult agreements they had reached. The meager light coming in the small window did little to brighten the gloom. Kara, over in the doorway, blocked some of the light. The room had the feel of a dungeon. Richard, dressed in dark clothes, looked like a shadow. So many times as she lay in bed recovering, Kalin had thought of it that way, as her dungeon. Now it had the palpable sense of a dungeon, but with the clean aroma of pine walls instead of the stench of a stone cell from where trembling, sweating prisoners were taken to their death. Kara looked forlorn one moment, and the next, like lightning-seeking ground, Kalin knew that the moored Sith's emotions had to be as torn as her own, balancing on a knife's edge with despair and grief on one side and rage on the other. Mord Sith were not used to being in such a position, but then Kara was now more than simply Mord Sith. Kalin watched Richard pack the black trousers, black undershirt, black and gold tunic, silver wristbands, overbelt with its pouches, and golden cloak into his pack where they took up a good portion of the available space. He was wearing his dark forest garb and didn't have time to change. Kalin hoped a time would soon come when he would escape and again wear the clothes of a war wizard to lead them against the Order. They all needed him to lead the Daharan Empire against the invading horde from the Old World. For reasons that weren't always entirely clear, Richard had become the linchpin of their struggle. Kalin knew his feelings about that, that people must be willing to fight for themselves and not only for him, were valid. If an idea was sound, it had to have a life beyond a leader, or the leader had failed. As he threw other clothes and small items into his pack, Richard told Kalin that maybe she could find Zed, that he might have some ideas. She nodded and said she would, knowing Zed wouldn't be able to do anything. This terrible triangle was not liable to be susceptible to influence by outsiders. Nietzsche had seen to that. It was just a hope Richard was giving her, the only bouquet he could offer in the desolate void of reality. Kalin didn't know what to do with her hands. She stood twining her fingers together as tears dripped off her chin. There must be something to say, something important, some last words while she had the chance, but she couldn't think of them. She supposed she knew what she felt, what was in her heart, and words couldn't add anything to that. She pressed her fist against the aching knot of anxiety in the pit of her stomach. A sense of doom crowded in the room like a fourth person, a grim guard waiting to take Richard away. This was the heart of terror, being controlled by what you couldn't see, couldn't reason with, couldn't persuade or battle. The doom waited, implacable, immune, indifferent. As Kara vanished from the doorway, Richard pulled a fistful of gold and silver from an inside pocket in his leather pack. He hastily dropped roughly half back in the pack and then held out the rest. Take this. You might need it. I'm the mother confessor. I don't need gold. He tossed it on the bed for her anyway, apparently not wanting to argue with her in their last moments together. Do you want any of the carvings? she asked. It was a stupid question, and she knew it, but she had to fill the awful silence, and it was the only thing to come into her head other than a hopeless plea. No, I've no need for them. When you look at them, think of me and remember I love you. He rolled a blanket tight, 
wrapped it with a small patch of oiled canvas, and tied it with leather thongs to the bottom of his pack. I guess if I were to want any, I could always carve some. Kalin handed him a cake of soap. I don't need your carving to remind me of your love. I'll remember. Carve something to make Nietzsche see that you should be free. Richard glanced up with a grim smile. I plan on seeing to it that she knows I won't ever give in to her in the order. Carvings won't be necessary. She thinks she has this all planned out, but she's going to find I'm bad company. Richard jammed a fist in his pack, making more room. Very bad company. Kara rushed back in, carrying small bundles with the corners tied in knots at the top. She plopped them down one at a time onto the bed. I put together some food for you, Lord Rall. Things that will keep for traveling. Dried meat and fish and such. Some rice and beans. I... I put a loaf of bread that I made on top. So eat it first while it's still good. He thanked her as he put the small bundles into his pack. He put the bread to his nose for a deep whiff before packing it away. He gave Kara a smile of appreciation. Richard straightened. His smile evaporated in a way that for some reason made Kalin's blood go cold. Looking like he was in the throes of committing himself to some last grim deed, Richard pulled the baldric off over his head. He held the gold and silver wrought scabbard in his left hand and drew the sword of truth in his white-knuckled right fist. The blade rang out with its unique metallic sound, announcing its freedom. Richard drew his sleeve up his arm and wiped the sword across his forearm. Kalin winced as she watched. She didn't know if he cut deeply accidentally or on purpose. With an icy sensation, she recalled that Richard cut very precisely with any sharp steel edge. He turned the blade and wiped both sides in gouts of vivid red blood. He bathed the blade in it, giving it a voluptuous taste, wetting its appetite for more. Kalin didn't know what he was doing or why he was doing it now, but it was a frightening ritual to witness. She wished he had drawn it before and cut down Nietzsche. Her blood, Kalin would not fear seeing. Richard picked up the scabbard and slammed the sword of truth home. Blood running over his hand left greasy red smears across the scabbard as he slid his hand down the length of it to the tip and then seized the sheathed weapon at its center point in his fist. His head bowed, his eyes on the dull silver and gold reflections, lustrous even through his own blood, he loomed closer to her. Richard looked up, and Kalin saw the lethal rage of magic dancing in his eyes. He had invoked the sword's terrible wrath, called it forth, and then put it away. She'd never seen him do such a thing before. He lifted the sword and its scabbard to her. The tendons in the back of his fist stood out in the strain. The white of his knuckles showed through the blood. Take it, he said in a hoarse voice that betrayed the struggle within. Spellbound, Kalin lifted the scabbard in her palms. For that instant, until he pulled away his bloody hand, she felt a jolting shock, as if she were suddenly welded to the weapon by hot fury unlike anything she had ever experienced. She half expected to see a burst of sparks. She could feel such rage emanating from the cold steel that it nearly dropped her to her knees. She might have dropped the weapon itself in that first instant had she been able to let go of it. She could not. Once Richard removed his hand, the sheathed sword lost the passionate rage and felt no different from any other weapon. Richard lifted a finger in caution. The dangerous magic still glazed his eyes. The muscles of his jaw tightened until she could see it standing out all the way up through his temples. Don't draw this sword, he warned in that awful hoarse whisper, unless it's a matter of your life. You know the ghastly things this weapon can do to a person. Not only the one under the power of the blade, but the one under the power of the hilt. Kalin, arrested by the intensity of his gaze, could only nod. She clearly recalled the first time Richard had used the sword to kill a man. The first time he came to learn the horror of killing had been to protect her. Using the weapon that first time, unleashing the magic the first time, had nearly killed Richard as well. It had been a struggle for him to learn how to control such a storm of magic as the Sword of Truth freed. Without the rage of the sword's magic, Richard's eyes were capable of conveying menace. Kalin could recall several times when his raptor's glare by itself had brought a roomful of people to silence. 
there were few things worse than the need to escape the look in those eyes. Now those eyes hungered to deliver death. Be angry if you must use this, he growled. Be very angry. That will be your only salvation. Kalin swallowed. I understand, she nodded. I remember. Righteous rage was the only defense against the crippling pain the sword exacted as payment for its service. Life or death, no other reason. I don't know what will happen, and I'd just as soon you not find out. But I'd prefer that to you being without this terrible defense if you need it. I've given it a taste of blood. It will come out voracious. When it comes out, it will be in a blood rage. I understand. His eyes cooled at last. I'm sorry to give you the terrible responsibility of this weapon, especially in this way, but it's the only protection I can offer. With a hand on his arm to gently reassure him, Kalin said, I won't have to use it. Dear spirits, I hope not. He glanced over his shoulder, taking a last look at their room and then at Kara. I have to get going. She ignored his words. Give me your arm first. He saw she had bandages left over from when Kalin was still recovering. Without objection, he held out his blood-soaked arm. Kara used a wet cloth to quickly swab his arm before she wound it in clean bandages. Richard thanked her as she was finishing. Kara split the end, put the tails around his wrists, and tied a quick knot. We will come part of the way with you. No, you will stay here. Richard pulled down his sleeve. I don't want to risk it. But, Kara, I want you to protect Kalin. I'm leaving her in your hands. I know you won't let me down. Kara's big, beautiful eyes, glistening with tears, reflected the kind of pain Kalin was sure Kara never allowed anyone to see. I swear to protect her as I would protect you, Lord Rall, if you swear to get away in return. Richard flashed her a brief smile, trying to ease her misery. I'm Lord Rall. I don't need to remind you that I've wiggled out of tighter spots than this. He kissed her cheek. Kara, I swear I'll never give up trying to get away. You have my word. Kalin realized he hadn't really sworn to Kara's words. He wouldn't, she knew, want to make a promise he might not be able to keep. Bending to the bed, he pulled his pack close. I have to go. He held the strap in a stranglehold. I can't be late. Kalin's fingers tightened on his arm. Kara laid a hand on his shoulder. Richard turned back and gripped Kalin's shoulders. Listen to me now. I wish you would stay here, in this house, in these mountains, where it's safe for you. But I don't think anything short of my dying request could convince you to do that. At least stay for four or five days, in case I'm able to figure out what's going on and can escape Nietzsche. She may be a sister of the dark, but I'm no longer exactly a stranger to magic. I've escaped powerful people before. I've sent Dark and Rawl back to the underworld. I've gone to the Temple of the Winds in another world in order to stop the plague. I've escaped worse than this. Who knows, this might be simpler than it seems. If I do escape her, I'll come back here, so wait for a while at least. If I can't get away from Nietzsche for now, try to find Zed. He might have some idea of what to do. Anne was with him the last time we saw him. She's the prelate of the Sisters of Light and knew Nietzsche for a very long time. Perhaps she knows something that, along with what Zed might be able to come up with, could help. Richard, don't worry about me. Just take care of yourself. I'll be waiting for you when you get away. So just be at ease about that much of it and put all your effort into escaping from her. We'll wait here for a while, I promise. I will watch over her, Lord Rawl. Don't worry about the Mother Confessor. Richard nodded. He turned back to Kalin. His fingers on her arms tightened. His brow drew down. I know you, and I know the way you feel, but you have to listen to me. The time has not yet come. It may never come. You may think I'm wrong in this, but if you close your eyes to the reality of what is in favor of what you would wish just because you're the Mother Confessor and feel responsible for the people of the Midlands, then there is no reason for us to bother hoping we'll be together again because we won't. We will be dead, and the cause of freedom will be dead. His face loomed closer. Above all else, our forces must not attack the heart of the Order's army. It's too soon. If they, if you... 
carry an assault directly into the heart of the order, thinking you can win, it will be the end of our forces and the end of our chances. All hope for the cause of freedom and all hope to defeat the order will be lost for generations to come. It's the same way we must use our heads with Nietzsche and not fight her in a direct attack or we will both die. You promised you would not kill yourself to free me. Don't throw that promise away by going against what I'm telling you now. It all seemed so unimportant at the moment. The only thing that mattered was that she was losing him. She would have cast the rest of the world to the wolves if she could just keep him. All right, Richard. Promise me. His fingers were hurting her arms. He shook her. I mean it. You could throw it all away if you don't heed my warning. You could destroy the hope of people for the next 50 generations. You could be the one who destroys freedom and brings a dark age upon the world. Promise me you won't. A thousand thoughts swirled in chaotic turmoil through her mind. Kalin stared up into his eyes. She heard herself say, I promise, Richard. Until you say so, we'll make no direct attack. He looked like a great weight had been lifted from his shoulders. A smile spread on his face as he pulled her into an embrace. His fingers combed into her hair and cradled her head as she rose to his kiss. Her hand slipped up the backs of his shoulders as she held him. It only lasted a moment, but in that moment of stolen bliss, they shared a world of emotions. All too soon, the kiss, the embrace, was over. His warm presence swirled away from her, allowing the awful weight of doom to settle firmly down atop her. Richard briefly hugged Kara before he hefted his pack onto a shoulder. He turned back at the bedroom doorway. I love you, Kalen. Never anyone before you nor ever after you. Only you. His eyes said it even better. You're everything to me, Richard. You know that. I love you too, Kara. He winked at her. Take good care of the both of you until I'm back. I will, Lord Rall. You have my word as Mord Sith. He gave her a crooked smile. I have your word as Kara. And then he was gone. I love you too, Lord Rall, Kara whispered to the empty doorway. Kalin and Kara ran into the main room and stood in the doorway, watching him running across the meadow. Kara cupped her hands around her mouth. I love you too, Lord Rall, she shouted. Richard turned as he ran and acknowledged her words with a wave. Together they watched Richard's dark figure flying through the dead brown grass, his fluid gait swiftly carrying him away. Just before he disappeared into the trees, he stopped and turned. Kalin shared a last look with him, a look that said everything. He turned and vanished into the woods, his clothes making him impossible to distinguish from the trees and undergrowth. Kalin collapsed to her knees, sitting back on her heels as she lost control of her emotions. She wept helplessly, her head in her hands, at what seemed the end of the world. Kara squatted beside her to put an arm around her shoulders. Kalin hated to have Kara see her cry that way, cry in such weakness. She felt a distant gratitude when Kara held her head to her shoulder and didn't say anything. Kalin didn't know how long she sat on the dirt floor in her white confessor's dress, sobbing, but after a time she was able to make herself stop. Her heart continued to spiral down into hopeless gloom. Each passing moment seemed unendurable. The bleak future stretched out before her, a wasteland of agony. She finally looked up and gazed about at the house. Without Richard, it was empty. He had given it life. Now it was a dead place. What do you wish to do, Mother Confessor? It was getting dark. Whether it was the sunset or the clouds getting thicker, Kalin didn't know. She wiped at her eyes. Let's begin to get our things together. We'll stay here a few days, like Richard asked. After that, anything the horses can't carry that will spoil, we'd better bury. We should board up the windows. We'll close up the house good and tight. For when we return to paradise someday? Kalin nodded as she looked about, trying desperately to focus her mind on a task and not on that which would crush her. The worst part she knew was going to be night, when she was alone in bed when he wasn't with her. Now the valley seemed more like paradise lost. She had trouble believing that Richard was really gone. It seemed as if he were just off to catch some fish or hunt berries or scalp the hills. It seemed as if surely he would be coming back soon. Yes, for when we return. Then it will be paradise again. I guess when Richard returns, wherever we are will be paradise. 
Kaelin noticed that Kara didn't hear her answer. The moored Sith was staring through the doorway. Kara, what is it? Lord Rahl is gone. Kaelin rested a comforting hand on Kara's shoulder. I know it hurts, but we must put our minds to... No, Kara turned back. Her blue eyes were strangely troubled. No, that's not what I mean. I mean that I can't sense him. I can't feel the bond to Lord Rahl. I know where he is. He's going up the trail up to that pass, but I can't feel it. She looked panicked. Dear spirit, it's like going blind. I don't know how to find him. I can't find Lord Rahl. Kalin's first flash of fear was that he fell and was killed, or that Nietzsche had executed him. She used reason to force the fear aside. Nietzsche knows about the bond. She probably used her magic to cloak it or to sever it. Cloaked it somehow. Kara rolled her Aegeel in her fingers. That's what it has to be. I can still feel my Aegeel, so I know that Lord Rahl has to be alive. The bond is still there, but I cannot feel it to sense where he is. Kalin sighed with relief. That has to be it. Nietzsche doesn't want to be followed, so she cloaked his bond with magic. Kalin realized that to be protected from the Dreamwalker by the bond to Richard, people would now have to believe in him without the reassurance of feeling the bond. Their link would have to remain true in their hearts if they were to survive. Could they do that? Could they believe in that way? Kara stared out the doorway across the meadow to the mountains where Richard had disappeared. The blue-violet sky behind the blue-gray mountains was slashed with blazing orange gashes. The snowcaps were lower than they had been. Winter was racing toward them. If Richard didn't soon escape and return, Kalin and Kara would have to be gone before it arrived. Bouts of dizzying grief threatened to drown her in a flood of tears. Needing to do something, she went to her room to take off her confessor's dress. She would set to work with the task of closing up the house and preparing to leave. As Kalin pulled her dress off, Kara appeared in the doorway. Where are we going to go, Mother Confessor? You said we were going to leave, but you never said where we were going to go. Kalin saw Spirit standing in the window, fists at her sides as she looked out at the world. She lifted the carving off the sill and trailed her fingers over the flowing form. Seeing the statue, touching it, feeling the power of it, made Kalin want to reach deep inside for resolve. Once before, she had been hopeless, and Richard carved this for her. Her other hand fell to her side, and her fingers found Richard's sword lying across their bed. Kalin focused her mind, ordering the turbulent swirl of despair thickening into wrath. To destroy the Order. Destroy the Order? Those beasts took my unborn child, and now they've taken Richard. I will make them regret it a thousand times over, and then another thousand. I once swore an oath of death without mercy to the Order. The time has come. If killing every last one of them is the only way to get Richard back, then that's what I will do. You swore an oath to Lord Rahl. Richard said nothing about not killing them, just about how. My oath was not to try to drive a sword through their heart. He said nothing about bleeding them to death with a thousand cuts. I won't break my oath but I intend to kill every last one of them. Mother Confessor, you must not do that. Why? Kara's blue eyes gleamed with menace. You must leave half for me. Chapter 24 Richard had stopped to turn back and look at her only once as he ran, just before he went into the trees. She was standing in the doorway in her white confessor's dress her long, thick hair tumbling down, her form the embodiment of feminine grace, looking as beautiful as the first time he saw her. They held each other's gaze for a brief moment. He was too far away to see the green of her eyes, a color he'd never beheld on anyone else, a color of such heart-piercing perfection that it sometimes would stop his breathing and at other times quicken it. But it was the mind of the woman behind those eyes that in reality captivated him. Richard had never met her equal. He knew he was cutting the time close. As much as he hated the idea of turning his gaze away from Kaelin, her life hung in the balance. His purpose was clear. Richard had plunged into the woods. He had traveled the trail often enough. He knew where he could run and where he had to be careful. Now, with little time left, he couldn't afford to be too careful. He didn't try for a glimpse of the house. 
He was alone in the woods as he ran, his thoughts but salt in a raw wound. For once he felt out of place in the woods, powerless, insignificant, hopeless. Bare branches clattered together in the wind while others creaked and moaned as if in mock sorrow to see him leaving. He tried not to think as he ran. Fir and spruce trees took over as the ground rose out of the valley. His breath came in rapid pulls. In the cold shadows of the forest floor, the wind was a distant pursuer far overhead, chasing after him, shooing him along, hounding him away from the happiest place he had ever been. Spongy mounds of verdant moss lay dotting the forest floor in the low places where mostly cedars grew, looking like wedding cakes done up in an intense green, sprinkled over with tiny chocolate-brown scale-like cedar needles. Richard tiptoed on rocks sticking up above the water as he crossed a small stream. As the little brook tumbled down the slope, it went under rocks and boulders in places, making an echoing drumming sound, announcing him to the stalwart oaks along his march into imprisonment. In the flat gray light, he failed to see a reddish loop of cedar root. It caught his foot and sent him sprawling face down in the trail, a final humiliation on his judgment and sentence of banishment. As Richard lay in the cold, damp, discarded leaves, dead branches, and other refuse of the forest, he considered not getting up ever again. He could just lie there and let it all end. Let the indifferent wind freeze his limbs stiff, let the sneaky spiders and snakes and wolves come to bite him and bleed him to death. And then finally the uncaring trees would cover him over, never to be missed except by a few, his vanishing a good riddance to most. A messenger with a message no one wanted to heed. A leader come too soon. Why not just let it end? Let silent death take them both to their peace and be done with it. The scornful trees all watched to see what this unworthy man might do, to see if he had the courage to get to his feet and face what was ahead. He didn't know himself if he did. Death was easier, and in that bottomless moment less painful to consider. Even Kalin, as much as he loved her, wanted something from him he could not give her. A lie. She wanted him to tell her that something he knew to be so was not. He would do anything for her, but he couldn't change what was. At least she had enough faith in him to let him lead her away from the shadows of tyranny darkening the world. Even if she didn't believe him, she was probably the only one willing, of her own free will, to follow him. In truth... He lay on the ground for only seconds, regaining his senses from the fall and catching his breath as the thoughts flooded through his mind, brief seconds in which he allowed himself to be weak in exchange for how hard he knew everything to come would be. Weakness to balance the strength he would need, doubt to balance his certainty of purpose, fear to balance the courage he would have to call upon. Even as he wondered if he could get up, he knew he would. His convulsion of self-pity ended abruptly. He would do anything for her, even this, a thousand times over even this. With renewed resolve, Richard forced his mind away from the dominion of dark thoughts. He wasn't so hopeless, he knew better. After all, he had faced trials much more difficult than this one sister of the dark. He had once gotten Kalen out of the clutches of five sisters of the dark. This was but one. He would defeat her, too. Anger welled up at the thought of Nietzsche thinking she could make them dance at the end of her selfish strings. Despair extinguished, rage flooded in. And then he was running again, dodging trees as he cut corners off the trail. He hurtled fallen trees and leaped over gaps in the rock shelves rather than taking the safe route down and up. Each shortcut or leap saved him a few precious seconds. A broken tree limb snagged his pack, yanking it from his shoulder. He tried to hang on to it as he flew past, but it slipped from his grasp and spilled across the ground. Richard exploded in fury, as if the tree had done it on purpose just to taunt him in his rush. He kicked the offending branch, snapping it out of its dry socket. He fell to his knees and scooped his things back into the pack, clawing up moss along with gold and silver coins and a pine seedling along with the soap Kalin had given him. He didn't have time to care as he shoved it all back in. This time, he put the pack onto his back rather than letting it hang from one shoulder. He had been trying to save time before, and it had cost him instead. The path, which in places was no more than sections of animal trails, began to rise sharply, occasionally requiring that he use both hands to hold on to rocks or roots as he climbed. He'd been up it enough times to know the sound handholds. As cold as the day was, Richard had to wipe sweat from his eyes. 
He skinned his knuckles on rough granite as he jammed his fingers into cracks for handholds. In his mind's eye, Nietzsche was riding too swiftly, covering too much ground, getting too far ahead. He knew it had been foolhardy to take so much time before leaving, thinking he could make up for it on the trail. He wished he could have taken more time, though, to hold Kalin. His insides were in agony at the thought of how heartbroken Kalin was. He felt somehow that it was worse for her. Even if she was free and he was not, that made it worse for her because in her freedom she had to restrain herself when she wanted nothing more than to come after him. In bondage to a master, Richard had it easy. He had only to follow orders. He burst out of the trees onto the wider trail at the top of the pass. Nietzsche was nowhere to be seen. He held his breath as he looked to the east, fearing to spot her going down the back side of the pass. Beyond the high place where he stood, he could see forests spread out before him with mountains to each side lifting the carpet of trees. In the distance, greater mountains yet soared to dizzying heights, their peaks and much of their slopes stark white against the gloom of heavy gray sky. Richard didn't see any horse and rider, but since the trail twisted down into the trees not far beyond where he stood, that didn't really prove anything. The top of the pass was a bald bit of open ledge with most of the rest of the horse trail winding through deep woods. He quickly inspected the ground, casting about for tracks, hoping she wouldn't be too far ahead of him, and he could catch her before she did something terrible. His sense of doom eased when he found no tracks. He peered out of the valley far below across the straw-brown meadow to their house. It was too far away to see anyone. He hoped Kalin would stay there for a few days, as he had asked. He didn't want her going to the army, going to fight a losing war, endangering her life for nothing. Richard understood Kalin's desire to be with her people and to defend her homeland. She believed she could make a difference. She could not. Not yet. Maybe not ever. Richard's vision was really nothing more than the acceptance of that reality. Shaking your sword at the sky didn't keep the sun from setting. Richard cast an appraising squint at the clouds. For the last two days, he had thought that the signs pointed to the first snow of the season soon rolling down onto their valley home. By the look of the sky and the scent and the wind, he judged he was right. He knew he wasn't going to be able to escape Nietzsche so easily as to be able to get back to Kalin within a few days. He had invented that story for another reason. Once the weather shifted and the snow arrived up in these mountain highlands, it tended to come in an onslaught. If the storm was as big as he estimated by the signs it could be, Kalin and Kara would end up being stuck in their house until spring. With all the food they'd put up, as well as the supplies he'd brought in, they had plenty to last the two of them. The firewood he'd cut would keep them warm. There, she would be safe. With the army, she would be in constant danger. The dappled mare walked out of the trees, coming around a bend not far away. Nietzsche's blue eyes were on Richard from the first instant she appeared. At the time the Sisters of the Light had taken him to the Palace of the Prophets in the Old World, Richard had mistakenly believed Kalin wanted him taken away. He didn't know or understand she had sent him away to save his life. Richard thought she didn't ever want to see him again. While in captivity at the palace, Richard thought Nietzsche was the personification of lust. He was hardly able to find his voice when around her. He had hardly been able to believe a creature of such physical perfection existed other than in daydreams. Now, as he watched her swaying gently in her saddle as she walked her horse up the trail, her intense blue eyes locked on his, it seemed to him she wore her beauty with a kind of grim acceptance. She had so completely lost her stunning presence that he couldn't even envision any reason for his one-time sentiment about her. Richard had since learned the true depths of what a real woman was, what real love was, and what real fulfillment was. In that light, Nietzsche paled into insignificance. As he watched her coming closer, he was surprised to realize she looked sad. She seemed almost to be sorry to find him there. But more than that, there seemed to be a shadow of relief passing across her countenance. Richard, you lived up to my faith. Her voice suggested that it had been tenuous at best. You're in a sweat. Would you like to rest? Her feigned kindness drove hot blood all the way up to his scalp. He pulled his glare from her gentle smile and turned to the trail, walking ahead of her horse. He thought it best if he not say anything until he could get a grip on his rage. Not far down the trail, they came to a black stallion with a white blaze on its face. 
The big horse was picketed in a small grassy patch of open ground among towering pines. Your horse, as I promised, she said. I hope you find him to your liking. I judged him to be big and strong enough to carry you comfortably. Richard checked and found the smooth snaffle bit to his approval. She wasn't abusing the animals with cruel bits used to dominate, as he knew some of the sisters did. The rest of the tack appeared sound. The horse looked healthy. Richard took a few moments to introduce himself to the stallion. He reminded himself that the horse was not the cause of his problems, and he shouldn't let his attitude toward Nietzsche affect how he treated this handsome animal. He didn't ask the horse's name. He let it sniff his hand beneath its curled muzzle, then stroked the stallion's sleek black neck. He patted its shoulder, conveying a gentle introduction without words. The powerful black stallion stamped his front hooves. He was not yet all that pleased to meet Richard. For the time being, there was no choice of routes. There was only the one trail, and it ran from the direction of the house where Kalin was, back to the east. Richard took the lead so that he wouldn't have to look at Nietzsche. He didn't want to jump right on the stallion at first sight and make a bad impression that would take a lot of work to overcome. Better to let the horse get to know him first, if just for a mile or so. He held the reins slack under the stallion's jaw and walked in front of him, letting him get comfortable with following this strange new man. Putting his mind to the task of working with the horse helped divert him from thoughts that threatened to drag him under a sea of sorrow. After a time, the stallion seemed at ease with his new master, and Richard mounted without any ado. The narrow trail precluded Nietzsche walking her horse beside his. Her dappled mare snorted its displeasure at having to follow the stallion. Richard was pleased to know that he had already upset the order of things. Nietzsche offered no conversation, sensing, he supposed, his mood. He was going with her, but there was no way she could hope to make him happy about it. When it started getting dark, Richard simply dismounted beside a small brook where the horses could have a drink and tossed his things on the ground. Nietzsche wordlessly accepted his choice of campsite and unstrapped her bedroll from her saddle after she'd taken it down off her horse. She sat on her bedroll, looking a little downcast more than anything else, and ate some sausage along with a hard biscuit washed down with water. After her first bite, she lifted the sausage to him, meeting his gaze in a questioning manner. He didn't acknowledge the offer. Nietzsche assumed he declined and went back to eating. When she was finished and had washed in the brook, she went behind the thick undergrowth for a time. When she came back, she crawled into her bedroll without a word, turned away from him, and went to sleep. Richard sat on the mossy ground, arms folded, leaning the small of his back against his saddle. He didn't sleep the entire night. He sat watching Nietzsche sleep in the light of the overcast sky, lit from the other side by a nearly full moon, watching her slow, even breathing, her slightly parted lips, the slow pulse in the vein at the side of her throat, thinking the whole time how he might overcome what she had done to them. He thought about strangling her, but he knew better. He had used magic before. He had in the past not only felt but unleashed incredible power through his gift. He had faced situations of enormous danger involving a wide variety of magic. Richard had called upon his gift to conjure such power as no one living had ever seen, and he had watched as it was brought to life at his conscious direction. His gift was invoked mostly through anger and need. He had an abundant supply of both. He just didn't know how it could help him. He didn't understand well enough what Nietzsche had done to begin to think of what he might do to counter it. With Kalin's life at the other end of Nietzsche's invisible cord of magic, he dared not do anything until he was sure of it. He would be, though. He just had to figure it out. Experience told him that it was a reasonable supposition. He told himself it was only a matter of time. If he wanted to keep his sanity, he knew he had to believe that. The next morning, without speaking a word to Nietzsche, he saddled the horses. She sat watching him tighten the cinch straps, making sure they weren't pinching the horses as she sipped from a water skin. She took bread from her saddlebag lying beside her and asked if he would like a piece. Richard ignored her. He would have been tired from not sleeping the whole cold night, but his anger kept him wide awake. Under a leaden sky, they rode at an easy but steady pace all that day through forests that seemed endless. It felt good to have a warm horse under him. Throughout the day, they continued their gradual descent from the higher country, where the house was, down into the lowlands. Toward dark, the snow arrived. At first, it was just a few furtive flakes swirling through the air, 
As it steadily increased, it seemed to leach the color from trees and ground alike until the world turned white. Visibility steadily diminished as the snow thickened into a disorienting, drifting, solid wall. He had to keep blinking the fat flakes from his eyes. For the first time since leaving with Nietzsche, Richard felt a sense of relief. Kalin and Kara, up higher in the mountains, would wake in the morning to several feet of snow. They would decide that it was foolish to try to leave when they would believe it was only an early snow that would melt down enough in a few days for them to have an easier time of traveling. Up in those mountains, that would be a mistake. It would stay cold. A storm would follow on the heels of this one, and they would soon have snow up to the shutters. They would be nervous about waiting, but would probably decide that it was now more important for them to delay until a break in the weather. After all, there was no urgency. In all likelihood, they would end up safely stuck in the house for the winter. When he eventually escaped from Nietzsche's talons, Richard would find Kalin snug in their home. He decided that it would be foolish to let his anger dictate that they sleep on the open ground. They could freeze to death. He recalled all too well that if Nietzsche died, Kalin died. When he spotted a big wayward pine, he walked his horse off the trail. Brushing against branches dumped wet snow on him. Richard flicked it off his shoulders and shook it from his hair. Nietzsche glanced around, confused, but didn't object. She dismounted as she waited to see what he was doing. When he held a heavy bow to the side for her, she frowned at him before poking her head inside for a look. She straightened with an expression of childlike delight. Richard didn't return her wide grin. Inside, under the thick boughs caked with snow, was a still, frigid world. With the snow crusting the tree, it was dark inside. In the dim light, Richard dug a small fire pit and soon caught fire to the dead wood he'd carefully stacked over shavings. With the crackling flames built into a warm glow, Nietzsche gazed around in wonder at the inside of the wayward pine. The spoke-like branches over their heads were cast in a soft orange blush by the flickering light. The lower trunk was bare of limbs, leaving the inside of the tree a hollow cone with ample open space at the bottom for them. Nietzsche quietly warmed her hands by the fire, looking contented, not like she was gloating that he'd given in and found shelter and built a fire, but contented. She looked as if she had been through a great ordeal, and now she could be at peace. She looked like a woman expecting nothing, but grateful for what she had. Richard hadn't had breakfast with her or anything the day before. His bitter resolve gave way to his hunger, so he boiled water from melted snow and cooked rice and beans. Starving wouldn't do him or Kalin any good. Without words, he offered Nietzsche half the rice and beans poured into the crust of one end of his loaf of bread. She took the bread bowl and thanked him. She offered him a sun-dried slice of meat. Richard stared at her thin, delicate fingers holding out the piece of meat. It reminded him of someone feeding a chipmunk. He snatched the meat from her hand and tore off a chunk with his teeth. To avoid her gaze, he watched the fire as he ate his rice and beans out of the heel of bread. Other than the crackle of the fire, the only sound was the thump of snow falling in clumps from limbs not stout enough to hold the load. Snowfalls often turned a forest to a place of eerie stillness. Sitting by the low fire after he'd finished his meal, feeling the warmth of the flames on his face, the exhaustion from the long ride on top of his vigil the night before finally caught up with him. Richard stacked thicker wood on the dwindling fire and banked the coals around it. He unrolled his bedroll on the opposite side of the fire from Nietzsche as she silently watched him, climbed in, and as he thought about Kalin safe in their house, fell soundly asleep. The next day they were up early. Nietzsche said nothing, but once they were mounted, decisively cut her dappled mare in front of the black stallion and took the lead. The snow had changed to a cold, drizzling mist. What snow was left on the ground had melted down to gray slush. The lowlands were not quite ready to relinquish themselves to winter's grip. Up higher, where Kalin was, it was colder and would be snowing in earnest. As they rode carefully along a narrow road at the side of a mountain, Richard tried to watch the woods to keep his mind on other things, but he couldn't help occasionally looking at Nietzsche, riding right in front of him. It was cold and damp. She wore a heavy black cloak over her black dress. With her back straight, her head held high, and her blonde hair fanned out over her cloak, she looked regal. He wore his dark forest clothes and hadn't shaved. Nietzsche's dappled mare was dark gray, almost black, with lighter gray rings over its body. 
Its mane was dark gray, as were the lightly feathered legs, and the tail was a milky white. It was one of the most handsome horses Richard had ever seen. He hated it. It was hers. By afternoon, they intersected a trail running to the south. Nietzsche, leading the way, continued to the east. Before the day was out, they would encounter a few more paths, used mainly by an occasional hunter or trapper. The mountains were inhospitable. Even if you cleared the ground of trees, the soil was thin and rocky. In a few places closer to Heartland or other population centers to the north or south, there were grassy slopes that were able to support thin flocks of sheep or goats. As he felt the stallion's muscles moving beneath him, Richard looked out at land he knew and loved. He didn't know how long it would be until he was home again, if ever. He hadn't asked where they were going, figuring Nietzsche wouldn't likely tell him this soon. That they were headed east didn't mean much just yet, because their choice of routes was limited. In the passive rhythm of the ride, Richard's mind kept returning to his sword and how he had given it to Kalin. At the time, it had seemed the only thing to do. He hated that he had given it to her the way he had, yet he could think of no other way to afford her any protection. He prayed she would never have to use the sword. If she did, he'd given it a measure of his rage, too. At his belt he wore a fine knife, but he felt naked without his sword. He hated the ancient weapon the way it pulled.